The Senate has referred to the committee the particulars of proposed expenditure for 2021-22 and related documents for the Treasury portfolio, the Industry, Science, Energy and Resources portfolio and elements of the Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications portfolio. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Questions on notice. The committee is set 25 February 2022 as the date by which senators are to submit written questions on notice and 25 March 2022 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. Under Standing Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee. In such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings, and I quote, any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings, end quote. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has the discretion to withhold details or explanations from the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. The Senate has resolved also that an officer of a department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. In particular, I draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of 13 May 2009 specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised, in which I now incorporate in Hansard. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. An officer called upon for the first time to answer a question should state their full name and position for the Hansard record and witnesses should speak clearly into the microphone. Please make sure all mobile phones are switched off or turned to silent. I remind senators and witnesses in the hearing room that microphones remain live unless I instruct otherwise, for example at suspension or adjournment. For witnesses participating via video conference, please mute your microphone as the default and unmute your microphone when speaking. I ask members of the media to follow the established media guidelines and the instructions of the committee secretariat as set out in the guidelines, senators and witnesses, laptops, mobile phones, other devices and personal papers are not to be filmed or photographed. I remind everyone in the gallery that they are not permitted to speak or interfere with the proceedings or with witnesses at any point during the hearing. Security is present and they will be asked to remove anyone who does not follow these instructions. Witnesses and senators who are seeking to table documents during the committee's hearing were requested to provide an electronic copy of those documents the day prior to the hearing so the documents could be circulated electronically during the hearing. Please liaise with the Secretariat if you need assistance. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the additional budget estimates 2021-22 hearings are conducted in a safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. I draw your attention to the QR codes available at all weight rooms. Witnesses, observers and staff are encouraged to use the codes before entering rooms to allow a full record of attendance to be kept. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. The committee proceedings today will commence with the Treasury portfolio beginning with Treasury's Corporate and Foreign Investment Group and Macroeconomic Group. The hearing will then follow the order as set out in the circulated program. I now welcome Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham, Minister for Finance. I also welcome the Secretary of the Department of the Treasury, Dr Stephen Kennedy, and officers from the Treasury. Minister, Secretary or officers, would you like to make an opening statement? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Senators. Uh, I don't have an opening statement to make, but as is customary in this committee, I believe Dr Kennedy does. Over to you, Dr Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I do have an opening statement. 
Over the summer, the Omicron wave impacted health and the welfare of the community and disrupted economic activity. The most significant economic impacts stemmed from increased absenteeism. Many businesses found it difficult to maintain their full operations because of high levels of staff absences. In my EFO, uh, we recognise that the pandemic would continue to create headwinds for the recovery and we laid out scenarios that reflected this uncertainty. However, we did not foresee the extent of the Omicron wave nor the extent of the disruption to supply chains. Nonetheless, while the disruption caused by Omicron has been significant, its overall economic impact is likely to be less than was foreshadowed in the downside scenario. This is because we have also learnt that the underlying economy is stronger than we had recognised. These recent developments reflect a pattern that has emerged following the first wave of the pandemic. The challenging health outlook has persisted, while the economy has proved more resilient. This likely reflects both policies being more effective than expected and a more rapid adjustment by the community to the tribulations of COVID. With widespread community transmission of the virus in most parts of Australia, the community is now familiar with the challenges of living in this new phase of the pandemic. During January, many businesses faced acute staff absences because of the high number of workers infected and many others required to isolate as close contacts. In a range of industries, reports of staff shortages as high as 30 to 40 per cent were widespread in our liaison with business. This created a challenging business environment in industries such as food manufacturing, transport and logistics and retail that led to some temporary shortages of goods. Other high social contact sectors like restaurants and entertainment also saw activity significantly impacted. In January, Treasury undertook analysis of the potential impact of the outbreak on staff absences for National Cabinet. We used infection scenarios provided by the Doherty Institute for the New South Wales Omicron outbreak. This analysis suggested that up to 10% of state workforces could be absent due to COVID illness or the need to self-isolate at the peak of state Omicron outbreaks. Self-isolating rules for close contacts working in essential industries have subsequently been relaxed. Case numbers have fallen and we have observed labour pressures lessening in these industries. Notwithstanding the significant impact on labour supply, our current assessment is that the negative impact on aggregate spending has been relatively muted. Spending declined in January relative to a strong December but remains above levels experienced in previous lockdowns. The latest labour market data indicate that late last year demand for labour was robust, pushing the unemployment rate down sharply to its lowest level in 13 years. We do not expect the Omicron wave to have, a, to have a large negative impact on employment. It is more likely to have a relatively larger impact on the number of hours worked across the economy rather than employment. Globally, the Omicron wave is having a major impact on health systems and is interrupting economic activity. However, as for Australia, the impact on economic activity is expected to be relatively muted and short-lived <coughs> compared with earlier waves of the virus. The IMF recently revised down its expectations for growth this year, but continues to forecast solid global growth of 4.4%. Forecasting the path of the pandemic is difficult. Cases have moderated from the peak in January, but the Chief Medical Officer has indicated that future surges in community transmission are likely, potentially another wave of Omicron in winter and the ongoing emergence of new variants. Treasury continues to work closely with the Department of Health and Doherty Institute to incorporate health scenarios into our assessment of the economic outlook. Uncertainty surrounding the health outlook will be with us for some time. Business and community could be dealing with, with an extended period of inter intermittent disruption and higher absences. That said, the community can be confident that Australia is in a strong position to manage future waves. I'd now like to turn to some of the challenges facing macroeconomic policy. Usually monetary policy is the primary tool with which to manage economic cycles and fiscal policy focuses on growth and budget sustainability, while being complementary to monetary policy primarily through automatic stabilisers. Fiscal policy plays a more active role in the face of significant shocks, but the circumstances surrounding the response to COVID is something different again. 
The relative primacy of monetary policy in responding to the COVID shock has been entirely reversed due to the nature of the shock and interest rates being near the zero lower bound. For example, unconventional monetary policy on its own would have had little impact in the face of lockdowns. Instead, it was most effective through its support of fiscal policy. This is not to underplay the importance of bond purchases, for example. There is little doubt they have lowered longer term yields and the exchange rate providing important support to the economy. Nonetheless, such impacts are likely to be much less than the effects of $337 billion in direct spending from the Australian Government. Further, it is likely that fiscal multipliers have been larger than normal during this period. Evidence from the literature suggests that in deep recessions and when monetary policy is constrained by the zero lower bound, this is the case. This unusual episode of macroeconomic policy is now coming to an end. The fiscal policy impulse is receding, reflecting the temporary and targeted nature of the policy response. After two very strong years of growth in Commonwealth payments, in my EFO, payments in 21-22 and 22-23 were forecast to fall by 6.3 and 4.8 per cent in real terms. As a share of GDP, Commonwealth payments are estimated to fall across each of the budget and forward estimate years from 31.6% in 2021 to 26.5% in 2024 25 And monetary policy is beginning to normalise with no additional unconventional monetary policy being applied and bond purchases coming to an end. Moreover, in other countries, interest rates have begun to rise slowly from very low levels. Despite these early steps towards normalisation, macroeconomic policy settings are still far from usual. Interest rates are still close to zero and expected to remain historically low for some time. It will not be until we see interest rates rise back towards more usual levels that the risks associated with very low interest rates abate. In these circumstances, it is important that the withdrawal of fiscal policy is tapered as it currently is, to ensure that monetary policy has an opportunity to normalise. However, there is an even more compelling reason for fiscal support to sensibly taper, and that is the opportunity to achieve full employment. The unemployment rate averaged 4.7 per cent in the December quarter, rather than the 5.25 per cent forecast at MAIFO, as workers returned to employment more quickly than expected after the Delta lockdowns. Surprisingly, the unemployment rate fell to 4.2 per cent in the month of December, the lowest rate since August 2008. We have seen dramatic falls in youth unemployment, an especially welcome sign after some years of underperformance in this area. The young always bear the brunt of an underperforming labour market. The underemployment rate has decreased to the lowest level since 2008, alongside a steady increase in average hours worked indicating a genuine reduction in, labour, in the labour market spare capacity. Measures of long-term unemployment have fallen to around 16 per cent below pre-pandemic levels. Other countries have seen significant falls in their unemployment rates, but few have also experienced an increase in labour supply from the working age population to the extent we have in Australia. <clears throat> More people were in employment as a proportion of the working age population that at any time in Australia's history in December. And the employment to population ratio is now higher than any major advanced economy. Not only has the supply of labour been responsive to demand, but dynamism in the labour market has increased. Workers have been switching jobs at increased rates. This is assisting the economy to adjust to shifting demand patterns because of the pandemic and is facilitating productivity improvements by matching workers with the right jobs. This will support stronger growth in earnings. A tight labour market will mean firms will have to compete harder for labour by increasing wages and improving conditions. Firms need to focus on lifting productivity, will need to focus on lifting productivity. For example, by changing businesses practices to encourage greater employee engagement and increasing investment in training to upskill and reskill new and existing employees. The reopening of our international borders will provide some additional supply following the collapse in immigration of the past two years. This will assist in easing the tightness in those industries such as hospitality that are more reliant on working holiday makers and migrant workers. However, the recovery in population growth will also support demand, so the broad-based tightness in the labour market is likely to persist. 
The improving outlook from business investment is adding to the potential for future increases in productivity. If our expectations for non-mining business investment are realised across the next two financial years, non-mining investment would rise to its highest share of the economy since 2011. Our assessment is that the role of fiscal and monetary policy and policy more broadly has been instrumental in supporting Australia's strong outcomes. As noted by the OECD, countries that introduce job retention schemes seem to have had a more positive labour market seems to have had more positive labour market responses to COVID than others. In Australia's case, the JobKeeper program in conjunction with the job seeker enhancements appear to have been especially successful in preserving employment while supporting incomes and encouraging rapid recovery. Both temporary supports were appropriately withdrawn as they were no longer required as confidence in adapting to the pandemic increase, labour markets tightened and substantial income support accumulated on household and business balance sheets. I have previously noted that following a recession, the Nauru, the level of unemployment below which inflation would be expected to accelerate, typically drifts up because of the late of labour market scarring, ultimately constraining the ability of the economy to grow strongly out of the recession. At this stage, there is no evidence of any labour market scarring and the debate has shifted to how low the unemployment rate can fall and be maintained without generating rising inflationary pressures. Our experience in the years prior to COVID and recent developments suggests that the no rate could be lower than our historical estimates. This suggests a degree of caution is required in framing fiscal and monetary policy, particularly given the large error bounds associated with technical estimates of the Nehru. To put this another way, overestimating the Nehru could see policy tighten prematurely and prevent Australia from attaining the goal of full employment. A further consideration is the likely nonlinear relationship between wages or inflation and unemployment. That is, there may be little trade-off between wages and unemployment until we hit an inflection point, at which point wages growth increases more rapidly with further falls in unemployment. This suggests we should approach low levels of unemployment steadily, but it certainly does not outweigh the argument for persistently testing these boundaries. At full employment, and if we can achieve productivity growth of 1.5 per cent, then nominal wages can grow at 4 per cent and put no pressure on inflation. However, on the other hand, if productivity is only 0.5 per cent, then wages can only grow at 3 per cent before they begin to put pressure on inflation. This again illustrates the importance of achieving strong productivity growth for our long-term prosperity. Before I conclude, I would like to mention a few of the other macroeconomic risks that we're continuing to monitor and assess. Most notably, there remains a high level of uncertainty surrounding the ongoing impacts of COVID on the economic outlook. As I noted earlier, our most recent assessment is that the economic impacts are continuing to, to diminish, even in the face of new waves <coughs> of infection and some health measures. However, the effects of COVID on inflation, often characterised as a combination of increased demand for goods and supply side shocks, are still passing through the economy. Fortunately, these impacts have been much less pronounced in Australia than in other countries. Nevertheless, the impacts have been felt and headline inflation is currently at an 11 year high. Geostrategic risks are also increasing. This is leading to shifts in global trading patterns and supply change as countries seek to build additional economic resilience. There is also a heightened risk of sudden economic disruption as illustrated by current events in Eastern Europe, which may bear down on global markets and investor confidence. There are also ongoing and rising risks from climate change and the transition to a lower carbon economy. There's not sufficient time here today to speak to this important issue in detail but Australia will need to continue to adapt and build resilience to the physical impacts of climate change. Finally, as a result of the response to COVID, many countries have significantly higher levels of public debt that will need to be addressed in the coming years. As the pandemic ebbs and begins to become endemic, health responses will still be required. Vaccination and treatments will remain crucial to reducing the economic impacts and there will always be an ongoing need to protect the most vulnerable, especially as the focus shifts away from transmission. Remarkably, at the same time, Australia may be given an important opportunity, the opportunity to achieve and sustain full employment. These circumstances, with the right policy settings, 
could entail an unemployment rate with a three in front of it or at the very least settling in the low fours, rising productivity back towards 1.5 per cent per year, inflation settling in the middle of the band and nominal wages growing at 4 per cent. This would be an outcome consistent with the maximum opportunity being afforded to all Australians to enjoy prosperity and the benefits that flow from a highly engaged and well remunerated workforce. Australia has not, been close, has not been this close to this opportunity since 2008 and before that prior to the shocks of the 1970s. While nothing is assured, let us hope that we can seize this opportunity in the period ahead and reward younger generations for the significant impost they have taken on through the budget in protecting all Australians from the impacts of COVID. Thank you for the opportunity for the opening statement, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr Kennedy. That was very useful. Uh, questions? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr Kennedy, for appearing today and for that very long uh, opening statement. It's really useful. Hi, Mr Birmingham. Good morning again, Senator Gallagher. <laughs> yeah, morning again. Um, OK, there's a lot in that. Can I, perhaps if I, um, no, in no order particularly, but just where I've highlighted things, um, in relation to your, I think you made some comments about the tapering of fiscal support. Um, yeah, on page four, where you say it's important that the withdrawal of fiscal support is tapered. Um, can you just expand on that a bit? Because um, your, your next point is there's even more compelling reason for fiscal support to sensibly taper to, towards the opportunity to achieve full employment. Yep. Um, so, um, well, as I said, and as I pointed out in the growth and Commonwealth payment numbers, Senator, um, the fiscal support is naturally withdrawing with the closure of some of the programs. Um, uh, and, um, but that impulse that came from that fiscal support is still passing through the economy. It's not complete. It doesn't stop as the spending comes comes out. Uh, the mon monetary policy is still at unusually low levels. Um, well, I think um, I see a lot of news about the, the difficulties people would face with rising interest rates. Um, uh, I think, as the Reserve Bank Governor has spoken about, over time we would like to see monetary policy move to more normal levels, which would entail higher interest rates than the zeros that we see, or the very low at this stage because of the risks that come with those. And if we were to withdraw fiscal policy uh, abruptly through you know, very large widespread cuts or something of that order, um, um, that would have a negative impact on the economy. Monetary policy well m may need to remain looser for longer than it otherwise would, and that would bring with it the risks of, once again, very low interest rates being persistent, and those risks include, for example, things like um, significantly increasing housing prices or other asset prices, all those types of things. So, um, so do you have a time? Is there a time period for this tapering? That I know you've got the the fiscal plan that. Um, was you know has been part of the, all the budget documents, but yeah. what what are you saying when you you're tapering? Is it a matter of you know over the forward estimates, or is it a longer tapering? So the current taper effectively sits in the uh, forward estimates. Um, I sit here with comfortable today. I think that I don't think that will. Um, um, I think that gives a real opportunity for monetary policy to normalise the economy to remain strong. Um, I, um, I, in, in fact, the economy's been surprisingly strong. Uh, it's hard to see a case for any additional support, so tapering less slowly than what we currently are. Yeah. Um, uh, and if circumstances turn out to be even better than we anticipated, um, it's the, the potential to um, improve the fiscal position more rapidly may well arise. But I think we're still, we're still going through waves of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. As I said in my opening remarks, um, the chief medical officer is talking about 
uh, and alerting us to the fact that there may well be a subsequent wave in winter, the new variants, etc. So I think it's you know appropriate to be cautious. There are definitely risks to the outlook, but we seem very well placed. Um, and, and as I said, it's generated this sort of really, in my history, the last time I, I wrote about full employment was in 2007. Um, yeah. So it's really a great opportunity. I think the balance is roughly right at the moment, Senator, but it, it's, um, no, there's no set and forget. Yeah. Senator, I think um, Dr. Kennedy puts a lot into his opening statement and so sometimes it's uh, the, the figures um, don't stand out because there's so much there until you go back over them in the, in the type of line of questioning you're pursuing. And, yeah. uh, and so you know, I think those indications of the step downs of 6.3% uh, fall in Commonwealth payments in yeah. the current financial year yeah. and a 4.8% reduction in real terms in, uh, in the next year, in 22-23, um, are a demonstration of, uh, of that you know, very clear stepping down occurring. Buffering that, which Dr Kennedy has, uh, has highlighted in previous estimates hearings, are the elevated savings rates that, uh, that exist across households and businesses uh, still, and so uh, yeah. show that, that along with some of the other measures government still has in place, you've also got the fact that uh, measures we have applied continue to provide extra capacity for households and businesses to, uh, to work through mm. challenges as they arise. Mm. Yeah. Um, Dr Kennedy, you, you spoke about monetary policy returning to more normal uh, settings. Can you expand on that and what you mean by that? Um, well, th that would involve um, some form of steady increases in interest rates over time. I, uh, I'm not going to get into foreshadowing what I, that might look like. It's a matter for the Governor to talk on behalf of the Reserve Bank Board, in which I'm part of, to talk about the uh, future outlook for monetary policy itself. So, but in more broad terms, um, I, I, I don't see interest rates uh, around where they are as um, something that we expect to see um, uh, in the longer term. Uh, he spoke at length at this at these House of Reps um, appearance on Friday about what interest rates might rise to. So I'd, I'd refer you to his remarks really there, but. Um, and that partly depends on some of the things I spoke about, the lift in productivity, the returns on investment, mm. where, the, where that equilibrium, if you like, interest rate increases to. But monetary policy and fiscal policy have both been applied to stimulate growth. And so they don't stay at that level. They, 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 uh, um, uh, they both return to more neutral settings over time. My points around tapering is that one wouldn't want a mistake. You're trying to find a sweet spot there, Senator, not going too fast and not going too slow, and that's what the tapering refers to. Yeah, okay. Um, I accept um, you're, you know, you're being careful in terms of um, your evidence on interest rates, but so you are, as a member of the Reserve Bank, uh, board. I mean, there is an expectation in line with the comments of the governor that interest rates will head up. Yes. Will go up. Well, okay. that, that, yes. It's very unusual for them to be where they are today. Yeah. And uh, and um, um, and and I and I think it will be in the longer term interest of the country for them to return to a higher level when circumstances allow it to. And that um, is not dependent on a federal election, for example? Um, the, the settings of fiscal policy are relevant. I'm, yeah. go I'm, going, to kind of <laughs> I'm going to avoid being drawn into the uh, comparisons of different governments' policies, but, the, but, the, um, but the, I guess the, my main point out of this was the fiscal policy settings will be the most relevant other macroeconomic policy setting in terms of the interest rate trajectory. Okay. Um, it's just there has been some political commentary, for example, that um, a changing government would impact interest rates, would increase interest rates. Senator, uh, I think I'll let the minister take yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, Senator, uh, um, yeah, that debate. Well, I'm interested in your views um, on that. To well, be fair, well, Dr. Well, Kennedy. Well, well, Senator, well, he's uh, the um, head of Treasury. 
Sure, Senator, and, uh, and if nothing else changed with the change of government um, and all policies remained completely static, uh, then of course uh, I'm sure uh, Dr Kennedy would be able to address that answer in, uh, in one way. Uh, but from what I can see, you're not proposing uh, as an alternate government that nothing else would change. Uh, I've noted that there seem to be some quite significant but as yet uncosted spending promises being made, be they in terms of uh, the commitments to basically provide for um, free TAFE or free childcare, um, uh, be they some of the other costed commitments that, uh, that have been made. Um, and uh, and you know, as is clear from Dr Kennedy's statement, one of the challenges to manage moving forward is, uh, is in terms of um, the budget position, the rate of payments, and that if we have a situation where uh, where uh, fiscal policy is seeing growth in payments and growth in government spending at elevated levels, well, that would present then potential risks, uh, Senator, in terms of fiscal policy being out of step with monetary policy uh, and would put greater pressure potentially on the Reserve Bank. Um, I don't expect Dr Kennedy to run that sort of commentary uh, here, uh, but the contrast that, uh, that will be painted at the federal election, dependent upon just how much extra spending your party commits to and how they indicate they're going to pay for it you know, will be um, a question that then has consequential impacts for other areas of policy and potentially interest rates. So will, um, will all the rorts and the waste and the mismanagement that you spend, that doesn't have any impact at all well, going se forward? Se Is se that right? Se Senator, I, I look forward to um, uh, your party announcing any savings measures. I haven't seen you suggest uh, any particular programs that you're abolishing at this stage. Uh, so uh, so um, you know, whilst you sort of make generalised statements like that, unless you're actually going to take certain programs well, out of government spending, uh, then they still add to the totality of government spending, add to the overall um, impact of government so spending on the economy. So will interest rates rise under your government's uh, fiscal settings? We said we'll do everything we can to keep interest rates rise as low as your, possible. Well, you're the minister. Senator, Will they rise under your Senator, fiscal setting? Senator, um, I hope you know and appreciate that, uh, that the Reserve Bank operates independently uh, and that yes, uh, and I do. That we cannot I do provide understand assurances that. in relation that. to what the Reserve Bank will or won't do. Uh, but uh, what we can provide assurances of is that we will be very mindful of trying to ensure that we keep uh, fiscal policy settings as consistent with monetary policy as possible so that we can keep as much downward pressure in terms of where interest rates sit as is possible. Noting as Dr Kennedy has said, and I acknowledge this, uh, that interest rates are at unusually and historically uh, low levels. Uh, and so, uh, and so, so will they rise under your government? Oh, Senator, will, will interest uh, rates rise under your government? Senator, where interest rates go precisely will be a matter for the Reserve Bank. What we can do as a government uh, and what we will do as a government uh, is seek to put in place and maintain policy settings that keep them as low as possible for Australians. Um, and that means that we won't be pursuing uh, the type of largesse in spending uh, that is evident in, uh, in the way in which your leader speaks. Dr Kenny Kennedy, you've spoken before um, at estimates about inflation and um, in July last year you spoke about the gradual strengthening of inflation if there was higher wage growth. Is it true that in Treasury's view the underlying forces influencing inflation build up over some time before there is a visible impact? Uh, that's, yes, that's usually the case. Um, 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 sort of persistent inflation um, we'd expect to build up over time, reflecting high, um, you know, higher wages growth, for example, or, or those types of things. So it, it is fair to say um, that uh, we have been uh, surprised by the strength of inflation more recently from some of these sort of shorter term impacts, the, the sort of um, uh, supply chain disruption um, effects that have flown through. But um, I think you know pre-COVID that um, inflation was below or, or, or even at the very bottom of the RBA's target band for quite a number of years. And, uh, um, and, and, and the Governor has spoken about how we wouldn't really expect to see inflation settle persistently in the band until we saw a strengthening in wages growth, and I'd hold the same view. Okay. Um, 
The Reserve Bank has revised um, their forecasts on inflation higher, um, and I think after I think it was the December quarter was uh, stronger than and higher than anticipated. Will Treasury similarly revise up your forecasts as part of um, from the MIEFO in part of the budget? Well, the government will present the forecasts at, at budget, um, but I'd be very surprised if we weren't revising up inflation forecasts in, in line with the way the bank has. So we'll wait and see in the budget? Yeah. Basically, OK. Um, the Reserve Bank said in their statement on monetary policy recently that given the tighter labour market and strong demand conditions anticipated over the coming years, inflation is expected to remain in the upper half of the bank's inflation target range of 2 to 3 per cent. Does that suggest, or can we draw from that, that the underlying causes of inflation that are likely over the next few years have already been created? Well, there's two things um, that I think will sit behind the um, how inflation evolves over the next two or three years. The first is the extent to which the current shorter term impacts abate. So um, uh, some of the increases in um, prices in some uh, goods that we've seen um, uh, in other countries, not so much in Australia, the increase in energy prices, but certainly in Australia, the increase in petrol prices and transport prices, depending on how they either fall or even if they just simply remain at a higher level, they stop adding to inflation uh, in, the, in the short term. The, the sort of more two-year horizon, two to three-year horizon that I think we all think about, it is more the underlying forces that you're talking about. Yeah. And, that, um, and that relies more on um, uh, the conversation I had about the labour market, the labour market being tight and tight and are tighter and a strengthening in um, wage growth, which we're yet to fully see, I might add. Um, we have seen it in some, a couple of sectors, but um, it's yet to be broad-based. Uh, and, and I said that led to my conversation about um, in effect how low the unemployment rate needs to get before we start to see some of those wage pressures start to, to come through. Um, I suppose I'll just quickly add, the other point I was trying to make was um, um, we can see wages rise from where they are, from where they are and not put necessarily um, these pressures on inflation. It's actually a little unclear to us just how low that unemployment rate can get before we really see pressures in, on wages that would lead to inflation that, um, that, that wouldn't settle, for example, in the RBA's band. Uh, but, um, even in the RBO's own forecast, while it does remain in the band, it remains in the band throughout their forecast period, inflation with wages strengthening. Okay, so um, you would, so if we take out the, the short term impacts yeah. and focus on the second um, part of, of or seven, the second factor, the underlying forces. Yeah. Is your expectation that that would continue its current trajectory over the coming years? From, uh, from what you, I think you said two years. Um, is it beyond that, or um, is that the time frame? So, so the the question um, becomes where they settle. So that, that was, I guess, the point up where. I, so, so we're coming off some pretty low levels. I mean, inflation, underlying inflation, has got to the middle of the band through those other reasons. But if the shorter term reasons, but the, um, effectively what we're trying to get is inflation in the middle of the band, or, you know, or in the yeah. band, let's say, sorry, in the band. Um, and and that, could, that could be consistent with wages growth, depending on productivity, anywhere between 3 and 4%, which is well above what it is today. And that could be consistent with an unemployment rate that's at least at lo as low as what it is today. So that... that what I was trying to point out in my statement is that with the right policy settings that support productivity growth and continue ongoing stable macroeconomic policy environment, the, um, I don't see pressures driving you necessarily outside of that. That's a sort of an e we'd call an equilibrium circumstance that could persist. Now, of course, things come along and bump you off that all the time. You're mm -hmm. rarely sitting at this sort of mm -hmm. so-called theoretical equilibrium. Um, <coughs> There can be other shocks, but that—that's the. Uh, 
Well, that's the opportunity that's presenting itself at the moment because trying to keep inflation where it is, uh, sorry, pardon, the unemployment rate where it is, um, we will soon observe over time whether that's, that is consistent with inflation and wages at those levels. But um, I think you know very well, Senator, the great power that comes from a very low unemployment rate. And my argument is it's well worth testing uh, how long we can keep it at that level to see if it is consistent with stable inflation and solidly and quite strongly growing wages even. That's the argument I'm putting today. And so um, just understanding, I, I guess, some of those, is Treasury trying to, because things are changing and you're not seeing some of the more, I guess, traditional linkages between um, the labour market and wages yeah. growth and, and those um, interactions, are you trying to understand what's going on more? Like, is Inside it the changing nature of work? Is it, um, you know, the shift to more insecure work, um, the gig economy? I mean, are all those factors influencing um, and challenging that traditional nexus? Um, pro probably the um, most significant um, challenge to understanding the, the, uh, the unemployment trade-off has been um, um, with wages has been probably more around the, the fact that underemployment rose at the same time um, and um, people seeking additional hours. In, in some ways we've been quite surprised by how many additional people are being drawn into the labour force, even from outside the labour force. So even as we're lowering this sort of pool of unemployed, you know, I think two thirds of this increase in the employment population ratio, I hope that number's right, Trevor, um, are coming in from outside the labour force. So we're discovering um, um, that there's, this, there's a pool of workers there who want to work, who perhaps aren't being recorded as unemployed. And so in other words, there's more slackness in the labour market than mm. we anticipated. Um, I think that's um, um, the area that we're focusing on whether we've made misjudgments on over time. I'm not as convinced around um, the other factors you raised around the gig economy. Um, it's a certainly a new development and we watch it closely. I, I haven't seen in the statistics any substantial shift in the rate of casualisation, for example, in the workforce. It's been stable for a I think a couple of decades, I'd have to confirm that for you on notice. But having said that, of course it's a new development that one wants to understand carefully, so I don't rule these things out, but it, I, I've, I'm more inclined to think that um, uh, as an institution we probably underestimated the extent to which we could draw people into work and not put any pressure on, on wages, and, uh, and we're coming to understand that more fulsomely over time. Um, Hence, though, hence I was drawing out the, um, um, the falls in underemployment and long-term unemployment in this data I, I very much welcome, because it's not just, of course, the unemployment rate that tells you about the mm. health of the labour market. There are a variety of other statistics. And just to finish off this section, I'm not sure how much time do I have? Oh, if you just finish off this section. Oh, okay. uh, OK, so just to finish off um, this line, is in this inflationary environment, does Treasury consider it inevitable that interest rates will be raised over the next year at some point? I'm not going to make a comment. I have the, the Governor um, is, speaks on behalf of the Board on the future transition of interest rates. The only comment I will make on interest rates is that they are... Um, uh, at unusually low levels, uh, and I would expect over time they would, I'll use the word normalise, but I'll leave it to Phil to comment on when they might rise and what they might do. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Dr Kennedy, I have some, uh, some questions to put to you, uh, and in particular I'd like to walk through a few of the concepts in, in your opening statement, which I found very helpful. Uh, thank you very much. A little long, perhaps, I think I heard Senator Gallagher say. No, so. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I said that I wasn't casting any negative comment yeah. on it at all. Well, I, I personally I found, it, uh, I found I, it very useful. I have useful. done that to others, but I'll... <laughs> I found it very useful. I would have been happy if it were even longer. <laughs> uh, there were uh, a reflection you made on a, on a pattern that has emerged 
during the pandemic, and I quote from page one, um, the challenging health outlook has persisted while the economy has proved more resilient. So what do you, what do you think are the, the underlying reasons for that resilience in terms of the economy and, and that unemployment rate? What's, what's, what's that a result of? I think one, one reason is um, we've, uh, we've underestimated potentially how quickly the community, I mean, I'm not saying it's not difficult, but can adapt to the circumstances that are in front of them um, you know, this might include, you know, for example, working from home. A vast proportion of the staff at Treasury are working from home at the moment. These were things we just didn't anticipate, Chair, at the start of the pandemic. People yep. have been able to continue to work in different circumstances and work productively. It's clearly not the case for some industries where you must be present. Uh, there's, um, we've seen, um, like even in industries that have been badly affected by hospitality, a really substantial amount of adaptation in the services people are providing that you, know, you would have seen um, uh, to, to take away food that's been providing and a, and a range of other things and the way people try um, adapt quickly to whatever the health measures are so they can go about their their economic activity um, secondly um, um, very substantial support has been support, um, provided by um, by the government and uh, uh, and the central bank, as I said, and um, and people have retained their confidence um, uh, quickly, and then are willing to continue to spend. And we've seen quite substantial increases in demand, for example, for durable goods, because people haven't been at stages been able to go and enjoy the services they would normally enjoy because they can't go out, go to things, and they've been willing um, to 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 redirect those monies. So. I think that would have been um, uh, more problematic if, certainly if that support hadn't been there, but also if confidence hadn't been retained about, in effect, the management of the pandemic itself, but also pe people's economic futures. If presumably been, one feeds into the other. Absolutely. So I mean, to if the they, extent that policies have been implemented, and, and your statement says uh, this likely reflects both policies being more effective than expected and a more rapid adjustment by the community. So if, if policies have been more effective than expected, presumably that feeds into confidence as well, yeah? I, I, think, that's, I think that's absolutely the case. And we saw, I think, from memory, confidence rising again yesterday. This is not at all to suggest that people aren't knocked about by waves that come along. They, they become concerned about the health circumstances. They particularly become concerned about the uh, pressure on health systems and concerned about the um, health circumstances, in particular perhaps for vulnerable or older people. Uh, I'm not downplaying those very significant impacts on the community at all. But the con you know, it has to be said, um, the economy is holding up remarkably well through all of this. So, and, and so Dr Kennedy, what are, what are the particular policies from your perspective that have been, and I, I, Hats off to Treasury yeah. uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the great assistance provided by your department through the course of the pandemic. Uh, what, are, what are the policies from your perspective, the specific policies that have been more effective than, than, than expected? In the initial waves of the pandemic, I think the, what the OCD calls the job retention program, or the job, you know, it was, we call, uh, the government called it the JobKeeper program, um, was very effective in that connection between business and um, business and employees. Maintaining uh, that relationship between the business and employees. I mean, what we're seeing in other countries, the US probably is one example, where more support was provided through, say, a, just an income channel rather than a business employee channel, right. that um, people often left their jobs or they were put off and then when they're in the subsequent recovery business has to re-engage employees they have to get things started back up again and um, uh, and that's and and what we've seen for example in the US is while their unemployment rate is falling the proportion of the population they have employed has fallen and has not fully recovered to nearly the same ex well we're at record levels in Australia so I think that aspect of the program was effective. I think the broader income support um, later on in the later waves, the, um, um, uh, 
um, the pandemic, um, just got to get the name, names right, the pandemic disaster payments, for example, particularly gave low income people confidence they could meet their ongoing costs. And, right. uh, and, and, and I think um, they, they were very effective in that setting. So I think the income support, coupled with the type of support for business to maintain business and to adjust, yeah. um, um, uh, t has turned out to be, um, and now subsequently encouraging recovery, possibly a little stronger than we thought. It all comes back to the health, though. Um, um, none of that support would have been much less effective if um, people didn't have a broad confidence in Australia's ability to man manage the pandemic from a health perspective. And um, we would have seen very dramatic withdrawals from economic activity, people fearful about their outcomes, which we saw at stages, but we would have seen that persistently. And that would have had very negative economic consequences. I have always been a proponent that there hasn't been a trade-off as such between health measures and, um, and economic activity. If health measures aren't used to successfully manage the pandemic, then you will get the economic consequences anyway as people lose confidence in the management of the pandemic. Sure. Minister, did you have something to add? I was just going to, to add um, Senator Scar in terms of from Dr Kennedy's statement. I think the other policy area, Dr Kennedy's addressed many of those that have had direct impact in terms of economic uh, success over the last two years. But if we then look at this period of recovery uh, and our economic recovery plan from the pandemic, uh, Dr Kennedy highlights uh, in his statement there that if our expectations for non-mining business investment are realised over the next two financial years, non-mining investment would rise to its highest share of the economy since 2011. Mm. Um, the policies that the government has applied over the last two budgets uh, in terms of uh, full expensing measures and the loss carryback arrangements for Australian businesses were designed to stimulate uh, that activity in terms of non-mining investment. Um, that, as Dr Kennedy's statement identifies, doesn't just have the immediate consequential benefit of increased business spending and economic activity, uh, but it also has a productivity dividend in terms of those businesses that, uh, that will provide more lasting benefits mm. in terms of increased output and increased productivity mm. across those businesses mm. moving into the uh, medium and longer mm. term. So um, uh, looking there that, yes, very direct, immediate financial assistance at the times of crisis uh, in terms of particularly household assistance but also business survival assistance mm. that Dr Kennedy's highlighted, but then also as, uh, as the economic recovery plan has taken shape, mm. uh, looking at the measures that uh, were uh, not focused in terms of, uh, of any um, uh, spending as perhaps previous um, stimulus packages back around the GFC were criticised for in, uh, in terms of um, uh, infrastructure that was not productive and was potentially wasteful, but instead um, using uh, using the levers of government to be able mm. to stimulate investment in productive investment um, that uh, that will underpin growth and uh, mm. and uh, in the economy and hopefully uh, mm. further uh, sustain those low levels of unemployment mm. as Dr Kennedy's indicated. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Dr Kennedy, it really is an extraordinary set of numbers, isn't it? When you when you look at the fact that. Um, we, we're still in this mm. pandemic um, and the unemployment rate fell to 4.2 per cent in the month of December, the lowest rate since August 2008, uh, which presumably was a, a, a moment just before the Im impacts of the GFC uh, flowed through the economy. And the dramatic falls, for example, um, in long-term unemployment has fallen to around 16% below pre-pandemic levels. I mean, these, these numbers must be beyond what your expectations were uh, when you were sitting in this room uh, perhaps two years ago. Uh, is that a fair comment? Um, I certainly didn't anticipate the circumstances of the last two years, a couple of years ago. Um, but the... Uh, uh, and, and you're right, the labour market outcomes are... Um, are frankly excellent. Um, th there's, there is a lot, I'll just, I'll just put a note of caution, there, there is a lot, as um, Senator Gallagher drew out, a lot going on. We have had very little immigration for two years and we, and we have to understand how when we bring back uh, immigration um, 
it's not our expectation that it would lead to any deterioration, frankly, in the labour market. Um, but um, um, and nor do I ascribe the the this excellent outcome um, to um, to that. But th those those um, those those um, issues are having an impact. I mean, there's no doubt. For example, in the hospitality sector, and I'm sure you would hear this from the people who have struggled to source people, and no. and, and they have, um, and subsequently maybe they've been. Uh, uh, other people have had an opportunity they, they might not otherwise have had. But it is very broad based. When we look across all industries at the moment, we see higher vacancy rates in every industry than pre-COVID, not just those um, such as ag or hospitality that had, for example, a relatively higher proportion of their workforce in immigration, which gives us some confidence <coughs> that this is predominantly about a broader macroeconomic strength. Uh, and. And hence that opportunity I spoke about to um, both um, come back and um, and uh, improve and stabilise our fiscal our fiscal settings, see our monetary policy settings normalise, and sustain these and sustain these outcomes. And and in terms of those uh, future targets, uh, you talk about um, the importance in terms of productivity growth, making sure we continue to drive productivity growth. Uh, because it's only then that we can uh, control inflation uh, in that context. Can you, can you expand on that, perhaps? Well, really, what productivity growth will lead to is the extent to which we can have growth in real wages. Yeah. So if we had no productivity growth at all um, and inflation was 2.5%, then wages would be, could grow at 2.5% and put no pressure on inflation. But we would have no... Obviously, with inflation and wages growing at the same levels, we would have no growth in, growth in people's real spending power. Their yeah. growth in their real spending power will come, as you're, you know, rightly drawing me to, to productivity. You know, yeah. that is the that is the that is the place where we will find people's living standards improving over time, um, and, uh, uh, and and hence my comment about um, getting back to. Our 30 year long run average productivity growth rate is 1.5%, but we have not been at that level in the last decade persistently in recent years. But I see no reason why we can't get back to that level. Um, and that will depend in part on government settings, um, you know, a lot just on the dynamism of the private sector uh, and those sorts of opportunities, very significantly on how productivity is improving around the world, because much of our productivity improvement is us adopting mm. advancements that come from outside our country. Uh, so, uh, but there is, I do, I do, you know, as you're drawing me to that, there's a real opportunity there um, to improve. Most of the improvement in people's living standards that will come over time will come through productivity, let me put it that way. So presumably some of the investment in, in capital uh, that's been triggered through elements of fiscal policy such as accelerated depreciation, instant asset write-off, that assists in, in driving productivity. Um, what are the other elements we should be looking at in terms of driving that productivity? Um, um, I guess the, the, the capability um, for businesses to come and go, so this will sound a bit strange, but insolvency reform is an important element of, of that, for example, the, the opportunity for businesses to reorganise themselves, to change, to meet their circumstances. Effectively, uh, competition and dynamism in any markets is absolutely crucial. I mean, I spoke a little bit in this. Uh, it, it, it's, it's one way strong aggregate demand is going to assist us. When businesses are out there competing for labour, they are going to be thinking about how to make what labour they have more effective. They're going to be thinking about the opportunity to put more capital against that labour, and all those things are more competitive, um, uh, stronger demand environment. Um, very obviously, the extent to which people are constrained in going about their activities to generate um, business. So um, regulate the regulations effectively. I mean, the ease, the ease at takes to uh, engage resources, the ability to get The ease of doing business. Exactly. Well, the, yep. the, how hard it is to get your investment, your investment done, mm. how hard it is to um, even to, to source your work, 
how hard it is to get people with the right skills. Uh, okay. Though, of course, business has a, I would add, business has a very important role to play there um, in skilling its own workforces in its own interests. Yep. Just my final question before uh, I give the call to Senator McKim. So just to um, give you some warning, Senator McKim, and then I'll go back to Labor, uh, and uh, then I'll go to Senator Rennick. Uh, how are we comparing with our major international trading partners in terms of unemployment, in terms of inflation, in terms of growth? Uh, where are we standing in terms of uh, in terms of international comparisons? Um, well, at, at the moment, Australia is doing a very well compared to all other developed countries. So, some, some are doing well, a uh, few as well as us on all matters. I mean, as I said, while, in, while inflation has definitely strengthened three and a half through the year, it's, it's nothing like the uh, seven and a half that we're seeing um, being reported out of, of the US. Um, it's, um, as I said earlier, it's very pleasing to see so much of the working age population being engaged in work yep. and people getting their additional hours. I think, um, I think you know that is an excellent outcome, and uh, and we've got these strengthening in growth rates. I mean, we've got the we have um, the government has taken on a very significant increase in public debt through this period, chair, to support these mm. outcomes. Um, we can take some comfort from the fact that it's significantly lower than the uh, relative levels of debt in other countries, um, but it is a significant increase. And, um, but a very strong going economy will be the most effective means to address that issue over time and, and also allow us to um, pay that down. Excellent. Okay, Senator McKim, you have the call. Uh, thanks, Chair. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? We can hear you. Thank you and good morning to you, uh, Dr Kennedy and your team, and thanks for your attendance and thanks for opening statement, which I also found really useful. And just uh, as an aside, I can say I thought it was about right in length, so um, thanks for that. I wanted to, um, I wanted to start by um, raising the issue of wealth inequality in our society. Oxfam released a report in January that found that the wealth of the richest 47 billionaires in Australia doubled over the two years of the pandemic. And as you would know, over the same two year period, uh, wages have gone up um, in Australia by about 4%. Do we understand why or how this has happened? Why the wealth of billionaires has increased more than 20 times as much as the rate of wages uh, on which the majority of, Stra of Australians are forced to subsist? And is this good for the economy? Um, I'm going to pass, I think, to my colleague um, Mark Cully um, to talk a, a little bit about uh, wealth um, uh, inequality and what we've been observing. There have been some very large um, increases in the value of assets, um, you know, leading to wealth being wealth increasing even beyond what you're yes. talking about around housing, for example, which we've spoken about in the past together, um, and and some of that. Um, some of that is uh, is is cyclical, um, but there are there are other more persistent impacts that you're drawing uh, our attention to, um, and then and then um, uh, and then uh, it, I, I would expect. I mean, interestingly, I think this is important. I mean, think through COVID and and through the application of the government's policies. Um, Income inequality, I would say, is likely to have fallen, though, Mark, we probably don't have the recent data on that, but there, there, there is an excellent um, paper that was done by the, uh, out of the ANU, which I'll send to you, which showed through the middle of the, um, the first wave, for example, poverty actually fell in Australia, partly because of the application of the income support payments, Senator McKim. So there are some distinct trends going on in income inequality and, and potentially in wealth inequality and then and then this issue about their link to growth. Most of the studies that have been done about the impact on inequality, I, th I think, Mark, have predominantly been done about the impact on income inequality on growth. Um, and the study I think Mark will probably talk to, the most recent one I've seen in Australia, 
um, uh, looking at that impact saw that um, it actually depended more on the poverty rate than it did on income inequality per se. Um, so th there's sort of this intersection between the very much the bottom rather than just the broader distribution of income inequality across the whole income distribution. But Mark knows more about these issues than me. So if you don't mind, I might pass to him to flesh it out a little bit. Uh, I'd find that really helpful, Dr Kennedy. Perhaps given the preliminary response you've just given, I could um, before we cross to your colleague, and I really appreciate the opportunity to listen to him, just perhaps ask, a, uh, I guess, a supplementary that's based on something you've said, and yeah. perhaps either your colleague could respond, because it does go um, to the issue of um, asset price speculation and the growth in, um, in particular in, um, in property in Australia. Um, and, and that is that I, while I accept um, Governor Lowe's argument that um, things would have been worse if the RBA hadn't printed, you know, four hundred odd billion dollars during the pandemic. Would Treasury agree with Oxfam's findings that essentially central bank money has done a far better job of inflating the value of assets that overwhelmingly already belong to the wealthy in our society than it has in helping the average person get through the pandemic? Um. I'm not sure I would agree with that. I, I have to be honest with you and say I haven't read that report in its entirety, so I, I will now go and read it since you've raised it with me. Um, and apologies for not having Thank done you. that. Uh, but uh, okay. uh, um, one of the channels of monetary policy um, is is um, the impact it can have through uh, encouraging investment and in, in the re and the wealth effect effectively and the revaluation of, of assets. It's just one channel. Um, but as to whether it's counterproductive to the extent that uh, you raised, I, I don't think so, but I, I'm more than happy to go and um, have a look at that um, report. And I might pass, pass to my colleague now, uh, Mark. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, thank you. Um, Mark Tully, I'm the First Assistant Secretary of the Macroeconomic Analysis and Policy Division. Uh, as with the Secretary, I'm not um, you know, broadly familiar with the kind of debates that are going on around uh, this area, but not with the uh, particulars of the Oxfam uh, report. Um, uh, one of the issues we have in trying to understand wealth inequality is uh, there's, there's quite a long lag in getting hold of, of data that's kind of more broadly representative of the Australian population. Uh, so we only have data prior to COVID. Uh, I think actually the most recent is for 2017-2018. That's the last time the ABS ran its um, uh, or reported on its survey of income and housing, uh, so we have uh, yet to see. So obviously, you know, 47 billionaires is a is a pretty skewed sample. I um, mean, common uh, discussions around wealth inequality would talk about the top one percent of uh, of individuals in Australia. That's 250,000. That's a, a long, uh, a big difference from 47. So we we don't really have a good appreciation of what's going on with wealth inequality. Uh, the secretary is accurate that at least from what we know from preliminary data that, uh, if anything, income equality appears to have, have lessened uh, through the course of COVID. Uh, as, as he mentioned, that's a function of, of um, uh, both welfare payments, uh, but also the way incomes were supported uh, through employment. Uh, and would probably, again, you alluded to this point yourself, um, the uh, low interest rates contributed to higher levels of employment and higher levels of economic activity than would otherwise be the case. And to that extent that that increased people's employment opportunities, that probably also acted as a, a factor in favour of reducing income inequality by, by lowering unemployment. Um, I'd also, in, in terms of the point about asset prices, uh, it's completely true. Uh, what we've seen extraordinary growth in asset prices um, over the, the last couple of years. They have come off. Uh, since, uh, since January, we've seen a bit of volatility. Um, I'd, I'd point out uh, that you know, many Australians uh, are house owners. Uh, uh, almost all Australians have, uh, working Australians have superannuation accounts, uh, and uh, they are ones who've benefited from uh, those kind of rise in asset prices over uh, the past couple of years. All right, thank you. Um, that's Helpful and useful. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'd, I'd just like to ask a follow-up question, and you know, um, decide who answers it. Obviously, but um, 
Bottom line, financial markets to transmit policy is one of the fundamental principles of the concept of independent central banking. Would you accept the premise, the argument that we've just seen the limit of this approach, particularly with interest rates near zero, when you get all this um, money printing that the central bank's been engaged in in the last couple of years, the cash just effective hoovered up or the majority of it gets hoovered up into asset price speculation. Isn't that just what's happened? And again, is that good for the economy where um, so much of the, the new money that's printed is hoovered up into asset price speculation, which is not actually a productive part of the economy? Well, um, look, as I said in my opening statement, um, I think the role of monetary policy um, through this period has been very supportive. I mean, if if monetary policy hadn't responded in the way it had uh, relative to, particularly because of what was going on elsewhere in the world, uh, Senator McKim, we would have faced higher, I think, higher, ex I think the bank, uh, RBA, these are issues mostly for them to speak to, but the, I think we would have seen higher exchange rate and um, and, and higher interest rates, obviously, along um, the yield curve. And I think that has a broader benefit. It's not just all about um, the impact on um, on asset prices, um, um, that, well, the types of impacts on asset prices then, that you're speaking about. I think it is the case that, as, as, I, as I also pointed out in my open, opening statement, that it is a period when um, fiscal policy, though, has had to take more of a lead than it normally would, and I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, and uh, uh, that may change back to the more usual circumstances over time. I, I hope it does. I think that, that they, and and I still have confidence in those institutional. Very, I have a very strong confidence in the existing institutional arrangements. Um, we're not alone in Australia in facing these sort of very low interest rates uh, that have you know, risen all around the world and we've seen banks um, instituting, central banks instituting unconventional policy elsewhere. Um, I, I, but yeah, I'm, I'm much more, um, well, I'm not sure that you're not confident, but let me say I am confident in the current institutional arrangements. Um, uh, um, Oh, I'm on the Reserve Bank board, so I, I, um, um, it's not for me to comment on uh, its effectiveness. But, um, but, I, but I, so I guess I can only limit my comments to the institutional arrangements, which I think are robust, and I think will persist. And I think the opportunity for us to sort of move out of these unusual circumstances is appearing now, Senator. So I'm, I'm more confident about uh, the recovery. Uh, than you appear to, and and um, but I, I I do accept the part of your argument, I think, which is saying it's not a great idea to have monetary pol unconventional monetary, persistent unconventional monetary policy, or you know very very low interest rates um, um, uh, persistently. But you know, but we we on the other hand, we also need to see mac um, fiscal and monetary policy working effectively together to ensure that the macro economy is recovering strongly, um, it's equally a very, very bad idea to see you know, large numbers of people unemployed. So we must do all we can to ensure that the economy is growing strongly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I think our monetary, I'll say this bit, I think our monetary policy institution takes that incredibly seriously and does its best to ensure that it happens and has been largely successful. All right, thanks, Dr Kennedy. And um, this is my last couple of questions, Chair, thank you. And uh, perhaps I could just preface them by saying, Doc, Dr Kennedy, that I'm not expressing a lack of confidence in um, the recovery, and I'm not certainly not arguing against the need for QE over the last couple of years. It was more um, a question that was based on whether uh, we're seeing the we're approaching the limits of that approach, and particularly the fact that a lot of that QE went into asset price speculation and the impacts of that on um, uh, on the economy and on um, people's lives. Um, and you and I have spoken about um, rents in the past, and I thank you for um, thank you for responding to me on that. And if I've got some time, I will explore that issue with you again today. But before that, I just wanted to ask, um, and you've raised this in your last answer around 
um, and in your opening statement around um, approach to full employment. And um, obviously, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it would be a good thing for more people to have more work. Uh, and it's also, I, I note, um, one of the um, central functions of the RBA is the maintenance of full employment in Australia. But you said in your opening statement that um, not been this close to full employment since uh, 2008, I think you said, and then before that prior um, to the shock of the 1970s. So in other words, in the last 50 years, so two full generations of Australians, the three primary goals of the RBA has not been achieved. Uh, doesn't this indicate um, somewhat of a failure of fiscal and money policy over the last 50 years, which is, I note, a period that um, corresponds directly to the rise of neoliberalism in Australia. And doesn't it suggest that critics of neoliberalism are right, that the last 50 years of fiscal and monetary policy has assisted wealth accumulation for the far more than it's helped support employment and incomes for the many? Senator McKim, I, I do think the the breadth of that question. I thought that might um, attract you, Minister. Uh, well, it attracted all of us. Well, well, well yeah, <laughs> indeed, Senator. And I'm just, uh, I mean, there is an acceptance at, uh, at this committee when Dr Kennedy is, uh, is at the table that uh, perhaps the, um, uh, the approach elsewhere in terms of seeking opinion is, uh, is applied a little more liberally in seeking Dr Kennedy's analysis that can sometimes stretch into, uh, into uh, where others will debate opinion. But your question there and the breadth of that question, Senator McKim, um, you know, really is seeking to have a philosophical debate rather than oh, actually well, I'll direct asking the question a, a to more you, precise Minister. question for the current context and environment. That's fair. So that's a fair comment, Minister. So I'll direct the question to you. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, well, Senator, uh, um, uh, we would certainly contend uh, that the policy settings that, uh, that have been applied, uh, both uh, pre-pandemic, uh, which saw uh, record levels of employment achieved in the country uh, and record levels of workforce participation achieved in the country, uh, and then through the pandemic, that have not only maintained but enhanced those sorts of outcomes, you know, such that, as, uh, as Dr Kennedy highlighted in his opening statement, you know, we now have as employment as a proportion of the working age population at the highest level of any time in Australia's history and an employment to population ratio higher than any major advanced economy. Uh, and the importance of those outcomes is demonstrated when you then look at, uh, at the evidence uh, the RBA governor gave, where in terms of questions about inequality, uh, he said very clearly and quite accurately that getting people into jobs is the best way of solving inequality problems. The worst thing for many people is that if they don't have a job, they don't have an income. Uh, now, it's not just the mere measure of a job, as Dr Kennedy's indicated. Of course, uh, the hours worked uh, and, uh, and the rates around those employment measures are important contributors as well. But again, seeing the elevated rates of, uh, of mobility across the workforce in recent times is another function of demonstrating the strength there uh, and the fact that we have uh, those, uh, those um, strong demand factors for employees across all sectors of the economy right now uh, demonstrates the opportunities that exist to, to maintain that very optimistic outlook that the policy settings we have applied are achieving positive outcomes uh, for people getting into work and into jobs, uh, and from that, uh, for the potential for us to achieve uh, stronger outcomes in, uh, in productivity that can sustain uh, wages outcomes too. So, Senator McKim, Thanks, if, uh, can I uh, share the call? Are you OK now? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Thank As I indicated, if there is an opportunity for another just a couple of minutes towards the end of Dr. Oh, well, we'll see, we'll see how we go. We, you, how we go. You had a All pretty right. good go there. Uh, Senator no, McCall. Thank you. I, I accept that, Chair. Thank, thank you. you yeah. um, thanks, Dr Kennedy, for your remarks this morning. I wanted to ask you about um, the, just your passing comments about productivity and the role of firms in, um, in uh, lifting productivity. Um, 
you talk about changing business practices to encourage greater employee engagements and increasing investment in training to upskill and reskill your existing employees. And I don't disagree with any of that. I wonder what your view is about government's role, though. It's a, it's a very deliberately uh, focused um, mm. set of remarks on firms. Um, it was deliberate um, because I think the the role of business uh, in this area um, is sometimes um, underappreciated. There's no doubt the governments have a very important role in the foundational skills that people need, literacy and numeracy, and then beyond, well beyond that, um, the training that would come from technical training, uh, post, any post-school qualification. Uh, the quality and scope of that being delivered by government is very important. Uh, it should attract a lot of policy attention. I don't pretend to be an expert on that area, but, but I, I absolutely accept it's a crucial part of um, the productivity story and, and very supportive of firms and, 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 um, and support individual outcomes. Um, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to draw out that it is not all about government you know, making everyone perfectly form for a business to um, take and then you know, put into a job. I'm not saying businesses um, necessarily think that way, um, but certainly you know, it's been my life experience that, um, um, that businesses play a very important role in how they provide on the job training, how they improve, in, you know, how they improve the skills of individuals. And uh, uh, and I was just I chose today to try and draw that out. I think um, it gets a little harder for businesses when they're competing for people. Maybe they can't readily find the skilled person they normally can in a looser labour market. Things get a little harder. Um, I personally think that's a good thing. I think that's it's a it's a it's going to lead to better wage outcomes. Um, it's going to it's tough for business, but it's going to lead to more competition and better outcomes. Um, many businesses will thrive in that setting and welcome it. Others will find it tough, but it is frankly the nature of our economy. And uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, just a, occasionally, that's why I sp chose to speak about it today, um, an underappreciated part of skill formation. And, uh, and, and I'm hopeful uh, that, um, that, it, that effectively a stronger and tighter labour market will actually improve, see it improve. Mm. On that, it's not just skill formation, is it? I mean, there's a quite deep literature around management capability and the integration of technology in business for productivity enhancement as well. There, yeah, there's been, a, there's been a very, you're absolutely right, there's been a, an interesting, I'm a little out of date on this now, I'm probably 10 years out of date on this, but there, there was an interesting literature on uh, management capability in Australia, and whether we lagged in that, it lagged in those areas. The previous OECD studies looked at those areas, and there was um, a lot of interest in whether, um, um, for the the capabilities or um, you know, in opportunities around small business and in other areas were um, were what they were what they could be. I am frankly a bit out of out of date in that area, but there's no doubt. Um, um, contemporary, you know, modern management practices can lead to uh, significant improvements in productivity through skills. On the question of government, though, uh, in addition to skill formation, when the Productivity Commission did its last report, it highlighted a range of areas. Skill mm. formation was one of them. Um, the structure of incentives and institutional arrangements around the healthcare sector was another. Mm -hmm. um, urban planning, towns and cities. Yeah. Fixing up what the Productivity Commission at the time described as the energy mess. Mm -hmm. um, those are all key areas for government in addressing lagging productivity, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Because I do observe, um, you know, your, and again, quite sensible observations around wage growth, um, and you discuss the possibility of achieving productivity growth at 1.5%. But 
it's considerably more than where we are at the moment, isn't it? I yes. mean, the last decade, it's, it's been much, than what, much lower than it's that. It's higher than what we've achieved in the last decade, which I, I think, Mark, is closer to 1.2 from memory, I think. Um, I'll confirm that for you anyway. But yeah, it's certainly lower than what we than it's certainly higher, I beg your pardon, than what we've observed and achieved in the last decade. Um, just to clarify on that particular point, we, we tend to talk about these things in terms of cycles. Um, and over the two most recent cycles, which are the period from 2004 to 2018, it, it was 1.1%. 1 .1%. 1 .1. Yeah. Okay. The government has indicated an intention to initiate a, a second round of um, policy work from the Productivity Commission. Um, I note that the website seems to indicate that the government is yet to respond to the last Productivity Commission report on, on shifting the dial. Is that correct? Senator, I'm not sure whether your question relates there to, uh, to um, formal paperwork of response or, uh, or policy responses, but in terms of some of the areas that, uh, that you just identified in terms of policy responses. Uh, no, it's the, a, government, it's the formal response. The gov I mean, has government yeah, just you're, you're, failed to respond to the PC well, report? Well, is, no, that's I mean, what the, the website says. Well, no, the government, the government's quite conscious of, uh, of uh, the desire to achieve uh, productivity enhancing outcomes across the economy and uh, I've already touched in response to previous questions highlighting uh, the role of focus on driving business investment consistent in some ways with um, an element of what Dr Kennedy's uh, focused on in terms of the role of business but also the complementary role government tax policy can play in driving that business investment through which can lift productivity. Uh, of course our response in terms of skills uh, sees uh, the highest number of people in uh, uh, in trade training uh, in Australia's history uh, since records were began in 1963 uh, with a doubling of pre-COVID level investment and support in terms of skills investment. Uh, the Back outcome of our policies in energy uh, have, actually seen, uh, have actually seen energy prices, particularly electricity prices, uh, reducing over a period of time. Is that policy number uh, so, 17 or 18 um, or 19? Well, the outcome, the outcome Senator to. McAllister, yeah, is, so that, is that electricity prices were consistently well, rising when you were last in government and they've been falling under, uh, under, uh, under, the under our policies. So policies the outcome is that we have achieved reductions in electricity sorry, sorry, prices. Just, order, just, just, order. Just, for, just for the benefit of, of broadcasting, if we can just try and keep a delineation between answers okay. and questions. Well, I asked um, a question. I'd highlight and digital economy uh, strategy. Uh, point of order, just for the benefit infrastructure of point investment. Point of order, Chair, if I may make sure. a point of order. I did ask a really specific question, which is for officials to confirm that the government is yet to respond in a formal sense to the last report from the Productivity Commission. The answer being provided by Senator Birmingham, or the Minister, is not actually an answer to that question. It's the answer to a different question, which I didn't ask. So I'd ask you to draw him back to the question, which was, is it correct that the government is yet to respond to the last report from the Productivity Commission? OK. Senator Birmingham, do you have anything to add to the answer you've well, given? Um, uh, I, I could add plenty, Senator Scar, but uh, it is purely to highlight the importance of what the government is doing, <laughs> achieving, and the outcomes being realised uh, in, uh, in, in heeding it advice and recommendations question. around productivity. Okay. Senator McAllister, Look, do you have a follow-up question? I do. I mean, the reason I ask is that sometimes the website's incorrect. You know, I get that, and I don't wish to make assumptions. It seems incredible to me that the government would have the hide to commission the product commission to do another report when they haven't actually answered or provided any formal response to the last one. So I'm really seeking to confirm whether or not that is true. It may not be true. You may have answered. You may have responded to it. May just have an update to the website. Well, Senator, uh, I'm advised that of the uh, of the 28 recommendations from uh, that uh, first five yearly review by the PC, uh, 21 of those are wholly or partial. Sorry. 2021 are wholly or partially the responsibility of state and territory uh, governments oh. there. <laughs> but I have it's identified there, of course, what we have been doing okay. in relation not to good. productivity as a Commonwealth government mm -hmm. in terms of those sorts of tax reforms, not just those for business tax, but also uh, the abolition in relation to uh, an entire tax bracket of personal income tax and the reforms element there. Uh, what I've outlined in terms of 
um, so electricity, in terms of skills. No. I didn't get to infrastructure investment so and productivity no, enhancing infrastructure across the country. The uh, I can take you through the digital economy strategy and, uh, and the uh, benefits to productivity that can flow from the consumer but, but data rights, if you like, chair, the red tape reduction the elements around environment. Really I can't, I can't, Senator, I can't direct the minister. I want to know what government's doing questions. in terms of productivity. We have there is a lot, Senator. time with Dr Kennedy, Minister you, Birmingham. You, you've got plenty of time with us, which I know you'll enjoy. Senator McAllister, you've got the call. Look, thanks very much. Um, Dr Kennedy, you uh, touched in passing at the end of your remarks um, on the significance of the climate change transition um, and the risks uh, posed to the outlook associated with climate change itself and, and, the, respo and the policy response to climate change. Um, can I invite you just to add a little more to the, the brief comments that you made in your opening statement? What is it that we need to do to mitigate those risks you refer to? You know, in broad terms, there's, I see two, two sources of risks. Um, one is the um, risks that come from the changing, the, um, come from the changing climate itself that is you know, already in play. Mm. Uh, and. Um, and you know we, we've seen those evident in Australia, and so whether that's through how insurance markets are working, or whether it's um, uh, people living safely in the environment, for example, um, the risk itself to our environmental assets. I spoke a couple of years ago about the very substantial loss of um, flora and fauna in the bushfires. Um, so, the, the, so there's a set of risks there. Um, often called adaptation. Uh, um, and then secondly, there are the risks with sensibly transitioning the economy such that um, it's productive which f with far lower emissions. So that goes to the issue of how the energy sector will transform itself, how the transport sector will tra transform itself. Any transformation, any transition of any form will entail risk as you change assets over, as you change um, um, the nature in which you go about businesses, um, um, and the, obviously the most uh, positive contribution governments can have there are stable uh, and predictable policies that allow that transition to unfold in a sensible way. So in two broad terms, they're the two areas of risks I see. Mm. So when the Productivity Commission referred to fixing the energy mess, they presumably didn't assess that the energy policy settings at that time were stable and predictable and sufficient to address the risks that you refer to? Senator, um, I'm Senator uh, uh, conscious and cautious when it comes to uh, uh, the paraphrasing of, uh, of different um, um, quotes or, uh, or otherwise. Uh, the point uh, that, uh, that I think was a very important one in terms of uh, the energy sector and electricity that this government's been focused on uh, is, yes, uh, how we support uh, the transition to a lower emissions and ultimately a net zero pathway, uh, but also uh, how we ensure reliability uh, and uh, prices to be lower and, pri and, and prices. Mm -hmm. uh, we it's have been achieving need. positive outcomes there uh, that are having uh, a reduction impact, uh, which means that okay. the contribution of electricity in terms of inflationary pressures is lower, uh, and indeed downwards in, uh, at some times, uh, that, uh, that the contribution of electricity uh, in terms of business productivity is, uh, is uh, positive in terms of the fact that it's a lesser input cost, uh, and, uh, and the policy settings and trajectory we're on, we believe, will maintain that. Of course, in the present environment, we're particularly, decade, we're particularly conscious uh, of, uh, of gas markets, uh, and again, the work we've failed. done there uh, sees that at present there's a significant, a very significant differential in terms of the domestic gas prices compared with international gas prices, uh, which uh, again is a very important ability for uh, for Australian businesses to compete more effectively. Okay. So I just want to draw everyone's attention. We've got Dr. Kennedy for another 25 minutes. Yeah. So if we can please keep uh, questions and answers. Rolling through well, as quickly as possible. So, 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 so it's Senator not the McAllister, you, you still have the call. Thanks. Um, look, Dr. Kennedy, you'll be aware that there's been um, comments from the Treasurer 
about the impact of tax policy settings on women and on young women. Um, from a process perspective, um, the, the, the news articles referred to unpublished analysis from the Treasury. Could you just explain to me when that analysis was undertaken and when you intend to publish it? Uh, um, look, I don't have immediately to I know the analysis was undertaken by our revenue group. They are Mary, um, and Ms. Marakovic will be appearing in front of you. Um, so I, I can't give you the precise date, but she will have heard the question and she will give you the precise date and when the briefing was provided and uh, in terms of that Treasury analysis. Um, uh, as to um, whether we will be publishing that data or, um, or publishing that analysis more broadly, I look, I'll have to, I'm not sure where that's up to. I'll have to take that on notice as well. Okay, that's all for me, Chair, but I think okay. Senator Gallagher has some Senator Gallagher. I just have a few follow on So the data was, um, in the brief, was prepared for the Treasurer. That's my understanding. A normal briefing but process. I'll, I'll ask Mary Ann to confirm that for you. Okay, well, we will have questions for her. But when you, um, when it, and perhaps this is one for the Minister, but when there are media articles about unpublished data, I mean, is it the government's intention to make that information public or, um, you know, do we just have to trust you at your word that that's what the data, that's what the data said and what was provided? Uh, well, uh, Senator, uh, uh, ministers uh, draw on briefings, information, data points all mm. of the time from a range of, uh, of different sources. Yes. Um, we heard about that yesterday, remember, with your little costing, dodgy costings unit you well, set up. Again, I'm more than happy yeah. to uh, to go through the absence of any Labor Party costings oh, on your policies yeah, anyway, if you want to raise that. that Sorry, Senator. I shouldn't have invited Senator that. Gallagher, you did mention yes. we only have Dr Kennedy till yes. uh, 11 o'clock. Yes. And You've so a quick answer from the Minister is, it follows well, on from questions well, to Dr well, Kennedy. You're, you're, unpublished you're, Treasury depend. analysis, is it going to be published and can, so that we can all see what it said? Because presumably it wasn't just about tax rates for women. Um, uh, well, Senator, uh, I can't speak to precisely what was uh, in, uh, in the briefings provided to, uh, to the Treasurer and the scope or breadth or otherwise of them um, uh, in terms of the release of information that's always considered on a case by case basis. I'm happy to take it on uh, notice, Senator, the, and raise with the Treasurer the publication of that material. Okay, um, I just got a final question. So, when uh, on the um, Dr. Kennedy, on the, the sort of the long term or the average of um, government spending or payments to GDP, sort of if you take out some of the the blips from um, you know stimulus years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it sits roughly around 26 to 27 percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Is that? I mean, when you talk about tapering support, is that where you think it would naturally sit? Um, uh, well, going to... forward, I mean, I know there are decisions for government, but yes. but you, you're talking about how. Um, you know, fiscal and monetary policy work together to secure the economic recovery, basically, and not cutting things off too soon, and and ensuring that they're working hand in hand to to deliver, you know, full employment and prosperity. Mm. So, uh, I mean, is there a figure that the Treasury has that would say this is a normalised level of spending uh, to GDP, and what is it? Well, the IGR laid out the 10 year and then beyond profiles, and it's consistent with what you just described. The settling at the 26 to 27 per cent as a proportion of GDP on the spending um, range. You're absolutely right. It's a matter to government where it, what the spending indicates is the scope of government. And that will be a matter for government for how, at least through spending, yeah, it sure. settles the, the scope. Uh, if the government has a, a decision around the amount of revenue it's prepared to raise, then obviously it constrains the amount of sp spending to to some extent, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, because, um, uh, for example, if it wishes to achieve a balanced budget, those two things have to look the same. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to cut spending as a proportion of GDP, or it doesn't have to cut spending um, necessarily to see the proportion itself 
shrink over time. For example, um, if there's higher productivity and the economy grows more quickly than the rate of spending grows, then spending can grow, uh, but the economy will grow more quickly, revenue will grow proportionally with the economy, and the two will close in that way. Yeah. So there's a range of ways that you think balance can um, sure. be brought about. But, you know, your general framework, I can only agree with that, uh, is that, um, um, and that's all we were pointing out in the IGR, wherever the spending settles as a proportion of the GD of GDP, um, it's a relevant consideration for how much revenue you're prepared to raise if you intend, as this government does, to um, uh, move back towards a uh, balanced budget over time. And we, we have consistently laid that out, I think, in the last five, GR, five IGRs, shown pretty much the same problem five times around, um, partly because um, there's areas of government spending that seem to grow persistently more strongly than the economy. Health mm. spending is one mm. important such area. Um, uh, the two more, um, two areas that are now, that we pointed out in the IGR that have added to that challenge uh, are aged care and NDIS. Mm. Okay, so in terms of sort of pressures on the budget going forward, um, in your view it would be health, aged care and NDIS? In terms of of those areas of expenditure growing, yes, yeah, and, okay. And Senator, I mean, I think I've I've expressed publicly, of course, the uh, the priority uh, and the uh, and the challenges in terms of defence uh, spending as well, which is uh, is a significant area of government priority and of commitment. And so, um, we've seen uh, the uh, the pressures of NDIS realised in uh, in the last couple of budget updates, uh, which have seen very significant adjustments to, uh, to uh, the profile of the NDIS in, uh, in the forward estimates and now has the NDIS uh, clearly overtaking Medicare uh, as, uh, as a payments line for government. Um, uh, the pressure in, uh, in aged care, of which the government has, uh, has again banked and realised much of, uh, of that, uh, but uh, the crucial then impact as to how we make sure uh, the in achieving new models for, uh, for delivery of, uh, of uh, aged care payments into the future, um, that, uh, that they are designed in careful ways to, uh, to work as much as possible within that additional $18, $19 billion over the forwards that we've provided for. Um, and, uh, and of course those, uh, those defence priorities uh, in uh, meeting the additional uh, equipment and, uh, and requirements there for, uh, for the Australian Defence Force um, uh, that, uh, that will be a, a longer term commitment profile too. Okay, um, sorry. Yeah, you will. Um, so, Senator Walsh, we've got um, 17 minutes left. So, I'll be quick and then go to yeah, Senator Rennie. I'll, if we go to you, I promise Senator Patrick the call at 10.45. So, if okay. I can, you can go a bit longer than that. And then Senator Rennick has some questions. So, Senator Walsh. Okay, I will be um, quick. So, uh, I've just got a couple of questions, Dr. Kennedy, about. Um, wage growth and you've given us a, a, a view that um, people might be able to expect over time their nominal wages to rise um, by 4% a, a year. If productivity growth was one yeah. and a half, yeah. I just wanted to ask um, if you could reflect on how that sort of scenario applies to the, the sort of group of people that we've been referring to across the, the pandemic as, as essential workers. Mm. Um, so, you know, people from aged care to nurses to cleaners, early childhood educators, you mm. know, logistics workers, drivers. Public sector know. wages, do you mean, more broadly? Or? Well, I've mentioned some private sector yeah, okay. industries there as well, mm -hmm. you know, sectors like logistics, yeah. delivery drivers and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the main message to those sorts of, you know, low and moderate um, income earners is that they can take advantage of the sort of the switching opportunities that you've referenced in your opening statement in, in the labour market, in a tight labour market. But does that theory really apply to those 
groups of workers. I mean, for a start, obviously, we don't want aged care workers to leave their jobs. Yeah. Um, we don't want logistics workers who are dealing with supply chain issues to, to, to leave their jobs. Yeah. But is there, you know, a potential sectoral difference here? You know, ha you're pointing to sort of 4% nominal wage rises. How, how does that theory really apply to those large groups of people who are on below median wages doing jobs that we need them to stay in and do? Well, I think you're pointing out a really important point. I'm only talking in very broad aggregate terms, and there's a lot of heterogeneity or difference in the labour market at any given time. Some workers doing extremely well in some sectors and other workers not doing so well, and some with their wages being set outside of private sector arrangements, you know, through Commonwealth or state governments, for example. Um, um, so I, I really do appreciate the point you're drawing out. One has to be very careful to take these broad characteristics of the agri-economy and then suggest everybody is now, on average, doing exactly that. Uh, um, and that's long been a comment around um, how well will unskilled people do, even in these better labour markets, you know. Hence the focus often on skilling people to give them a better opportunity not, um, to improve the job that they go to, to earn more, etc., rather than uh, necessarily stay in the p position they are. So I, um, I suppose the main, main comment I can say is there will be substantial difference within the labour market in terms of um, wage outcomes at any given time, including even when they're growing at a level that we're more comfortable with and mm. that we think is consistent with productivity, they won't be the same. And there will still be specific circumstances um, that apply to um, uh, health sector workers. Um, um, I, I would say that, that generally um, wage arrangements will spill more broadly around the economy if the general economy is tighter, but it is true, you know, as, as, a, as a former nurse, if you you know, you don't think, oh, well, I'm just, possibly I'm just going to substitute now and become a completely yeah. different, you know, I, I've trained to work in an area and... Uh, that I, would be a problem for us if, if and, they did. And yeah. I want to continue to work in that area. But over time, as people compete to get more people to go into that sector, um, as people do see other opportunities and can change, because um, um, as you know, the, char the characteristics of nurses mean they are a highly valuable employee in a range of settings, then that does mm. put pressure then on wages in those sectors to rise. So, but I don't want to, you know, I appreciate you raising the point. I don't want to leave the committee with the impression that somehow or other this all just settles down, there's no difference, there's no bumpiness, and there's no issues, specific issues in some sectors, for example, to either improve conditions or to address issues around not only wage issues, but the conditions that some workers might face to ensure that's an attractive sector to work in. So I accept that argument, um, and, and, um, and yes, and uh, as I said, I don't want to leave with the impression that those broad macroeconomic circumstances uh, you know, encourage us all to try and work towards wouldn't mean that we wouldn't have much work to do in the detail of the labour market mm. to ensure that it worked effectively. And so, thank you, and so for either you or the Minister, if, if he wants to answer, I mean, a, apart from pointing to a general labour market tightening, you know, for those groups of people on low and moderate, you know, below median sorts of wages, in, what government policies can we point to that would get their wages moving? I mean, is there a government policy to get wages moving for low and moderate income people? Well, Senator, it, it is um, in the focus of the government to um, have the economy uh, growing as, uh, as strongly as possible, to have jobs growth as, uh, as strongly as possible uh, within that, uh, and from that to see uh, to see the avenues for businesses um, with some of the uh, different productivity measures that we talked about before uh, have the capacity to support in a more competitive environment uh, wages growth too. So uh, the types of uh, things we were just discussing before in terms of um, 
lower pressure on businesses from electricity prices or, uh, or enhanced support in relation to skills and productivity or the digital mm. economy and data reforms that are there. They all add to uh, an equation that, uh, that seeks to, uh, to lift um, business conditions alongside uh, the type of investment that businesses are making to, mm. to generate um, higher, um, uh, higher wage jobs in uh, in areas of advanced mm. manufacturing so not or, a, not uh, a or specific, the like. So not um, a specific sort of wages policy that you can point to? Well, well Senator, they, they are very much integrated policy mm. measures to, uh, to, to drive uh, that type of, uh, of growth. I mean, uh, you know, what we uh, saw was that the, um, the last wage price index outcome for 2021 uh, was higher than, uh, than had been uh, forecast. Um, uh, now, uh, and we've seen a, a, an upgrading in terms of uh, some of those wages forecasts uh, moving forward. Uh, of course, uh, we know we've got to continue that focus on those mm. uh, contributory policies that, uh, that help achieve a stronger outcome overall. I do just want to ask Dr Kennedy, if I can, um, just, just briefly, final yeah, final question yeah. about um, your assessment of the impact on unemployment and wages of reopening temporary migration. Um, so you, you pointed in your opening statement to sectors like hospitality, uh, where you know, there are some above award wages for the first time, possibly ever, um, but you also point uh, to that pressure easing um, with uh, temporary migration starting again, which I take to mean... Student, uh, students as well. I yeah, think. international That's students, yeah. Um, uh, working holiday makers and so on. So what, what do you see as the impact of temporary migration in, uh, on wages as we open up again in some of those sort of sectors that we've been talking about? When you uh, have, um, I distinguish between short term and long term. Yep. When you have some short term changes in the supply of a particular type of work, a worker into a market, you know, there's, then you change the supply and demand balance. And so you, you've pointed out there are bonuses being paid in hospitality to employ people at the moment. Conditions are very strong uh, and, uh, and uh, existing workers are, are, are probably benefiting um, from that. Um, that uh, might moderate somewhat, um, but the longer t our, our best assessment around the longer term impacts of these migration flows on wages uh, that, you know, frankly, they're roughly awash. There's quite a lot of literature that's looked at this over a long period of time, including for uh, skilled and unskilled workers. <coughs> and we just tend to find that the wage impacts are very hard um, to identify. So I don't personally tend to focus on, you know, what is the optimal size of the migration program um, uh, or particularly its composition in some ways from a from a from a wage perspective, the optimal size and composition of the program, however, are incredibly important decisions for the government to make. How fast we can run a mic, for example, including the temporary program, how fast our cities can cope with population growth, the impact that has on people around us. Um, I think often, um, you know, a, a lazy way to think about this issue is more people just means a larger economy. Frankly, we have to be much clearer in our assessment of that. What we're really interested in for Australia is how GDP per capita grows as migration grows. In other words, how income grows for all of us per person, as opposed to just, I mean, of course, business would like to see more people come because it's a larger market, but there are many more considerations for a government to make when it sets the migration program. Wages aren't irrelevant, but they're not top most of my, my mind. More it's around the skills the country needs, the benefits that flow from um, being open to many ideas, from having people coming from many parts of the country, and then frankly, how quickly, um, how sensibly state governments and Commonwealth governments can absorb whatever the population growth turns out to be as a result of that migration program. Um, Okay, thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Senator Patrick, thank you for your patience. Then I've got uh, some questions from Senator Rennick, so if we can keep it moving, please. 
Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, yes, uh, what assessment has uh, Treasury undertaken in regard to the current sharp rises in um, energy prices, gas and oil, uh, particularly exacerbated by the, the uh, situation in Ukraine? The, um, the um, Minister was just speaking a moment ago about um, watching closely that um, domestic gas prices on the East Coast domestic gas prices have actually mm. remained at, a, at quite a um, stable um, level and have not risen to the same extent that we've seen in other countries. In, in some ways they've disconnected, uh, Senator, from the very rapid increases we've seen in the UK and the US and other places. Um, we're watching it closely because of um, the potential shock around um, uh, developments in Eastern Europe that you know that you would be very well aware of. Uh, so we're watching that because of its impact on in, on inflation. More broadly, energy prices have not been um, anywhere near the impact on um, inflation in Australia that they have been in the US and other countries, with the exception of petrol, of course, which has increased significantly off, off very low levels. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, come, so, I'll come to that, because so, in some sense that's, that's so what that's, I'm leading so to. So that's probably the main sure. um, place that um, those things are, are coming through at, and I'll last comment on that. I mean, not only does um, um, you know, petrol now being predominantly imported good these sorts of things contribute to inflation, but you know people forget they also reduce demand because it's hard to substitute away from petrol, particularly in the short term, so they reduce your income. Um, so we're watching those impacts, not only on inflation, on it, but also on growth. Okay, so thank you. Very quickly on the gas prices front, I mean, uh, we've worked closely with, uh, with producers to seek to maximise rates of production in Australia um, and, uh, and to ensure that surplus production is available in the domestic market in ways that keep downward pressure on prices. And, uh, and I acknowledge uh, the work of Australia's producers in terms of working in a supportive way, with government, with industry and, uh, and for the Australian economy. Uh, I see plenty of speculation uh, about whether uh, there could be further opportunities in terms of uh, gas exports created uh, by challenges uh, emerging out of the uh, the terrible situation along the Ukrainian border. In practical terms, there are constraints there. There are constraints in terms of the capacity of, um, of Australia's LNG plants. There are constraints in terms of shipping and, uh, and the trains necessary to, uh, to export those goods. And of course, um, most of our export production is contracted for, uh, for uh, existing markets and existing clients that companies would, uh, would uh, uh, seek to honour and respect those contracts. So uh, we're monitoring, of course, that very closely, as Dr Kennedy said, um, but, uh, but also continuing with our strategies of seeking to ensure production levels in Australia uh, remain and grow wherever possible to, uh, to support that domestic environment. OK. Um, you, use the, you, you use the word gas companies in a, a kind of nice way. Um, I think I use the word cartel, and I think Rod Sims uses something in between. So uh, I'll see what he says when he, <laughs> when he comes on later. But uh, um, uh, now I don't want to, just not in the controversy yesterday in NFP, I'm just going to read out what you said uh, yesterday. Um, you said that there, that there have certainly been some discussions and briefings in Treasury in and in resources and, and energy, and in particular looking at some of the potential consequence, consequential impacts of different scenarios that could occur out of the environment in the Ukraine. So I just look to the tre Treasury and say, um, what are the range of scenarios that you've uh, been considering? What are sort of the price ranges of gas and petrol? Um, and what sort of inflationary impact, notwithstanding what you've just said about gas? Um, uh, what, what, what uh, are you expecting in relation to the Australian economy? What are the op what are the boundaries that we mm. that, that you've looked at? Um, look, um, to be frank, we're just um, it's so there's a substantial amount of uncertainty there. So we're we're just sort of um, um, frankly settling our own views and looking at what the market anticipates, particularly on petrol or oil, if there was to be a you know, a significant increase. Um, and I, to be honest, don't have those numbers in front of me and we've worked with our colleagues on DISA on it, but I, I I will take it on notice. I won't hold you up on it. I will sure. get you back those market numbers quickly. And I'm, it, I'm going to speak to DISA about it uh, okay. tomorrow as but well. It, so. it would be, I think the, my guidance to you would be 
is, and we'll try and provide it, is um, frankly to get a sense on what people think the current um, dollar per barrel would, US dollar per barrel would go to 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 be um, uh, if there was a very significant um, shock. We haven't run it through um, kind of formally through inflation models yet because the other part of it is it's how long it's up there for. If sure. it spikes for you know a week or two, then you know it's, I'm not saying it has no impact, but it's in and out. But if there was a, 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 a some other form of deterioration, then um, and it stayed up higher, then then it has it's still persistent. It might persistently lift the level for a stronger period of time, and it'll have longer and more consequential flow-ons. So we've in terms of what we've talked to the government about is we've talked to talked to them about it through that framework, but I. We haven't, Trevor, as I'm aware, put a number through an inflation model as yet. We will in preparations for the budget, um, and it will be up to the government what it puts in the budget material, talk to those scenarios, and we'll know more by so, then about so, what that would look like. So, so, but, so, but in summary, very quickly in summary, there's no doubt it would, it would lead to the increase, but I can't quantify it for you, Senator Patrick. So, Senator Patrick, if I can give you just one more question, because Senator Rennick... Sure. Um, has a few I'm questions, sure. then we lose Dr Kennedy. So, sure. Senator okay. Patrick. So, um, this goes to the, the price of petrol at the Bowser, which is starting to hurt people, um, and no doubt will have a flow on uh, for the economy. Um, and this is in the spirit of uh, the philosopher Seneca, which is hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Yeah. Um, uh, have, have you modelled the impact of any reduction in excise duty rates uh, for petroleum and diesel products, uh, perhaps in preparation for consideration uh, for the budget? Um, and uh, well, ha have you looked at that? Not that I'm aware of. I'll double check for you, but not that I'm aware of. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Senator Rennick. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, just a couple of questions here. Um, <clears throat> How is the RBA and Treasury going to deal with uh, interest rates, rising interest rates, given the record housing debt and government debt uh, without crashing the economy? Is the RBA appearing chair in front of the... Yeah, it is. Later it's not. Um, but it's a fiscal measure as well as a Yes, so measure. I'll, I'll try and keep my mind... Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, um, it goes a little bit back to the earlier comments I made around how fiscal policy should and needs to sensibly um, taper. Um, one of the considerations that, um, w one of the reasons you want that withdrawal to happen sensibly is um, um, if you were, for example, overstimulating the economy and the bank and the monetary policy authorities felt they had to respond more quickly, then you raise the risks that you're talking about, Senator, of, yep. of an error. Um, and. Uh, uh, so I think that would be a relevant consideration on fiscal policy, on the risks that it was putting on monetary policy. Within monetary policy, I'll let, I presume Guy de Bell's appearing for you tonight. Yep. I'll let him uh, talk to these issues. But, uh, but I, it, I'll just state it because it's obvious. A very relevant consideration is the extent of leverage in the economy and the extent of debt. I think you raised that because we have to be cautious now um, in how we do that because... Uh, uh, it's just a fact that that we have, we carry households carry a higher levels of debt. They do have very substantial buffers as a result of the income support that's been given to them. But regardless, they carry higher leverage, and that means small like increases in interest rates now have a larger impact uh, through that. Yeah, leverage. exactly. Um, and look. How is Treasury going to deal with, because yet again it's a fiscal stimulus, uh, the RBA is stopping the bond buying? I would have thought it would make more sense to keep an accommodative, uh, quantitative easing policy whilst uh, tightening qualitative easing. Oh, not qualitative measures, sorry. Um, again, I'll sort of, I'll leave a bit of that to Guy. You ask the, you'll ask the same question to Guy. I, I will just uh, kind of, I will say, look, I am comfortable with the trajectory of normalisation. Uh, when I look at the strength of the economy at the moment, Senator, um, uh, I think it's a pleasing outcome. I'm not saying there's not risks, but there's plenty of opportunity to respond should they arise. So, uh, well, that's my question right there. Uh, are I, risks, and the risks will be a higher interest rate. 
right? Because we're running at two and a half percent, three percent for housing loans now. So if it goes back to normalisation, five to six percent, that's going to double interest on record debt levels. I mean, house prices have gone up twenty percent across the country on average in the last you know eighteen months. So there is a magic. So, so there are risks. That, but that's my question: How are you going to manage those risks? Very carefully. Yep. So, so wouldn't it? So this will lead to my last question. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Wouldn't the best way to do that is to stimulate productive measures via a quanti via an infrastructure bank funded by quantitative easing, or you know, quantitative measures, rather than just raise interest rates on its on its own, because for too long the RBA, when it's dealt with monetary policy, has only used qualitative measures, i.e. manipulate the interest rate, which just fiddles around the edges with housing bubbles and destroys fixed income for pensioners, rather than actually looking at funding ways to build genuine nation building infrastructure. I mean, we've talked about this a bit before. But yes, I, we have. I, I, yep. I'm, I'm frankly more in the camp of the risks will be lower if we see what I describe as a normalisation of um, monetary policy and fiscal policy. I accept um, the increased debt servicing costs and things that you're talking about that come with that, but I think the risks are best... You know, my last comment would be I do still think the risks are best managed in that arrangement. OK. Thank you very much, Dr Kennedy. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your perfectly... Uh, the length of your opening statement was absolutely perfect. I wish I hadn't raised. I'm sorry. The, uh, I'm sorry the consensus I raised, yeah. view of the committee. <laughs> consensus view of the committee. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for joining us today. We'll adjourn now until 11:15. Thank okay. you very much. Too many notes or not enough? <laughs>
um, uh, at present in terms of, uh, of households uh, dealing with some of those pressures from fuel price rises. Um, we would always highlight um, you know, what is being done to assist uh, in household uh, income by way of the uh, income tax cuts that have been delivered to date. And they're currently putting around $1.5 billion a month extra uh, into um, household bank accounts uh, alongside, of course, uh, the current um, unusually abnormally and historically low interest rates that, uh, that households uh, are benefiting from as well. So whilst the impacts of fuel prices are uh, real at the Bowser, and don't discount that right now, um, the government in terms of what we can do uh, already has policies in place from our perspective, uh, as well as, of course, what the, uh, the bank's policies are uh, that uh, that are uh, helping households uh, deal with some of those some of those pressures. So if, I, if I decoupled it from the budget, is it something that the government would would uh, ever consider in respect of high petrol prices? Um, uh, look, Senator, uh, uh, of course, yeah, we'll look at all levers that are at government disposal uh, in response to different pressures across the economy. Uh, uh, in the context of something like this, uh, you would also uh, want to be mindful of uh, whether what was within government's control uh, was meaningful relative to what's occurring in terms of global markets uh, and, uh, and whether, uh, whether that is um, something the proposal you've suggested uh, is a um, realistic proportionate or meaningful response um, to, uh, to any such pressures you know, relative to, uh, to what else you can uh, pursue across other economic policy settings to, uh, to assist households and businesses. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, now, who's seeking the call? Senator Gallagher? I think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're, we're still in macro. We are still in macro. Macro and corporate still here? Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, can Treasury outline whether or what work they've done around the um, use of rapid antigen tests in the reopening plan agreed to at National Cabinet? Whether you did any work or have done any work since the national plan was agreed? Um, from a macroeconomic perspective, Senator, um, I, I, perhaps your question is not necessarily an economic one. I don't know if perhaps you're talking about the supply of rapid antigen tests. No, I, well, I'm, I guess the, from a macro level, the sort of safe opening and the arrangements put in place to facilitate a safe opening would fall under the macro group, I would have thought. No? So, no, no, so they do. Um, I guess perhaps in relation to the actual supply of tests, um, Mr MacDonald, I guess, might might like to, to comment. OK, so maybe there's two bits here, which is what, what involvement Treasury had in ensuring we reopened safely and, you know, didn't have or the economic consequences of having a safe opening plan in place and uh, the analysis around rats. So, so, so I think, Senator, on, on, on the first issue, um, Treasury uh, worked quite closely in providing um, analysis and information that sat alongside the work of the Doherty Institute uh, to inform those arrangements in relation to opening. Okay. It's no secret that, uh, that subsequent to um, uh, that analysis being undertaken by Doherty and by Treasury uh, and informing the pathway that the Commonwealth and the National Cabinet were taking, uh, the emergence of Omicron uh, had uh, a massive impact in terms of uh, many of those assumptions and, uh, and yep. Treasury has subsequently informed um, uh, governments, uh, ourselves and, uh, and state and territory governments in terms of analysis about uh, particularly the workforce implications yep. of, uh, yep. of Omicron and those workforce implications being uh, a result of uh, people having to isolate uh, and, uh, and together then with the health advice, Dr Kennedy's uh, clear advice earlier today about the importance of the two working together, uh, together with the health advice, governments have taken steps to alleviate some of those workforce pressures by, uh, by making adjustments uh, consistent with health advice to some of those, um, uh, to some of those isolation requirements uh, that, uh, that were in place. So uh, there's probably a, a number of areas from that initial advice um, uh, uh, around the reopening to then the advice in response to those Omicron-related pressures that, uh, uh, 
that Treasury uh, can uh, can provide uh, information on. And, okay. Um, yep. So, so if it helps, uh, Hamish yes. MacDonald, our uh, First Assistant Secretary, Strategic Coordination and Communications Division. So as the Minister was saying, we're involved in the work, uh, closely involved with the Doherty Institute, the Health Department and Prime Minister and Cabinet in the work on the National Transition Plan mm -hmm. uh, that happened uh, from the middle of last year through to the end of last year. So this is the one that was agreed in August? Uh, that's correct. Yep. Um, and so as part of that, uh, we worked with those other institutions. We provided some economic analysis that supported those decisions. Uh, RATS has been uh, something that's been discussed a few times in the context of how, how the plans have have evolved. So, um, Or testing in general, I presume. So testing, the approach so to testing in So in August, in it was testing, trace, isolate, quarantine. They were mm -hmm. the kind of key components mm -hmm. of the safe reopening plan. Mm -hmm. That's pre-Omicron. Um, so. Did you um, did Treasury provide advice, or did Doherty provide the advice that you then um, utilised around the testing arrangements that should be in place for a safe reopening? Uh, so there was Doherty advice around uh, rapid tests in the context of schools, uh, which was around the impact of rapid tests as a screening device for schools, yeah, um, as a way to uh, both reduce infections and increase attendance. Uh, through schools, and that was something that uh, is, is available on National Cabinet websites. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. And then I guess further to that, there was a National Cabinet conversation around the roles and responsibilities for rapid testing, um, the roles and responsibilities in terms of testing, and that was in November last year. So and the of that were roles also and that. responsibilities for rapid testing in November, so that's post, is that um, post awareness around Omicron or just prior to that, because that was sort of early November? I, I can't remember for certain. I mm -hmm. feel like it could have been prior to the emergence of Omicron. Okay. Because Omicron was quite late in November. Yeah. Okay, so there was agreement around the roles and responsibilities for testing in general. Are you saying including rapid, rapid use of rapid tests? At any point did Treasury have a view of the role of rapid tests like more broadly outside of schools because the experience in the UK, in the Northern Hemisphere um, before Omicron had been quite a widespread use of rapid tests. They had higher community transmission at the time and I've been through this with the COVID committee but um, you know, was there uh, any view from Treasury around the, you know, the more widespread use of rapid tests as a way of further bolstering um, some of the protections against COVID. Yeah, I mean, as you say, in the UK, they've used uh, rapid tests. They were using rapid tests a bit earlier, but in the UK, they also had a different context uh, in terms of, um, as you say, they had higher higher case rates. Yeah. Uh, and at that con in that in the context of Australia's low case rates, I guess, you know, it probably affects where you'd hit the balance between. Uh, the certainty of testing um, and the, the breadth of testing that you can conduct. Um, so I guess I, I think I think the, um, the, the the circumstances are different. I probably leave it defer to my health colleagues uh, about the exact balance between the use of rapid tests and PCR tests because yeah. it's more their their um, their responsibility. Yeah, I mean again. I'm just trying to understand from your uh, policy area. Um, there was in in the northern hemisphere there was widespread use of rapid tests. Also, firms had, you know, large companies um, had started utilising rapid tests as a way of again ensuring they could keep operating and and manage the risks that presented from um, transmission of COVID. Um, you know, was the Treasury conscious of that? Like, had you been monitoring what had been happening in terms of how people were keeping their economies open and working um, based on what had happened in the Northern Hemisphere? Uh, yes, we were aware of what was happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. Um, Senator, I mean, I mean this, it goes to I mean, the role of testing for diagnostic versus the role of testing for screening purposes. Um, uh, now, alongside that, you know, there is, of course, how that balance in terms of the role of testing changes with different variants of, uh, of COVID. Um, and, uh, and 
uh, with um, a variant now dominant in Omicron uh, that has uh, much lesser uh, health outcomes in terms of the severity of, uh, of impact there. So um, I think, as, uh, as Mr Macdonald said, it's the health advice that informs uh, those decisions, but uh, from government perspective, you know, we've uh, pursued and followed that health advice in relation to screening, uh, testing for screening purposes uh, in high risk settings um, and, uh, and have supported uh, in certain cases uh, the states using testing for screening purposes in settings such as schools where it has uh, um, a direct and flow on impact uh, to, uh, to workforce availability. Um, but uh, um, then decisions for businesses in terms of that type of screening is, uh, is a matter really for uh, businesses dependent upon uh, their different circumstances. Yeah, sure. I guess I was using it more to illustrate that, you know, private firms were seeing the benefits of rapid testing as a way of keeping their businesses running. Um, and this is sort of in late 2020, this was occurring in the Northern Hemisphere. So, um, and, and it's slightly different. I accept that we've been following the health advice, but it, your department, this department, sorry, not your department, but this department comes from things at a slightly different angle because presumably the Treasurer is seeking advice about how to ensure that, that the you know, economy is in as good a shape as it possibly can be with the overlay of a health pandemic. So um, I'm trying to understand whether there was a request from the Treasurer around optimum use of testing to ensure that large parts of the economy can keep going and don't have the the supply shortages and the staff shortages that we saw. I mean, at what point was that, you know, did that kind of feature in front of Treasury? Uh, like, what, where are we talking? Was it when it happened? Was it during the Christmas, January period when people clocked on, well, this is, this is a problem now? Um, you know, staff shortages, supply chain disruptions because we didn't, and then, you know, lack of access to rapid testing. Is that the point where the Treasury understood there was a problem or had there been some foresight and thinking done on this earlier? I mean, I guess I, I, I might be repeating what I've said before, but I guess, uh, so, you know, the role of rapid tests, we're aware of the of rapid tests being used overseas and the role that they've been formed overseas in a different context of higher case numbers. Um, so the health advice at the time was that uh, in the context of low case numbers, the PCR tests were the better, were the more appropriate tests for Australia to be using. Um, the, approval for, the approval for rapid test use at home came uh, in around October, I think it was, last year. Yeah, it's November, I yeah, think, November. first approved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, before that point, there wasn't health uh, system approval for, for the use uh, in home, home settings. Um, and... Uh, at that time in November, there was the National Cabinet Conversation, which goes to, you know, which has gone to a number of aspects, including use in schools, but, you know, the more broader uh, issue of roles and responsibilities in okay. testing. So is your evidence that prior to um, the situation we saw emerge in, in, in December, January, um, Treasury hadn't advised about the use of rapid antigen tests to ensure the opening up that was occurring at that time was happening as smoothly as it could or, the, or that you know, people would be as protected as they could. Regardless of the TGA approval, I'm trying to understand, did you provide advice to the Treasurer that we needed effective testing arrangements, including the use of rapid tests, as part of the opening up? So certainly as part of opening up, we, we would have... Uh our advice would have included going to the issue of effective testing arrangements. Um, that's, in, you know, okay. certainly. And as part of, we, we, we would have provided, um, I can take on notice exactly what, but we would have provided advice about um, the importance of rats, certainly prior to December. Prior to December? Well, did you uh, say uh, that? yes, yes, I did say that. As yes. I said, there's been conversations about the use of rats in schools, for example. Okay. Were, did the Treasury have any concerns and raise any concerns about the availability of the product for 
broader community use? Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, the national the, the, the agreement on the roles and responsibilities set out uh, different different parts of the system. Commonwealth having some responsibility, the states having some responsibility, and businesses having some responsibility. Uh, and so that that set out some roles and responsibilities with regard to that. Um, within that framework, uh, we were not the purchasers of uh, rats, either for Commonwealth pur purposes, and we weren't the um, people buying rats for business purposes. Are. But had you had the Treasury raised any issue around availability of, like, had you seen this coming? Did you provide any advice that there could be a shortage of rats if there was, um, you know, uh, transmission rates increased? I'd need to take on notice when we first kind of received advice from businesses that they were having trouble purchasing rats. So, okay, you don't know when that exactly was? I don't, I don't have that. Okay. So am I led, am I led to believe that the shortage of rapid tests and the consequences of that was a surprise to the Treasury? Like, were you learning in, as, in real time as that unfolded? Senator, I do think it's important to, to remember that through, through those months, and there's still pressure in certain parts of the supply chains there, but through particularly those couple of months, it was a global shortage of, uh, of rapid antigen tests um, that, uh, that you, know, you can find uh, stories and reports from other parts of, uh, of the world, uh, the UK, Canada, US, um, in terms of challenges that they were facing as well because of the impact of Omicron and the surge that uh, that was causing in not just case numbers but testing numbers. Uh, whilst, the, um, whilst that surge put real pressure uh, on Australian systems and, uh, and, there's, uh, uh, and that was, uh, was evident and clear, uh, Australia did also maintain throughout that time some of the highest <coughs> testing rates in the world. Yeah, because we were having the highest <laughs> transmission of the virus in the world as well at that well, point in time. Well, it, which well so, correlates. So, so, Senator, there were huge spikes in transmission yeah. in uh, yeah. in many other countries as well. Uh, but uh, but um, uh, whilst you know, the pressure and there were uh, certainly time delays and uh, and there were challenges in terms of availability uh, for people wanting to buy a rat at uh, at a given point in time, but our testing rates uh, remained amongst the highest uh, in the world, um, you know, notwithstanding all of those pressures. Okay. So when you said, you know, there was this global shortage, are we talking around the same time period here? Are we talking December, January? Is that when you say... That there were global shortages yeah. uh, realised? Over yes, that, Senator. I'm trying to pinpoint when, when the government knew there was global shortages. My, my earlier question was, was what happened in December and January in terms of the impact on the economy from the increased rates of transmission of COVID, did that come as a complete surprise to the Treasury? Well, well um, I think Dr Kennedy uh, acknowledged earlier that, uh, I mean, they, that he didn't predict or foresee Omicron and, uh, and so in that sense um, um, the consequential impacts of, uh, of that. And it's always been acknowledged that there could be different uh, and would be different variants of, uh, of COVID-19, but how they manifest themselves becomes, uh, becomes the more uh, unpredictable nature yeah. of, uh, of handling uh, the virus in, uh, in that regard. Yeah, but I'm, again, it, my, I'm trying to understand, surely <coughs> under some of the modelling and, and some of the scenario work that was done with with other experts, including the Doherty, but perhaps even on this question around the economic impacts of the pandemic, that increased community transmission would have been part of the thinking for the past 18 months or so. You know, having an understanding of the economic consequences of a, an increased rate of positive cases in the across the economy would have been part of the scenario planning by Treasury and then some of the risk 
um, management of those scenarios would have been considered. And so, well, <laughs> yes. Can you give it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, yes. Please, like, I'd yes. really like yes. to know that this didn't yes. come as a complete yes. shock yes. to people just because yes. I'm a Senator, right. um, But, uh, and health, um, and I know we're appearing uh, concurrently with us today, yeah. uh, better place to, to say this um, with accuracy than I am, but uh, essentially the, 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 the impact of Omicron uh, saw that um, case numbers uh, far exceeded uh, the upper end bounds of the Doherty Institute modelling and uh, an analysis that, uh, that had been done. However, the impact of Omicron has not necessarily exceeded uh, those upper end bounds in terms of the health outcomes yeah, uh, of, the, uh, of the work that Doherty has done. Yeah, so that, that's why I'm asking from the, um, the economic side of government whether those scenarios of high levels of community transmission and the impact that would have on keeping businesses open, essential services functioning, staff at, at work, um, you know, all of those, surely that had been considered by Treasury. Mr Powell, you're sort of nodding. Like, were you doing that work so, so that reason? you could respond quickly in the event that the worst case scenario happened? And Senator, the reason I'm not in is because we have been considering various scenarios and right, published yeah. published various Good. scenarios yeah. in, in in varying budgets over time, and um, where Senator Birmingham started, we've also done um, quite a lot of work um, on absenteeism and different sectors of the economy, um, and for example, been able to provide advice into um, the government in conjunction with health professionals about which sectors of the economy are really quite important. So for example, childcare and schools and how that flows into worker availability, absenteeism. So we have done a lot of that work and, and very closely with Doherty um, and provided that into, into government. Um, as, as again, Senator Birmingham pointed out, there is a question then about what's the, what's the suitability of different types of tests, which is really a health question. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and then um. there is questions of availability and supply chains. Um, for those. I think our role from a macro point of view has been to provide the advice on um, how cases might move, for example, into absenteeism affect overall spending and availability of workers in the economy. So I think that's where we've, that's how we've partnered with Doherty over time. Um, I think, that, as I said, the question about um, the suitability of different tests is obviously a health question and the reliability of those and it's not something that, that certainly that um, we are an expert on. Okay, um, so you were you were involved in various scenarios. Like, from your point of view, then, is the answer to empty supermarket shelves, you know, the transport system and logistics being under pressure, um, the testing regime essentially collapsing in the eastern side of the country, the eastern states, you know, um, high levels of community transmission, is all of that is the answer to all of that Omicron and there was nothing else we could have done about it? Um, well, Senator, Omicron did change the circumstances and we've had to change in response to Omicron too. Yeah, but so, it's like we were caught so, short so on a, on a you, number of fronts and I'm trying to understand it, whether there was something that could have been done to mitigate that. Well, well, like well, why I mean, were we not better prepared? I mean, if you, if you take, um, um, for example, the point I made before that um, case numbers exceeded what Doherty had modelled, um, but uh, the consequential health outcomes did not necessarily exceed the upper boundaries of, uh, of what Doherty had modelled. That, of course, then provides the basis to inform the decisions made uh, um, by government and through National Cabinet uh, to change some of those isolation rules and, uh, and settings because you've got um, a changed paradigm of, uh, of the health outcomes versus uh, the case numbers that, uh, that you're dealing with. Um, and, uh, and ultimately the, the function of um, absenteeism and worker shortages uh, that created uh, a number of those pressures there um, uh, was a function of isolation requirements broadly as they relate to how many people were captured by each individual case uh, across the economy and for how long uh, people were captured 
uh, by those isolation requirements. Mm. So um, uh, the, uh, the isolation requirements that we had in place um, were appropriate as advised by health to deal with the health impacts of Delta. Um, they were adjusted uh, as we got the updated medical advice around the health impacts of Omicron. Um, uh, you couldn't have updated those in, uh, uh, in advance of that until you actually had the advice around what the actual impacts of, uh, of Omicron were. Um, uh, but uh, um, yeah. yeah, but I guess my my question is a, a scenario in a in a global pandemic where we've seen waves and variants. The scenario that we all lived through in December, January, um, could have been foreseen in terms of some of the planning. And your 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 answer is well no because Omicron was different. But a scenario, regardless of the variant, where you had high levels of community transmission, testing regimes under pressure, high levels of absenteeism, supply chain impacts, surely that could have would have been a scenario that had been considered by the government over the past two and a half years. And therefore, some planning around how you deal with that scenario to mitigate some of the economic consequences of that would also have been considered. Or are you saying no, that 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 wasn't possible? Um, Senator, I, mean, I think there are there are limits to mitigations that uh, that uh, can apply uh, when you are looking at a scenario of um, a very very high level of workforce. Uh, uh, unavailability and absenteeism um, uh, that uh, that that ultimately the rules as were applying um, appropriately from uh, from the earlier days of COVID and from the Delta outbreak uh, and Delta being the dominant variant uh, as the rules had been uh, been set for um, had a consequential impact of of huge levels of uh, absenteeism um, and uh, and so. Uh, that would always result in, uh, in disruptions and there are limits to the extent to which you could mitigate those disruptions. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, the, uh, the health advice was able to vary because the health impacts of Omicron proved to be uh, so much less severe than, uh, than was the case previously uh, and the um, speed of likely transmission from Omicron appeared to be most likely within a compressed number of days, which enabled the shortening of that number of days for close contacts to have to isolate. I think I think I'll just keep going round and round. But um, what I can take out from this evidence is that it, the what happened here in December and January wasn't foreseen by the Treasury that you Treasury responded once it was unfolding? No. Yeah. As, as, okay. as Dr Kennedy acknowledged, uh, um, they didn't predict Omicron, uh, no. But uh, uh, if you look at systems around the world, I'm not sure anybody else did either, Senator. Well, it was, it's more about planning for a range of different scenarios coming from a global plan pandemic. And, Hi. Yeah, I mean, but again, I'm going to go yeah. round and round. No, that, that's right. and, and I'm so, trying we, to... we, we did look at scenarios. Um, it turned out, as I said, that yeah. you know, we had a scenario where case numbers were far higher than had been uh, modelled on the uh, on the upper boundaries of that modelling, but where the health outcomes actually came within uh, those uh, those upper bounds of modelling. So health systems have faced pressures as a result of workforce shortages, um, but they haven't faced uh, the type of pressures as that, you know, that would have been the worst case scenario as a result yeah, of um, admission numbers of, uh, of very seriously ill individuals. Yeah. Okay. Can I just, on, finally on this, that um, when did the Treasurer ask the Treasury to provide advice about the viability of using rapid antigen tests in an Australian context? Do you need to take that on notice or would you have an answer? Uh, I, th I think I'll need to take it on notice, but 
Um, it's, a, it's a very broad question that you've asked about. It's when the Treasurer did. So it's not necessarily when, when Treasury advised. Mm. On you know on the national plan, I know you've indicated that you did. I'm asking whether the treasurer asked the treasury to provide advice on the viability of using rapid tests in an Australian context. Okay. I think Does that I mean, narrow I mean, it for I mean, you? I mean, Mr. McDonald's taken it on on notice, but I mean, there have been you know, long discussions, um, uh, overwhelmingly informed uh, by the health advice about the role that rapid antigen tests uh, you know, would or could play in Australia. So I, I'm not really sure that your narrow framing of that question is uh, is a reflective of the reality that the, okay. the Treasurer would have been, you know, as part of meetings, hearing those health opinions in terms of the preference for PCR tests and engaged in all of the you know, consequential discussions. Okay, well, let's see what... So, Mr. McDonald, do you understand the question that you've taken on notice? Yes. Yeah. So. Yes. You do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I don't imagine I'll get an answer this side of the election, but anyway, we'll we'll see. Um, so I'll keep going, shall I? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, I've got some questions around the advertising campaign, the Our Comeback campaign. Does that require a change of officials? Kelly, um, can I ask uh, to begin, can you tell me how much the department has spent on advertising contracts if you have the um, previous financial, you know, the, well, whatever information you have with you, but um, in the previous financial year and then in this year to date? Roxanne Kelly, Deputy Secretary, Corporate and Foreign Investment Group. Are you specifically after the economic recovery campaign? I will come to that. Um, sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. If I start with the, the, the cost of all of the campaigns, if you have them. Oh, Ms Kenner. Senator Shannon Kenner, Assistant Secretary of Communications Branch at Treasury. Um, we don't have the figures compiled, but we can give you individual spends on campaigns. If you okay. wanted to go through it that way. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll start with the Economic Recovery Plan campaign. Um, so, total ex do you want total expenditure or expenditure by contract? Um, I'll have total expenditure. Yep. yep. So, total expenditure for the 2021 financial year was two million eight eight three four nine two eighteen cents. Eight eight three four nine two eighteen cents. And uh, spend on the 2020, sorry, 21-22 financial year, as at the 31st of December, is six four nine five four five and thirty two cents. Five four five and thirty two cents. It gives us confidence when you've got the cents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, it's some tracking. No, that's all right. <laughs> so um, the economic recovery one, the, that first figure you gave me, the two point eight three figure, was for the um, previous financial year, was it? That's correct. Yeah. So that. Okay, um, and then this year to date, so it's 2122 and 2021 is 650,000 essentially. Is that and that campaign's continuing? Is it? How much is it expended to cost by the time? Uh, the campaign isn't live at the moment, Senator. We had to pause it um, in I think it was July last year because of the COVID outbreaks. Okay, so. Um, it started just before, I think. When, can you tell me when it started? Yep. Just a moment, Senator. So, the first phase of the campaign was launched on the 14th of October, 2020. Yep and ran through to the 19th of December, 2020. Yep. The second phase of the campaign launched on the 6th of June, 2021, and then paused on the 1st of July, 2021. 
Okay, and um, that was essentially when we all went back into lockdown. That's correct. And who made the decision to stop that? Uh, it was a decision of government at that point. Okay, so the Treasurer or the Cabinet made the decision to pause that campaign? Correct. Well, it's, it, Treasury was the one that instructed uh, the, the media buyer to pause the campaign. Yeah, but, but someone on... instructed you? Correct. So the Treasurer? Was it just a decision of the Treasurer or was it a decision of the Cabinet? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how you characterise it, Senator, because it was, it was sort of a joint decision of government at that point. Okay. Did you brief, did, did you brief the government that you thought this should pause? No, we didn't provide briefing at that point, Senator. Okay. All right, so that's the first, um, that's the, our comeback effectively. So that's um, sit, currently sitting at 3.3, .3, around $3.3 .3 million. It hasn't been recommenced then? No, Senator. So that 650,000 was essentially the June to, oh, so how did that work? Because I think you've said you've spent 649,000 in the 21-22 year to date, but yes. then you said you paused it on the 1st of July. That's correct, Senator. That's because some of the costs flow into the next year anyway once we get invoiced. Oh, okay. All right, so it's, a, it's more of a payment process. Correct. Okay, so um, the 3.3 .3 was really for costs incurred, the cost of the campaign in the previous financial year, but you, you paid for some of that in the, the next financial year. That's correct. Okay. Um, and the other campaigns, you said you had, could just quickly tell me some of the other ones? Uh, yes, there was some expenditure on the Your Future, Your Super campaign as well. Yep. Which I can give you a quick summary of. So Your Future, Your Super um, campaign spend as at the 31st of December uh, for the 21-22 financial year. Um, oh, sorry, I just realised I haven't actually got that totaled. I can run through the campaign, sorry, the contract costs for you if you yep. want, Senator. Yep. Um, so research with 555 is 584-689-60. Yep. Five eight five six nine. Yep. Evaluation research with Hall and Partners is one hundred and five seven eight eight and ninety four cents. Yep. Ogilvy the Creative Agency is one one two seven three six two twenty five cents. Yep. Fenton Public Relations two hundred and sixty five two nine fifty cents. Cultural perspectives, one four seven eight nine five and one cent. I don't know how you bill for that, but anyway, <laughs> they'll take every last cent, won't they? Yep. Government literally, contract. Literally. Just let's add in another cent. <laughs> uh, carbon, uh, the uh, Indigenous uh, Specialist Agency, two four eight three two eight and fifty two cents. So was that um, a specific? targeting of um, uh, um, Indigenous communication for Indigenous, about the Your Future, Your Super. Correct. Um, and cultural perspectives, the one before that was for um, culturally and linguistically okay. diverse audiences. Right, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Universal McCann, so the media buy is 2827, 706 and 10 cents. 282706 and 10 cents. Okay. So it's a much smaller campaign than your future, your super. And is that, um, I think the Our Comeback campaign was um, TV, newspapers, social media, yep. Facebook, things like that, was it? Digital, social. Um, let me just confirm for you. So it would have been TV, radio, print, out of home, digital, and social. Okay. 
Um, and cinema, sorry, I was in there as well. Oh, in the movies as well. Okay. Um, all right, and do you have the other campaigns? So perhaps we don't have to break, unless you've got the global cost, I don't want to take up too much time. But no, no, that was, they were the only two. They're sessions. the only two campaigns you've been running. Okay. And um, the, our comeback, when, when is it due to kick off again? That hasn't been determined anymore. Okay, so, and has that, um, has it been updated, that campaign? Like? No, we're still, the government is still considering what we do with that one at the moment. So there hasn't been a formal decision made about relaunch. Do you know, Minister, what's happening with the, our comeback? Is it going to be now come back Mark II? Um, uh, Senator, uh, no, I have to take that on notice. You don't know? Yeah. Um, uh, no, Senator, and obviously officials have, uh, have covered the, uh, the suspension of that campaign. Okay, so we'll... we'll suspension we'll... indicates yeah. it's hard again. Well, it was, uh, uh, the campaign was, was ceased, suspended, uh, put to put the word you uh, put the word you like there on it in terms of, uh, of where it was at that point in time, Senator. Um, uh, in terms of uh, any intentions around uh, around that campaign, uh, as I said, I'll take it on notice. I haven't uh, got any information on that. Will there be a um, will it will there be a, uh, our comeback? Will we see it before caretaker? No. It's only a short I've, amount of time. I've, I've, I've taken that on notice. Senator. Okay. How how long does it take to kind of get one going again? Like, could you just ring up the contracts you have in place and say we want to get this moving again, and that would happen reasonably quickly? No, Senator. It takes several weeks, if not months, because there's um, quite a bit of development work that needs to be done. We still need to make sure campaign material is suitable to be used in the current environment. It might need to be updated. We would need to do research. We would need to go through the government approval processes, um, as well as the internal approval processes in the department. So it's it's not a, a quick turnaround. So you, you would, couldn't just get a call from the Treasurer's office and then press the green button? No, Senator. OK. Um, because what have we got? We've got, we've got six weeks to uh, budget day. Minister, is there going to be a budget advertising campaign? Uh, Senator, uh, um, as I said to Senator Patrick before, I'm not about to um, speculate around um, budget measures. If there's a budget measure in relation to something like that, that would be identified in the budget. But this government quite often gets the ads out before, pretty early on, um, sometimes you know, like uh, I think the ads around rapid testing came out before there was rapid tests to test yourself with. So has the government made a decision about a budget advertising campaign? Um, so I said to Senator Patrick before, I'm, I'm not going to do um, what is or isn't in the budget. I'm not and, asking uh, and that, that. And that includes I'm not communications asking. elements to, uh, really? to the budget. So considering, I mean, this committee is able to ask any question relating to expenditure across government. Mm. And we've just had evidence that it takes but some time, some time to build yes. in a campaign. It's a legitimate question to ask of the estimates committee. I'm not asking about what's in the budget. I'm asking if you're going to advertise the budget. Well, to, to do that, Senator, would require a budget decision in relation to, uh, to funds for that. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm not going to go to what decisions may or may not be taken in. So will you regard. rule out a budget advertising campaign? Because uh, you'll probably have a few days, won't you? As, uh, as I said to Senator Patrick before, I'm not going to do the rule in, rule out when it comes to, uh, to decisions to be taken in the lead up to the budget. But those decisions would have to have been made now whether you're going to have an advertising campaign for the budget. Well, Senator... So uh, you're, just not, you're just not telling us? Uh, you know the answer, I'm, but you're not telling I, I, us? I'm not engaging in, uh, in, in any of the various forms of budget speculation. When would you have to um, buy the advertising spots for, a, um, for early April? Would you have to be doing that now, Ms Kenner? 
Um, it's, it's really dependent, Senator, on what the media placement situation is like at that time. Um, I'm not sure what the media landscape is like at the moment, but it's, the, the preference is normally that you buy a few weeks in advance of going to air. Mm. That's normally quite late. If it's busy, you might not be able to get spots. So it can be very dependent, but you'd, you'd want at least a couple of weeks beforehand. Okay. So has the Treasury bought any advertising space for, in preparation for, for early April, late March? No, Senator. Okay. And you haven't been asked to? Uh, not at this stage, no. Okay. Minister, with the Our Comeback campaign, considering it had to be pulled, do you think that you got ahead of yourselves with the, with the ad campaign before and prioritised that above actually ensuring um, you know, Australians were kept safe from COVID outbreaks? No, no, Senator. The, uh, uh, I mean, the campaign uh, is part of the overall strategy to, uh, to um, drive uh, confidence across the economy. Consumer and business confidence um, uh, was, uh, was yielding results before the, uh, the Delta-induced lockdowns of, uh, of uh, the second half of last year. Um, uh, those, um, uh, that lift in confidence was seeing a very uh, strong ahead of expectations uh, comeback of the, uh, of the Australian economy, uh, of jobs numbers that, uh, that was uh, quite world leading um, uh, amongst uh, other developed nations at the time. So um, uh, it was all playing its role. Uh, obviously, as we've seen through COVID-19, circumstances can change and can change quite quickly. But our economy is on track to come back, had to be pulled because we weren't on track to come back because we went into lockdown oh. for months. Well, we well, Senator, as I said, we were uh, ahead of most other developed nations in terms of our we're economic of recovery um, for, uh, uh, for much of that time. Um, and the strength of the economy and its resilience to, uh, to those shocks uh, has been uh, evident um, post Delta, in terms of the uh, the rate of uh, of quick recovery, and even uh, and even with the Omicron shock, we're uh, we're now seeing uh, strong um, resilience across the economy. Uh, you know, we have an unemployment rate sitting at uh, at 4.2 percent, and the Treasury Secretary sitting here earlier today, um, you know, talking about um, the possibility for uh, for optimal scenarios for essentially full employment and, uh, and strong growth and potential for areas of wages growth uh, in an environment the likes of which he, uh, he can cite very few occasions he's seen previously with mm. uh, such possibility. So do you say that the 3.3 million spent on the suspended our comeback campaign, um, suspended as Australia went into five months of lockdown was efficient, effective quality spending by the governments? Senator, we don't make any apologies for trying to ensure confidence across consumer and business, uh, uh, across consumers and businesses around Australia uh, is optimised. Um, you know, that sort of confidence helps to achieve stronger economic outcomes. Now, uh, the shocks and the uncertainties and the unpredictabilities that come from COVID, uh, we all have to adjust to, and that means you change and alter policy settings uh, in response to those uh, those impacts but um, yeah. so you do um, you I know I know, I know well that spent. I know well that spent. I know the opposition likes to try to find every opportunity to talk down aspects of, uh, of the Australian economy uh, and to try to weaken consumer sentiment we or confidence lockdown. or weaken business sentiment or confidence uh, we want to try to bolster that at every uh, at every avenue no, because my question is about whether it was money well is important. spent you think the our comeback that got suspended because we went into five months of lockdown maybe wasn't a bit premature and you think it was money well spent? Senator, as, as I said, it was until those lockdowns okay. had to occur, working very clearly in tandem with, which, with what was a very strong recovery and comeback by the Australian economy at that time. And you won't uh, tell the committee whether there will be a budget ad campaign? I'm not going to speculate on, uh, on budget decisions, including around what communications may or may not be funded in the budget. So we'll just have to wait and see whether the ads come. Just Cut. Okay. Customarily, run these... alongside for a few days before you can 
actually have to start paying for them by the Liberal Party. Customarily, when we gather together for portfolio additional estimates uh, uh, each and every year, um, uh, ministers sitting uh, here at uh, Treasury or Finance uh, find themselves answering questions where they say, yes, you will have to wait and see for the budget to, uh, to find out what is in the budget. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Senator Walsh, you're seeking the call. Senator Patrick had some questions. Are we still in macro? You still want to, your questions in macro, Senator Walsh? No, they're in corporate. They're in corporate. Anyone have any questions in uh, macro? Uh, yeah, Chair, Senator McKim here. I do have. Uh, still got small. corporate at the table, though. Okay, so. we still have corporate at the table. So we, so Senator Walsh, we still have corporate at the table. So I'll go to you, you Senator McKim, on macro. Then we'll go to Senator Walsh. Uh, and take it from there. Senator McKim. All right, thanks, Chair. Look, these questions are in regards to um, the Treasurer's view that uh, the $424 billion odd dollars in private that has been accumulated will sustain the economy now that um, fiscal support is being withdrawn. In the last, na in the last national accounts, uh, 20, uh, they showed that on a household basis, the top 20 per cent by income had about $90,000 in savings, and the bottom 20 per cent had negative $8,000 in savings, uh, which I assume means they're carrying, um, on average, about $8,000 in non-mortgage debt. You know, I just firstly ask, is there any reason to expect that this ratio changed drastically since the 1920 national accounts? Um, thanks, Senator. One reason um, maybe which we referred to a little bit earlier um, is where some of the payments during the pandemic were uh, directed. Um, so we know that some of the economic support payments um, that were made uh, did boost um, incomes at the lower end of the spectrum rather than they did at the higher end of the spectrum. But um, I think as, you, as we talked about this morning, um, particularly as it relates to asset prices, for example, um, uh, certainly you know, they, they accrue across the spectrum, but, but um, uh, in relation to actual household balance sheets, um, incomes um, at the lower end um, increasing slightly more than at the higher end may change that, but I don't have a, a renewed breakdown from the one that you just mentioned. All right, thank you. Um, Jericho and The Guardian's done a little bit of work tracking inflation by discretionary and non-discretionary items. Um, he's found that um, over the last three quarters, discretionary items have been growing at an annualised rate of about 4%, uh, whereas non-discretionary items were growing at an annualised rate of about 2%. Does that sound about right? Does Treasury do any work uh, in, uh, in terms of um, differences between inflation rates for discretionary and non-discretionary items? Um, you can, Senator, break down the rates of growth in the CPI. There is obviously a lot of categories um, in there, and I can tell you that um, in the most recent um, CPI outcomes, um, uh, things like, as we talked about earlier, automotive fuel, for example, as, we, as we've noted in relation to oil prices, um, uh, did rise. Uh, but other items, like, for example, household energy um, here in Australia, um, haven't been rising into the same degree they have overseas. So again, it, that's probably a matter of going through the detail of that, um, of the components. But um, uh, certainly discretionary items um, uh, on the good side have risen significantly um, due to supply chain pressures and prices coming through the global channels. Okay, is, is that work that Treasury does when um, when CPI figures come out to um, to categorise um, or to, I guess to put um, goods and services into baskets um, around discretionary and non-discretionary spending? Um, we actually look, um, Senator, at different cost of living indices. So, for example, you, you know, you'll be aware that there's the CPI. There is also employee household indices, uh, pensioner indices, and transfer recipient indices. 
So we do um, keep a close eye on um, how those indices are all tracking and they do pick up the different compositional um, issues that you're talking about. I can tell you that, um, for example, for employee households, um, that indice grew slightly below CPI um, through to the December quarter 2021. So whilst the um, CPI more broadly grew 3.5% through the year for employee households, that indice grew in the order of 2.6%. So yes, we do, and we do take note of how those different weights impact cost of living, for example, for different households. All right, thanks. So can I ask, um, Domain.com has reported um, a 7.4% incre increase in rents across the country on average over the last year, which is the highest rises in rents since 2009. Does that sound about right? Um, perhaps what I should just say, Senator, is that there's two ways you can look at rents. Um, one is the advertised rents, um, which you'll see if you look, for example, at Domain or other um, uh, websites. Those advertised rents have been growing quite strongly. Um, through the year to January 22 um, across capitals. The other way that uh, rents are measured here is, is in the CPI, um, and that just doesn't take into account advertised rents, but it takes into account all rents across all households, of course, um, and um, not all rents are advertised. People are on contracts that, that won't be changing. So um, advertised rents um, uh, across the capitals uh, grew about 8%. Uh, this is the number I have in front of me to January 22. If you look at CPI rents, which takes into account the whole rental basket, um, that grew um, around 0.4 uh, to December 21. So there's just two ways to look at rents, and so I just wanted to draw that out for you. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. Would you attribute a significant discrepancy in those two figures to the fact that it's measuring um, different time periods, or is there something else at um, I think I would attribute that to um, effectively the, um, the time it takes for the rental um, contracts, for example, to be uh, to come up for renegotiation or people to move. So obviously the stock of rents across the whole economy and people's rents they're paying, they don't change um, as frequently. But um, when rents are advertised, obviously that's an opportunity for um, landlords and others to reprice rentals. All right. But... Um, is it reasonable to say that uh, looking at the um, advert measure of advertised rents, which um, you've said on your numbers have grown um, 8% in the 12 months to um, effectively to now, to, to January this year, um, they show a significant, um, that's a significant increase in, um, in the cost of renting a home, isn't it? So, that, so those numbers are uh, significant increases, um, as you've pointed out, Senator, so I think that's fair to say. All right, thanks. And, and in any event, well above um, wages in the corresponding period, probably just back of the envelope, about four times what wages were in that period. Is that fair? Um, well, I think that that's an interesting question, Senator. So. Um, uh, what is probably important to look at from that point of view is how incomes have changed over, for example, two years. So um, uh, wages are one measure of that. Um, um, households, gross disposable income is an important measure, uh, partly because that takes into account some of the payments that have been made um, to support households through the pandemic. Um, so incomes have grown um, significantly ahead of wages. Um, partly due to those social assistance payments. They've grown just over 11% um, over the two years to the start of the pandemic. So um, I, I guess it's, it's important to take into account um, some of those other factors um, in addition to wages is the only comment I'd make in, in response to you. All right, thanks. So um, what is the increase in gross disposable incomes then for the same period um, to 12 months to January this year? Um, as I said, um, uh, I have the number for two years, which is around 11% um, over those two oh, sorry, years. I thought you said 
Oh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I thought you said that was two years up until the start of the pandemic. Was that was that the two years from the start of the sorry, pandemic? That's from the start of the pandemic. Um, okay, if right. you like. So um, I'm happy to try and break that out for you for the um, the last year, if you like, and try and split that eleven across individual years, if that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. If you could just do that on notice, that'd be um, that'd be appreciated. Um, uh, all right. Um, so we've got um, step three tax cuts coming up that will deliver um, a nine thousand dollar plus tax cut to those earning more than two hundred thousand dollars. Does that sound about right? Um, I might need to pass that question to my revenue group colleagues for the details of how it interactions, interacts with the exact tax brackets, uh, Senator. I can tell you, though, that from right. a macro point of view, we have all of those uh, dynamics built into our outlook and have had for quite a while. Mm, OK. All right. I'm, I'm happy to park that um, for now. Um, all right, look, I might park. So, sorry, are you suggesting that it would be better for me to park any questions on stage three tax cuts for. Well, as they relate particularly to different income groups, um, um, those questions, I think, I, I don't think I'll be able to help with you, you with them now here. Um, mm. And perhaps my, my colleagues later on may be able to help you there. All right, so um, I guess I'll just put something to you and ask for a response. And if you feel it's um, an unreasonable question, I'll, I'll put it to the minister. So we've got a situation where fiscal support we've seen during the pandemic um, has been or is being withdrawn and to a large degree has been <laughs> withdrawn. Um, you've got inflation in non-discretionary items on the rise, obviously um, people who are uh, at the lower end of um, the economic spectrum, spend a lot more of their income on uh, non-discretionary items. Um, you've got rents going up, um, as um, uh, as we've discussed. Um, wages growth um, still stubbornly low, despite you know repeated forecasts to the contrary by Treasury over quite a number of years. Um, so I guess. Um, what I'm asking is what, and, and actually, I will ask the Minister this. Minister, what does the economic recovery look like, or so called economic recovery look like, for someone who's um, on a low wage, has little to no savings, and can't to buy their own home, can't even afford a deposit to get into the housing market, doesn't have wealthy parents um, to help them? Uh, doesn't really have much choice about where they spend their wage because they're spending a lot of it on non-discretionary items, um, and who's run off their feet at work. I mean, you know, stuck on the hamster wheel. I mean, what where, what does the economic recovery look like for someone like that? Well, thanks, um, thanks, Senator McKim. It uh, it is an environment in which the first two stages of the government's income tax cuts have been delivered and are providing a significant additional take-home pay. Uh, into uh, into the pockets of uh, of many uh, low and middle income Australians in terms of uh, of uh, assistance in a direct and ongoing way from uh, from uh, those reforms out of the first two stages of those income tax cuts. Uh, the current economic recovery uh, is an environment in which uh, we've seen uh, the availability of jobs uh, and the take up of jobs at uh, at. Um, record levels, and, uh, and as uh, Dr Kennedy highlighted today, uh, the proportion of the Australian workforce um, in employment uh, sitting um, at record highs and, uh, and at highs uh, relative to other developed economies. Uh, it's an environment where we're seeing, um, because of uh, those high levels of workforce participation uh, and high levels of job availability across all sectors of the economy, uh, people moving more dynamically uh, and at greater speed between jobs um, and seizing opportunities from doing so. Uh, and, uh, and where we saw uh, the last full financial year outcome, uh, uh, wages growth exceeding um, uh, uh, forecasts, uh, an upgrade uh, to forecasts in terms of recent uh, wages growth and, uh, and the potential 
as, uh, as Dr Kennedy has outlined uh, in his remarks today, for the fact that we can, uh, in some of the most positive circumstances that Australia has seen um, in a long time and in circumstances that he cites as only having occurred a couple of times before, essentially in his lifetime, strive to achieve um, uh, essentially uh, full employment uh, with stronger wages outcomes uh, driven uh, from that uh, that full employment. So, uh, Senator McKim, I appreciate there are challenges in, uh, in terms of uh, parts of the economy as there always are, uh, but uh, the strength of the recovery and the potential from the recovery uh, is, uh, is great uh, and the government is focused on uh, maximising that potential as much as possible. All right, thanks, Minister. Just my last question, Chair, and thank you. And it's again to you, Minister. Um, as I mentioned um, a few moments ago, um, the Treasurer uh, has been um, uh, basically pointing to the $460 billion um, in private savings and saying that'll help um, drive the economic recovery now that um, federal government stimulus has been removed. Um, and I'll just remind you again uh, of my comment earlier about the Accounts where the top 20% by income have about $90,000 on average in savings, and the bottom 20% um, are carrying, uh, on average, about $8,000 in non-mortgage debt. Um, isn't an economic recovery built around people spending their savings just another um, version of trickle-down economics? I mean, isn't it just saying that the nation's future and our economic recovery is dependent on high-income earners? spending on the things that they enjoy, using the savings they've got, um, while everyone else, as I said earlier, just is um, stuck on the hamster wheel. Uh, well, Senator, um, uh, the, uh, the elevated rate of savings can be seen across wide parts of, uh, of the Australian population and wide parts of Australian businesses um, uh, where people have saved by different means, some in terms of getting ahead of their mortgage payments, uh, others in terms of, uh, of savings that are held in different ways. Uh, businesses that uh, that also have uh, have uh, banked uh, additional savings that uh, that provide additional capacity for them to invest, and we're seeing um, positive outcomes in areas of business investment uh, that will create uh, greater potential for growth and for productivity dividends uh, from those sorts of businesses. So, uh, no, I don't uh, reject. Uh, well, I do reject, Senator, and I don't accept uh, the uh, the premise that you're putting there um, uh, when you have saving rates grow in a way as elevated as they have done, uh, you would expect to see uh, people potentially utilise some of those savings. One of the other functions as to where I expect to see some of that utilisation is that uh, people's ability um, to spend on services has been particularly suppressed by virtue of uh, the type of restrictions in place through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so uh, so um, uh, people have saved in some parts out of caution, in some parts because of the scale of support that's been uh, provided across the economy, but also in some parts because the areas that they actually want to be able to spend on that are also valuable areas of our economy have been suppressed um, uh, by virtue of health orders and regulations and, uh, and changes of behaviour as, uh, as people take a cautious approach to the health implications of COVID. Uh, I think we will see as, uh, as the economy continues to reopen um, that you know, the particular benefits in the services sector, um, which is a very big employer of, uh, of Australians, the dominant employer of Australians, is, uh, is really where uh, people take those opportunities of a greater normalisation that flows uh, from, uh, from hopefully the months and years ahead. Minister, uh, thank you, Senator McKim, and I uh, commend to you the work of uh, the great Dr. Thomas Sowell, a leading economist in the United States on trickle-down theory, so-called. Uh, can I pass the call to you, Senator Walsh? Yeah. Just for housekeeping, I've just got a couple of follow-ups from Ms. Kenner uh, from Corporate, and then I think we might be done with macro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. 
Ms. Kenner, I just wanted to follow up on some of the information you gave to Senator Gallagher on the um, Your Future, Your Super advertising spend. Um, so I think you said that the advertising component of that spend was 2.8 million. Um, yes, that's correct, Senator. Yeah. And when was when when were those ads up and about? Sure. One minute. I'll just get the dates for you. Um, so the campaign launched on the 10th of October, and uh, had a sorry. In an initial round, we had radio, press, and online, which included search, digital, and social. Uh, and then on the 1st of November, another round of um, small business advertising, the Indigenous advertising launched across radio, press and online as well. Small business, Indigenous and what, sorry? Um, sorry, it was just the small business and Indigenous communications launched across radio, press and online. So the 10th of October advertising spend was to the general sort of population? Uh, it was probably a bit more employer focused, but yes, it was. there was a further employer round um, of the small business advertising that was put out on the 1st of November. And so was this was broadly about the, the benchmark test and was it and, and your opportunity to have a look at your fund and change funds? Yes, it was, it was related to the Your Future, Your Super reforms about um, Australia's, Australians' ability to choose a better super fund, uh, the comparison tool, Your Super, um, the underperformance letters that were being issued yeah. by funds um, and the um, stapling measure as well for employers to be aware of. Yeah. So the, the advertising spend um, on, on stapling was directed to employers. Correct. Was there any advertising spend by government to inform the community broadly that they are about to be stapled to a super fund? Um, the material that we put out was also able to communicate to the public about the fact that, that this was something that was coming into play. Um, there was a lot of other work that was done by the Australian Taxation Office to communicate um, more broadly about this as well. So we were responsible for the high level media advertising, but the ATO did a lot of um, what we refer to as below the line work. So um, worked directly through their networks and through their channels. And so was the theory that both uh, you and it sounds like the ATO would engage employers who would then engage employees about opportunities to look at the performance of their fund. So, so the strategy was largely or entirely to provide the, the information to employers. Um, the strategy was largely to provide information to employers about the stapling measure um, and the fact that they, need, they had different obligations they needed to be aware of um, for any new employees. So the material or the information that was yeah. being put out to um, employ, sorry, employees or potential new employees about the performance of their funds, they were all being communicated with directly by their funds. There was material being put out by the ATO and I believe APRA as well. Okay. So that wasn't the intent of the material that we had to talk about the, the fund performance. I think, that, sorry, to be clear, I think there was one ad that did mention it, um, but a lot of the, the bulk of the work was done by the ATO in that regard. So your focus was on uh, educating employers about their obligations under, uh, about stapling and the information uh, that they were provided was also potentially in a format where they could provide that to their employees. That's and correct. And that was your main focus? Yes, that was the yeah. main focus of that advertising. Okay. And then I think the benchmarking issue, which is a bit related but separate, you didn't have a particular focus on that. That was the ATO. That's correct. Well, I think we had one, it might have been a radio ad, um, that talked about the fact that you may be receiving a letter from your super fund because yep. they haven't done as well as they could have and, yep. um, you know, to, to visit the ATO to find out more. Okay. And so anything, any questions about ads that the ATO ran 
go to the ATO. That's correct. Um, so government ran one radio ad telling people that they might get a letter saying that they might w want to change their funds based on the information in that letter. As part of that round of advertising that we did at the end of last year, that was, there was one execution. I can come back to you on whether it was radio or print. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Oh, sorry, I thought you said radio. Yeah. No, I, okay. I think it was radio. Yeah. Sorry, Senator. Okay. Um, yeah, so there was one ad in that round um, that spoke to that, and um, the other stuff that was being done by the ATO um, would have to be discussed with them. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, do you have any plan? Do you have a further spend for this financial year planned around either stapling or uh, the benchmark test? Uh, nothing planned at this stage, Senator. I think that is all my questions, Excellent. colleagues. Excellent. Thank you, Ms Kenner. All right. So that's the end of uh, corporate and uh, the macroeconomic group that assists officers. Uh, so we'll move on to corporate and foreign investment group, and Senator Patrick has the call. Very, very quick. Well, Lord Machine. Yes. Tick-tacking. Tick-tacking. Secret messages. <laughs> Our independent senators. Oh, very important. You don't understand the plight of a, of a crossbencher during oh, yesterday. Oh, oh, we're we're oh, very so sorry. It's so important we, we only have to be with you, Senator Patrick, for five minutes but to you, understand it, I can assure you. You are very kindly accommodated everywhere. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, thank you. I'll, I'll bring out the ukulele for you. Uh, <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> No, Senator, I'm not that skilled. Let us move quickly on. Thank you. Um, New South Wales is about to issue a whole bunch of um, free floodplain harvesting licences, estimated at uh, in value between one and two billion dollars. Now, a fair chunk of that wa that water, or that, that entitlement, will go to foreign uh, companies or companies that have large uh, foreign ownership. I know it's a concern, it gets raised with me all the time about foreign ownership, particularly around water. Um, and I also understand there's water licence also about to be handed out across WA, NT and um, North, Northern Queensland. Um, do you review the, the issuing or the gifting of water licences to foreign companies? Senator Tom Hamilton, I'm the first Assistant Secretary for Foreign Investment. Division. Um, at the moment, water entitlements are not specifically screened under the FATA. Um, they are screened should they be associated with an agricultural land acquisition, for example. But as you would know, the FATA has a range of sort of specific sectors and assets that it screens. At the moment, water is not one of those. The acquisition of water entitlements, though, is as a matter of policy by the government required to be notified to the ATO for inclusion in the asset of foreign ownership of water entitlements. Um, we do know that there is community interest in this aspect of the, the screening regime under the FATA, and we are seeking community views at the moment about, where, about the community's views about the screening of water entitlements. Okay, so that's, that's uh, good news. Uh, Minister, uh, so I'll just direct it, direct it at you then. Um, there is a general concern about foreign ownership of water in, this, in, in the country. Um, and we now have a situation where you know, potentially one to two billion dollars of water is to be gifted to um, uh, foreign entities. Is the, with, is the government in consultation with the New South Wales government in relation to this? Um, uh, so, Senator, certainly the, uh, uh, the sensitivity of, um, of community sentiment around water licences and the holdings of water licences is something the government uh, has been and is very conscious of. Uh, it was our government that uh, established the uh, register of ownership in relation to uh, water licences, uh, as uh, Mr Hamilton uh, indicated, and, uh, and that the ATO uh, plays a role in regard to, uh, to the maintenance of that 
uh, register and, uh, and the information that is uh, is provided there, so that there is transparency and uh, is often as is often the case when it comes to um, foreign ownership questions generally, uh, whether it be um, assets, land, or uh, uh, or assets such as water licences. Um, sometimes, once you have that degree of transparency, it becomes more evident that the degree of sensitivity and concern does not always match up with actually the share of holdings that, uh, that are held um, by, uh, by different uh, um, foreign entities or by foreign entities from particular nations that are identified as, uh, as causes of concern. Obviously, um, we may at the appropriate time be able to go to what the current ratios look like in, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, water licence holdings right now. Um, uh, but in terms of, uh, of further potential reforms around, uh, around those areas, as Mr Hamilton indicated, uh, there are um, uh, consultation arrangements um, uh, underway in, uh, in that regard and, uh, and happening. In fact, uh, I gather um, that, uh, that submissions, I think, on, um, uh, on that are due within four weeks. 25th of March. Uh, 25th of February. February, sorry. Um, so could you accommodate what the Minister was proposing, just to give perhaps the top five foreign jurisdictions that are in our water and the, and the percentages? Do you have that information available? I don't have that information to hand at the moment, Senator. We can take that on notice for you and we will look at the register of assets and see if that can provide some information for yeah, you. Yeah, I think I mean I think it's in the public domain. I just um, wanted yeah. perhaps to people who might be watching to get a, a, an understanding of the, who, who the top top owners are. Yeah. Point, the point is that it's a public register. Sure, no, and I, I get that. Okay, um, there's, there's uh, um, AAM Investment Group has just been awarded uh, uh, 65,000 hectares of land in the Northern Territory as part of the um, Ord <coughs> Irrigation Scheme, Ord 3 Scheme. Um, does FIRB, uh, does that invoke anything in, in respect of the FIRB because it's, it's, in, it's in effect an, an asset transfer that on the face of it would appear to be free? Um, I think that, that that investment group is Australian or registered in Australia, but I don't know whether the shareholdings are foreign or, or Australian. Has that come across your radar? Um, Senator, uh, um, it doesn't ring an immediate bell to me. Mm. Um, it could be will be media reports. Of course, as, as the committee knows, um, we are constrained in what we can comment on, even if sure. we were aware of it. Well, OK, but generically, Maybe you can have a look at that and just come back and, and generically advise the committee whether those sorts of transactions would normally invoke some sort of consideration by the FIRB, but not necessarily this one, but similar sorts of transactions. Yeah, as, as I said, Senator, there are a range of thresholds within the FATA that will trigger the attention mm. of the FATA and obligations under it. Um, uh, we can provide the committee with some information in relation to how that uh, translates to a range of sectors, yep. uh, which could provide the, the information you're seeking. Mm. Senator Patrick, what was the actual asset transferred, or what, what's what's the actual asset they've? Uh... Uh, it's land. Right. So it's a transfer of land. So it's so a transfer of ownership of yeah. that land. Well, yes. on, on face value, um, you know, we would be interested in that. Um, as I said, there are a range of thresholds in the FATA. They are lower for agricultural yep. land than they are for some other asset classes. Um, right. It's hypothetical, of course, it depends on the value of the transaction. Sure. But. Hey, sure. Senator, I'd just note too, we do have now a very active market scanning uh, function within the division. So where we're actively looking at those mm. sorts of transactions, what's reported in the media around things as well, and making sure um, that we're monitoring if they they do need to apply and when and if they do apply as well. So we are trying to look at that sort of and address those concerns which have been raised by people as well. Thank you. Can I just ask, sorry, with your indulgence, Senator Patrick, yes. when you're looking at the value thresholds, are you looking at the market value or the price paid? Um, is that a complicated question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 there are a number of thresholds, and, and some of them, some of them don't. They're not just. There are monetary thresholds um, that are reported to us. There are also thresholds around the level of control, um, 
uh, and they differ between sectors. I, uh, unfortunately, I would need to take that on no, notice to make sure no, no, I get a, a, a good just answer. Just answer. Senator Patrick. Uh, actually, that was it, that was it, uh, Chair. So I okay. think. Okay. Thank you, and Excellent. I thank Labor for their indulgence in respect of the plight of the crossbench. Well, you don't have to thank them. They didn't raise it with me. I did it <laughs> off my own bat. <laughs> OK, so who's seeking the call? We should do an early lunch if we're getting up to No, well, we're, um, so no more questions. Well, actually, I've got one question for in foreign investment. Uh, Mr Hamilton, uh, Ms Kelly, any recent trends that you can identify, perhaps over the last 12 months, in terms of the origin of new foreign investment into Australia? Are the sources of foreign investment undergoing some sort of change over the last, say, five-year five period? Yeah, I can answer that. So I'm going to give you a very high-level high level view of it. Um, over the last course of the last sort of five years or so, the big, the big change and trend internationally has been an adjustment in the nature of outbound Chinese investment. That's a global trend that we've seen uh, since around 2016, 2017, when globally Chinese outbound investment flows dropped by around 49%, I think, globally. And Australia experienced a very similar um, uh, drop, um, or, uh, drop in Chinese investment, which saw Chinese investment through the foreign investment process dropped from being our first or the highest in our list of foreign investors down to, uh, in our most recently published information, I think uh, uh, sixth highest um, uh, below a range of other countries with the top being the United States uh, at the moment. Um, that said, over the course of the last you know, couple of years, uh, you know, we can continue to see investment from, from, from China, that country and continue to imp uh, approve those investments. In the course of the last sort of six months or so, the biggest change for us in terms of general trends has been the, an international boom in mergers and acquisitions activity, particularly around infrastructure where uh, conditions have been right for a significant uh, number of very large transactions and a significant number in terms of the volumes of cases coming through as well. And that's been translated into our data in terms of just seeing very large numbers, so a very, a very large quantity of individual applications, uh, as well as some very big individual transactions as well. And that's a global trend, that, that kind of mergers and acquisitions boom. In, in the infrastructure space? Uh, particularly in infrastructure, but, I, right. but I, you know, I think that's probably... So a, when you a say infrastructure, what, what can you give us a bit more granularity? So every, well, I mean, everything from uh, energy uh, infrastructure through to transport infrastructure, um, you know, we, we see a large number of uh, transactions involving infrastructure, yes. Sydney Airport, as an Sydney example, would, you know, could, would be an example of transport. Just to start that, it says this related. The instrument that was brought in just after COVID to lower the, all the thresholds, that, that's expired now. Has it gone back to ops normal? So the, 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 there was a temporary zero dollar threshold, Senator, um, which reduced to zero dollar mm. um, the threshold. Triggers, for, yeah. So we screened everything. It's important to note, though, that when we reverted to the pre-existing thresholds, there were a range of those, we retained a new zero dollar threshold for anything relating to national security. Mm. And that was a new step that the government introduced from the 1st of January last year. So is that, how does that distinguish between critical infrastructure and national security? Are they one and the same or somehow related? Yeah. That, that, that's the way that we treat it, Senator. The way that the, the Act and the regulations work is on critical infrastructure, if you're covered by the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, you are a national security, okay. it's national that's security for our purposes. All right, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, another question I have is, do you, so you talk about inbound foreign investment, do you track disposals of uh, foreign owned assets within Australia? So you're talking about the evolution in foreign investment in terms of inbound investment. Presumably um, there's also potentially some sort of data in, in, in relation to which foreign owners are disposing of their interests in Australia and exiting Australia? That, that data is tracked as not, not by us as the regulator of foreign investment, but it is included in some data um, to sort of 
including the, the Bureau of Stats, which looks at the, the net movement of capital, which is the inbound right. foreign investment yeah. uh, minus the, the sort of the, the outbound flow. So that it's but not by us. So unfortunately, I can't help you with the, any data on that right now. Okay, that's okay. Uh, no other questions in this space. So we. Um, are people happy? Are you happy, to, Deputy Chair, to have a adjourn for lunch before we go on to the fiscal group? Yeah, sounds fine. Sorry, that sounds fine. That's okay. Okay, so I we did uh, cut short our morning tea, so people will get the benefit of uh, a bit extra time for lunch. So we'll come back at uh, at uh, two o'clock. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jeff. Thank Thanks, everybody. And meanwhile, I'll just go back to another committee. Oh, oh. listen to it. Oh. So we'll uh, recommence. We are now in the fiscal group. Uh, so welcome, Thank you. Ms Wilkinson. Uh, so Senator Faruqi, you've got the call um, for 10 minutes, quick 10 minutes, and then I'll go to you, Senator Gallagher. And thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, does the department have a full list of which private schools received JobKeeper payments and the amounts that were handed over to them? Uh, no, Senator, we don't have a list. We don't have the details of anyone who received JobKeeper. That's, um, JobKeeper was implemented by the ATO. Um, the ATO will be appearing um, in, uh, alongside Revenue Group uh, later this afternoon. Um, but we don't, that information is confidential. We don't have a list of um, entities that received JobKeeper. Okay, the, so just the stated purpose of JobKeeper payments, as I understand, has because your department were the architects of this, yes. uh, has been to keep struggling businesses afloat and to keep people employed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Is that what the purpose was? Um, well, yeah. Yes, uh, they were. Uh, they were the uh, the purposes of uh, of JobKeeper, but um, uh, JobKeeper was also extended to uh, not for profits uh, across uh, across the economy, recognising um, both the employment function, but also the uh, service provision uh, of those not-for-profits. So as the architect of this program, Ms Wilkinson, would you then accept that where, where the effect of JobKeeper payments really was actually at the end of the day, <coughs> it didn't pan out the way it was intended to for many organisations and especially for private schools, because they have actually reported surpluses to the effect in New South Wales of almost the exact amount of JobKeeper that they received. <clears throat> so, Senator, I guess all I can say is that the government's policy in designing JobKeeper, which was designed to be an economy-wide support program, uh, was to um, design a program that would provide support to businesses in particular situations and to not-for-profits in particular situations, and it was implemented, like the rules were made and were made clearly, and it was implemented by the ATO. Um, and in designing JobKeeper, and we had quite a long discussion about this towards the end of last year, um, uh, in, in thinking about the design of JobKeeper, um, there was no question there was a, an element of it which was about providing confidence to businesses and not-for-profits in a really uncertain environment about uh, how they were going to survive the next six months when it was just very un, un, very unclear what was going to happen. And in that case, it was unclear whether schools were going to be opened or closed. It was unclear as to whether not-for-profits would be able to raise um, the normal sorts of funds that they could raise through fundraising. There were just there were lots of different things that were very uncertain at the time. Private schools have reported surpluses during 2020, like millions of dollars, and they received millions of dollars in JobKeeper as well. Is that not misspending of public money? And will you ask those private schools to return those JobKeeper payments that are pretty much ballooning their surplus profits? Um, well, Senator, uh, the answer to your second question is no, um, uh, as, uh, as is consistent with the response the government's provided uh, right across the board in relation to JobKeeper, that we're not going to retrospectively uh, change the eligibility criteria for JobKeeper for those who received it across any sector of the economy. Now, we have acknowledged previously, Senator, that um, uh, as Ms Wilkinson said, JobKeeper was established um, at a time of enormous uncertainty uh, for 
many aspects of, uh, of the Australian economy and many entities involved in different areas of service provision. Um, it was established in a way to ensure that we could quickly end that uncertainty with, uh, by providing uh, entities with the confidence uh, that a funding stream was there to get them through uh, the period of, uh, of great uncertainty. That's what JobKeeper did. Um, uh, as has been acknowledged, a number of entities who received JobKeeper, um, some not-for-profit, such as those you're raising, some uh, indeed for-profit entities as well, did better than they had expected to when JobKeeper uh, was established. Now, that didn't change their eligibility because of the way in phase one JobKeeper was structured, uh, and it was structured in that way uh, deliberately to ensure ease of access for businesses, ease of access for other uh, not-for-profit entities, uh, and to provide that underpinning of confidence that they would get through that period um, of enormous uncertainty. Uh, now, uh, for those who uh, ended up not facing um, the significant economic or revenue hits uh, that, uh, that had been anticipated or feared by them at the time, um, uh, they have been in positions to uh, often reinvest, uh, to create more jobs in different ways, uh, and those things have helped parts of the economic recovery. So private schools will just pocket that profit. Okay, I'll move on. Um, Senator Mer Birmingham, you have, you not long ago, held the education portfolio. It's a little while um, ago now, Senator, but yes. Just, uh, yes. just today we have found out that I government funding, just in the scenario story on the front of- front page of the age that kind of took me back to my education portfolio. Yeah, I, I, about I, teaching I, I have, you know, have, you know, I have you kept it for a few minutes, so I'm just going to do that. Um, today we find out that government funding for private schools in Australia had has increased at nearly five times the rate of public schools. And this is, I'm asking this in the um, you know, context of um, JobKeeper and the millions that went to private schools. Just yesterday it was reported that some of Sydney's new schools built just a few years ago are bursting at the seams, and this I'm talking about public schools, while older schools in high growth areas of the city are at double or triple their enrollment caps and have more than 40 demountables. I mean, they're clearly underfunded. And at the same time, private schools like Mariah College received yep. 6.7 million in JobKeeper. Are you, do you think it's fair for public school students to be studying in demountables? Um. So I spent a decent chunk of, uh, of my schooling studying in a demountable at a, at a public school. Um, While private schools um, below gastro um, and swimming pools. Uh, uh, and, um, and indeed I've also visited plenty of, uh, of private schools that also use demountables. But regardless of the structure of, uh, of the building, Senator Faruqi, I'm not sure uh, over what timeline you're uh, giving your um, five times the growth figure. Uh, certainly That's my, over 10 years. Certainly my recollection... It doesn't really matter, does it? Um, certainly my recollection, uh, Senator, uh, of um, the funding profiles and growth rates from, uh, from uh, school reforms that, uh, and school funding reforms that were implemented when I was Minister was that some of the, uh, the growth rates and trajectories of growth for, uh, um, for much of the public uh, sector for funding to the states and territories for, uh, for their schools uh, was over the, uh, the remainder of uh, this decade uh, at a faster rate uh, than for, um, uh, for independence or the Catholic sector. Minister, JobKeeper for Wealthy Private Schools has really compound, compounded the vast inequality of public funding for schools. So as the leader of the government in the Senate, what are you going to do about it? Well, Senator, um, we addressed the JobKeeper equation specifically before. We've also during the course of the pandemic provided some uh, enormous additional assistance through, uh, through to the states and territories um, in a range of ways, usually targeted, but nonetheless helping their balance sheet uh, equations in, uh, in responding uh, and helping their ability to be able to, uh, to support other services that they provide, including uh, in education. Yet inequality is entrenching in public schools. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Chair. Um, hi, Ms Wilkinson. Thank you for coming. Um, not that you had a choice, but <laughs> we appreciate <laughs> it anyway. Come over <laughs> um, when was the 
department made aware that the budget was going to be brought forward to March the 29th? So, Senator, I, I think um, I, I think I became aware of that uh, roughly when the um, parliamentary calendar was published. Okay. Uh, uh, so I, I, I can take on notice exactly when that was, um, uh, but that's that's when I was made aware. No, I, I, I would have thought, in terms of for, for Ms. Wilkins and, and many, that would have been the, the final point of awareness. Um, I think in uh, in my department, uh, Senator, uh, certainly some um, scenario options mm -hmm. came through. Um, in terms of making sure that as, uh, as the government made decisions and, uh, and, as, the go and as the department uh, was ensuring that uh, all things around the need for appropriation, supply, etc., were, were contemplated through um, the scheduling of those arrangements. Um, uh, but that was the department um, being prudent in terms of, uh, of their um, providing advice and information that, uh, that could inform government to make sure that whatever decision we made about the sitting program and the date for the budget um, uh, was uh, was informed by uh, the consequential impacts of, uh, of those uh, decisions. Okay, <laughs> that's a long way, I think, of you saying the department well, the was government... ready for an early budget, but it wasn't confirmed until the sitting plan was, the sitting uh, the, calendar uh, was tabled, uh, is the, that correct? The, the, the departments are always uh, um, uh, very good at being ready for uh, for whatever circumstances come along, and, uh, and yep. yes. But that. I think the guidance that had been provided. What you're saying is that the government had essentially, um, whilst not confirming the date, had left the option of an early budget. An early budget was on the table as far as departments were concerned, yes. as had been publicly said by the prime minister and treasurer and myself. Okay. So whilst the option was there, you found out essentially when the, your evidence is when the sitting calendar was tabled, which Absolutely. is at the end of November. Yeah. Okay, so how did this, um, so you find out the budget's gonna be at the end of March, at the end of November. So how does that affect um, the budget schedule? The, how you manage to line up all the ducks to get a budget ready for delivery? Uh, so the main thing it affects is the timetabling of the decision-making process within government, so ERC meetings um, uh, and, and uh, the, um, the planning that we do around the production of the document. So um, as um, with, you know, when, when the date of my IFO is confirmed, when the dates of budgets are confirmed, we then do all of our planning around what that means for when decisions have to be taken and forecasts have to be finalised and um, uh, and all of that sort of thing that feeds into the budget process. Okay, so it's essentially shortened it by about five weeks or so, yeah. so usually in the first week, first or second week of May, yep. it brings it to the end of March. Yep. Um, so that, that series of meetings and productions of documents and decision trees and things like that all gets Get compressed. Okay, so... Get brought forward as well as... I mean, there's, there's probably a little bit of compression in there, but mainly it, it, these processes just start a bit earlier. Oh, okay. So instead of... I see. So basically you're in active budget putting together over December, January, are you? Um, so again, I mean, it's a bit of a rolling process. So we always, yeah. so we're always doing uh, macroeconomic forecasts over January in particular. Once we've got the, um, you know, we get the national accounts, September quarter national accounts at the beginning of December. That flows through into my EFO. Then, then we sort of, I mean, to be honest, Senator, it's not like it really stops a lot between mm. one cycle and the next. Um, at the beginning of every budget cycle, we have a new set of parameters that we have to provide to the Department of Finance. Yeah. And to, um, so, so that process just kind of continued. Was there a bit more work in January as a consequence? Yes, probably, though at the same time, we were of course also dealing with um, uh, Omicron and you know the sort of policy decisions around that. Okay, so... Um when when are final decisions taken for this year's budget? What do you have a deadline for when that has to be to work um, it through all your systems? Well, 
Yeah. What's the cutoff? There must be a budget cutoff point. No, well, I mean there are there are a series of budget cutoffs, and depending upon the you know, okay. pressures at the time, there's also certain you know flexibility. You can you can, you can apply yeah. some flexibility to. So obviously what are the there's, you know, Practical things like the actual printing of the budget papers that uh, um, that you know, needs to occur before the day, and uh, and the you know, the proofing and so on that goes into the days leading up to that, uh, Senator. Mm. Um, um, so, barring unforeseen circumstances, you try to minimise um, you know, decisions needing to be made uh, close to uh, to that timeline. Okay. So is that mid March that things have to be completed by? Well, you said there's a series of cutoffs. So, well, there's, can you explain to me? No, uh, there. I mean, there are Senator, but I also indicated there's you know, there's a degree of flexibility depending on you know, what pressures you're responding to at the time too. Agencies uh, not unreasonably want to, uh, want everything settled as early as possible, um, but sometimes there will be circumstances that necessitate um, yeah, later ERC meetings or considerations in the process. Okay, so I'm not going to get any dates out of you. I'm not going to say you know, this, right. is the, this is this All is right. the date, and from this date, then okay. you can sort of yep. um, have uh, the opposition or journalist quizzes and say, "Oh, we've well, already made all the decisions," because it, that may not actually mm. prove to be the case. Yeah. All right. Um, in your under your fiscal strategy, you say that the economic um, that changes um, your well that your fiscal strategy will move into the next stage when the economic recovery is secure and the unemployment rate is back to pre-crisis levels or lower. Um, can you tell the committee when um, you will meet that the criteria that the economic recovery is secure? Can you define that? Um, Senator, I think, um, I think uh, last time I was sitting here, um, we canvassed the fact that there's not going to be a, you know, a simple switch flicks, flicks from one stage to the other stage in terms of the, the fiscal strategy, that there is a, um, a gradual approach of, uh, of increasing confidence about the economic recovery, uh, of increasing confidence about where we and the world sit in relation to uh, the management of COVID-19 and the ongoing assessment of um, the economic outcomes that are being achieved. Uh, now, um, uh, Australia's economic recovery looks very strong uh, right now, um, and uh, and our employment circumstances are uh, incredibly strong, as uh, as Dr. Kennedy went through this morning. The uncertainty around COVID uh, remains, and the Omicron experience, um, not all of which has been reflected in uh, economic indicators to date, uh, but the Omicron experience is. Um, a reminder of the uncertainty uh, that we're dealing with there. Uh, but in terms of that transition to a more stable fiscal policy setting compared with where we were, that's evidenced by the type of significant step downs in spending that Dr Kennedy highlighted mm. in his uh, opening statement this morning. Okay, so will you update that in the budget, your fiscal strategy? to be more clear around when you move to the medium term fiscal strategy? Um, well, we obviously review all of those statements and settings in, uh, in the context of, uh, of the budget um, and, uh, and would be uh, continuing, uh, no doubt, to, uh, to highlight and to talk about um, the areas of the economic recovery plan, um, but also how that intersects with, uh, with the fiscal strategy. Okay, so you will be updating it. Um, well, will you be? Well, 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 Senator, I can't. Don't don't take. You know, we will be. You know, we review all of the text in the budget papers um, before a new set of budget papers uh, um, it comes out. Um, whether that text changes um, is a decision the government takes through the budget yeah, process. Yeah, sure. I don't know why that would be so. Difficult to say if you were going to update your fiscal strategy, though. Like that's well, well, it's a because I, I'm always conscious as to how the words I use at these committees are then interpreted um, or portrayed by others, and I wouldn't want to create the expectation that uh, um, you know, the government is going to change its fiscal strategy by responding to 
a question from you of will the government review its fiscal strategy? And if I say yes, um, then well, you somebody did say takes yes, that. Effectively. I said, uh, yeah. I said, of course, we review you up, yeah. everything that's yeah. in the budget papers. So you did say yes papers, to that. You didn't tell me if it was I, going to be I updated. But I put it in the context very clearly that mm. that's not necessarily to say that the fiscal strategy changes. Okay. Will you be up front in the budget about um, where your spending restraint, which seems to be something that you are pursuing in terms of what I've picked up over the last two days, Will you be clear about where your spending restraint will be coming from and when in the budget? Uh, uh, yes, Senator, the budget will be um, a transparent reflection of, uh, um, of the government's uh, intent in relation to uh, both uh, payments and receipts. Um, so uh, so um, in that regard, the budget will update those figures that, uh, that Dr Kennedy gave about the scale of step down in, uh, in payments and spending uh, uh, through this year, next year, and then of course what it looks like across uh, the forward estimates. Um, and, uh, and we'll identify uh, uh, if and where we are pursuing any savings, just as it will identify if and where we are uh, having to address any additional expenditure. Okay, so um, I think it was in Dr Kennedy's opening remarks where uh, he, and I presume, I think under your fiscal strategy, you talk of um, spending, continue, well, I think the quote is, continued support at crisis levels. Is that what you would describe as that 31.6% of um, payments per share of GDP? Is that, I think that's where it peaked, isn't it? So that's, the crisis level of spending. That's uh, that that uh, that peak in 2020-2021. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, certainly is a okay. reflection of the crisis level of spending. And then it goes to 26.5 per cent in 24-25. So as you bring in the new fiscal year, will that continue that tra trajectory down? So you're going to go below 26.5. Um, well, Senator, uh, I mean, I'm always eager to see us um, uh, reduce payments as a share of the uh, of the economy uh, as much as we possibly can, uh, and um, uh, the efforts made uh, in my EFO uh, in uh, in the previous budget have shown an improved trajectory in terms of uh, of the budget uh, outlook, and uh, from that improved trajectories for gross and net debt, which. Uh, uh, highlighted at pages 64 and 65 uh, of the MyEFO papers. Um, and if we can build further on that in, uh, in this budget, uh, yes, we will be looking to, uh, to do that in terms of, um, of uh, the implementation of that second phase of, uh, of the fiscal strategy, um, which as I emphasised before, uh, isn't uh, something that will be a, a sudden um, consolidation that in any way could jeopardise or harm economic growth. Uh, it is, uh, is a fact that uh, our pursuit of uh, maximising economic growth uh, remains a priority, consistent with uh, that stated budget strategy to reduce the share of um, the deficit uh, as a proportion of uh, the size of the economy over time. And so do you have a target there of where you would like payments to get to, noting that you've been, you haven't really been able to, what are you, I'm just looking at your um, payments as a share of GDP. In 2019, they were 27.7%. Uh, so yeah, so um, that was pre-COVID. Senator, you, you, well, six you, months you, you of COVID quizzed on that. that a little bit earlier today um, in terms of yeah. the likely you know, range there yeah. for the operation of payments. Yep. Um, now, this, is, of course, is as a share of GDP. So there's uh, there's two factors that yeah, influence sure. that. There is you know, there's the quantum of actual payments, and then there's the size of the economy. Yep. Um, and we've indicated that uh, that we, um, you know, whilst we will look for savings where savings can reasonably be pursued, and we will be transparent about that uh, in the budget if there are any savings that are being pursued, uh, we don't see 
uh, that there will be uh, abrupt or, uh, or sudden uh, shocks uh, or adjustments in relation to, uh, uh, to those payments, uh, that bringing them down off the elevated peaks is, uh, is the priority back to a normalised level representing the, the normal and, uh, and core functions of, uh, of government. Um, but our priority is on maximising economic growth and the size of the economy and the more successful we can be uh, in that, uh, then the lower uh, that uh, those payments will be okay. as a share of the economy. So if you've got savings, you will be upfront about it? Yes, sir. Um, because, okay, um, I think in the 2019 campaign, which is a similar situation, um, you released additional savings that weren't in your budget um, as part of your costings two days out from the election. Um, so is that an approach you would take again? Considering the budget is so close to when the election will be being called. Uh, well, Senator, I would, uh, I would expect that we will overwhelmingly, uh, um, well, we will reflect the position of the government at the time the budget is handed down in the budget. Um, uh, now, there is an election campaign to follow. Mm. Um, I'm sure we will both have things to say during that election campaign. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it won't be the case that uh, the government has nothing to say from budget day to election day uh, in I'm terms not, of I'm not other policy that. proposals or the like. Um, and so if there are other things we have to say, yeah. well, we will account for those. Well, you said you were going to be upfront about savings, but in yeah. 2019, you weren't upfront. You put the savings that you were going to seek <laughs> in your election costings that were released a day or two days before polling day, they didn't feature in the budget. Oh, the Senator, uh, Senator, uh, well, not all uh, of them did. That's what I'm saying. There, 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 the there, there were savings in the budget, insofar as there were additional um, um, commitments made during the campaign. They were then, it was then identified how they'd be paid for. Uh, okay, so sort of a commitment that if there's savings they'll be in the budget but you reserve your right to have additional savings announced as part of the election campaign you will be trying to reduce your spending further but we'll have to wait till the budget for that and we'll have to wait to see whether you revise your fiscal plan at budget time too summary not, not for the first time today senator yes you'll have to wait for the budget to see what's in the budget um, <laughs> just trying to get a steer. Um, I have some other questions about uh, the ACT housing debt, which I've pursued here, Last time. I think, a couple of times. Um, and I just want to see if there's any further progress around that. Um, the ACT owes the Commonwealth in it, one of it, its major housing debt with the Commonwealth is in the order of 98.3 million. Um, they're paying an interest rate at the moment of 4.5% on that. Um, last estimates we discussed various requests from the ACT government to refinance this loan. Um, and Minister, you said you'll look into it and come back to the committee. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure I've heard back. In fact, I'm pretty definite that I haven't heard back. <laughs> Um, this was at the end of October. You said, I'll look back to it and come back to you. Look into it and come back to you. The short version is the ACT government, I think, has written six times to the Commonwealth seeking to refinance its loan, and they have yet to get a response. Uh, Damien White, First Assistant Secretary, Commonwealth State Popula and Population Division. Um, Senator, after you asked that question at last estimates, uh, we have talked to the ACT Treasury. Uh, the last of those six letters was, I think, 18 months ago. It might be a bit longer now. So I think in 2020 was the last time there was a letter written, I think, by the Chief Minister. Um, and as I said last time, as a result of those, we forgave uh, or allowed an early repayment, I think, of a of a small amount of housing debt, only a few million dollars, and there's about a hundred million dollars remaining. Uh, I think. Sorry, can you tell me? So, on one of the other loans, you've allowed, you've forgiven one of their other loans. I think there was there's a number of loans, Senator. There are, yeah. Um, and I think we we allowed 
we allowed early repayment, I think, of two of them. As I said, it was only about, it's about four or five million dollars. It was a small amount. And the rest of the loans add up to just short of a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Uh, so our treasurer agreed to allow that early repayment of those small amounts. I think he's made it quite clear to the ACT that he is not, uh, not uh, looking at the other $100 million at the moment. I accept, though, I don't think he's actually written back formally okay, to those, so how's those letters. So how has he relayed that to uh, the So I suspect our out. Treasurer and the ACT Chief Minister have had a number of conversations over time about this issue. And since we raised with the ACT Treasury uh, after Senate estimates about the state of play, we've seen nothing from the ACT uh, Treasury or the, or the Chief Minister since. So you went to the AC. So there's six letters. None of them have been replied to. So we've got that on the record. And because the ACT government hasn't pursued it in a seventh letter in the last 18 months, uh, that's it's the balls in their court, is it? So, but Senator, as I said, we did actually forgive part of the debt, and so I, susp I think that uh, as a result of that transaction, and that we didn't do anything about the rest of the debt. Uh, yes, it is in their court to come back again if they wish to pursue it. So is it your understanding that, um, so was it Treasury's advice to the Treasurer that those smaller loans be repaid or be allowed to be paid out early? Um, and what did that cost the Commonwealth by doing that? Uh, I would have to go back and look, Senator, I'd take that on notice about what exactly we we suggested, uh, because it was only a few million dollars and because it was only the term of those loans only had, I think, about 18 months to run, uh, it did not cost the Commonwealth very much. Okay. Um, it was, it was, so the difference in interest rates was about, I think those ones were about 12% interest rates they were, they were being paid out and we let them about a, uh, as I said, about 18 months early, so I'd have to go back and check, but it was like, I think it was less than a million dollars that... It would have that, cost you yeah. in, in foregone Yeah, exactly payments. right. Okay, if you could take that on notice, um, that would be useful. Yeah. So was that your advice to the Treasurer? Sorry, I didn't catch that if you uh, answered it. So I'd have to go back and check, Senator. It was a while back about what exactly we provided, so I can take on notice that okay. along with the other so question. So did the Treasurer say to you, look, I'm not going to waive the 100 million, but... If we can give them something, what you know, work up an alternate plan uh, to toss them some crumbs. No, no, I don't. I wouldn't quite characterise it like that. I think he looked at. It is compared to the Tasmanian deal. Uh, yes, there was a different Tasmanian deal, Senator. Yeah, I agree. That, that was the price of a vote in the Senate. That one. Um, but yeah, my recollection, Senator, was that he basically mm -hmm. agreed. I think along with the finance minister. Uh, who's, I think the finance minister has the actual decision of making in these arrangements to forgive debts, uh, that they would forgive that small number of millions of dollars and that they, the other hundred million dollars or so uh, would be left as it was. Okay, so you don't see the hundred million dollar request or the request to refinance uh, that loan as an active matter under consideration at the moment is your evidence, I think. No, and we made that clear to the ACT Treasury. Oh, I made that clear to the ACT Treasury, Senator. To the head of the Treasury uh, there? So not to the head of the Treasury, but what, to basically a people at person at my equivalent level, yeah. Okay, all right. So you've said to them that's all you're getting and um, I said that we've made the decision about the four million. If they want to re-prosecute the 100 million, we think it's in their court. We're not actively considering okay. it. And were, were you of the understanding that the, uh, the position the ACT put was a commitment that if, if the loan was able to be um, refinanced or waived, that the ACT's commitment would be to reinvest the money gained through those, that arrangement into further housing programs, including social housing in the ACT? Uh, yes, Senator, there was a promised by the ACT government to do something like that. I wouldn't know if yeah. that's exact, the exact specifics, but a thing along those lines, yes. Yeah, and so did the Treasurer consider that at any stage about the, the value in, in um, entering into an agreement where money would, instead of just paying the Commonwealth back, the ACT would actually spend that money on improving social housing in the ACT? Uh, uh, do you know if he considered that? I don't know exactly, but uh, he, I would assume he knew the contents of the letter which spelt out what the ACT were offering. Okay, so 
even though there's a, a housing crisis right across the country, the Commonwealth would still prefer that the ACT just keeps paying back its loan in the way that it was originally uh, designed, what, 20, 40 years ago? Um, How long, when was that loan from? I don't know, Senator, but it was, it was quite a while ago. But as we talked about at the last estimates, the interest rates on those loans were set when uh, the loans were given and reflected market rates at that time. So we're not making a profit on them, given we borrowed no. then. No, I'm and not. there is a cost to us for giving those loans as well. For what's the cost of, of that? Ah, so we would forego the interest that we would have otherwise received. Oh, for, for waiving those or, yes, or allowing right. the refinancing. Yep. Yeah, exactly. But what would that be on a $100 million loan over? I don't know how long that one's got to go, but. I'm not about to have a guess. At, I don't have that number with me, Senator. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, in the context of the Commonwealth budget, it wouldn't be a very large number, would it? Uh, well, I would suspect it would be a smallish number of millions, but as I said, I don't have the number. Okay. Minister, um, has this crossed your desk at all? Um, um, uh, look, any, like, have you if, considered I'm, this? I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of, uh, of Mr White's observation that in uh, insofar as any element of, uh, of waiver may have occurred, it, it might have crossed my desk. I'm not actually remembering that, so I would have to, uh, have to double check uh, in, uh, in that regard. Um, the uh, whilst finance has uh, has the um, has the technical responsibility as it relates to debt waivers and so on, we would in matters like this um, you know, refer to the advice and so on of uh, of a relevant portfolio department in terms of the handling of it. And, uh, and obviously, uh, those decisions uh, have been made as, uh, as Mr. White has outlined. I mean, if we were to if we were to waive that debt altogether, um, well, then that you know, obviously then um, continues to sit um, uh, indefinitely, therefore, on, uh, you know, on our debt books. Um, it's not like uh, the Commonwealth is, uh, is riding high with significant um, surplus positions at present, Senator. No, I understand that too, but you've got an offer here from a, a government to refinance, waive, enter into some discussion about how to manage this, and a promise to reinvest it in improving social housing stock. I would have thought the Commonwealth would have an interest in that too. Um, uh, well, look, I think I mean, the issues as, uh, as put by the ACT have obviously been considered um, you know, through, uh, through the work of uh, NIFIC. Uh, we are uh, supporting investment in, uh, in housing stock uh, right around the country. And uh, um, I forget whose question it was. I think it might have been one of Senator McKim's uh, ideological rants earlier, um, uh, in which case, where I didn't quite get in, uh, in terms of the response I provided uh, around the increasing rates of first home ownership that our policies are, uh, are achieving too. Okay. So, um, Senator Lambie managed to get a $157 million housing debt waived in Tasmania for her vote on a particular bill. Do I have to become an independent in order to get the ACT's housing debt waived? I mean, is that what has to happen? Uh, well, uh, well, Senator, um, uh, I'd always welcome the opportunity to discuss with you uh, the passage of, uh, of legislation. Um, uh, but isn't I, that the problem uh, I wasn't, here? I wasn't party to uh, discussions uh, with Senator Lambie or the Tasmanian government but you know uh, that's in, what happened. Uh, in relation to, uh, to previous matters around Tasmania. But you know that's what happened. You were in the Senate. She voted with you, I think, on Medivac or some aspect of Medivac, you waived $157 million worth of housing debt, yet the ACT government has engaged over a number of, well, since that time, to see if we could have theirs waived or refinanced and reinvested back into social housing. But is it, I'm a Labor senator, so that doesn't, that doesn't float with the government. No, Senator, I mean, exactly I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there are, I mean, I mean, there are, uh, I think, in terms of uh, of um, housing policy, housing challenges, uh, and the like, um, some fairly significant uh, differences in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, Tasmania and the ACT. Um, Come on! I'm, it wasn't so done on I a policy I wasn't, analysis. I wasn't part of, uh, Come on. of 
the deliberations or decision at the time, but uh, but I think that's fairly self-evident. Mm. Okay, so if you're an independent, you have a much better chance of getting your state's housing debt waived than if you're in the opposition. I think that's that's the answer. No. Which is, Sen it's, it's not policy based and it's not fair. Thanks, Senator, the, the issues have been considered at different times in, uh, in relation to, uh, to the merits surrounding them and, uh, and obviously the decisions made. Okay, so it's over to the ACT government to re-agitate on that front, Mr White. If, uh, if, if that's to reopen that chestnut, it's coming back raise, to your desk. States can raise issues at any point with yeah, us, Senator. Because you don't have an active file. You consider it closed, uh, stamped yeah. closed. Uh, exactly, Senator. We, yeah, it's in their court. Do you have a closed stamp that you've... No, Senator. Okay. <laughs> it's in the closed file, filing cabinet. Um, showing my age there. Okay, can I ask a couple of questions? I don't have many more for fiscal, you'll be pleased to know, so I don't know if other people do. Um, okay. Um, about JobMaker, mm -hmm. the final numbers for JobMaker, or as up to date as you have. Environment, Industry and Infrastructure Division. Mm -hmm. uh, so as of the 31st of January, uh, we've had 3,911 entities um, with payments dispersed in respect of 7,357 newly eligible employees. Newly eligible? Did you it's say? Sorry, newly hired eligible newly, employees. Sorry. Newly hired. So that is the total number for the program um, as at 31st of January. Uh, okay, so that is from... Is that my, my recollection right from October 2020? Uh, Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think the last time we met there had been 5,278 employees. I think that was the last estimates. So that 7,357 is a cumulative total of that figure. That's right. That's the number of new, it's the number of new hires who have been yeah. supported through this program. That's yeah, right. from the beginning to the 31st of January. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so it has fallen well short, I think, of expectations. Um, in the I think in the budget it was said that this will support around 450,000 jobs for young people. Has there been a review, or, or have you? Um, reviewed this program or is it education's job to do that? So no this is a program that we're responsible for okay. um, and we certainly looked at it, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was in the lead up to uh, budget last year and um, by that stage it was clear that the take up had been much less than we'd expected. I think we've had discussions at estimates um, over time about the different reasons why it was very much lower uh, than expected. Um, and there were a range of different factors, including, for example, very early on, some, some of the very large employers said that they didn't feel like they uh, needed to participate in the program. Um, and so immediately that, 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 you know, there are lots of new hires in places like supermarkets, for example, and, and, and the, the supermarkets decided they didn't want to participate. Um, we have also talked about the fact that at the same time uh, there have been a range of other supports for employment which and, and in particular the um, apprenticeship programs okay. um, which um, and and I would suggest that some of the demand that could have gone to this program has probably gone into uh, apprenticeships um, uh, instead um, uh, and and as we've had discussions again, I think in this in these estimates around the fact that you know the um, the program was very clearly designed to make sure that it um, only supported additional employees and it wasn't used to churn employees by employers. And um, you know we certainly received some feedback from small businesses, for example, that that they felt that that was quite an onerous. Uh, it placed some onerous requirements upon them uh, to work out how to engage with the program. So there was a, 
I, mean, I think we've talked before about yeah, yeah. the integrity yeah. concerns around any of these sorts of yeah. programs and, and it's hard getting the balance right. Um, and a range of those things have just meant that the take-up has been much less. Uh, sorry, and I, of course, the, and the fact that the economy has grown very much more strongly than we expected. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in a sense that the need for a subsidy in order to bring on new hires has been much, much less than less than you thought in October. Right. What oh, oh, it was costed, I think, at four four billion dollars. So you know, last you budget, um, the you, you the, revised it. Didn't it you? was revised down. To um, yeah, to ninety three million dollars. Ninety three million, and are you revising it down any further? Uh, well, we'll certainly be looking at the estimate as we feed into this year's budget. Okay. But, but if you is it it's lower than you thought again? I think yeah. it's I think it's reasonable to say that yeah that again. So it'll be so revised thing, down further. It's well, certainly not the, being revised up, is it? So, so one of the things we've observed through the program has um. So there's been lower take up, but it's also we've observed that um, some employees who've come on and we expected them to stay for the full four quarters that they could get support for, and some of them have moved on to other jobs. So just the the amount of turnover in the labour market has also meant that we there aren't the same we're not getting the same um, sort of cumulative impact of new hires on the, the cost of the program. Yeah, I should and, just and, and, and I, I just observed that I mean in terms of a program not not meeting its projections and forecasts. Um, yeah, this is an area where it is, you know, what the government would say, a very good outcome. I mean, we're happy not to have to spend the money and still see youth unemployment, um, you know, not only not having worsened from a recession, but actually having improved straight off the back of, uh, of a recession. So we'll see in the budget the, what, what you reconcile that for the yeah, there'll, final... There'll be updated yeah, for, this for, for the final program. year of the program. Yep, okay, thank you. Jeez, that's your okay, thanks very much. Um, I just had about five minutes still on uh, fiscal. fiscal. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if I just before uh, you commence, Senator Chisholm, if I can just say to our witnesses for the next session, uh, we'll probably we'll be commencing your session in uh, in five minutes. So if you could just stand by, thank you, Senator Chisholm. Thanks. Just had some questions about small business support. So specifically focused on. Uh, generally the proposal by the New South Wales State Government uh, and it was reported by, it was reported that they asked the Morrison Government to help fund a small business support package. Was Treasury made aware of this request? Uh, so the Government shared 50-50 in the um, support packages that were rolled out by State Governments through the Delta wave last year, uh, through that first lockdown. Um, uh, are you talking about a more recent? Yeah. So okay. in in January uh, this year, it was reported that the New South Wales government had asked the Morrison government to help fund uh, more small business report support. So uh, I, I think I, I think I was aware of that. But did you were you asked to do any work on what that proposal would look like? Uh, no, I don't recall being asked to do any specific work on it, no. Okay, so there was never a request from, I presume, the Minister's office to say, can you have a look at what this proposal would look like? I don't, I don't recall so, no. Okay. Um, so you've got no idea what the Commonwealth share of that New South Wales proposal would be? No, I don't. Sorry, Senator. Okay. Um, on the 26th of January, it was reported that the federal government has directly rejected a request by the New South Wales Premier to help with the revised assistance scheme. Uh, and on the 31st of January, Matt Keane wrote to the federal treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, calling for more support. Um, did Treasury provide any advice on the request made by the New South Wales government before this? Before the before the letters were received. Yes. Uh, no, I mean, I, so Treasury has of course provided advice um, to the Treasurer. You know, through through the last six months, there've been you know a number of different um, discussions around assistance, whether it's for individuals or for households or for businesses. Um, uh, but I don't. Uh, there wasn't a specific discussion around this particular request. Okay. No. So, the, so the letter from the treasurer never made it to the letter from the New South Wales treasurer 
never made it to the department. Can I just check with... No, I think the letter did make it to the department, Senator. Right. But it wasn't given to the department and said, can you guys have a look at this and how much we would have to contribute or something like no, that? No, that's ones. right. So letters, so letters that come that uh, relate to, in that case, my division, uh, get sent down to us uh, as a matter of course. Sometimes they come with instructions, sometimes they just turn up. Okay. Um, so the decision, it's fed, the, the federal government rejected the request. That would be accurate, Minister? Um, uh, um, yes, Senator Richardson, uh, um, uh, the government did uh, decline that request from New South Wales. So we have uh, provided uh, enormous uh, support, so more than $300 billion and more than 360 to uh, the latest estimate, Ms Wilkinson, a uh, billion dollars across, uh, across the economy, the vast bulk of that in terms of uh, economic support that can then underpin uh, the health responses across the economy. Um, uh, we've, uh, we've done um, far more in that space uh, and in our total COVID support than states and territories, uh, as Ms Wilkinson said. We, uh, we did targeted packages on a 50-50 basis uh, with different states and territories, including New South Wales, during the lockdowns that occurred uh, last year uh, and in response to, uh, to those. Um, but uh, it was our view uh, that, uh, that uh, in relation to proposals at this time, uh, if different states felt there were uh, targeted areas of assistance that they should provide in, uh, in their states, that was to be welcomed, that they might uh, do that uh, and provide some support given the scale that we have provided, that we are continuing to provide uh, through various uh, support for the economy, uh, be it the type of loss carry back or investment incentive arrangements I spoke about earlier, or the ongoing flow through of support to the construction sector, or the support for apprenticeship programs and, uh, and people in training, or a range of other measures that are uh, providing assistance uh, to, uh, to states and territories um, that, uh, that uh, we didn't see a need for the Commonwealth to, uh, to partner on uh, that particular proposal. So, but it, it's the decision to reject the proposal wasn't based on advice of Treasury. That's correct, Minister? It's specific advice in relation to the proposal. Uh, Senator, um, uh, um, um, the uh, Treasurer uh, has, and, uh, and the PM and I are uh, privy to uh, the discussions with um, uh, Dr Kennedy uh, um, from time to time about uh, the degree of support or stimulus or assistance that, uh, that uh, he believes may be necessary uh, across the economy, uh, and we have uh, have uh, those opinions and that analysis, including the analysis provided by the Reserve Bank and uh, other agencies, to inform our opinions on uh, on these sorts of, uh, of matters. Uh, but uh, I mean, we uh, since the start of the pandemic have d delivered more than 63 billion dollars in uh, in direct economic and health support to New South Wales. Uh, activity alone, um, uh, including jointly funding a range of, uh, of measures uh, with the New South Wales government. Uh, and it's crucial not just on term in the areas of business and economic support that I spoke about before, but also to remember uh, that we uh, have also been and still are uh, paying the $750 uh, pandemic leave disaster payment uh, to people in New South Wales and around the country. Uh, that was part of a discussion um, um, had by National Cabinet quite some time ago where it was agreed the Commonwealth would, uh, would provide direct income support, um, states would provide more targeted business support. Yes, for the lockdown periods we went 50-50 with the states on that, uh, but, uh, but we don't see the need for us to, uh, to do that uh, in the current environment. Uh, on the 30th of January this year, the New South Wales Treasurer uh, said when announcing their package I was hoping to make this announcement standing beside the Prime Minister today, the Prime Minister today and the Treasurer and Treasurer Frydenberg, but they're not to be found. Um, so in terms of the decision by the federal government it, it not to provide support to the New South Wales state government, um, it wouldn't have mattered what their proposal was. It, a blanket decision was made that we're no longer going to provide support 
uh, two state governments along these lines, no matter what persuasion or what the proposal was? Uh, well, Senator Chisholm, to, uh, to paraphrase uh, former Prime Minister Paul Keating, never stand between a state premier or a state treasurer and a bucket of money. Um, uh, we, uh, there's, never, um, uh, there's never a shortage of desire from the states and territories uh, for the Commonwealth to pay for things. Um, uh, the Commonwealth budget, as we were discussing before, uh, is in significant deficit. Indeed, we've recorded the largest deficits in the nation's peacetime history uh, to get us through the global pandemic of COVID-19. Um, so there can be um, no questioning the scale of economic response that, uh, that the Commonwealth Government has applied uh, to support the health outcomes and business and household outcomes to get through the pandemic. Um, uh, we have always weighed carefully uh, the types of responses necessary at different points in time, um, but uh, our judgment uh, in relation to essentially the current point in time and that request uh, that came from New South Wales was that we still had significant support flowing from the Commonwealth for businesses, uh, for small businesses as well, through things like our SME recovery loan scheme, uh, through other areas of economic support and stimulus across the economy. For households of which uh, the pandemic leave disaster payment, uh, we've seen more than $221 million uh, distributed in New South Wales alone through that, uh, that payment um, uh, and that uh, we're also mindful, as I said, of, uh, of um, the fact that uh, although Omicron was having a pressurised situation for certain businesses, uh, we need also to be mindful of the extent to which we, um, uh, we uh, continue to stimulate aspects of, uh, of the economy and to balance those considerations too and that if there was really targeted areas for support. We welcome the fact that New South Wales or any other state government steps up to the plate, um, given the scale of support that we've provided relative to what they've done to date. Um, just, just on other states and territories, are you, are you aware if any other uh, states or territories have approached the federal government in a similar way that New South Wales government have this year? Uh, I don't think there's been anything, um, um, anything like uh, what New South Wales necessarily proposed, but um, I mean, have have other states and territories asked for Commonwealth uh, uh, funding or support in in different ways? Well, um, yeah, it does the sun rise each morning? Thanks, Chair. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Senator Chisholm. Right. So we'll um, we'll now move on to our next group. So thank you, Ms. Wilkinson, for joining us today in your offices. Thank you very much. And we'll ask the revenue group to come forward to the table. Commissioner Jordan, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can, Chair. Excellent. Uh, Commissioner Johns, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm just... Uh, waiting for our next witnesses from Treasury to join us. Just whilst I'm waiting, Commissioner Jordan, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Chair, um, I do not have uh, an opening statement, but I just wanted to comment that I had been very much looking forward to uh, being there in person um, uh, to attend, but uh, yet again, uh, interstate people were um, suggested uh, not come and do it virtual. So maybe one day, uh, this year at least, we can uh, all be there in person. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I just wanted to say too that, uh, look, uh, obviously uh, we've had a very productive period at the ATO since the last estimates. In December we published our um, seventh annual report on corporate tax transparency, uh, which uh, demonstrated a, quite an encouraging trend towards improved voluntary compliance uh, among large corporates. We had another record tax, record tax time for 2021 and facilitated more than 20 billion in refunds to millions of taxpayers. Uh, and we've continued to oversee me measures and provide assistance to those who are still experiencing uh, some pressure or hardship as the pandemic enters its, its third year. So just a couple of little snapshots and I'd be happy uh, to go straight to questions uh, from the committee. Excellent, Commissioner Jordan. And just before we introduce the other witnesses, uh, uh, can I just pay my compliments to your team? 
Um, I've actually gotten feedback from uh, small businesses in, in my patch uh, who've been dealing with the ATO and um, uh, they greatly appreciate the, the practical assistance that's, uh, that's been provided. And um, if I could also, wearing my chair of the Economics Legislation Committee hat, uh, compliment the members of your staff who have been working on the, uh, the Collective Investments Corporation, the new vehicle that's been established, um, which is a very complicated area. And I think, again, the outstanding job was, uh, was done in that regard. So thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner well, Johnston. Thank you, Senator. Um, you wouldn't want to stand on rooftops and shout that or something about our... I thought I just did, Commissioner <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> Um, but happy to do so again, and happy. Um, feel free to send a megaphone through to my uh, my suite. I'll use it. Uh, Commissioner Johns, do you have any opening statement to make? Uh, on this occasion, no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Mrakovic. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today with uh, your officers. So we'll uh, go to questions. Jenny. Thanks, Chair. Senator McAllister. Thanks. Um, I asked the Secretary about this, Ms Marakovic, and he referred me to you. Um, newspapers on Monday carried a story saying that Treasury analysis suggested that uh, women have been the big beneficiaries of our tax cuts. I wanted to understand the origins of that analysis. Uh, when was that requested and what was it that Treasury actually produced? Um, Mary Ann Rackbeck, Deputy Secretary of Revenue Group. Mm. Um, uh, Senator, I'm aware of the newspaper articles. Um, so uh, the only gender analysis um, that uh, I'm aware of that Treasury's done has been in respect of the lower middle income tax offset and that information that was provided in the women's budget statement uh, last year. We have not provided uh, any gender analysis on the tax uh, system or the entirety of the personal income tax plan or uh, anything like that. Um, we have provided some cameos that illustrate hypothetically the interactions of the tax system with the benefits of the childcare subsidy. Those were not gender specific. Um, you might be aware of the kind of cameo analysis that we do, which essentially goes to trying to illustrate the interaction of um, for taxpayers generally, mm. um, a hypothetical taxpayer, um, and how um, on a particular, on a, on a certain uh, wage, uh, the interaction of the personal tax rates and, as I said, welfare payments might impact on them. So we did provide some cameos. Right. So when um, the material, uh, when the journalist described this as unpublished treasury analysis, um, there, your evidence is that there is in fact no unpublished gender analysis on uh, overall on the tax system subsequent to what was provided back in the women's budget statement. So, Senator, I think that the news reports um, referred to both Treasury and ATO analysis, um, and I might also defer to my ATO colleagues, um, but. Um, the analysis that we provided um, was, as I mentioned, the Lamito analysis in last year's budget statement and the cameos that I've referenced. Right, OK. Um, well, I might ask colleagues at the ATO, Commissioner, are you aware of the unpublished, of any unpublished analysis in relation to the tax system and women? Uh, I am not, but I'll pass over to Second Commissioner Kirsten Fish. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator. Kirsten Schiff, Second Commissioner for Law, Design and Practice. Uh, Senator, uh, not uh, so much unpublished analysis as such. Um, the ATO obviously provides a considerable amount of anonymised tax and super data generally to stakeholders. Um, the ATO has regularly reported and provided the uh, Treasurer's Office uh, with data on Lamito and personal tax cuts. Um, that regular reporting was on a, a fortnightly basis. Um, during January, the Treasurer's Office did ask for more detail on the data we were already providing. Uh, and in particular, the Treasurer's Office requested uh, the Lamita on personal tax cut data be split by 
gender and uh, age cohort, and that was provided to the Treasurer's office in February. Right, okay. So when the Treasurer um, tweeted that young women have been big beneficiaries of our tax cuts, um, what was he referring to? What, what is relative to whom and over what period? I think he's referring, I mean, Senator, in, in terms of a statement like that, he's referring to um, the facts about uh, the reduction in tax rates that, uh, that our government has, uh, has delivered. Right, so if lots of women are, for example, on low incomes and there's a low and middle income tax offset, women will benefit from it as a consequence of being on low incomes. Is that what you're saying? From, from different components of, of stage one and stage two of, uh, of the tax reforms. Right, and so when the Treasurer said on average that $3,130 less tax is being paid by more than five million women, using that same measure, how many men would be paying less tax? Uh, well, Senator, unless somebody has that figure to hand, I'll have to take it on notice. Right. What's the average amount less tax that men are paying? Again, Senator, unless somebody at the table has that figure to hand, I'll have to take Did it on you notice. you publish the, the data that the Treasurer is relying on for these claims? Um, uh, well, Senator, uh, Senator, it sounds like the Treasurer has, uh, has drawn upon uh, information from, uh, from the agencies across his portfolio to, uh, to be able does. to, uh, to uh, identify um, what has been delivered. The simple reality is that mm. you lower the tax rates, people are going to be paying less tax. Yes, um, and so, I mean, occasionally journalists get confused, don't they? But, I mean, when, when the newspapers published information suggesting that there was unpublished Treasury analysis. Where did they get that impression? Do you think the Treasurer told them that uh, the work done in his office was Treasury analysis? Do you think he accurately represented it? Well, Senator, I think, uh, I think you've just heard from both, uh, both uh, Treasury and the ATO in, that in different ways they, uh, they do provide uh, analysis and information to the Treasurer. Mm. Cameos, which provide a hypothetical exploration of an individual. I mean, I, I, th these cameos wouldn't produce any of these numbers, would they, Ms. Marakovic? I mean, your cameo doesn't demonstrate that, on average, three thousand one hundred and thirty dollars less tax is being paid by more than five million women. That's not what a cameo does, is it? Correct. No. Thank you. No, but I don't think we're talking purely cameos there, from what I heard uh, Ms. Fish say. No, but I mean the article that, refers the to unpublished Treasury analysis, and no such analysis exists. And, uh, and from uh, the ATO, we have the, uh, the breadth of, uh, of anonymised tax data that uh, they indicate uh, they publish and provide to stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I'll direct these questions to the ATO then, because um, your evidence seems to be, Minister, that this is in fact uh, ATO analysis, not Treasury analysis, that was relied upon when speaking to the journalist. Well, well, um, Sen Sen Senator, what I've said very clearly is that, uh, is that the Treasurer receives analysis data and information from um, you know, all of the agencies across his portfolio, including Treasury and the ATO. Mm. Um, the Treasurer has stated that women uh, aged 24 years and under are paying 20 per cent less tax under the Coalition compared to under Labor. Um, uh, can the ATO explain what the decline in the tax rate is by gender for each age court, a cohort? Uh, Senator, I'd have to take that question on notice. I don't have the data with me uh, today, but I can take that question on notice. What's the average reduction in tax by gender for each age co cohort? Again, Senator, I don't have that information in front of me. I don't have all the data with me today, so I can take that on notice as well. Mm -hmm. So any, any questions that you have that go to the, the specifics of the data provided to the Treasurer's Office and what it shows, I can take on notice. Uh, Right, good, so good on Monday the Treasurer provides in, information uh, in to a newspaper in relation to, um, to tax cuts, but on Wednesday 
the agency which allegedly provided the data that supported those public remarks can't answer any questions about it at all. Is that the situation? Oh, what I can say, Senator, is that um, so I, I have had my team confirm that this that the data that we provided to the Treasurer's Office showed estimates of the total amount and average amount of uh, tax cuts in Lameto by cohort and also the proportion of the taxable income that that represents. Um, the data that the ATO provided didn't include childcare subsidies or, or things that we don't um, hold data on. Uh, the data does support the statements that were attributed to the Treasurer in the media on Monday, um, which relate to the three years of 2018-19 through to 2021. Uh, and in particular, the, the data that uh, was attributed to the, or the, the statements attributed to the Treasurer in relation to female workers um, are supported by the data provided. Right. Well, let's get the data, Chair. We'd like this data tabled. Yeah. So it's been uh, taken on, on notice, Ms Fish, in relation to the data, correct? Well, no. yes. With respect, Chair, and I acknowledge officers can, and I don't know if the Tax Commissioner has a view here, but there is data that has appeared in a newspaper article making claims. We've now had the officers say, yes, those claims are supported. I can't see any reason why the data that the, both the minister and now the officer are relying on cannot be provided to this committee. Now, like it is, it has, it is available. You're getting contact from your team. Why can't it be provided now? Senator, data can be presented um, uh, in a range of ways in terms of, uh, of just how much has been provided, what else uh, accompanied it when, uh, when briefings were provided to the Treasurer's Office or the like. Um, uh, you've had specific requests for particular information um, and, uh, and in terms of being able to tabulate that information in a way that responds to the request, it's not unreasonable that Ms Fish has taken that on notice. Well, it looks to me like, seriously, it looks to me like you are making a decision to delay providing this to the committee when it is readily available. We heard that you were making it available every fortnight to the Treasurer. I don't want the covering briefs. I don't want anything else. I think it's reasonable that we have access to the data. Um, Senator, if I could just comment. Um, I would like the opportunity to look at the way that was presented uh, to, the, to the Treasurer's office to see if we can um, sort of provide it. We could, if, if so, fairly quickly. But I, I just need to take on notice how that was uh, presented and what categorisation it had. Because mm. um, I've never really been, for, you know, <laughs> the request for such documents hasn't really arisen. Um, so you don't see, all. you don't see documents that go to the Treasurer's office? Not always, no. So you don't see, you haven't seen this data, Commissioner? No, I haven't. Okay, but you would have read the article in the paper, I presume? Yes, I did. Yeah, because it attributed it to you. Well, we sit till 11 o'clock tonight, And I did tonight, make inquiries around that. I was on leave last week, so it's Yeah, sort fair of, enough. Uh, but we do sit till 11 o'clock tonight. My concern is, and, and this is an issue around timing, we take things on notice, which we always agree with, and then two months later, mm. or a month, between a month and two months, and sometimes, if you're PM and C, a year later, you might get an answer. And often, taking on notice is used as a delaying tactic to providing information and allowing transparency. Well, I think and I'll um, put that on the record. I'm okay. not saying that the tax office exercises yep. that. I'm just saying that that is what it looks like to yep. me when that information is yep. clearly available. But, but Commissioner Jordan has given a, a, an explanation in this particular case as to the process. Uh, Commissioner Jordan, you would like to go through, uh, and presumably you can. Um, uh, undertake that process mm -hmm. as soon as you reasonably can. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, and if, if, if possible, we will do all we can to provide information, you know, uh, can if I... necessary by tonight. Okay, thank you. All right. I'd like to ask a couple of methodological questions of the officer who was involved in preparing the data. Sorry, for... a couple of which? Methodological questions. Right, okay. Uh, about of the officer who prepared the data. Um, so you indicated that it was in relation to 
the Lomito and the personal income tax cut. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And it's for all age cohorts? Uh, yes, that's my understanding, yep. And then it's broken down by gender? Yes. Okay. And is it based on um, actuals, uh, by which I mean the sort of actual tax paid by individuals interacting with the tax system? Uh, the actual methodology, I would have to uh, take questions on that on notice. Um, I've got a, a team uh, that works for me that pulled the data together, but I would have to check in with them uh, exactly the methodology that they used. Right. It. But it's not a model. It's about the actual exchange of monies um, between individuals and the tax office. Uh, it will be based on uh, data that we have on, in the system and operation, yes, um, but there will likely have been some assumptions made in there as well, but I cannot give testimony as to, uh, as to what assumptions were made in, in preparing the data. Right. But so yes, it's based on, it's based on lodged returns and, and data that we have. Lodged returns, okay. And so, for example, if um, a large cohort of women had their economic circumstances change, for example, many of them moved from one income bracket to another, that'd show up in your data, wouldn't it? Uh, Senator, I assume that would be the case because we would be able to see the numbers in the population from yeah, so if a lot of women lost hours um, or indeed moved to zero hours during shutdowns and lockdowns in the pandemic, that would show up in your data, wouldn't it? Women would be earning less. Uh, well, the data, I assume, would show uh, the average earnings or the, the earnings of women who are lodging returns and um, it's aggregated data. so the aggregate population in each uh, income tax bracket, yes. Right, so it's by income tax bracket and age and gender. Uh, there are, yes, yeah, so that is how it will have been calculated. The, um, the primary data provided in February was by age and gender, but the, the calculation will have incorporated income tax rates, uh, which would have taken into account tax bracket. Right, so the average tax paid and the average income earned would incorporate any changes in the labour market in the period in question. Uh, I'd have women's to, position to ask, in the labour market. Yeah. Mm. I, any questions as to methodology, I really would need my revenue analysis person to answer for you accurately, Senator. I'm sorry, it's just not my area of expertise. I wasn't involved in pulling the data together. Um, I see. But any questions that you do have about methodology, I can have uh, my team answer on notice. Well, I understand that you and Mr Jordan are going to have a look at the material that was provided to the Treasurer's Office um, to assess whether it can be provided to the committee today. Um, can I also ask formally that in doing so you consider whether you can provide the assumptions um, that were used in bringing the data together and any other material that describes the methodology that was used to bring this data together? Uh, Senator, we undertake to, to do that for the committee. Hmm. Thanks, Chair. And, uh, and, and Chair, I do think it's, it's worth noting there are, there are no ATO questions on notice outstanding, so the ATO does have a good record in terms of uh, response to questions yeah, and, uh, and obvious things to Jordan record. has, uh, uh, has given, uh, given a commitment to try to uh, get what information yeah. he can. So Commissioner Jordan, you're getting many compliments uh, during the course of uh, this appearance, both uh, from the Chair and in relation to your record on uh, questions on notice. I want to go to two other areas. It's still, um, it's still early in the session. So. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had the call yet. Yeah, but Senator Patrick's going to ask some questions after me, Commissioner Jordan. So uh, 
and just put you on notice, notice to brace yourself. But uh, there were two areas I wanted to cover. Uh, the first is in relation to the ATO's anti-avoidance work. Could you give us an update uh, with respect to the progress of that work uh, and uh, uh, in particular um, an estimate if you could provide us with the uh, foregone revenue, the revenue that would have been foregone, which has actually been clawed back through the, through the work of, uh, of that group? Uh, yes, Chair. I'll pass to uh, Jeremy Hershorn. Um, we have been very pleased with the results of both the uh, uh, tax avoidance task force that the government has funded us uh, over the last uh, number of years. We've exceeded uh, the uh, predicted revenue for that. But a fundamental aspect of this is that not only are we now um, agreeing the past with, with the large corporates in transfer mispricing, uh, whatever else, but we will only um, come to some settlement or arrangement where we lock in the future treatment. And that is a really big difference from the past. We used to you know, do an audit, go to court, settle, whatever. Three years later, you'd come back, do it all over again. Um, and it's been a very strong feature of uh, the way Mr Hershorn has um, uh, run this uh, task force that it is very, very important to lock in the future so that we have a very much um, uh, a dollar in a tax return is the best dollar you can collect. Excellent. Um, but I'll pass over to Mr Hershaw. Mr Hershaw. Uh, thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chair. So maybe uh, focusing on our work with the Tax Avoidance Task Force, which is the largest public groups and private companies, uh, I would like to report that the, the state of large corporate tax is very healthy in Australia. Um, we currently estimate that we collect 92% of their tax, the full tax payable at lodgement, and 96% after compliance activity, which is world leading uh, in terms of co compliance at the large corporate end. Uh, that has been enabled by the Tax Avoidance Task Force funding, and also a series of very important laws which have been implemented in Australia, uh, which is world class, the, so most modern anti transfer mispricing laws. Uh, and two other very important laws, the multinational anti-avoidance law and the diverted profits tax. Um, I know there's been a lot of focus, and focusing on those, there's been a lot of focus on the e-commerce, the rise of e-commerce and its taxation. And I'm very happy to report that, uh, with, can I say, not adding to anything, which is already in the public domain from the companies themselves, but pretty much every large brand name multinational which used to build from over, sell here but build from overseas is now billing from Australia. So the revenue is hitting Australian tax returns. And we have collected 1.25 billion in tax from a range of e-commerce multinationals and as the Commissioner said, locked in future tax performance. Um, I, I would have thought maybe just a couple of other comments uh, diverted profits tax. We have uh, issued some diverted profits tax assessments. Uh, one is being disputed and will shortly hit the public domain. And that is a very important, uh, that's a very important provision uh, to deal with particular sorts of tax, multinational tax avoidance. Uh, to, to the Commissioner's point, uh, in terms of locking in the future, just to talk about one area has been around the trend pricing or mispricing of related party debt. That is where the Australian arm of a multinational borrows from its offshore parent. Um, our estimate is that we have denied, well, it's not an estimate, we have denied $14 billion of interest deductions that companies claim. And our estimate is that over the next decade, companies will not claim $26 billion of interest deductions that they would otherwise have claimed. Sorry, can you, can you just give those figures again? Because I think they're, uh, they're extraordinarily significant. So the first figure was claims for interest expense, which have been yes. denied in terms of past claims. And the second figure was an estimate with respect to the future. Can you just set out those figures again, please? Yes, of course, Chair. So in in terms of interest deductions, which we have denied, it is $14 billion since the establishment of the task force. And in terms of interest deductions, which companies have changed their position and so will never claim, 
our estimate is that that will be tw that's twenty six billion dollars over the next ten years. And is it is it correct to observe that that dovetails with Commissioner Jordan's point about the way you're looking at these issues? It's not just looking at past claims; it's also looking at in terms of the future uh, to make sure there's an agreed pathway forward, so you don't have to re-prosecute or re-argue the same issue at, at medium intervals. Absolutely, Chair. It, it gets us off this merry-go-round of auditing the same company on the same issue every four years. This is a way of locking in future compliance. And as the Commissioner said, a dollar in the tax return is the best dollar for the tax system, from as far as all are concerned. Um, I, I would also say that we're the, moving perhaps to a, uh, a state, a, a part which gives the community can give the community confidence. The task force funding allows us to deal one-on-one -on -one every year uh, to do what we call a justified trust review of every one of Australia's 100 largest companies. And they pay, those 100 companies pay about a third of all corporate tax in Australia. So it's not, that's not insignificant. And it allows us to review the next 1,000 public companies over a four year cycle. And what I am very happy to report to this committee is that the vast bulk of Australian largest, particularly Australian owned companies, but also some multinationals have improved their uh, tax governance, they've improved their tax compliance and uh, increasingly are achieving what we describe as a high assurance rating, and which we uh, provide to the companies. We provide them a report on their performance, like a due diligence report. Um, we publish, so any senator can find it on our website, a report on uh, those programs. We, we're very transparent around those programs. But also, if you are a shareholder in a company, you know, you can ask your company. Many companies are actually now publishing their assurance rating from the tax office and really quite proudly representing to the community and their shareholders that they are uh, contributing to the tax system. So I, I, I will, I suppose, wrapping up, I could speak on this for hours, Chair, but wrapping up, I just want to wrap up with that first comment, which is the committee should have confidence that through the work of the Tax Avoidance Task Force, we are uh, the performance of large corporates in Australia is, is extraordinarily high on a global scale, probably world, world, world leading, and, uh, and improving. So it's on an improving trajectory. So excellent. Thank you, Chair. No, ex excellent. Look, I, I just want to go into one other area before I give the call to Senator Patrick and then I'll go to Senator Roberts. Uh, who's got some questions as well, uh, and that is Commissioner Jordan, this new service that was established on 1 July 2021, the new investment engagement service. Now, in a, a, a previous life, uh, I was part of a team that visited different jurisdictions and looked at potential investments, uh, whether or not to invest in those jurisdictions. And I can tell you, uh, the notion of a new investment engagement service being able to actually engage with the revenue authority in a jurisdiction if you're looking to make an investment seems a profoundly positive initiative. I'm wondering if you can tell us uh, what the experience has been since it was announced and uh, is it up and running now? Um, I'll make some preliminary comments and I think, um, is it Jeremy, that, uh, Mr Hershon, that will uh, come in. Um, we have very much tried to have a, a very transparent, open relationship with uh, both um, new investors into Australia, and we encourage the advisors here to say, if you want a risk-free investment, um, and a lot of new people, new foreign investors, they don't want to carry risk. They, they actually don't. So mm -hmm. to, to, to have the ATO effectively sign off on the tax treatment of new investments is, is well, that's quite a lot to, to foreign because they can eliminate what sometimes can be a significant risk. We also encourage uh, Australian large companies that do big mergers or divestments or whatever to come with us, you can you know, you trust us, uh, in, in a confidential way that uh, we realise it's extremely market sensitive, but we will give assurance as to the shareholder tax treatment and there so that when they do release their their proposals, they can say, this is the tax treatment that will happen. And any time you can de-risk M&A mm -hmm. activities or new investments into Australia is, is hugely important to, to encourage that investment, to encourage 
uh, uh, M&A activities, if that's of benefit to, to shareholders and, and the Commissioner, but, can it, oh, sorry, well, actually, um, I was just going to pass over to Jeremy to sort of give you a bit of Oh, OK. Uh, All right. And I, I'm, I'll have a follow-up question, but um, if, we can, uh, if we can hear from, uh, from Jeremy. Yeah, so thanks, Chair. So, yes, Chair, the, this new engagement, new investment engagement service is in force. Um, we have, uh, to date, nine investments have been uh, brought to it. Of course, it's at the choice of investors. Um, I can say that three uh, engagements have been finished to date. Uh, those deals were 20, there was $26 billion of deals value that were facilitated through this service. Uh, it's a very, again, it depends, it's very much tailored around the individual transaction and what the investor is looking for and their time frames. And I can report that on two of those transactions where they were, they were extremely time critical, uh, the engagement was completed within 10 days. So we bring out some of our best people to bear on the problems to help, uh, you know, facilitate investment into Australia. And, and I should uh, say, yeah, it, it just sorry to sort of interrupt, but that that time criticality uh, is a very pertinent point because uh, overseas investors might be going through very aggressive due diligence timetables, and and being able to get that uh, quick turnaround in terms of comfort could enable them to participate in an investment process which otherwise they would be unable to uh, because of the risk. But it could also mean that they can bid more for an investment in this country, and that's to the benefit of the whole economy, um, than they might otherwise be able to because they've gotten that tax comfort. Isn't, isn't that correct? Yes, so Chair, the, I mean, the worst thing that could happen is that a bidder paid less for an Australian asset because of a, a fear around Australian tax risk, which was not warranted. Exactly. And so if we can provide tax certainty, it allows people to invest and bid with confidence. Uh, and, and, and what I would say is that we're getting referrals uh, through the Global Business uh, and Talent Attraction Task Force. Um, we've had a referral through Austrade. And we have had also had referrals through the, the more traditional intermediary channels of the advisory firms. So it's a very promising start for this program. Excellent. Good to hear. Uh, and with that, I'll pass on to Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon um, to the Tax Office. Um, I just wanted to go to um, uh, to item Mr. Uh, Commissioner Hirsch, um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Hirshhorn, or. Um, Ms. Fish is uh, Ms. Fish here. Yes, I'm here, Senator. Okay, fantastic. So you recall the conversation we had at Estimates last year uh, in relation to the tax determination 2019 um, D11. I uh, asked you about the status of that. Uh, you said you're active, actively working on finalising it, and I put the question before next estimates. And you said we will have a resolution before next estimates, and I said I'm going to hold to that. Thank you very much. So, just wondering what the status of that might be. Yes, Senator. Um, so we have uh, we have progressed this matter since last Senate estimates. We've uh, received further legal advice, um, which we are considering based on that legal advice, and also uh, in submissions on the draft. We intend to uh, revise the draft uh, and we have updated our advice under development program uh, to reflect this. Um, but we need, based on, on the feedback to date, including the more recent legal advice, uh, we intend to revise the, the draft. We stand firmly by the position that I stated last time, that a taxpayer does not get both cost base and a deduction for the same outgoing. Uh, that hasn't changed. Um, but, uh, but the revision uh, may require us to go back and do more targeted consultation before it's released publicly. Uh, all of that information has been updated on our Advice Under Development program on our website, and we're targeting a mid-year release publicly. So my problem, this, is, this has been going on for some considerable period of time, so since 2019. Um, all of this is within your control. We have a situation where 
taxpayers are jumped on relatively quickly if they're not paying the right amount of tax. And I don't mind that as long as it's been, it's, it's done fairly, but nonetheless it's done quickly. Here we've got a large entity, and my understanding is, well, this, this flowed from uh, you know, Lendlease double dipping. They're a company, a you know, multi-billion dollar company. In fact, if I look at your tax transparency data, they're a company that um, has uh, an income of, I think it's something like uh, 50, 50 billion dollars over seven tax, tra tax transparency years, has paid no tax in that, in that time frame and um, there's an issue where there's a question over the way, manner in which they've conducted their business and this stretches on for, f for four years. Um, this Senator, is completely within okay. the control of the tax office. <coughs> is it a case of you're not, you don't have the right resources? I mean, I understand you need to ground this properly in law, but I, I'm struggling to, to, to work out how it is you can't get the right lawyers in the room, get the right accountants in the room, and come to the right conclusion and issue the determination. So, Senator, up before... Ms. Fish answers about the timing on the ruling and the ruling process. Um, I would, and of course, I cannot comment on individual taxpayer compliance matters. I understand um, that, but I except, can. Except what is in the public domain. Um, my understanding is that Lend Lease has disclosed that it is in uh, some form of dispute with us on this issue. Um, and I perhaps reiterate a previous testimony to this committee, which is that should not be assumed that the audit and the draft ruling are codependent. The audit of a taxpayer uh, will progress on its pace. Uh, a ruling, the, the timing of a determination is uh, independent. So, um, okay, I understand. So I might just make that comment and then pass it over back to Ms. Fish. Yep. So, uh, yes, I would reiterate what, as Second Commissioner Hershon has just said, um, the, our uh, compliance programs and our uh, public advice and guidance programs are independent. Um, our public advice and guidance program is to provide, support, provide advice and guidance to the public so that they can comply with their obligations. When we uh, publish a, a position in draft that represents our, our considered, although not finalised, you. Um, while that is uh, in the public domain um, and not withdrawn, uh, the, the public can see that that is our continued considered but not finalised view. Um, during the course of consideration of this particular issue, we have had to consider uh, a number of elements and how it interacts with other parts of the tax law as well as other uh, public advice and guidance products. Um, the uh, we have also received in feedback and comments on the draft that while this is a public ruling of general application, the circumstances in which it can apply do not arise uh, very often. And so it is, it is uh, I guess, not a, a ruling of broad um, uh, application in that sense that it, that it needs to be applied by the public in many circumstances. But nonetheless, the, the, the advice is out there in draft, um, and as I've said, we stand by the position that, that taxpayers can't claim twice for the same outgoing. And, and I absolutely support you in that, um, just not with any sort of legal base, but on, stop you, on, so. on, on principle, <laughs> um, you shouldn't double dip. Um, uh, just going back to the comments you made about the audit, and I appreciate what you're saying is that you are able to deal with other with, with individual taxpayers uh, in the absence of the public determination. But does that mean um, that you can apply the draft to their to their to their audit? Um, you know, wh where do you stand in circumstances where you haven't got a final determination? and you are auditing uh, a company and you identify the problem that is the uh, subject of the determination, where does that leave you legally 
um, do you, does that mean it's an individual test case or you, you apply your draft determination uh, and leave yourself potentially open to litigation? How does, how does that work? So, so, Senator, of course, in any um, audit, we, uh, we uh, come to our view of how the tax law applies, which almost by definition is different from the way that the taxpayer thinks the tax law applies to them. We come to a view and we prosecute our audit and then potentially litigation with that view. Um, if we have a contrary public view, uh, well, in a sense, if we have a public view, we will conduct our audit uh, consistently with our public view. If we do not have a public view, and that sometimes happens because it's, you know, you, you can't have a ruling on every possible issue in the tax system. Sure. Of course, we'll have an internal view which we prosecute through the audit and potentially litigation. Uh, I think the, uh, Ms Fisher has, has, has said, when we've got a draft ruling out, that remains our considered view. Uh, so the ruling, so any audit which interacts with that issue will continue to be conducted on that view of the law, uh, whether or not it's draft or final. Okay. Oh, Senator I, Patrick, are we getting to the... I've got, I've got a few more. A few more. So do, let me can I, can I just do one on, on tax transparency. Um, I just want to correct the record. I said I made a guess at what Len Lee had paid, so I just want to be accurate. Based on your tax transparency data, $53,446,000,000 um, uh, 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 $82,000. I mean, and, and the company has paid no tax. And if I look at the tax transparency data, and I, I look forward to it coming out every November or December, when, when, wherever it is, and, I, and I, take, take, I go through the process of adding up all of the companies that have paid no tax. And sadly, this year, we've got a situation where 150 companies had revenues of a total of $970 billion, almost a trillion dollars, and not a cent of tax paid. Um, I used to watch this data come out and think, this is good, it'll cause people to maybe do the right thing. But most Australians would look at that, I mean, it's a trillion dollars worth of, of revenue, no tax paid. A, a barista pays more than more tax than, than Lendlease or ExxonMobil with uh, $71 billion in revenue, no tax paid. How so, do we address Senator, this? I mean, this, this, this is, it, it's almost unbelievable. So, Senator, can I uh, maybe make a, a, a few comments to that? So, the first is that sometimes that transparency data includes some companies in a group, but not all companies in a group, and other companies are paying tax. Um, it also does not include the tax which is paid as a result of ATO enforcement action. So some of these groups will be paying tax as a result of ATO enforcement action. Um, for some groups, and particularly this, uh, you know, the oil and gas industry is an example of this. They have spent an extraordinary amount of money and they are, uh, have to effectively recoup their startup costs before they start moving into tax profit. Uh, maybe referring back to a line of questioning from the chair and bringing those together, uh, we are anticipating that several large participants in the gas industry will start paying income tax this year, and that is due to a combination of three things. One is that they've been in operation for a while and so are recouping their startup costs. Uh, the second is that there have been some good gas prices. And the third, which is also important, is that we have uh, taken very firm action to make sure that they do not participate in inappropriate tax, aggressive tax structures. Um, but what I, I would say, Senator, as well, is that there are situations where, where companies have historically made extraordinarily large losses. Um, it takes a long time for them to, to recoup those losses and during that period of recruitment, they come up as zero tax payable, um, even though they have, like that limited data that we produce does not show uh, the recruitment of losses. Uh, what we 
we also look forward to is in the next couple of years, many of those companies being tax payable. Yeah, okay. So um, I don't want to get started on, you don't want to get me started on oil and gas companies. I can assure you of that. So let's no, just. No, we don't, yeah. Senator Patrick. So, so let's look at a company <laughs> like Ford Motor Company. $20.5 billion in revenue, zero tax paid. Now, I just can't comprehend a car company earning that sort of revenue. See, I ran a small business, and one of the fundamental things you try to do with a business is make money, make some profit. And I put it to you, if you've got a company like Ford, and over seven years they earn, they earn uh, $20 billion of revenue, uh, and don't make a profit, you're being fleeced. Business so, exists to make a profit, to return something to their shareholders. There's something really going wrong here with a lot of these companies just fleecing the Australian taxpayer. We have um, the Australian taxpayers doing their bit to you know, ensure that our infrastructure, our education, our health system is, is, is operating properly. We have all these other companies that come here, enjoy the benefits of our system, and don't contribute at all. So, Senator Patrick, a particular question, or is that a... What are you doing about it, is the, okay. is the, yeah, is the so fundamental well. question. Okay. This is so unacceptable. So, yeah. so, Senator, of course I cannot comment about particular companies, but uh, referring back to the previous line, we have, uh, through the Tax Avoidance Task Force, we, we deal with all of the very large companies uh, either yearly or four yearly. No, I think no brand, every uh, Australian community should have confidence that pretty much every brand name company that they recognise, we are in active live review of. Uh, I, I would say it's important that we tax profit, not revenue, and I absolutely take your point, Senator, that companies are in existence to earn a profit. Uh, in the car industry, you know, that is a classic uh, it, it's one of the tradition, the classic industries for transfer mispricing risk around importing cars. Uh, what I, I would say, we are very well aware of that. I think for, particularly for some companies though, if you're looking at a particular company, it is worth thinking about their history over the last decade and whether they have necessarily performed very well in this country. And in some cases they've performed economically very poorly in this country. Uh, notwithstanding that they have a big brand name and that they potentially sell lots of cars. The car industry, for example, has not been very helpful. If we look at who are, who's selling cars now in Australia, it's not the same people who are selling cars you know, 10, 20 years ago, that uh, even the biggest companies sometimes are not successful in achieving their goals of making a profit. So, Senator Patrick, I need to share the call sure, with Senator Roberts, that. if I could. I might come back sure. another round. Thank you. Okay. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for attending. Uh, Minister, when, when all the COVID protections, when, when are all the COVID protections ending for businesses? You know, for example, the Australian Taxation Office pause on debt collection activities, and what have you provided to ensure businesses are supported and not thrown to the wolves? Um, uh, well, Senator, uh, to, to answer the second part of your question, um, types of measures that, uh, that we outlined in, uh, in the last couple of budgets, such as the loss carryback arrangements, the small business loans programs, uh, they're the types of, uh, of support that have been embedded uh, for businesses to, uh, to help with the economic recovery uh, coming out of COVID. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the dates of when, in some cases, already have occurred uh, or to occur in the future, uh, certain protections around insolvency arrangements or um, uh, or uh, uh, or ATO uh, debt recovery practices are coming to an end. I'll let agencies uh, uh, where they can speak to any of the details of those. You're probably not the right person for that, though. So, Senator, there's a range of um, support measures that have been um, provided. The minister referred to the loss <coughs> carryback. There's also obviously the temporary full expensing measures that go to June. 2023. They're the uh, support measures, um, uh, stimulus measures that I'm aware of in the tax space. Um, I will we'll pass to the ATO who can talk about the administrative actions that they've been taking to support business. And I think some of your uh, question or some of the aspects of that support um, 
in the space of insolvencies or you know um, market front features is probably best put to markets group later this evening. But I don't know if the ATO want to add anything on the administrative actions. Uh, yes, Senator. Um, we have recommenced a very measured uh, approach to debt collection. Um, we are concerned that the longer um, businesses sort of stay out of engagement with us, um, uh, the more problematic those collection of debts are. I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, our total collectible debt um, has, uh, as at 31 December 2021, uh, has increased by nearly $5 billion. Uh, that is collectible debt, which is largely, uh, I understand, undisputed debt. So they've put in a bad statement. They've said they've earned this amount. They've withheld um, pay as you go. They've collected GST. And for one reason or not, they haven't remitted amounts they've acknowledged they're responsible for. Um, we are instituting um, a process of contacting businesses individually um, to make sure they're aware of the debt and trying to come to an acceptable payment arrangement at least. But it is um, something we just cannot ignore because of the debt stock has gone up about 14 per cent um, from the same time last year. Uh, and is now around $40 billion. So we, we have to focus in as empathetic way as we can, but it's something we just have to get on with it, it, without jumping out there uh, too quickly. It's very well known in the advisory community that we're doing this now. Um, and in some cases they're saying, well, you should, because uh, uh, the longer we leave it, the more likely some of these amounts just won't be paid. But if um, our Chief Service Delivery Officer wants to add anything to that, I'll pass over to Melinda Smith. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Melinda Smith, uh, Chief Service Delivery Officer. Um, I just uh, echo um, the Commissioner's comments. Uh, last year, we actually um, had uh, over 8 million engagement activities that we uh, put in place to help uh, small business and individuals, and the growth tends to be in the small business debt to actually um, help them and assist them to understand what's their liability and how do we help them to actually get uh, back on their feet. Um, and we're seeing some positive signs. Um, payment plans are being uh, set up. We have um, very high catch rate in terms of those effectiveness of those payment plans. Um, and as the Commissioner uh, commented, we're getting some terrific feedback from the community about uh, about the balance we're having to take um, uh, very empathetically um, based on quite unique circumstances. Thank you. So it, it's fairly, um, this is not a criticism of you, it's a, it's a comment about the situation. It's, it's fairly um, vague and I understand that. So what does your research indicate will be the likely business insolvency rates for the next two years and across what industries and regions? Mm -hmm. Um, Sen Sen Senator, I don't know that the ATO, I mean, they can obviously speak for themselves, but I don't know that the ATO undertakes its own modelling or research in relation to, uh, to uh, business insolvency rates. Um, uh, and again, a revenue group of Treasury wouldn't be the right um, uh, agency to provide analysis in that regard. Um, uh, to just add to at least uh, answer to your first question, I just wanted to check, but uh, um, the relief for directors against personal liability for insolvent trading that uh, was part of the initial package of measures has also expired. So, uh, so uh, in that sense, um, some of those initial early extreme COVID protection measures that were put in place at the depths of uncertainty uh, have come to an end. As the ATO has indicated, from their perspective, they um, now manage uh, debt recovery in, uh, in their cautious and targeted ways that uh, they've indicated and are very conscious in terms of um, uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, impact of their activities and, uh, and seeking to uh, maintain business viability while doing so. Um, the government did outline some other um, uh, insolvency reforms, which I can get some information tabled if you like. Um, uh, I'd note that insolvency rates um, have been 
down quite significantly as a result of um, both some of those temporary measures but also the additional um, financial support uh, government has provided to businesses during, uh, during the pandemic. Um, I'm not aware of there being any spike in those insolvency rates since any of these measures have um, come to an end. Um, uh, but, uh, but we would expect to see at least a normalisation of, uh, of those rates. Uh, Minister, thank you. The early on, and in fact, the first and second day of sitting single day sessions on this coronavirus issue were on Monday, March 23rd, 2020, and then Wednesday, the April, April 8th, 2020. And I pointed the government to Taiwan, which has had a far superior performance to ours. They, despite having a population similar to ours, have had one quarter the casualties per million population that we've had. And they did it without locking down. Um, in the previous Senate estimate sessions, I confirmed with the Chief Medical Officer and the Department, the Federal Department of Health Secretary, the seven components that would be suitable for seven strategies for managing a virus comprehensively and properly. And the Federal Government has missed the two key ones never even looked at it, even though they were mentioned months ago, and as I said, on the first uh, single, single day sessions back in 2020. I believe the federal government has mismanaged COVID. Now, you probably won't agree, but... Um, no, I won't, Senator. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the facts are there. So what, what's happening is that the federal government has not protected people, and at the same time has decimated our economy, and we're losing a lot of revenue. Senator Roberts, have you, so, have you, have you got a quest yes, question? Yes, I'd like to know when the government is going to come up with a proper comprehensive plan. Um, well, as, as, as you noted on the way through, Senator Roberts, I, I don't agree with your assessment there. Australia has uh, some of the uh, lowest fatality rates in the world, uh, some of the strongest economic outcomes, um, uh, a jobs market uh, that um, is booming and is seeing uh, levels of participation um, that are at record points for Australia and are above uh, the performance of other developed economies. So, uh, Senator Roberts, I think we have a, a very uh, strong record there, as the Prime Minister has indicated, uh, has every decision that we have managed to, that we have made right throughout the course of the pandemic um, been the one that we would make with the benefit of hindsight? No, of course not. Um, if we've been able to foresee uh, every potential twist and turn along the way, uh, well, you'd navigate the route differently. Uh, but, uh, but we've been dealing with a global pandemic with different variants that have uh, come along uh, to the, uh, the COVID-19 virus and we've responded uh, accordingly. Uh, we have applied through the last two budgets an economic recovery plan uh, that has stimulated business investment, uh, that has seen the jobs market recover very strongly in Australia, that has seen uh, the budget ex um, um, uh, improve in ways beyond what had been forecast uh, and, uh, and we're obviously committed to continuing to implement that plan. Um, thank you for that, Minister. I just quote some figures here from Adam Crichton, who's a well-respected, clear-thinking economist who relies on data. And he's pointed out, Australia overtakes Japan in COVID deaths, a densely populated nation with many old people that never once locked down, never mandated vaccines and barely tested anyone. No riots, no tear gas. The lockdown argument has become a sad joke. You didn't implement lockdowns, but you enabled the states to. Taiwan, with a similar population to ours, uh, we have 4.4 times higher death rate per million population. Taiwan never locked down. They, they properly tested, traced and quarantined. So my question was, when will you... I, I've checked with this yes. Chief Medical Officer. There are seven strategies that he confirms. I've omitted none. I've got none that are in there that shouldn't be there. Seven strategies. The government is not doing the two most important ones. When um, will you come we'll, together we'll, with a we'll, plan? We'll, 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 we'll Senator Roberts, we, we have applied a plan right throughout the pandemic, responded to circumstances and have the clear economic recovery plan, as I said before. Um, I'd also just make the point in terms of your comparisons there that uh, um, lockdown is used as a, as a single word or phrase to, uh, to encompass what, uh, what different people have in mind. Um, there have been, uh, in uh, the countries you referenced, uh, some very tight restrictions on uh, human movement and activity uh, in response to, uh, to COVID-19 and, uh, and limitations in terms of uh, areas of activity uh, that have had, in terms of uh, economic impacts and impacts on different businesses, very significant impacts in parts of, uh, of their economy. Um, uh, their circumstances that every country's grappled with, I don't say that as in any way as a criticism, there we have 
uh, indeed gauge, engaged quite closely at different times with Japan and, uh, and, uh, and with Taiwan uh, during the pandemic in terms of sharing information, in terms of assistance between, uh, between one another uh, where possible for things like PPE or the like. So um, uh, there is much that we uh, admire and respect about their responses, uh, but I think to sort of characterise uh, as you have that makes it sound like they've managed in a way where there haven't been some very tight restrictions that, that are analogous in parts to the way some of the states have applied lockdowns uh, or ongoing restrictions um, uh, is not accurate in terms of uh, what they have actually done in those countries or, or in the country of Japan and, and, uh, and of course, uh, the economy of Taiwan. Well, Taiwan, which is way in front of us in terms of performance on COVID, um, has not locked down their, their economy and their economy has basically suffered just a minor blip, I think 0.6%. Sen Senator increase. Roberts, I need right. to share the call. You... Thank you, Chair, I'm finished. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Sen Sen Senator, Senator, could I just indicate I've got some questions for Revenue Group as well, just to help. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to give the call to Senator Urquhart, who's been extraordinarily patient and courteous. Oh, I haven't been in here very long, so I do appreciate but I do only have about five or six okay. questions. Thank you, so. Senator Urquhart. Thank you very much. So I've got some specific questions about the ATO in Tasmania. Um, so can you tell me how many current APS positions are there in the tax office in Tasmania? Um, how many of those are ongoing, FTEs, non-ongoing and labour hire? Can you break that down for me? Uh, Senator, um, we do have a uh, relatively significant office in Hobart and another in uh, Burnie. Okay. Um, I'll pass to our uh, head of people, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Bradley Chapman, to see if he has that geographic uh, breakdown available. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator. Uh, Brad Bradley Chapman, Deputy Commissioner, ATO People. Uh, we actually have two uh, offices in Tasmania. The first is our uh, is our Bernie office, which is um, which currently has uh, a let's see, we've got uh, one non-ongoing staff member, sixty-one ongoing staff members. <clears throat> and 11 casuals, uh, so that's a total of 73 APS employees. Um, and in Hobart, we have a total of 584 employees, which is made up of 488 ongoing staff, 22 non-ongoing staff, and 74 casuals. Uh, in terms of Labor higher. I will just check whether I have the figures by state, uh, by city. Um, I'm not sure I have those figures broken up in that way, so I may have to take that on notice. Do you have a, a Tasmanian figure and then you can provide the breakdown on notice? Nice. And it looks like I don't actually have uh, that information broken up by location or state for that. So uh, I'm happy to take that on notice and come back to you. Okay. Are you able to come back during the course of the hearing? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure we can, Senator. Great. Uh, yep. What I can tell you is we have been decreasing our use of labour hire and and also of casual and non-ongoing employees and rebalancing our workforce more and more towards uh, ongoing employees. Okay, can you tell me what is spent on salaries for the APS employees in Tasmania? And can you provide uh, that breakdown on each financial year from 2018? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd have to take that on, on notice, Senator. Sure, okay. Um, and can you tell me what was spent on labour hire for the various offices. And if you can break these down between Burnie and Devonport, that would be helpful. Um, and the amount, uh, again, for the financial years from 2018. So I, basically, I want those figures separated out into what you spent on your uh, direct own staff over that period broken down for each year and what was spent on labour high for each of those years in both those locations. 
Yes, I'd have to take that on, on notice, Senator. Okay, thank you. Um, and can you tell me what the average cost difference between the hourly rate of a labour hire worker and an ongoing APS employee in Tasmania is? Uh, again, that's not information I, I have to hand, Senator. Uh, I have to have to take that on us. What I, what I would say is that um, a lot of our our labour hire employees are generally in specialist um, specialist employees with uh, scarce skill sets that um, that are in highly competitive markets. Uh, the bulk of our labour hire employees, which have been or not employees, but labour hire officers who have engaged are uh, in our IT and data and analytics, so highly, highly technical fields. Uh, okay. With, with very rich yeah. the Okay, so maybe when you provide me with the, uh, the different numbers, uh, sorry, the different, uh, how many labour hire there are in each location, um, maybe you could provide me with the, the skill level as well, or, you know, the, the, the classification. An indication of the type of, uh, of expertise? Yes. Okay, um, and um, you can, and, and you'll provide me with those uh, the details from two thousand and eighteen on notice, and um, I think that's, I think that's really all I need. If you can take those on notice, that would be appreciated. Okay, uh, see what we can provide there, Senator. Okay, thank you, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Walsh, you have the call. Uh, Sorry to get you yes. mid-gulp. Mid <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to go back to uh, Ms Bish for a moment uh, around the unpublished ATO uh, data that was uh, released by the government. Um, which uh, is said to, said to show that um, women under 35 have benefited by more than $5 billion due to um, the government's tax cuts. Uh, and my question is whether um, it's likely that a significant proportion of that $5 billion could be accounted for uh, by the loss of jobs amongst women workers in COVID uh, and by uh, the loss of hours, uh, which is well documented, uh, to have hit women workers hard during COVID uh, as they uh, left the labour market in, in higher numbers uh, to be on home duties. Um, Senator, um, I don't have uh, um, macro groups at the table to, um, uh, to help um, have some of the data at, uh, at my fingertips, but I think your generalisations about, um, uh, about uh, women in the workforce, the number of Australian women in jobs, the recovery of those jobs from the initial hit of COVID uh, is not backed up by uh, the data and the evidence from, uh, from uh, employment statistics that show a very strong recovery right across the labour market and in, right across the number of Australians in jobs and indeed of, uh, of hours work, notwithstanding disruptions uh, that have been caused from periods of lockdown, um, but, uh, and that uh, they have been very strong outcomes um, for uh, women as well, uh, achieving some of the highest uh, workforce participation rates that, uh, that we have seen for Australian women. Um, so I'm yep. happy for uh, the ATO a, yep. to, um, uh, to seek to um, answer so much as the question as uh, as they can, but uh, but I don't think um, the sure. general statements you've made are matched by the economic outcomes sure. that have been reported by the ABS. I was really attempting a, a, a more simple question than than that, um, which is if it's the case that um, 1.8 million young Australian women under 35 did pay five billion dollars uh, less in tax. Could it be the case that that is because they lost their jobs and hours of work, in addition to the tax cuts? I think um, um, I don't. I don't think there's a scenario where that is uh, is likely to be the case, 
given the extent of be they payments of JobKeeper, be they payments of different pandemic leave payments, be they payments that uh, that were made through state and territory schemes during the uh, during the lockdowns, that uh, um, that as we've heard in other evidence, if uh, if anything. Um, Household savings are higher at present uh, because of the extent of additional payments that have been made. Not I noticed that you're taking these questions, Minister, instead of Ms. Fish, and, it, and if that's how you want to handle it, that's fine. But can no, well, I'm, I'm, can, I'm happy can for you rule, can you rule out that can you rule out that a significant proportion of this five billion dollars um, could be accounted for by people losing their jobs in the study period, which was I, I, the last I, couple of years. I, I am actually quite happy to, um, with a fair degree of confidence, rule that out, Senator Walsh. But I'm also happy for Ms. Fish to, okay. uh, or other officials, to add anything they want to uh, and can. Um, I jumped in because the breadth of your question and the way you framed it wasn't uh, specific to uh, the ATO's data sets. But uh, insofar as they can provide any extra information, happy for uh, for Ms. Zay. Yeah they or any of the other officials to uh, add to my response. Okay, I'll just have, and understand that I think we're seeing the, the data at some point, but I just have sort of one last go at asking Ms Fish about whether we can rule out that some significant proportion of that $5 billion in uh, lower tax receipts um, could be accounted for by lost hours and lost jobs amongst women. Yeah. So, Senator, uh, I can't speculate on um, on the drivers of the outcomes. Uh, I guess the the data uh, is based on returns and um, and the inputs into it, not uh, speculation as to what drove uh, the the outcome. So, it is based on population and uh, and returned income. Uh, as well as the cut by gender and age, um, the, we are working on providing that data, including the assumptions and the methodology that went uh, into preparing the data. So uh, you'll be able to see, based on the assumptions and methodology, what was taken into account. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll go to some questions for the ATO. Uh, about the answer that you provided um, to my question on notice uh, 128, um, which is about the work that you've done on uh, 19,600 um, reviews of, of employers uh, and, uh, and whether they were um, paying an appropriate, <coughs> appropriate amount of, of superannuation. Um, so I'm not sure who's best to answer answer those questions, but um, you've said that out of the 19,600 uh, unpaid super reviews that you conducted in financial year 2021, um, you found 14,500 of those employers had been found to be owing uh, superannuation. Um, can you just first of all tell me um, whether you have a, another number of how many employers you might suspect owe superannuation? And, and what I'm trying to understand is whether that 19,600 is a small subset and, and what the size is of the, of the larger group. Uh, Senator, um, Deputy Commissioner Emma uh, Rosenberg uh, is uh, in charge of our superannuation area, so I'm presuming she will be uh, able to assist in that question. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Deputy Commissioner Emma Rosenzweig. Um, so, Senator, we don't have a figure of how many employers exactly have not paid. What we do do is measure that, um, like we measure for taxes, we measure our super guaranteed gap. Um, and so for our most recent measurement of the gap, it is at 3.8% as the net gap. Um, or 5.4% as the gross gap. So the gross gap is what the gap is before we intervene. 
And the net gap is the amount that's still outstanding after we have taken action, which is equivalent to $2.4 billion. Um, okay. Yeah. Yep. So we don't have a number of yep. employers, but that gives you a sense. So from those 19,600 um, compliance activities we undertook, we raised $880 million in liabilities. So that gives you a bit of a sense of scale yep. of comparison. Thank you. And so in, in your answer um, to, the, to the question on notice, you said uh, that 300 million of that was in penalties and 560 million of it, I think, was in actual unpaid super. Um, I note that you've, you've repeated your assessment of what the super gap is to be 2.45 billion, which you told us last time we were here as well. Um, I, I note for the record that there are larger numbers than that um, that um, are estimated by, by, by others, but, but that's, that's your estimate is, is 2.45 billion. Where, um, where's the other 2 billion in, in unpaid super? I mean, you've recovered 560 million in the last financial year. You estimate the gap to be 2.45 billion. Um, where's, where's the rest? Senator, I think that goes to the nature of a gap. So that is the amount that we have not collected and that has not gone to superannuation funds for employees. So, uh, Senator, Second Commissioner Jeremy Hershaw. Um, so, Senator, superannuation at, at its first is a matter between the employer and, their, and the employee. Um, we, of course, take, we take action on every time when an employee comes to us and says they're worried that they haven't been paid their super. So we action every one of those complaints. Um, we also do work to try to find proactively other employers who are not paying their super, even where the employee has not complained. We produce now on our website, it's possible for any Australian to go in and see their super balance and see that they're being paid super in real time. So they can uh, check up on their employer to make sure the super is going into their bank account. Um, we are also actively exploring how we can use things like single touch payroll data to try to ident better identify employers who are not paying their super. But to go to Ms. Rosenfeld's answer about where's the rest, the, re the rest is what we, by extrapolating from the part of, that we know about, we think there are lots, you know, potentially lots of little bits of non-payment, which we are, you know, we, when an employee comes to us, we, we try to ferret out with our best efforts. We are trying to proactively identify other examples, even where the employee does not realise and so we try to help employees who are, uh, and, and indeed we try to give every tool to employees to identify whether their employer is meeting their obligations. But it's, you know, there are, I think, 12 and a half million Australians in jobs. It's, you know, we don't audit every employee's super balance. Like it's, the, and super money doesn't come by the tax office, I think is important. The super money goes from the employer to the super fund. And so we are using our data as best we can to try to identify where it's not paid, but we can't audit every employment relationship. And also, Senator, if I could just add to that, that <clears throat> I said this once before, um, but the reality is that um, a relatively significant, significant amount of the unpaid is in uh, small to medium businesses that uh, become insolvent. Um, and uh, there is no money to recover. We have certain um, uh, powers uh, to deal with directors of, of companies that, that may be employed, employing people um, that are significant, um, uh, and we do use those. Uh, so it is an ongoing policy issue around the timing of the payments from the employer to the super fund. Uh, Second Commissioner Hershon mentioned our single touch payroll system that uh, is a payday reporting of salaries and tax withheld. 
Um, and as I recall it, it also discloses the promise to pay um, an amount of superannuation. However, uh, employers, a uh, significant number of employers, have up to three months uh, to meet that promise. Um, and uh, it's only after that period that we, when we get the amounts received, and it's very clear that this is a relationship between an employer, employee and a super fund, not us. Um, however, we have a lag in being able to use the information that super funds give us about amounts received mm. for employees, and this is a big deal, right, just to be able to do that in itself, um, versus the promise to pay reported under the super, uh, single touch payroll. Um, and therein uh, lies some of the problems when we identify that the amounts are not paid, we follow that up, the business is, is insolvent or whatever. So sure. it's, a, it's a sort of a structural issue here that we're dealing with and we're using our data okay. through STP and the data we get from super funds as best as we can. This is a terrible situation, no doubt in the world. Um, this is money that employees lose. The page you go I refer to that doesn't get paid, um, the government stands behind that. They credit that to you in your tax return right? if it's not paid, please. The same is not for super contributions. So it's a real loss to the employee and that's why we prioritise it hugely in, in the ATO because of that real loss to the employer. I mean, this, this $2 billion, uh, just under $2 billion, um, that we're talking about in the 2021 financial year, um, the gap between what you recovered and what you estimate the super gap to be, that is an extraordinary amount of people's retirement savings that we're talking about. $2 billion. And we're trying to be very, very transparent. Uh, and it's, in and it's, much, much, it's a much lower estimate than um, other uh, industry experts would, would put it at. But your evidence seems to be and your message seems to be to, to both workers and employers that the ATO is not well placed to do anything about it. Uh, we are well placed and we do do a lot um, about it, but there are some structural issues around timing of payments and timing of reporting of information that inevitably go towards uh, contributing to, to that tax gap bigger. Uh, we are incredibly transparent by publishing all this. Never used to happen. We've, we've put it all out there. Um, so the size of the problem can be dealt with, and it's not ideal. I absolutely agree. Um, and that's why a personal loss to the employee is something we are very concerned about and follow up uh, very diligently. And Senator Walsh, I mean, it's why the government's strengthened the ATOs powers and, uh, and supported them in the development of their tools and resources to, uh, to monitor employer compliance. Um, and, uh, and whilst this is an ongoing challenge, as, uh, as Commissioner Jordan has made very clear, the ATO has conducted uh, more than 19,000 reviews um, informed by its data and its analysis and, uh, and the targeting. It's raised more than $860 million uh, in liabilities uh, in doing so. Um, and uh, and uh, whilst, of course, the vast majority of employers do the right thing, um, we do wish to make sure that there is no tolerance for those who do the wrong thing, that employees receive uh, the entitlements, including the superannuation entitlements that they are uh, entitled to. Um, single touch payroll and, uh, and more regular uh, super fund reporting of employer contributions uh, have, as, uh, as the ATO has identified, improved their visibility uh, of employer compliance and, uh, and that enables the ATO to then better um, uh, target uh, their audit and, uh, and compliance activities. But, I mean, Minister, the, the data that's come back in the, in the answer that, that we're all talking about confirms that there's $2 billion, almost $2 billion of people super missing from the, from the $2.5 billion gap that we know of, how, how is that, 
how is government being being successful in getting people paid what what is owed to them? How, how could you consider that to be success? The two point five billion dollar gap in in one year, of which almost two billion remains lost. Um, well, Senator Walsh, the um, uh, it's uh, it's a question of. Uh, continuity of effort um, of um, providing the additional resources and technical capabilities for uh, better targeting to achieve even greater outcomes for even um, greater compliance. Uh, as I said, we should, uh, we should first and foremost in this space uh, acknowledge that the uh, overwhelming majority of employers do the right thing, um, but there's no tolerance where, uh, where um, any do the wrong thing. Um, uh, the ATO uh, obviously works uh, to address uh, those who may have inadvertently done so, uh, but, uh, but we have even less tolerance uh, certainly for those who uh, have deliberately uh, done so. Um, both uh, both uh, gross levels and net levels of unpaid superannuation uh, gaps have trended down in recent years, and, uh, and that's a function of the fact that um, the compliance activities are evident uh, to all. Um, that, the, uh, that the system in terms of the technology and the ability uh, for businesses to ensure compliance has continued to be enhanced and uh, we'll keep doing that and, uh, and pursue uh, further um, uh, closing of those gaps. I think that's a very important uh, point, Senator, that with the better data feeds now available to us that has resulted from investment by government in the system has enabled us to more, more real time but not quite real time yet, um, uh, match the promise to pay with the actual receipt, uh, the promise to pay under STP with the actual receipt by the super funds. That's going to get better and better. Um, and it is trending down. Uh, uh, we do um, shift resources into the superannuation uh, when we can to ensure that the turnaround times of receiving uh, a query or a complaint are less. Um, there was some issues a while back when we COVID and all that, that we, we, we had to move people uh, to other pressing uh, needs. But we believe this is top of mind for the executive of the ATA because of the reasons that I've said. And, and, um, and it is something we will continue to focus on and we will benefit from the investment that the government has made in us uh, to enable uh, better matching of the data from the fund uh, receipt uh, to what we have been told through SDP. And, and Senator Walsh, just in terms of the, the closing of that gap uh, and that trending down that, uh, that Commissioner Jordan and I have both referenced, my understanding is that um, uh, the gross gap in, uh, in unpaid super um, uh, has closed from 6.5% uh, in, uh, in 2013 uh, to 5.4% uh, in latest data uh, and the net uh, gap uh, closing from 5.5% to 3.8% in latest data. Um, so uh, so um, success is evident in terms of the work the ATO and the government uh, have pursued uh, to, uh, to seek to uh, close that and ensure that Australians receive the superannuation to which they are entitled. Um, uh, but the work is ongoing and as Commissioner Jordan has indicated, you know, there will always be a role for compliance, uh, but the ability to better target and monitor uh, using the enhanced data flows will be a very important and powerful tool to close that gap further. Um, yeah, I obviously find it extraordinary that you would claim that $2 billion in missing super in the last financial year is success. Oh, big claps. Uh, and if that is success, I wouldn't want to see what failure looked like. Um, Senator Walsh, there was a greater rate of failure when we came to office and there is a lesser rate uh, um, now. So the gap is closing um, and the data indicates and demonstrates that's the case. Well, even, even if it was, you know, two, two billion, the, what you claim to be a smaller figure, um, for every year of the last nine years of your government, we're talking about $18 billion on a, on a low estimate of missing superannuation and you're claiming success for the system that you have in place to, to find it. Senator Walsh, what we're 
what we are claiming is, uh, is that um, the methods we've put in place um, have been addressing this problem um, over time, uh, that the scale of the problem is less today than it was when we came to office uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what we are achieving um, uh, in, uh, in uh, addressing it and managing it, uh, and that the increased use of data and technology is going to uh, enhance uh, those outcomes even further uh, from the ATO. So um, we don't shy away from the fact that uh, there is an issue uh, and the work is ongoing in terms of addressing uh, that issue. Um, uh, but I think some acknowledgement uh, can go a long way to the fact that uh, uh, that work is real, it's yielding results and it's yielded improvements uh, compared with what we inherited. Um, we, uh, we spoke to uh, Treasury Corporate um, earlier today who referred us to the ATO uh, on some questions about um, advertising and outreach regarding the um, Your Future, Your Super uh, changes. Um, what, um, what advertising and outreach did the ATO do um, regarding the stapling changes that came into effect last year? Uh, Senator, um, I think this might be our Chief Operating Officer, um, Jackie Curtis, uh, uh, within her area, so um, I'll pass that on, but I will say um, any of the advertising that we do um, goes through a very rigorous uh, process of committees and approvals, etc. Um, but uh, I, I will pass to uh, our Chief Operating Officer. Thank you, Commissioner. And Jackie Curtis, Chief Operating Officer. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the actual detail about that campaign with me. I've got lots of detail on upcoming campaigns, but not that one, so I will have to take it on notice today. I apologise for that, Senator. Do, do you know if, or do, do, does anyone at the ATO know today um, whether you directed those outreach activities that I'm, that I'm sure you did um, primarily to employers or did you also direct them uh, to target employees as well? Um, Senator, I might pass to um, Emma uh, Rosen. I said it wrong last time, Rosalie, um, to, who says she might be able to answer some of these questions. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, Senator, so we did not undertake any paid uh, above the line advertising campaign for the Your Super, Your Future, Your Future, Your Super um, program. Uh, and I know you had some questions for Treasury earlier on that. So we did not have any above the line advertising for that. What we did do was um, use our existing methods of communicating. So we, we looked at both messages to employers to understand what they needed to do in terms of their obligations to use the stapling service. Um, and we ended up writing out or emailing all employers, 800,000 of them, to inform them of this. As well as we worked through our usual stakeholder groups, we had um, social media posts, we had fairly prominent web material about these obligations. In terms of the, I know you had some questions about um, how much information we gave to employees about their ability to, um, well, about the impact of the stapling service for them, but also their ability to use the comparison tool. So we made some uh, very prominent changes to the choice form. Uh, both the, the online version and the paper version that they get. So right on the front page, there was a big alert put about um, the new stapling obligations for their employers, so they would understand that. And as well, we again, we used social media and we had a really prominent web banner and those sorts of things. But all of our activities were you know, below the line, what they call mm. below the line activities on that program. We did not have any um, above the line that were our responsibility. So, in, thank you. So, in relation to um, employees, in order to access information that stapling was going to occur and what it might mean for them, they would have needed to go to your website uh, and go to your Facebook. Uh, or, uh, Senator, that the stapling only applied to new employees, so an employer didn't have to go back and request stapling for all their existing employees. 
And so a new employee is required to be provided with a choice form or access to choice by their employer. So the most targeted way we had to make sure that employees understood the impacts of state planning was to make it very prominent in that choice process um, that if they did not select a fund, that their employer would use the state planning service and receive a state planning fund for them. Uh, Cinder Walsh, I'd just like to give everyone an update. I had a chat with the Deputy Chair. We'd like to continue uh, to the end with uh, the revenue function and the ATO, if that's okay, uh, and then we'll have a break before we move to markets. Uh, so I think, uh, how much longer, Cinder Walsh, do you think? Um, I think, I think I would just clarify at the end there that there was no information campaign from the ATO uh, to employees in general about stapling, apart from them going to your website or going, seeking out information on your Facebook page or, as a new starter, filling out a form. Oh, you're just on mute. Sorry. Sorry. That's there was no above-the-line campaign uh, from okay. the ATO, no, that we used our existing mechanisms yep. to communicate. Yep. That's right. That, that's all my questions, Chair. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, you've got a few questions? Yeah. Senator Chisholm has the call. Thanks for that. Uh, I've got some questions for the Charities Commission. Um, obviously, uh, it's an election year, Mr. Johns. Um, we know that charities can't support or oppose particular parties or candidates. But excluding that kind of activity, would you encourage charities to advocate and campaign robustly on issues central to their purpose in the lead up to the federal election? Oh, sorry, we can't hear you, Commissioner Johns. Yes, you'd think after two years I'd get the button right, would you? No, 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 so, we, all, we all suffer from that ailment, I can assure you. Hear you now. Yeah. Senator Chisholm, um, I can't, uh, I can neither encourage nor discourage charities, their advocacy. Um, rest assured, they are free to advocate whether or not during the Um, you wrote in your uh, 10th of February commissioner's column that it's an important part of this country's democracy for charities to play this role. Um, what did you mean by that? That there is no impediment to charities having a voice in the political arena but the limit of that is that they don't have the purpose to just impose or support a candidate for political office. So we want to make it as clear as we possibly can. There are very few limits to advocacy in one of the charities in this country, by law. Um, but there is a limit, which is about having a purpose, which is opposing or supporting a candidate for political office. And from time to time, uh, we have advised charities about approaching that point. Okay. Um, so, uh, for example, would you encourage charities to play an important part of in democracy by sharing their public policy expertise with voters in the lead up to the election? Again, it's not my role as a regulator to encourage or discourage. The fact is, uh, they do and they are free to. Okay. Um, I just wanted to go into a bit more depth a bit about the column that you wrote. Um, if you could just indicate whether you agree or not. Um, you wrote that advocacy and campaigning are important to the work that many of Australia's registered charities undertake. Um, you agree with that, I take it? Yes. Okay. Um, you wrote that advocacy and campaigning are legitimate and effective ways of furthering the charitable purposes of a charity. I take it you agree with that? Yes. And you wrote that 
the ability for charities to advocate and campaign robustly on issues central to their purpose remains an important role, an important part of this country's democracy. I gather you agree with that. Yes. What did you mean by the advocacy and campaigning role being an important part of this country's democracy? Well, it's point, uh, part of the notion of it's that a, a country that really debates is not likely to be well governed. And as I say, there's simply no, very little impediment in charities in being engaged in that debate. Um, still on uh, your column, uh, you wrote that Charities are allowed to engage in advocacy or campaigning if these efforts are allowed under their governing document, for example, constitution or rules. Um, now that's slightly different from what, the, what your website advises, um, which is this. This means that a charity can, can campaign if it is satisfied that its governing document its brackets, its constitutional rules, does not prevent the activity. So you say charities can advocate or campaign if their rules allow it. The website says they can advocate or campaign if their rules don't prevent it. Uh, can you just confirm for us whether your column uh, and the website advice are drawing on the same regulatory guidelines and are intended to make the same point? Well, I think they are. Um Charities are free to advocate uh, what's in their constitution might restrict the areas in which they advocate, as in the field, the, the, the charitable fields. Because always a charity needs to pursue activities that are in line with their charitable purpose. So that's what to Um, uh, would you accept that the information given or the formulation used in the, your um, commissioner's column gives the impression that a charity's constitution needs to actively allow a charity to do advocacy, whereas the website advice sets out in a more open and permissive frame, i.e. the constitution does not prevent the activity? Either statement is consistent with what we've said any number of times, which is uh, free, you, a charity, are free to advocate and to be involved in public debate, including during a campaign period, um, up until the point where you're seeing a purpose of opposing or supporting a political candidate. Um, is there a reason? that you deviated from the website wording? I don't think so. No, okay. just a, a different statement, a different uh, elaboration of... OK. So, so, so just to try and confirm, um, uh, what is on the website, um, that is, unless the charity's constitution says it can't do advocacy, um, that it can do advocacy as long as it furthers their charitable purpose? That's correct. Um, so the ACNC does not require charities who engage in advocacy or campaigning to have an explicit provision in their constitution allowing those activities? That's correct. Uh, just on to uh, political purpose letters. Um, in that recent column, uh, you mentioned, uh, just this week we wrote to a charity over some material they were distributing, which was likely to be construed as opposing a political candidate or party. Uh, could you give us a sense in general terms of the material and distribution that prompted this letter you wrote? I can in a general sense, of course, I can't tell you the specific example, but uh, if material is distributed, which names a person uh, in office, candidate, uh, and it's quite clear from the material that they want that person either to 
supported or opposed, then we think it's a signal towards purpose that we might have. So we would advise a charity to be careful of being so explicit. Have you been writing an increasing number of those letters in recent months? No. Um, in, we've, in the past, we've heard the ACNC has initiated a rapid response approach to political purpose concerns during election periods. Uh, will that be the case again for this coming election? What will that look like and what period will that approach be in place? Uh, we will be responding to as we observe or complaints which we feel and not is on. We stand ready to consider the matter advise a charity where we believe that it's advisable to educate them on a matter, or we may simply do nothing because there is no issue. Um, I've just seen a statement put out by the Smart Energy Council um, saying that uh, the Commission has advised them that if they continue to tell people to uh, chuck them out or put him in the bin, um, which they've been providing on stickers apparently, they could be in breach of the charity laws and lose their registration as a charity. Um, are they one of the organisers, organisations that you wrote to recently? I can I give any so I don't need to confirm that. Uh, the point is well made that we give advice to charities as believe that could be construed as a purpose of opposing or supporting. Doesn't you say that they have? We prefer to educate. We prefer to give advice. And that advice is generally very well received. Um, can I can I ask what what the specific problem was with um, their material that they were distributing? I won't go to that particular one, but, but the issue here is when you name a candidate, when it becomes obvious to do with a person, then you're moving away from, for instance, discussing policy advocating policy or against. That's an important distinction to make. Um, just a final one from me. Uh, uh, the, the Charities Commission have previously provided a table of the Commissioner's travel and accommodation expenses accrued in the course of office holder travel. Um, could you please update that table? Yes, but it'll be pretty thin. Here am I in Brisbane and unable to move very far. But uh, yes, we can update that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Senator, Senator McKim, thank you. Thank you for your patience. You have the call. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I've just got some questions for the uh, Treasury revenue folks, and it's specifically uh, around the proposed patent box for medical and biotechnological research. And I just wanted to start by asking what the Treasury did of policy options to stimulate R&D investment and commercialisation in uh, medical and biotechnological research. I'm sorry, Senator. Can I get, ask you to please repeat the question? I think I missed part of it. Oh, my apologies. What, what uh, analysis did Treasury do of the policy option um, to stimulate um, R&D investment and commercialisation of medical and, biotechnolo and biotechnological research? And ultimately, um, you know, prevented with the Treasury Laws Amendment Tax Commission for Australian Medical Innovations Bill that's currently before the Parliament, but I'm just asking about what sort of um, analysis you undertook of the different policy approaches there. I might ask my uh, colleague, uh, Marty Robinson, to speak to this issue. Uh, thank Thanks, you. Senator. Marty Robinson, uh, Acting uh, First Assistant Secretary, Corporate and International Tax Division. Uh, so the um, patent box, as you'd be aware, was uh, first announced by the uh, government in the 2021-22 budget. 
Uh, at that time, it was announced that uh, the scope of the patent box would be uh, for uh, medical and biotechnology uh, related um, patents and innovations, and that the uh, government would also uh, undertake some consultation around the, uh, uh, the proposed measure and at the same time consult on uh, the possibility of expanding into uh, other areas around clean energy and uh, low emissions technology. Uh, so the, um, uh, that was uh, subsequently followed up by a uh, consultation process, Senator. So uh, I think in July, uh, Treasury um, issued a consultation paper and uh, we received a number of submissions, uh, I think about 48 in total, uh, in relation to uh, that consultation, where we set out a number of questions to, uh, to stakeholders, uh, asking about their views on, uh, on the uh, scope of the, um, uh, the proposed policy, uh, how it might be uh, implemented in practice, uh, what sorts of benefits it, it could deliver and so forth. Um, so as I said, we, uh, we got quite a, uh, quite a large response in the 48 submissions. Uh, they uh, set out uh, views on a range of, um, range of factors uh, that sort of went to uh, some of the uh, detail around the implementation of the patent box um, and, uh, and you know, uh, a number of views in that sort of way. We, uh, um, in, in going through and assessing those responses, we uh, made some changes to the proposed framework, uh, and that was obviously reflected in the, uh, the final legislation that was uh, introduced. All right, thanks. Um, but pre the announcement, was there any analysis taken? So you've been very um, open, thank you, taking mm -hmm. us through the process post the announcement and post the decision somewhere in government that a patent box was going to be the approach here, but pre the announcement, did Treasury um, undertake an analysis of differing policy options in order to stimulate R&D investment and commercialisation in um, the medical and biotechnological research sectors? Uh, so probably fair to say, Senator, that in the course of um, advising government on policy in the lead up to any sort of budget uh, type, uh, type process. Uh, we generally consider a, uh, a range of options uh, you know, to achieve policy outcomes and advise government uh, on those options. Uh, that's then a matter for government uh, deliberation through you know, the standard sort of uh, cabinet process to uh, uh, decide budget, uh, to decide policy that it wants to implement. Senator, if I could just um, add to that, uh, just to note that um, certainly uh, we were aware of uh, uh, quite a, uh, a number of views expressed in the academic literature around patent boxes. Um, we had also um, had the benefit of having some discussions with other countries uh, that have patent boxes. I think that there's around 20 uh, countries at the moment that uh, do have them. And I guess that the other thing um, that I would note is that um, obviously uh, the competitive nature of um, uh, the tax rates uh, applying to those patent boxes, uh, you know, were raised uh, with us and I'm sure must have been raised uh, with the government and certainly there were um, uh, a lot of conversations, you know, around particularly with different sectors, the medical and biotech sector. So I think that the existence of patent boxes and their implications you know, for uh, different sectors have been um, uh, actively under conversation for some time. Those were certainly a, you know, the broad range of considerations. I, I will also um, note that um, uh, you know, there has been references to you know, the um, academic literature. One of the uh, uh, key features of the patent box was in fact uh, in Australian uh, situation was the link to the research and development being undertaken in Australia as well. So uh, that was, I think, one of the uh, learnings um, through various um, uh, investigations that the OECD has done in terms of, uh, you know, uh, highlighting or reinforcing the benefits of um, patent boxes and certainly ensuring 
um, that they don't contain, you know, harmful tax practice type uh, considerations. All right. Well, um, it's my submission that the patent box is basically a tax avoidance framework for big multinational companies. Um, was the ATO um, consulted before, either before the announcement that a patent box uh, in these areas would be would be delivered, uh, or uh, as part of the consultations that we've heard of post the announcement? So, Senator, I uh, will um, take on notice answering the question. I, I will answer it by saying that I am fairly confident <laughs> um, that we would have consulted the ATO because we do, as a general practice, consult the ATO, uh, particularly uh, in relation to uh, new policy measures. Um, no. Yeah, so it's, it's basically, I would say, uh, gen the general business as usual approach. And so I would be fairly confident that we had consulted with them. But I am going to, uh, if I um, am incorrect in this particular instance, uh, I will get back to you. <laughs> sure. And if you could just on notice, please, just um, if possible, just uh, lay out for the committee the, the nature of that consultation and whether it was um, a announcement in terms of an analysis of all the different options available to stimulate R&D investment and commercialisation in these areas or whether it was simply post the announcement and whether they were simply consulted on um, how a patent box might look. Um, we'll see look, what we can provide uh, on notice. Could, yeah. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Look, I've had a number, as you probably know, from my previous kind of question, which was a part of comment. Um, I've had some um, pretty rigorous critiques of patent boxes put to me, so I just I can reference any of these if you're interested. Um, I just want to put them to, to Treasury and uh, or the ATO uh, and see what you think. Uh, Senator, Senator so McKim, so, sorry, Senator McKim, can I just, um, how, how long do you think this might take, just because we're, we're running oh, over time and I'm looking to get a break? And I've, sure, I've um, got two other Senators to, sp to yeah, have questions sure. before we move on to the next section, so. Sure, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can, Chair. If I mean, you could. Certainly, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So. Um, I'll, I'll stop making comments and just um, find lots of questions there. Um, so would you agree with this statement that lost government revenue from patents, patent box regimes that exist internationally is greater than increased R&D spending that those regimes have delivered? Would you agree with so, that? Uh, uh, Senator, we're not in a position to sort of agree or disagree. Um, with uh, statements with respect to uh, other countries and what might be occurring there. The only thing that I would note, um, referencing back the earlier comment you made, uh, and it was also something I tried to address in my answer to your question, a lot of the literature, I'll simply note, um, has been done on you know, uh, pre-2015, 2016 changes, where I think most of the patent boxes now are actually uh, linked to the research and development being undertaken in the country. And that's, uh, I think that that does have implications for some of the findings that have been found in that earlier literature and critiques around a patent box. You know, obviously there are um, uh, uh, challenges, but as I've pointed out, uh, the reality is that, you know, there are now over 20 countries that have got patent boxes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's certainly, the OECD has their uh, base erosion and profit um, shifting uh, process uh, that they um, manage, and patent boxes, you know, have been considered in the context of that BEPS uh, range of actions, and they are actually, you know, uh, consistent with uh, the BEPS initiative, uh, as long as that link to the research and development is there. But I will just ask my colleague uh, to make sure that I have been correct in those set of statements. Uh, yes, I, I completely agree with uh, what Ms. Mirakovic just said. Um, as, as she indicated, prior to 2015, uh, there was quite a, um, uh, quite a strong practice amongst countries that were introducing uh, patent box regimes to really try and attract the, uh, that mobile uh, intellectual property uh, to those countries. And 
what was happening was um, IP was shifting so that uh, income could be claimed and, and, um, and taxed at a concessional rate uh, where there had been no link to the research and development uh, in those countries. And what the changes uh, 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 forced in 2015 was a uh, stronger relationship between uh, ensuring that there, there was a close nexus to where the research and development uh, spending and activity was occurring with uh, where the concessional income could be claimed. And so uh, I think the issue there is um, it's, it's hard then to start to draw comparisons around um, uh, changes in tax revenue uh, and comparing that to R&D if you look at the sort of pre uh, regime change in 2015 versus what's happened since then. All right, thanks. So even post the the regime, as you've put it, uh, um, does Treasury have any evidence at all that patent box policies have actually attracted um, the location of patents traded on the technology market as opposed to um, asset shifting within multinational corporations? And I'm happy if you'd take this on notice. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to have it here with you, but if it on notice, just, just provide some evidence that patent boxes have actually worked in the way that we all presume they're designed to, rather than simply to facilitate um, asset shipping within big multinational pharma companies. Because that's what I'm very much afraid that we're proposing setting up here is a tax avoidance framework for the big corporate pharma. So if, if you could um, notice, provide we some take, evidence that it be We will take um, your question on notice and again see um, to provide an answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I'll just give you, because we're under time pressure, I'll put a couple of other questions in on notice um, on this. I just wanted to um, refer you to the 2018 Oxfam report that found that uh, Big Pharma was avoiding about $215 million in tax per annum by shifting profits out of Australia and into tax havens. Uh, have we got any idea what would be the value of profits that are artificially shifted offshore by companies that would benefit from the proposed patent box? And again, if you want to take that on notice and provide any um, uh, any response that you're able to, um, I'd appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm not aware of the report, so we will look um, into understanding what the report says and see if we can provide any information. Um, yeah. and probably in addition to that, Senator, we'd, um, uh, given that that would start to um, uh, come down to uh, narrowing in on, on particular companies in a sector, we'd probably need to consult with the ATO on uh, you know, whether there were sort of uh, taxpayer confidentiality considerations around that sort of reporting as well. Okay, Doc. Um, thanks. And I guess um, this is potentially one for the Minister, but it's on the same topic, but happy for folks from Treasury to buy into this. I mean, just on a, on a policy level, um, does Big Pharma need a tax break? I mean, it, it's part of their business case to develop intellectual property. I mean, it's what they do as companies. Why do we, what's the policy intent behind offering them a tax break? Well, a Senator, in, uh, from overseas experience, we've seen, say, for instance, in the UK, they did a report in 2019 that suggested that firms that use the patent box there displayed an approximate 10 per cent increase in investment. Now, obviously, the overriding objective of this government is not just for the economy to recover, but for um, more jobs, better jobs, higher paying jobs and cutting edge innovations to be housed in Australia. All right, thanks. I'll put some other questions in on notice of that. Okay, thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. And I don't imagine this should take a very long time. Um, I just wanted to get an update on the Pillar 2 model rules and Australia's um, progress in implementing uh, 
uh, a global minimum tax rate. Are we on target to be ready for 2023 implementation? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that uh, question. Um, so uh, uh, discussions are continuing um, at the uh, OECD <coughs> level in terms of making progress on both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, the OECD uh, did release in December 2021 uh, the model rules, mm -hmm. uh, which is an important step forward in terms of Pillar 2. There is, um, that actually set out quite a lot of uh, information with respect to Pillar 2. Uh, there is still um, some uh, technical uh, work and clarification um, that needs to uh, be done there and we are still continuing to work on that. So there are meetings between uh, Australian officials and, and indeed the officials of all countries involved in the process with the OECD. Um, we are also undertaking consultations um, uh, in Australia in terms of with, uh, stakeholders to kind of um, get their reactions and insights into what's being proposed. There's, as you can imagine, there is also um, quite a bit of work involved in terms of uh, still thinking about some of the interactions with the Australian specific situation. Um, nonetheless, we are making quite substantial progress and we continue to work towards the timeline that has been set um, you know, for you implementation. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any um, interim milestones? So I appreciate that you are engaged both in an, an international process of consultation and discussion and also a domestic one. Um, do you anticipate, for example, a formal consultation, um, you know, attracting submissions or, or something of that kind? Do you anticipate releasing an exposure draft? Have you given thought to the process you might step through uh, to implement this for 2023? Yeah, and I should actually, um, I will ask uh, my colleague, um, Mr Robinson, to speak to some of the issues in more detail, uh, but I should have noted that um, we're also still having uh, discussions around um, Pillar 1 as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the, again, um, the intention is that that would be so, sort of uh, addressed through a multilateral instrument um, and the timing for that is around mid-2022. Uh, that still remains the timetable that we are working towards, but um, I will say just generally that there is a lot of activity going on and people are very conscious of the timelines, uh, but uh, uh, there's still a lot of issues to work through. But in terms of the formal milestones or, or uh, timing or planning that we might have with respect to uh, Pillar 2 specifically in this instance, um, Mr Robinson, did you want to add anything? Uh, thanks. I, I would add, uh, as Ms Marakovic has uh, just said, we have been uh, undertaking some consultation on, on this already. We, um, we've been engaging with business uh, in particular through our, um, we, we have a uh, digital tax working group which covers both uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Uh, so we'd undertaken um, some engagement, I think, towards the end of uh, 2020. Uh, we met again, I think, in about uh, May of uh, 2021 with that working group. Um, and that was obviously just prior to uh, the uh, endorsement of the framework um, for Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 uh, in both the OECD and, and G20 in July and again in October. Um, I think towards the end of uh, end of 2021, I can't recall the precise timing, it might have been about uh, August or September. Uh, we also undertook some consultation with business around uh, Pillar 2 and the, um, uh, the model rules that were in, uh, in development still. Um, in terms of uh, going forward from here, uh, we would anticipate um, uh, further engagement and uh, consultation on, uh, in particular, Pillar 2. Uh, model rules. Um, so targeted consultation? Yeah, uh, uh, I, um, that would be a, uh, a public consultation process. Um, as we mentioned before, we have the model rules, but um, as Ms Marakovic said, uh, there's a second sort of compendium part to the model rules, which is the, uh, the, the model rule commentary, which is still under development um, in the OECD. We're hoping uh, that will be finalised very shortly. Uh, and that would then enable us the, um, 
you know, further detail to be able to consult publicly on. Uh, and then uh, I would imagine there would be ongoing consultation again at, at a point, for example, where there will draft legislation after government um, uh, had, had taken uh, final decisions around implementation. Um, but that time frame will basically, you know, go on through 2022 in terms of precise dates for those different milestones. It's probably still a little bit hard to say, given there's been a little bit of slippage in some of the OECD um, um, milestones, uh, but we're still working very hard towards that um, 2023 commencement. So the outstanding task from a, a global negotiation, from an international negotiation perspective, is the, the commentary, I mm -hmm. think you referred to it. On pillar two. On pillar On two. Pillar two. Yeah. Um, has the international community established a, a target for concluding that discussion? The uh, actual it, discussion around the commentary, you mean? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it seems that that's the critical yeah, that's path right. so, for Australia to move to implementation and yeah, to a proper yeah. consultation. So I'm trying to understand mm. the timing, really. Yeah. So it's the OECD has had set out the uh, the time frames for that work to occur. Um, the intention was that that uh, commentary was going to be finalised by the end of January, mm -hmm. um, just just passed. So um, that has uh, slipped a little bit, as I mentioned. Where, um, teams are still doing many late nights, um, even as we speak. Um, on, on those negotiations, but um, the, the view is that's that's getting close. Right. So and I guess so the, the way of thinking about it, it, it has slipped a few weeks, mm. but we remain focused on the same right. end date at this point. And so if you are a stakeholder or an interested Australian citizen in this process, your next opportunity will be a public consultation on the rules and the commentary. Um, at some later point this year? Um, yes, and we would hope to get out there as soon as possible from our perspective. So once we have the commentary, and I think that the other piece is that we really do want to um, uh, properly integrate it with uh, the Australian system in terms of there are a, a certain number of features of the Australian tax system. We're not alone. Every country will have to think about how it integrates its own specific tax system with the pillar to model rules and commentary. Uh, we don't envisage that that is going to take a very long time. And, and indeed, this is exactly a component of what we would seek to benefit from being able to actually consult mm. publicly on. Yep. Um, and so, uh, yes, it's in our interest, um, quite frankly, Senator, to um, go out there as early as we possibly can and benefit from um, the, you know, the reactions and feedback from stakeholders. Um, have you tr calculated how much these reforms will return to Australia's tax base? So, Senator, um, it, it's a really good question, but it's also uh, incredibly difficult to answer, um, particularly with respect um, well, so it's from a process perspective. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Have you done this work or not? I'm not so much looking for the content, just uh, right. whether or not this is a process. So we have not take. done it as such. There has been some OECD uh, calculations sure. that were done around the, the benefit to global turnover. But just to give you one example, the whole sort of logic behind Pillar 2 is to avoid that race to the bottom. You might have seen that there has been a number of announcements by countries who are increasing their corporate tax rates. So the kind of philosophy is um, if another country is going to be able to tax me if my effective corporate tax rate is below 15%, I may as well increase my tax rate to 15% so that I'm the one who's benefiting from that increase in revenue. So every time another country increases its uh, effective tax rate to 15%, another country thinking, hey, I might be able to actually impose a top-up tax because their effective tax rate is below 15%, has to do their own recalculation. Mm. And I think that's the challenge. We have so much instability and changes occurring mm -hmm. that it is difficult for us to um, uh, do an estimate of this. We hope that as, the, um, as time progresses, uh, and there is a bit more clarity around what countries are doing, that we will have a relative degree of stability which will enable us to do 
those estimates. Understood, but not yet. Um, and just finally, you mentioned some of the work that you're doing already in, a, I think, a targeted way with stakeholders. Is it correct to understand that these are the affected stakeholders in who are operating within our economy and our jurisdiction? Is that, are they the main organisations you're seeking to speak with? Well, um, I think there are, um, I mean, there are roughly, we estimate, around um, 5,000 uh, companies in Australia that meet the um, significant uh, global entity threshold, which mm -hmm. is you know, effectively the turnover threshold for multinationals uh, that, that could be uh, potentially uh, impacted. Uh, the actual threshold for applying Pillar 2, uh, the global minimum tax, is 750 million euros of turnover. So it's around about 1.2 uh, billion Australian. So we. Um, uh, there are uh, around, uh, you know, I think it's 5,000 or so um, companies that mm. are uh, potentially uh, in scope. Of course, many of those um, would have effective mm. tax rates above the 15%. Uh, so it's probably fair to say that our uh, engagement has been pretty broad in terms of the, the sectors that we've been engaging with. We've also been uh, engaging with, uh, you know, tax advisory uh, firms. Um, and, and some of the uh, industry bodies that, that sort of represent larger groups of, of business. Right, okay, all right, that's uh, very useful. Um, just before we finish up, because this is my last, and I think Labor's last round of questions and, and for Senator these Senator Patrick groups. has a, a few minutes he needs. Yeah. Yes, Go but on. from an opposition yep, yep, perspective. Um, Mr Jordan, how have you gone tracking down these spreadsheets that you've been producing on a fortnightly basis for the Treasurer? Um, we're meeting directly after we finish this. Um, the data is the data that we've provided and uh, we're, we're compiling all the assumptions and methodologies used to generate that data that weren't necessarily all provided to the Treasurer's office, a lot of in-house detail. So we'll have both of the data and the methodologies and assumptions used. Um, we hope to be able to provide that shortly after this. Shortly after the dinner break, Mr Jordan. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chair. Excellent. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Just returning to my, um, uh, to, to just my, my concerns about this sort of big list of non-taxpaying corporates. Um, uh, Commissioner Her uh, Deputy Commissioner Hershorn indicated that there is action potentially behind the scenes being taken or uh, being taken in relation to some of these companies um, in terms of audits and or enforcement of some, of, of some kind. The difficulty I have is that you, know, you have your job to make sure you collect tax and to do so in a fair way and, and uh, within, within the law. Uh, my job is to make sure you're doing your job and I can't see how, I can't see from the data that I have available that, uh, that, that you guys are actually doing that. That's not to say you're not, I'm just saying I can't see that. And I'm wondering if there's some way in which you could uh, indicate, and it might be by way of some aggregates or some, some examples. I'm, what I'm gonna do, and the chairs, I've talked to the chair about this, I'm gonna table my list, which I've just taken from your tax transparency data, of the 150 companies that didn't pay any tax over the over the entirety of the period of the tax transparency data. I'm going to table that and ask you to look at those, look at the numbers that I provide you, or the companies I provide you, and, and give me some indication as to how you might have been uh, dealing with uh, this situation, um, Commissioner. I wonder if we can find a way to deal with this sort of. In a, in a way we're not sort of confrontational. Yep. So Senator Patrick, just to, just to tease this out um, and, and, and perhaps give the Commissioner an opportunity to reflect, as I understand the document you, you, you're proposing the table is a, is a spreadsheet you prepared in your office or prepared within your office which, has, which is based on uh, the transparency uh, information which you've gathered from uh, the ATO uh, and we're going to make sure that um, 
when it is tabled, it's going to be clear that this document has actually been generated by your office. It's not the ATO's document. Sure. It's, a, it's a document which you've compiled from the ATO's data, um, and, and you're seeking from the Commissioner uh, some pathway uh, for there to be the provision of comfort that, um, in terms of the companies, and you gave some examples earlier, um, which haven't paid tax, that um, there's, there's some action, scrutiny, um, undertaken by the ATO in relation to those those companies and the uh, I think the um, the second commissioner referred yeah. to some of the action and some of the context yeah, and, and, in that and it might be just so that's, the, yeah. that's what you're yeah. seeking and it might, uh, and through it might the just, tabling of the, the that's document right. is and that it correct? That's correct and it might be just that you say that look of, of the companies you named we actually audited um, 28 of them we uh, uh, you know, took action against 17 of them and recovered this amount of money uh, by way of enforcement. Something along so, those lines. So you're, you're seeking a response on an aggregate basis. Yes, so you're not right. seeking not a response an individual in relation company. to particular companies. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Jordan, um, do, do you see a pathway? Yeah, look, uh, uh, Chair and uh, Senator Patrick, um, I uh, commit to you that we'll do whatever we can uh, to, bro to provide assurance to you um, that we are doing our job effectively. Um, uh, Second Commissioner Hershorn mentioned that uh, what is not evident in, in, in the uh, tax transparency figures that are published is the work we've done in disallowing losses that are being carried forward um, because there have been um, very significant inroads into debt dumping into Australia resulting from the Chevron case that we've been able to um, uh, apply more more broadly, and uh, if uh, you could think about, and you said, don't get you started on oil and gas, but I, uh, at the risk of poking a bear, <laughs> um, <laughs> here we go. Uh, that um, uh, the big expenditure in in our economy has been in a lot of those uh, those projects. So uh, it would not surprise you to know that there's probably a lot of debt being financed um, to fund. Uh, those uh, projects in a way that we now um, have the power, pursuant to the Chevron case, to revisit. So, uh, so we expect, so we expect uh, a number of companies in the industries uh, that have had high levels of debt to be paying tax a lot earlier than they otherwise would because of the very, very significant reduction in the carry forward losses that have resulted from our audit activities, our compliance activities, but does not yet show in those transparency figures. Uh, Mr Hershorn mentioned, you know, and, and the Chair asked for it to be repeated because they were significant. $26 billion of deductions that are not going to happen. Um, a lot of those are a result of our compliance activities and a lot of which do uh, apply to the debt dumping rules. So, yeah, second, se second Commissioner Hershorn, you can see a pathway in terms of yeah, um, yes. providing the comfort that uh, Senator Patrick's looking for? Uh, yes, so, Chair, if, if I could take it on notice, um, sure. and I, I think what we are taking on notice is uh, what information we can provide around a population of companies that Senator Patrick will provide, what evidence, like, and I don't want to tie myself to any specific forms of information, but we'll, we'll work out what forms of information about against which fields we can provide Senator Patrick to provide the community the confidence that they should have that we are holding these companies to account. Yeah, so yeah. And, and I'm not in any way suggesting you're not doing your job. I'm just saying it's not it's not yeah. readily visible to the committee that that you know, the, all of these things that you've mentioned. Um, and uh, can I also ask you that you do that in relation to PRRT, the tax transparency data around PRRT? Because I know that you might, you, know, you might have gone back and looked at some of those, those as well, um, to see whether there was, you know, pricing at particular points in the in the processing chain or, or you know, transfer pricing taking place there. Yes. So indeed, yes. So Senator, we'll work out what we can say. PWRT is harder because it is such a small population, but um, and indeed there are a couple of PWRT disputes which are in the public domain. Yeah. Uh, uh, both historic and current, but we'll, we will see what information we can provide without affecting taxpayer secrecy, which will give you this confidence. Now, now can I just ask another question, that, and this goes to, I understand 
with the tax transparency data, there was, a, there was an amendment that listed the data that you needed to disclose being total revenue, taxable income, tax paid. Uh, in some sense, that it's misleading, the, 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 the data is misleading if in fact companies have gone back and ended up paying, paying tax. Uh, I wonder, I mean, does that require an amendment of legislation? Because it, in some sense it actually um, is misleading for the company involved. You know, that, that, that it, it turns out they have actually paid some tax or some money has been recovered and that's not recorded in, in some way. Yes, yeah, so indeed, Senator, this would of course be a great breach of taxpayer secrecy, the corporate tax transparency data, except for the fact it is legislated that we have to publish each year, as soon as reasonably practicable, those very few limited fields. Uh, I, I think at the time there was, you know, ultimately then it's a policy and indeed a legislative matter to change the fields that we publish in the Corporate Tax Transparency mm -hmm. Report. Okay. We, we are, it is a, a very tightly bound legislative exception to the secrecy laws. I'm just wondering whether or not and this is about also being fair to the companies, whether or not that needs to be expanded in some way, modified in some way, that would uh, provide a more accurate picture. So, Senator, uh, as I've said before in this committee, I'm the bricklayer, not the architect. That is a policy matter. We just publish what we're told to publish. Yeah. Okay. Senator Patrick, is that...? Uh... Well, I think, in fact, if, uh, depending on what data you feed back to me, that may help me I don't know, propose an amendment to reach some agreement with, uh, with um, Minister Hume on uh, you know, moving forward. And that's to try and just be accurate about the, the data. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. One, other, one other quick uh, thing, Senator Patrick, is um, sometimes the courts don't agree with our position mm -hmm. uh, in these matters. And I think it was a full federal court decision recently uh, for Shell, a um, $2 billion deduction for acquisition of an interest in a uh, mining or, uh, project um, that uh, we took issue with, but the uh, full federal court um, disagreed. And, and maybe just there's one question on, final question on notice. Uh, noting you are using litigation as a means for uh, recovery uh, or establishing what the law might be, um, can you maybe over the last five years tell each of the last five years tell me how much has been spent on litigation associated with recovery of of tax? Because that, in some sense, is a measure across the board, of across across the board or a board now. Well, ha, ha, I'm really after the bit that you know what, what you're doing with the big guys, not not yep. uh, not the small not the small players. Look, we'll, we'll do what we can there. I, I just don't know how the, that information is cut and diced. I know the famous sure. Chevron case was $10 million was our cost over a long period of time for experts uh, and all of that. It, it's paid itself back in hundreds, thousands of uh, times, sure. but um, these things can cost, uh, sure. particularly when it's around transfer mispricing. Sure. So I'm, I'm really after the, you know, I, you might take a small company to court and the return is not, not uh, substantial, but it's, it, on principle you have to do that. Uh, th there'll be a, like, like the Chevron case, you spend a bunch of money on that and the return is significant in the context of not just Chevron, but every other player. So it's kind of those, that second category I'm looking at. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, can I thank all the witnesses, Commissioner Jordan, to your team. Thank you very much for the work leading up to that $26 billion figure. Um, which we referred to. It's an outstanding achievement, so I congratulate everyone involved in that endeavour. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. The officials from uh, Secretary, thanks for uh, joining us. Sorry we went a bit over time. And to uh, Commissioner Johns, uh, thank you uh, very much for joining us uh, today as well. And we will uh, now take a 10-minute break. Um, Chair, can I just, uh, before you do uh, uh, make a break, um, Senator Urquhart, uh, asked a question about uh, the money spent on labour hire in Tasmania for the ATO. I can confirm that as of 31 December that year it was zero for both Hobart and Burnie. And I think she asked for earlier years, so we'll have to go back and only provide 
early years, but we did try to we committed to get what we can in session, but it was zero. Ex excellent, Commissioner Jordan. Thank you for that, and I'll make, we'll make sure Secretariat lets uh, Senator Urquhart know that you've uh, provided that information in such a timely fashion. So, uh, thanks to all of the witnesses. We'll now, now take a ten-minute break, and then we'll be coming back with uh, the markets group. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll reconvene. So, um, welcome, Ms. Quinn, and your team. Uh, good to see you, Minister. And uh, I'll give the call to Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Treasury issued a consultation paper on proxy advice in April last year. When did the Treasurer first ask Treasury to review the proxy advice industry? Um, so, Megan Quinn, Deputy Secretary, Markets Group. Um, I'll just have a check to see whether I've got that date. Obviously, it was before we issued the the release, uh, the consulta consultation report. Mm. So I don't have that date with me. I'll just check uh, if my colleague, Mr Dixon, does. I, I'm really just asking some process issues about the, th the steps that were taken in the lead up to the release of the consultation paper on proxy advice. Yep. My specific question was when did the Treasurer first ask Treasury to review the proxy advice industry? Um, certainly. So. Uh, for the hand side, Tom Dixon, Assistant Secretary of Corporations Branch. So um, just looking at the, the timeline, I know that the, um, the media release for the um, consultation being published was on the 30th of April. And so um, I don't have the precise date leading up to when we, were, when we were asked to prepare advice, but it would have been in advance of that date. So looking back, um, it would have been yeah, before the 30th of April, 2021. But, um Senator, we're happy to take it on notice to, to see where we can provide uh, more detailed information. Um, I'm aware of advice having gone in previous times, um, so it wasn't just one set of advice. Um, I, I, am, I have a recollection of a, of a series of discussions around parts of the financial system, um, but happy to take it on notice, um, the, the timings. Um, I do have further questions about it. but. My, I am most interested in understanding the sequence. So I wonder if um, one of my colleagues may wish to answer, ask some questions about other matters and you could see if you could just let me know. I'm just trying to understand. I, I, I appreciate that ASIC had looked at this some years back in 2018, but obviously there's a process within Treasury that leads to the issuing of a consultation paper, I'd like to understand when that began. So can you can I ask that you check that now? We can go to another senator and when that advice is available we'll come back. Would that be all right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, Thank you. Is, is that okay, Mr Dixon? You, that gives you an opportunity to, to check whatever you need to check? Sure. And um, it's um, these sort of past closing time for the for the department, so we I might not be able to get back to the team to actually get an answer. But okay. I'll do my best. Well, just do your best, and, and yep. you can come back, and we'll see what we're up to. Senator okay. McAllister, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So send sure. send a chisel. Oh, send a what? Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just ask a few <laughs> questions about the proposed reinsurance pool? Mm -hmm. The North, North Queensland um, Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool, to be specific. Um, I saw some media last week that, uh, with the government, has claimed that the reinsurance pool, it, it now has modelling that shows the reinsurance pool will delay, deliver savings on insurance premiums of up to 46% for homeowners and 58% for strata policy holders as a result of the pool. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, about this modelling that shows this? Um, so this, this is analysis based on um, a process of refining the 
the, the arrangements for the scheme, so what are the design features of the scheme, um, working with uh, industry uh, and insurers, um, so both sides of the insurance market to get extra information. Uh, and then there was um, detailed analysis uh, using consultants to uh, come to expectations about the savings that would be arrived at given the final design features. Um, and as and you're right, um, it is expected that um, the cost pressures will, re um, will reduce it will produce discounts of 46% for households, strata properties 58% up to, because it depends on the particular characteristics of properties, and then up to 34% for uh, smaller, medium-sized enterprises as well. So this, who did the modelling? So uh, the, there was sort of two um, different steps in the process, uh, but these numbers are drawn from uh, analysis from Fidelity. Sorry, they're drawn from? Analysis consultancy with Fidelity. Oh. Right. J James Kelly, First Assistant Secretary, uh, Financial System Division, um, just to correct, uh, it's Finity. Oh, Finity, the sorry. Finity. So they're consultants who are engaged? <laughs> Finity. Oh, Finity. Finity. Um, okay, so they did the modelling, Finity. And when was that finalised? I'll pass to my colleague, I don't have that detail. Um, so I can, maybe I'll just say a bit more about uh, the modelling, um, just to add some context before we get to the, to the date of the answer. So, um, Finity was the primary actuary um, consulting firm that we used. Uh, they did an initial kind of scoping uh, early in the process in March, uh, and then we did a second contract and with a few kind of variations as we went along uh, as part of finalising the final design. So they assisted with uh, estimating, um, assisted with the, the design uh, and estimating the impacts on uh, premiums uh, and other elements of the process. We also engaged risk management services, which is an internationally recognised uh, catastrophe modelling um, firm. So they provided uh, kind of supplementary and supporting information uh, as part of the process. We also had the Australian Government Actuary uh, involved at all steps of the process to again provide a level of insurance around uh, the modelling. Uh, I don't have the precise date on which we received uh, the final report uh, on the final design as announced uh, or put into legislation by the government. Uh, I'd have to take that on notice, okay. but it was, yeah, it was um, within uh, near the end of last year. The sorry, it was towards the end of last year. Uh, it was I think so. um, Could you please table that modelling? No, I'm afraid, Senator, what um, that the government is going to make a public interest immunity claim um, in relation to the production of modelling on the basis of well, two bases. One, that it informed and it was the subject of Cabinet deliberations, and for that reason disclosure would then disclose the deliberations of Cabinet. Uh, the government believes it's not in the public interest to disclose information about Cabinet's deliberations as it may impact the government's ability to receive confidential information and make appropriate decisions impacting the Australian community. So I advise the committee that the government also claims public interest immunity over the information requested originally by Senator Chisholm a couple of days ago on the basis of commercial confidentiality. In accordance with the resolution agreed to by the Senate on the 30th of October 2003 relating to claims of commercial confidentiality, the following statement sets out the basis of the claim and the commercial harm that may result from the disclosure of the information. So parts of the modelling were prepared and provided to the Treasury on the basis that it would be kept confidential, as it contains commercially valuable information. To disclose such material would undermine the ability of the Treasurer, as well as other government agencies, to obtain the benefit of such services in the future, as well as provide, provide advice to government. Um, Senator Chisholm also requested copies of all stakeholder submissions provided to Treasury during the consultation process for the reinsurance pool. A relatively small number of these submissions were provided to Treasury on a confidential basis and marked confidential. So the government also claims public interest immunity in relation to the production of those confidential submissions. To disclose information that Treasury has received on an explicitly confidential basis is likely to erode stakeholder confidence in the consultation process and deter stakeholders from openly engaging with and providing any commercially sensitive information to the government um, to inform future policy de development. Treasury did, however, receive over 100 submissions that were not provided on a confidential basis. So non-confidential stakeholder submissions are currently being processed for publication on the Treasury website shortly. Shortly. So, Minister, you say you've got some modelling which 
shows that people in North Queensland will save up to 46% on their insurance premiums if they're a homeowner, or 58% for strata properties, but no one can see the modelling that you say you have. Is that right? Well, it's not in the public interest to disclose that information oh. about Cabinet's deliberations because it may impact the government's ability to receive confidential information and make appropriate decisions impacting so the Australian So North Queenslanders community. can't be trusted to see the modelling that you say you have that shows that they'll save up to 46% on their insurance premiums. That what do you reckon, Senator Macdonald? Would North Queenslanders like that? I'm sorry, well, Senator Macdonald's not a minister yet. I'm very so pleased don't answer the question. Northern, Northern Australia reinsurance. But they, ca they can't be trusted to see the modelling. Uh, that's not, they don't want to see the modelling because they're relying on the government to bring in this yeah. announcement. It's, so, it's, I'm not answering questions. So North Queenslanders should just no, trust no, this North. government. <laughs> North Queenslanders should trust this government that is known for being able to be trusted, never tells lies that you'll give them an insurance cut of up to 46%, but you've hidden the modelling away, never to be seen. Well, thank you for the compliment, the Senator Watt. But I think you may have the people of Northern Victoria, of Northern, Victoria, Northern, Victoria Northern Queensland, <laughs> will be particularly pleased to have access to the reinsurance pool. So what proof at all, Minister, can you present today that shows that North Queenslanders actually will receive these insurance premium reductions that you claim they will? Well, I think the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, Senator Watt. So people should just go to the next election and make their decision about who they want to be the government based on knowing one day that they might receive a premium reduction, but you can't prove it now. Oh, I think that people will go to the next election and base their vote on many different factors, including how strong the economy is. This, oh, it's a very big issue in Northern Queensland, I know that. But they'll also make a decision on whether it's a strong economy, what their employment status is, how much money they've got back in their pockets from our tax cuts. I think that they'll base their decision on a lot of factors. So you, you can't produce any proof at all to back up these claims the government's making? That's not what I said. I well, said we will not be producing the modelling you. that you have requested. Okay. okay. Well, I don't accept that you should you can hide the modelling, but I invite you to present any proof at all that backs up these claims that your government has been making in the media. I think the people of Northern, Northern Australia are going to be extremely pleased that they have a reinsurance pool from which they can draw significant reductions in their uh, insurance premiums. You just can't prove it. I think that the people of Northern Australia will be very pleased at the government's announcement. But isn't... I mean, your, your climate policy, if I recall, relies on technology that hasn't yet been invented. And now we've got a reinsurance policy that relies on modelling that no one can see. You just think people should trust you? I think you're drawing such a long bow there, Senator Watt, you're gonna pull a muscle. Your, because <laughs> people have been waiting a very long time for your government to do something about this. There've been promises made for the life of the government. I'm gonna ruin your Twitter clip. I'm not thinking about Twitter clips, I'm, I'm okay. thinking about insurance premiums. Um, okay, well, again, all I can do is ask that you give some respect to people in North Queensland and show the modelling that you say backs up these claims. The, the other thing I noticed in this, in the Minister's press release, Minister Sukar, when he made this announcement was that he said, Homeowners in Northern Australia with the most acute cost pressures are expected to benefit from up to 46% premium discounts. What, what does that mean? What do we mean by homeowners with the most acute cost pressures? I would imagine, and I'm speculating, that it means those homeowners that have the highest premiums. Well, Ms Quinn or Mr Kelly, can you explain to us what, what we mean by people with the most acute cost pressures? Um, so just just to be clear, the, the legislation um, that contains the design elements for the reinsurance pool were in, was introduced on the 9th of February, and the regulations that underpin it were also released. So the design features of the reinsurance pool are in the public domain, 
and, and they set out um, the principles on which uh, the, the pool will be created uh, and, and managed by the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation. Um, and those design elements are designed to ensure that the maximum reduction uh, is um, goes to those people who have experienced the highest increases in premiums in recent times. So is that, that, is that essentially that's how we define it, is the people who've experienced the most, the biggest increases in their premiums? So it's, it's, it's around um, what the, the most risk that they bear in response to the cyclone um, risk, and so which in the past the insurance premiums have reflected increases in risk. So you can characterise it either those that bear the most risk or those that bear the highest costs, mm. um, depending on which way you wanted to characterise so, it. So in layperson's terms, how would you de describe the kind of people who will get this premium reduction, the most acute? So I'm happy to pass to um, I mean, Mr you, Kelly. I mean, the way um, to process it is you can kind of think of categories of low, like kind of low risk areas or kind of low risk properties, medium risk properties and high risk properties. Um, so the, the, those higher end uh, savings are referred to by the governor at the higher end. Okay, so what, uh, what percentage of North Queenslanders are considered to be high risk? Now, Senator, you're asking a question that essentially goes to the to the modelling itself. Um, that, well, that's um, why I'm not the modelling statement on. The it, so it doesn't mean, Ms. Quinn, that every homeowner in North Queensland will see a premium reduction of up to 46%. It's only the high risk homeowners. So uh, the up to um, is the expression. Um, talking about the, the, the largest reductions that people will get, how much people uh, will see will depend on their risk and depend on their insurance uh, that they have and other features that they co-insure, for example, as well. So what's the average, what's the average premium reduction expected for homeowners in North Queensland? So that, that um, number is, is not in the public domain. Because that's part of the stuff that the government's not prepared to release? Correct. Minister, don't you owe it to the average homeowner in North Queensland to tell them what their premium reduction is going to be? Well, Senator, what I know, Labor are very upset that because they don't have a plan to make assurance, insurance more affordable in Northern Queensland themselves. I'm that you do. But what I can say is that this plan, the one that has the legislation which has already been introduced into the parliament, has been welcomed by all stakeholders, including the Real Estate Institute of Australia, who said it's a win for well, homeowners and for renters. IAG, who said that the reinsurance pool will make insurance more affordable for home, strata and small business policyholders. And the Insurance Council of Australia, who welcomed the reinsurance pool's design. Have you seen what RACQ had to say about the, this? They sent an email to every one of their members in Queensland um, saying the RACQ is currently unable to validate the premium reductions that have been reported in the media. So, and I understand Suncorp has also had a bit to say questioning whether these figures can be believed. So it's not quite right to say that all stakeholders say this is a great thing, is it? Have you found a stakeholder that said it's a bad thing? I've certainly found stakeholders like the two biggest insurers in Queensland who say they can't see how people are going to get the premium reductions that the government's claiming. Insurance well, the reinsurance pool in North Queensland. The reinsurance pool is expected to increase competition and it's supposed to put pressure on premiums and is there's 2.9 billion dollars in premium reductions that are anticipated for eligible households, for strata properties and for small businesses. Is that what your modelling says? Correct, Senator White. So you can tell us about the modelling? No, the modelling. I can tell you what the information that's in the public domain, but I can't show you the modelling. So we can't, you won't tell us what the average householder in North Queensland can expect by way of premium reductions under this pool, Minister? It's estimated that for those living in Northern Australia and those particularly with those with the most acute cost pressures, they can expect to benefit from premium discounts of up to, as you said, Senator Watt, 46% for homeowners, 
58 per cent for, for strata properties and 34 per cent for small and medium enterprises. I, no, that's all through that's all your press release, I get that. But Mr Kelly, can you give us a rough percentage of the number of homeowners in North Queensland who would be considered high risk? Are we talking 5 per cent, 10 per cent? I'm assuming it's not 50 per cent. If they're high risk, they're, they be, must be a relatively small group. Oh, Senator, you're, you're going to the details of the modelling uh, again uh, that was done for these purposes. If I, if I can just take the opportunity to come back to the question I wasn't able to fully answer before. So the final report was Finity. Uh, we um, saw a new final copy on the 2nd of November and it was finalised and formally handed over on the 29th of November last year. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we actually now know is it's only high risk property owners who might receive premium reductions of up to 48% or whatever the figure is, but it's, it's not true to say that the average homeowner in North Queensland will get a premium reduction of up to 48%. It's only high risk, isn't it? Well, that's pure speculation, Senator Watt. I don't know Well, you, you can put from. me out of my misery if you tell me what the average homeowner is going to save. That's what, like, that's what actually people in North Queensland want to know. For those living in Northern Australia with the most acute cost pressures, yep, they it. can expect to benefit from premium discounts of up to 46% for homeowners, 58% for strata properties and 34% for small and medium enterprises. The, um, the other issue I've heard about this is that um, what the government's proposing um, is that the reinsurance and essentially the damage um, will only be covered if it occurs, I think it's within 48 hours of a cyclonic event. Is that how it works? I probably haven't expressed that particularly well. Uh, Senator, it's 48, 48 hours after the end of the cyclonic event. Right. So cyclones tend to be, especially when they cross the coast, it's a relatively quick, um, you know, within 24 hours, 48 hours, that it's wreaking havoc before it either dissipates, blows out to sea, blows further inland. Um, but any, so any damage that occurs because of, say, floodwaters that happen beyond 48 hours after the cyclone won't be covered by the pool. Is that right? Um, I think, uh, I mean, there, there's always elements kind of wording around this, but uh, as my understanding is that it relates to damage that commences um, within the 48 hour period. Mm. So it commences and some of it can mm. extend out. Um, but yes, 48 hours mm. is kind of the basic. So to give you an example, Cyclone Debbie, which happened in Queensland, North Queensland a few years ago, came over the coast, lots of damage within the first 24 hours in some parts, but it triggered very large flooding across a substantial part of Queensland and I think even northern New South Wales. Any of that flooding that occurred after the initial 48 hours would not be covered by the, by the reinsurance pool, is that correct? Uh, so as I said, Senator, it's after the cyclone ends that the 48 hours yep. applies. So yep. if the cyclone event, you know, whatever the event of the cyclone period is, and then you have another 48 hours. Yep. So if it goes from being a Category 4 cyclone and, say, within two days it's, I've forgotten the technical term, but stop being a cyclone, a a it becomes a rain event rather than a cyclone, um, any damage after that initial 48 hours won't be covered subject to the caveat I made about commencing, the damage commencing, uh, yes. Right. So actually, if you look back at some of the major cyclones that have happened in Queensland in recent years, a substantial amount of the damage has flowed from flooding that happened days after the cyclone ceased being a cyclone. And this reinsurance pool actually won't offer any assistance to people in that situation. Is that right? Uh, Senator, I can't verify the, the factual statement you've made. I don't have that well, information. With does you. anyone at the table know something of recent cyclones in Queensland and can talk to that? So not in detail, Senator. Th these were matters that were considered as part of the design features um, in, in terms of the analysis uh, that was provided, uh, the input from insurance companies and stakeholders. So there was a comprehensive um, engagement with the community and with experts on these things. It is a design feature um, and a, a decision for government uh, to uh, allow extra, 
the 48 hours after the, the finalisation of, of the cyclone. So they're the matters of policy, um, taking on board all the information provided to them in the more than 100 submissions. Yeah. I just want to draw your attention, the Secretary had actually drew my attention to it. Um, there are issues where we do need to be careful about asking questions about the meaning, and I'm quoting here from the estimate rules. Uh, notwithstanding the above paragraphs, it is not considered appropriate to ask questions about the meaning, purpose, intention or effect of clauses in bills that are the subject of a separate inquiry. And this bill, of course, is the subject of an inquiry uh, by this committee. Uh, so I think we do need to tread a bit carefully. I was, I was happy to let your questions go in terms of the modelling. Sure. Um, but in terms of the effect of particular clauses, uh, I think we need to be mindful that Understood. the bill itself is the subject of inquiry. Understood. And we can obviously ask some more detailed questions through that inquiry. Absolutely. Well, uh, just to keep it general, and I'll wrap up shortly because I know there's some other questions here. Minister, don't you think it would have been more honest for the government to advise uh, North Queenslanders of what premium reductions the average householder could expect? Why did you only focus on those at high risk? Uh, Senator, what I don't want to speculate on what may or may not be in that modelling. What I can say, though, is that the government listened very carefully to feedback that was received throughout that consultation and design process. It made key changes to ensure that the reinsurance pool delivers on its objectives. And that 96% of business property policies in Northern Australia will be covered by that reinsurance pool under the five million sum insured threshold. And we also expanded the coverage for strata buildings including for commercial strata properties, which means that the pool will now cover an over 6,000 additional strata policies, and coverage will also be expanded to small business marine property insurance. Policyholders will also continue to have freedom to choose their own insurer, and insurers will manage their own claims. Premium savings will then become available as insurers transition to the pool from the 1st of July, 2022, and that the only thing that would stop the pool from starting on the 1st of July 2022, precisely when we said it would, is the opposition. Can you, can you confirm that the average householder in North Queensland will receive a premium reduction of up to 46 per cent? That's not what I said. I know, that's a separate question. I'm, I'm inviting you to confirm that the average householder in North Queensland will receive a premium reduction of up to 46 per cent. Those with the most acute cost pressures can expect to benefit from premium discounts of up to 46 per cent yep. for homeowners. That's high risk. So the average householder cannot expect a premium reduction of up to 46 per cent. You're limiting your statement to high risk homeowners. Insurance normally is for high risk homeowners, is it not? I mean, you'd want the no, high no. risk homeowners to be insured. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm currently renewing my insurance policy for home. I'd quite so like to have it paid out. Um, and I don't, I'm not a high risk property. What, I'm, what you're saying is you, you are saying that high risk homeowners will get up to 46% reduction. No, I said those with the most acute property, well, acute, okay. acute cost okay. pressures. Okay, well, let's go with your language. Those with the most acute cost pressures will get up to 46%. But that does not mean that the average householder in North Queensland will get up to 46%, does it, Ms Quinn? So, de depending on the level of risk um, and how much premiums they currently pay, they will get different percentage reductions going yeah. forward. So some will get less? Some will get less than 48. That's why the, the statement is up... Sorry, 46. Um, that's why the statement says up to 46. Yeah, and it's the statement is limited to those at the most acute risk. That's what the statement is, yes. Yeah. Um, Minister, can you guarantee that the average homeowner in North Queensland will get a premium reduction of up to 46%? The government's made no statements around average homeowners, and I will not be making so any make comments that, that refer to uh, the modelling for which we have taken a public community So you can't give that claim. guarantee? If it's in the no. modelling, I cannot talk about it because it's a public interest immunity claim. It is part of Cabot deliberations. Can you guarantee that 
no I'm not ruling policy. in. I'm not ruling out, Senator. You know I'm not going to play that well, game. Well, can you guarantee no. that no policyholder in North Queensland game, will see Senator. their premium go up? Senator, I'm You're not going to play that game. About premiums this going is an down. excellent piece of policy, which we know the people of Northern Queensland have been crying out for for a long Senator period of time. Um, you've, I've, I've given you some time. Yep. Uh, I would like Senator McDonald has some questions to ask on this topic, so I would like. Maybe to she can get the modelling. Well, let's let's ask Senator. Let's give Thanks, Senator McDonald the opportunity to ask. Thanks, this Chair. Question. And as probably the only person here who lives in Northern Australia, <laughs> let me tell you how very very pleased we are by this uh, announcement <laughs> because what Senator Watt is failing to acknowledge is the number of people who are not insured at all anymore, not insured at all. And this policy will stand behind the premium providers of, the, of Northern Australia. What I wanted to ask you about um, was, uh, do you have any data on the number of people who are uninsured or do they just not show up because you know, they're not a policy holder? Uh, so there have been, um, I don't have the number in front of me, but I have given evidence before at this committee that there is a sizeable proportion of people who are underinsured. Mm. And this was canvassed in the ACCC's analysis of the insurance market. Mm. Um, and you're correct, it's significantly higher than the underinsurance rate elsewhere in Australia. Uh, indicating that the, uh, the the price and the and the risk um, that's borne by households has reduced insurance coverage in Northern Australia. So that um, uh, so, so I'm the, sorry. The numbers from the ACCC report. Mm. Uh, Twenty percent of properties in Northern Australia have no home building insurance, compared with eleven percent in the rest of Australia. Wow. So the ACCC uh, report, I think, talked about uh, premiums in Northern Australia being two and a half times the amount that they are in southern Australia. Um, I know that I pay um, three times um, per 100,000 what I would have been quoted in northern Australia. Um, mm. Sorry. Sounds like you are in, it sounds like you are in there, Senator Lloyd. Maybe they're disappointed you're not in there. They're asking where you are. Uh, so um, I understand that the reasons for this, uh, for the in insurance being so much higher in Northern Australia, is a is a collection of factors. Um, could you talk me through what you understand are the the factors affecting higher insurance in Northern Australia? So th this was uh, part of the ACCC's uh, investigation into the insurance market, and it found that the main driver was higher natural hazard risk, primarily driven by cyclones and in some cases flood risk. Um, did they mention the uh, different building codes in Queensland? The Insurance Council of Australia tells me the Queensland building codes are not as high as they are, for example, in Darwin and that they haven't been policed by the, uh, the Queensland Building Authority. So uh, the quality of buildings d definitely impacts on the assessment of risk um, and that goes to the underlying standards that are in place. Many so households, of course, build above minimum standards um, and, and as a result would get a reduction uh, in their insurance premiums. And I understand that the federal government has um, done a strata title unit trial of $40 million, is that correct? To trial improvements to building structures to try and assist them with the reduction in their premiums? So that there has been a, the trial, I'm not, I have to take on just the 40 million number, um, at which was looking at what um, mitigations could be done and how they would reduce premiums. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has resulted in um, clear reductions in premiums when households um, strata title um, invest in uh, known mitigants. And are you aware of the amount of stamp duty that's been charged by the Queensland State Labor Government on premiums uh, in North Queensland as uh, premiums have escalated? Uh, I haven't got the fixed amount, but it is a, it's a, as, a, as a percentage. So as premiums go up, the dollar amount uh, received goes up as well. So I understand it was $65 million uh, collected uh, the year before last. Um, and the Labor government has been putting uh, $10 million in that same period into resilience projects. Um, it seems strange to have the government putting forward 
a, a, a reinsurance pool to stand behind insurers to actively try and find a way forward on this catastrophe of insurance in Northern Australia, and yet the opposition minister doesn't have a plan. They don't have a plan in Queensland. They don't have a plan federally. Uh, are you aware of any plan that the opposition's put forward to address the reinsurance crisis in Northern Australia? I'm not aware of another plan, Senator, certainly. And I didn't realise that the state Labor government in Queensland was creaming off the top either. Creaming it. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting mitigation out there. Senator MacDonald, you have the call. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's very difficult to hear criticism of a positive, proactive uh, plan that everybody apart from the two insurance companies who have a monopoly in North Queensland um, uh, are critical of. And uh, I look forward to seeing the implementation on the 1st of July. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Senator McKim, are you seeking the call? Uh, I am. Chair, um, thank you. Um, I, I know Senator McAllister was asked some questions about the development of the proxy advice um, regulations. I've just got a few questions on that as well that are in a slightly uh, different area to Senator McAllister's. Um, firstly, can I ask Treasury whether any external consultants were engaged to, to um, assist in uh, the development or the drafting of the um, greater transparency of proxy advice regulations? Uh, Senator, no. Well, thanks. Um, can I ask whether um, uh, ASIC was shown um, the final version of the regulations before they were tabled? Uh, so I will pass to my colleague on that precise point. Thank you. Apologies for taking time on that. Um, so Tom Dixon, Assistant Secretary of Corporations Branch. Um, so my, my involvement um, at certain stages was more towards the beginning of the process. So I don't have information on um, in relation to consultation with ASIC, but I can take that on notice. All right, thanks. Um, I guess um, you know, ASIC's obviously the regulator. It's ASIC's responsibility to issue um, licenses to proxy advisors, I'd expect that they were uh, consulted through this process. I certainly hope they were. Um, so perhaps I could just extend my question out, given you're taking it on notes, and ask for details of um, consultation uh, with ASIC right through the, the process of developing uh, and drafting these regulations, and specifically, uh, as I previously asked, um, uh, were they shown a final uh, regulations before they were drafted. So are you happy to take it on notice? Yes. Yeah. I can, I mean, definitely Thank you. Um, can I? Oh, sorry, Senator McKean. There, there uh, definitely were Ms. conversations. There definitely were conversations with ASIC through the process. I just don't have the, whether they saw the very, very final version um, as, as uh, released, um, but they certainly were consulted through the process, um, as you say, given their implementation uh, role. All right, thank you. Um, to Treasury's knowledge, did anyone um, out Treasury or the Treasurer's office uh, get to see the final version of these regulations before they were tabled? Uh, so all regulations are a matter for government and are approved for release uh, by a minister. Um, and so the usual process is, is that that goes to the minister responsible and the minister approves them for a release. So um, they would have been signed off by um, the, the Treasurer, yes. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I do understand that, thank you. I'm asking whether, to Treasurer's knowledge, 
uh, the final version of these regulations was seen by uh, anyone um, outside Treasury um, or the Treasurer's office. Um, so, from so happy to take that on notice. Um, certainly, um, we 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 liaise with regulators on the basis of them implementing regulation. We have uh, various elements in our processes to consult with them. Um, we we act on behalf of the government. Um, I can't speak to whether the um, the ministers uh, share information with others. I'll take okay. I could take that on notice for you though. All right, thanks. I appreciate that. I also wanted to ask um, on what basis the 7th of February was set as the commencement. Is there anything um, particularly special about that date? Um, and, and whose idea was it that the 7th of February was set as the consultation, uh, sorry, as the commencement date? Uh, so I'm not, a, I'm not aware of, um, other than the usual process of considering how long it would take for um, various parties to adjust um, the passing of legislation, the time that it would take for regulators to have arrangements in place, etc. I'm not aware of any other um, specific considerations other than the usual set of considerations, but happy to take it on notice. All right, thank you. And uh, did Treasury <laughs> consult with a law firm called Arnold Block Liebler at any stage during the development and the drafting of the regulations? to that they provided a submission to the process but we did not have any um, engagement outside of that submission process. <coughs> Mr. Okay, Kinson, so that, that was, sorry to interrupt Senator McKim, I just want to clarify this. That was a submission in response to the Treasury consultation process. Yeah, that's right. That, that issued a paper calling yeah, for right. submissions. Yep. Yeah. Yep, and, um, and I think you've just given evidence um, that, that outside that the provision by Arnold of that submission, there was no further engagement with them on the, the development of the regulations. That That's right? correct. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thanks, uh, Chair, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, now Mr. Dixon, Senator McAllister had a, a series of questions in relation to process. Did you have the opportunity yep. to find the information you, you needed to fulsomely address that issue? Not fulsomely, so I can answer okay. partially. So um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to um, get every okay. detail and date. Um, well, perhaps we'll see I, how we go. But I can give you a characterisation that perhaps um, might suffice just for the time being. We can take the, the question on notice to give you more precise dates. But um, in terms of like our engagement, we, you know, we've engaged with the the issue over you know a, a number of months and. Um, that culminated then in a request that we received on the 13th of April uh, 2021 to, final, to produce and finalise a consultation paper. But leading up to that, there would have been conversations and engagement um, over a, 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 a lengthy period of time. So a number of months. Does a number of months refer to two or three? So to be precise, uh, like I, I don't have a strong um, recollection um, dating back that far, but um, I would say it would be um, uh, several months. And in fact, the issue kind of predates um, at my involvement in it. I think the, um, the issues relating to proxy advisors uh, may have even been canvassed by um, uh, my predecessors. When did you commence in the role, Mr Dixon? Uh, so my commencement in the role um, it's a bit hazy just because I was working on a lot of coronavirus things. <laughs> it's a bit hazy because I was, you know, we're working on a lot of pandemic things and so there's a transition period. But um, uh, my commencement and the role would have been uh, in 2020 sometime. In 2020. However, in the months leading up to the formal request on the 13th of April for a final consultation paper, You'd been having discussions with the treasurer, um, or with his staff, I assume. Yep. Um, did the treasurer initiate these discussions before or after the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors publicly criticised Rio Tinto for their destruction of Duke and Gorge? Uh, I don't have. Uh, I haven't drawn a connection between those two things and my work on the issue of proxy advisors, but if you 
if you have, I can look up a date of when that occurred and mm. provide an answer to that. Mm. Was it made before or after, the, and I speak of the request from the Treasurer's Office, uh, before our ownership matters released embarrassing information about the JobKeeper rorts caused by the Treasurer's failures? So, Senator, in relation to um, dates, I'm happy to take those questions on notice about you know, um, what the um, precise dates that those events occurred and how they related to any work that we did on proxy advice. But as I said before, in the work that I've done, I haven't drawn a connection between those things. Mm. Okay, so there was a formal request to prepare these uh, this consultation paper. When did the Treasurer instruct Treasury to prepare uh, the regulations? Uh, so, in terms of uh, the instruction to prepare regulations, uh, I mean, there would have been, um, I'm not sure if there was like a formal date as such because, you know, we would have, would have had conversations where, um, you know, we would be anticipating um, the likely direction of um, of reform in the area, so I'm not sure if there's a clear-cut date, but I, I, I could get a date for you. Mm. Why did Treasury not issue an exposure draft of the regulations for consultation prior to uh, putting them into the Parliament? Senator, I take that. So, Thanks, um, Ms Quinn. The, the release of um, documents for consultation are a matter of, for the government as opposed to the Treasury per se, um, and, and so you'd have to put that question to the government. Well, I mean, in the Westminster system, you're all actually the same branch of government, so normally I would expect you to answer questions, but perhaps the Minister can enlighten us if you don't know, Ms Quinn. Why didn't, why were there no, was there no public consultation on the regulations? Minister? There was significant consultation on the regulations uh, ahead of the final package. There was no public, uh, there was no exposure draft. Well, the final package of regulations did differ from the options in the consultation paper, but on the basis that those mm -hmm. changes were made on the basis of stakeholder feedback. Um, I mean, you're aware that the Office for Best Practice Regulation evaluated the RIS and found them to be not consistent with best practice. Is it common for major pieces of financial regulation to receive a finding from the IBPR as not being consistent with I, best practice? I couldn't answer that. You, you don't know, Minister. No, don't. Common in your area? I mean, is that what, you, but, but as a, in your policy areas, do your uh, RISs usually get a big black mark from the APB? Senator, I know that this particular regulation, these particular regulations have raised your ire, but they were only there to strengthen transparency and accountability. They were there to stifle in a, in transparency an industry, and accountability. In an actually, industry Minister that King. is highly concentrated and yet has enormous mm. influence and significant impact on, um, on the way companies operate and the way that they're governed. And I would imagine that the opposition would be in favour mm -hmm. of transparency and accountability in but, all I mean, aspects it's been of governance. described as an undergraduate exercise from a treasurer pursuing the grievances of others. So, Senator, I just wanted to be clear that the, OB, the Office of Best Practice Regulations Assessment is that the quality of the regulatory impact analysis in the RIS is adequate and therefore sufficient to inform a decision. So that's the formal declaration of the OBPR mm. on, the, on the RIS statement. And yet not consistent with best practice. Um, did Treasury prepare a response for the Treasurer in relation to the letter issued by Senator Ferravanti Wells on the 27th of January this year, which outlined serious scrutiny concerns with the legislation? So we provide advice on, on all matters um, that are put to the Treasurer from that committee um, and this wouldn't have been any different than, than others. Yes, yeah, so I'm not really looking for an explanation of your general protocol. I'm asking a specific question of fact. Did Treasury uh, prepare a response for the Treasurer to sign or a piece of advice for the Treasurer in relation to the, the letter from Senator Ferravanti Wells? Uh, so we did provide advice, yes. Advice but no letter. I'd have to check. I, I, I don't have in my mind whether there was a letter attached or not, but I, I know we did provide advice. Okay. Oh, I heard a couple of other questions back to the reinsurance pool. Um, and this is just a question of fact, although 
so few questions of fact have been able to be answered about this particular proposition. How many insurers will p participate in the pool on the 1st of July 2022? So you're asking about a forecast going forward. So it is going to depend a little bit on how the insurers kind of respond. Uh, but given that there's sort of a mandated coverage, um, I don't have the exact number. Um, do you have it, James? Um, so there, I mean, this is getting to questions about the legislation, which kind of raises questions, um, issues that the chair raised. I mean, there is a transition period in, so that's got a 1 July 2022 start date, um, but the larger insurers have um, 18 months to join, and then there's an uh, additional yeah. 12 month period for uh, the others. Thanks, sorry, I, you're misunderstanding my question, and I'm sorry, I'll ask it more clearly. I'm not asking about the terms of the legislation. I should, I'll, I'll ask it in a different way. How many insurers have advised you that they will join on the 1st of July 2022? I'd have to take that notice of question, Senator. Do you not know, Mr Kelly? No. Have any? So it is going to depend um, on the legislation passing and, um, and their final design and scheme uh, being in place. So it would be unusual for people to tell us um, something that isn't yet uh, passed by Parliament. Um, but certainly the insurers have been actively involved in the process uh, and the legislation put before Parliament has a, a mandated entry with the phasing in as, uh, as Mr Kelly said. Um, so it would be a little strange for them to kind of then declare or not declare um, their, their actual participation at this point uh, in the process. Mm. Oh, it's just, Minister Hume, you've been very enthusiastic about how marvellous this is going to be for people in Queensland. I'm just wondering whether any insurers at all will be participating on the 1st of July 2022. Well, I think Ms Quinn made that very clear that the legislation needs to be passed before we can assess that. I see. So you just don't know? You've got no idea? I can take it on notice and ask the Assistant Treasurer, but I think Ms Quinn answered your question adequately. All right then. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Now, do we have any more questions for the markets group? We do. We do? Yeah. Senator Chisholm. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to focus in on the SME loan recovery scheme, uh, which uh, was extended, I think, for another six months to the end of July this year. Um, oh, go on. Hooked. When SME loan guarantee was introduced in March 2020, it was budgeted to, live, to deliver $40 billion in loans. How many businesses were expected to take up these loans at the time? So we, we didn't make a, an assessment of how many uh, would take it up. Uh, the, the sort of the provisioning um, was based on a very conservative um, assessment. Uh, we were quite unsure what the pandemic was going to do and what the arrangements were going to be for small and medium sized enterprise, um, enterprises. So we took a, a conservative analysis, um, but we didn't make a, an estimate of the number of uh, people who would take it up. It was a demand driven scheme. Um, and uh, it's a sort of a different, uh, a different way of accounting for it, given the, it's a guarantee as opposed to an expenditure. Um, we weren't required to kind of make a forecast. So how did you reach the $40 billion figure? Uh, so we, we did look at um, how much uh, lending there were, was in this sector um, and what the possible uh, different scenarios and, and uh, made an assessment on a very conservative number. Um, so it, what has happened since, uh, what happened from that assessment uh, to the final outcome is a, a large number of other policies were put in place, including JobKeeper and the deferral arrangements uh, from the banks. Uh, so it's not at all a surprise uh, that the number is, is less uh, than that conservative number that was originally uh, put in place. So how much of the $40 billion has been budgeted for and been delivered by September 2020? So I don't have the numbers for September 2020, but we do, um, we do know that as at 31st of December 2021, across the different, both the SME guarantee scheme and the recovery loan scheme, there were 86,000 loans with worth around 9.3 billion that were provided. Um, 
and how, how many of those um, will call on the guarantee will be a function of how they uh, fare over the life of their loan. Okay. 20-date you're referring to is the end of the first phase of SMEG. Yeah. Um, so that number is 1.847 billion. 1.847. Was it, sorry? 1.847. Okay. And um, how many businesses do you know? Um, the, the number of loans approved uh, yep. was 20,500. Okay. Um, and what about for the second period, which I think ended on 3rd of June 21? Oh, so there the value is 4.721 billion and, and 57,000 loans. Um, and uh, December 21? So, so we have categorisation by the different types of schemes. So the next scheme uh, was the uh, recovery loan scheme. Uh, and as at the end of December, there were 9,000 approved loans at 2.839 billion. And so those, plus a few others, kind of add up to the, the, the show starter and then some refinancing add up to the 2.3 billion number that I uh, gave you at the start. And, and how much is expected to be delivered by 1 July 2022? So it is a, a, a demand driven program and it, it depends on the demand for uh, this, the guarantee through the banking system. So we don't have a forecast. No forecast on number of businesses that would be expected to take it up either? No, it would depend on um, how, they, how they're going and um, what options they assess for themselves um, in talking to their bank. Okay. Um, so when you were proposing it, you just had no sense of the total number of loans that would be budgeted. There was no... Not at the time. It was at the height of the peak uncertainty uh, of the what, what the pandemic was going to do to the Australian economy. Um, and it was before other policies were put in place as well. It was in the first phase. Okay. So it was highly uncertain what the outlook was. Have you got any state breakdowns on per state for those categories? Um, I don't with me. Um, and I'm not sure that we request that information from the banks, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Yeah, I'd just be interested to see um, what details you've got. And did was any work, I, I presume there was no work done on whether different states would have a better uptake of these than other states? No, I mean, it, it, there's no geographical dis, uh, element to the program. It's available to um, all businesses. The only geographical element was uh, when the impact of um, particular floods were added into the recovery loan scheme. Um, but, the, but, but in general, there's no geographical uh, component. It will depend on uh, the impact of the pandemic on, on business models in different parts. But you can imagine that, that, that uh, those areas that were most affected um, by restrictions or actual outbreaks would, would have been uh, more affected. Could, could I ask for some more detail and notice just about how much, if you can provide, how many there were per state and how much the dollar value was per state? Happy to take it on notice and see whether we have that data. Um, given that there was a relatively low take up of the loans, I understand you provided the, the, the context as to why that was, on, on what basis was the decision taken to extend the scheme to 30 June this year? Um, I guess I wouldn't characterise it as a low take up. Um, if, we, if, we, um, if I was talking to you about 86,000 small businesses supported by a guarantee of over $9 billion um, in any other time, it would be um, considered but a significant it's less than a, program. It's less than a quarter of the total that was set aside for those. But so as, I, as I said, you need to take the package of measures sure. uh, together and JobKeeper was not in play when we uh, when we first uh, looked at the, the number. So I really can't emphasise enough how speculative that first number was and it's um, sort of unfair of the program in some sense to characterise it against that element. Um, and so 
the extension of the program has occurred as uh, people have, as the government has assessed uh, the need for support in the economy in response to the pandemic uh, moving forward. Uh, it has changed the parameters of the guarantee uh, to reflect the circumstances. The first phase, for example, was very much focused on um, cash flow and uh, supporting businesses uh, in, in the first phase of the pandemic. Uh, the recovery loans uh, changed so that they could support investments to, as people came out of, um, out of lockdowns and into a growing economy and allowed uh, more investment uh, options with longer terms and higher loans. So the scheme has been adapted over time to reflect the economic circumstances and the needs of small business. Okay, um, just moving on to uh, another subject around small business payment times. Um, the Small Business Ombudsman has observed that the payment time reporting register um, reveals that more than 30% of invoices are being paid late by big business for what has already been earned by small business. Has Treasury provided advice to the Treasurer or the Minister for Small Business on the reasons one, or three, one in three small businesses are being paid late? Uh, so, we, as you have said, so the government has introduced um, a mechanism to track uh, how, how, what is happening for payment times for small business, um, and that uh, there's a sort of reporting scheme that uh, requires biz big business to report um, what they're doing. Um, this is a this was a policy outcome from uh, a few years ago, and it's taken a time to implement in terms of having registrations, etc. So we will will have. We have uh, provided advice on what is happening uh, in response to this, the register and the obligations under the scheme going forward. Senator Peter Kelly, First and Secretary, Small and Family Business Division. Just to um, add to Mrs. Quinn, Ms. Quinn's answer, um, in the development of the scheme, there was work done initially looking at the, um, a piece of work looking at the payment type performance to small business about small business being paid late and the economic impact. Um, that was some work that was done with um, Alpha Beta as it then was. It's now part of Accenture. Um, so obviously that advice was provided to small business ministers and other ministers in government as a justification for um, why the uh, the scheme was necessary, um, the, the economic cost to small business and to the economy of small businesses not being paid on time. Okay. Um, how many small businesses have been paid late according to the register? Um, I'm not sure if we have that. Um, I might see if Ms. Jeffries has the um, has that uh, has that analysis. Uh, thank you, I'm Mary Jeffries, Assistant Secretary, Payment Performance Branch. Um, Senator, I would have to take this specific number on notice and go back through the register to confirm the exact number. Um, what I can tell you, though, uh, based on the first reporting period that has um, we have now published on the register. Um, as at 30 November, um, there were 6,730, sorry, 6,763 7, 6, reports that were published for that first reporting period from entities um, that had a standard or a calendar um, income year. Uh, the average payment terms was thir just over 37 days. Um, what we could tell from um, the reports that were published, um, the across all industries, approximately 44% of small business invoices were paid within 20 days. That's based on the number of invoices paid. Um, we see based on those figures that less than 3% of invo invoices were paid after 90 days or more. Um, can you name the top 20 businesses who paid invoices outside the 30-day payment benchmark? Not off the top of my head, Senator, but I can take that on notice and provide that figure for you. Okay. Um, the, of the sectors, the manufacturing sector has got the longest average uh, and public administration has the shortest uh, payment time. So there is there are dif distinct differences across uh, different sectors in the economy. Yeah. Um, would you be able to provide that list of top 20 businesses relatively soon? Yes, Senator, we can. Thank you. Um, just on the 37-day the period, 
Um, what specific mechanisms are in place to ensure payment times are improved? The payment times are approved, or in the actual report? Improved. Sorry. Improved. improved. So, so, so the, um, the basis of the scheme is um, to have transparency around the way that big businesses pay small business, um, and through that transparency to drive better performance in terms of payment times. Um, so there's no um, formal process through that, but the transparency should, um, should drive the improvement in those payment times. Okay. Can you provide any examples of how that's happened, the business that's made reparations for paying small businesses outside of that payment benchmark as a result of the register? Uh, Senator, I, I don't think we could point to any examples of um, reparations where a big business may have paid a small business outside of its payment terms, and so those payment terms can, can vary. 37 is obviously the, the average, which means there's a number that pay quicker than that, there's a number that pay um, beyond that. But we can certainly say that what we've observed since the scheme has commenced is um, some activity by big businesses to look to improve their payment time performance to small business um, in the knowledge that that will be published and, um, and transparent and so wanting to um, improve their performance in that area. Just to add, if I may, um, Senator, many of the businesses that have submitted their reports have indicated in those reports that are now publicly available their commitment and intention to improve their payment times to small business. So an analysis of that, um, analysis of early trends will be possible following the second release um, of reports, or their second reporting period, um, which is due 30 March this year, and will be published after that. Has Treasury provided any advice to the Treasurer or the Minister for Small Business on further measures to make sure small businesses are paid on time in addition to the current reporting scheme? Um, Senator, during the course of the parliamentary um, progress of the, the bill, there was obviously a committee process and, um, and debate. There was a range of other measures that were put forward, including methods of mandating payment times. Um, one outcome of that parliamentary um, uh, debate was that there is now in the um, legislation a requirement that the payment time scheme be reviewed, um, and that review will need to commence um, in the first half of next year. Um, and part of that, there's some quite specific terms of reference enshrined in the legislation, which includes um, options looking at, uh, at, at, at whether the scheme has been successful, whether there may need to be um, other measures taken. Okay. Are there been any other mechanisms available to governments to ensure small businesses are paid on time, other than this transparency regime? Um, well, there's a suite of measures the government has adopted, so there is, um, uh, the government has a commitment that it will pay within I suppose I'm business days. I'm more looking for things, other things that could be under consideration, not what's done. What else could be under consideration? Um, Senator, what's under consideration would obviously go to advice to, um, to to government. I mean, clearly, in terms of the debate around when the scheme was being being introduced, there was discussion around um, mandating um, payment times, having set payment times for that, and that that is something that um, that has been adopted in some other jurisdictions um, and has not been overly successful, um, and so that's obviously one area that, um, that has been part of this, uh, um, this discussion about how to improve payment times for small business. Um, has Treasury received any feedback on whether small businesses have been able to access meaningful information from the data as it's currently published? Senator, nothing directly uh, from small businesses to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but as I mentioned before, com um, businesses that have submitted their reports, we've only just had their first reporting period lodged, um, sorry, published. So um, the reports are available for small businesses to uh, review. Um, but it, the first report set a benchmark for subsequent reporting periods. <laughs> I mean, we obviously will look at um, the, the number of people who are accessing those reports uh, and as part of any review we would consider how useful people found them. Um, so just on the uh, manufacturing industry which um, I think was identified as having the uh, longest average payment terms, That's 49 correct. days? Uh, over more than 47 days. More than 47 days, yeah. okay. Has Treasury assessed the potential supply chain impacts in key areas of sovereign national capability like manufacturing when small businesses are paid later than most other small businesses in that industry? So the policy responsibility for manufacturing uh, rests with the Department of Industry. 
Um, so it's probably a question best put to them. Um, but this information is available and and uh, publicly available, not just within government. Um, and so it would, would be a factor in terms of the operation of the different sectors, how the money f flows through those sectors. Um, Credit Watch reports that the construction industry payment times have blown out through COVID-19 and are now at record highs, with 12% of building companies more than 60 days behind on debts owed to suppliers and contractors. Does this data show that the payment time register is not equipped to reflect current market conditions in a timely way that can be acted on? So the reporting periods are with a lag uh, and a specific point in time. So they will pick up over time trends, as Ms Jeffrey said. Um, it, it's not a just-in-time uh, registry, though. It, it does uh, do, do, do points in time. Okay. Is there anything that could specifically be done in the construction industry? Because it's just consistently a problem and across the country, from what I can observe? Uh, Senator, I know that um, from previous experience, this is an issue that's been looked at by, um, by other portfolios, and particularly around issues around things such as security of payments, um, ensuring that subcontractors get, get paid full stop, let alone paid within, um, within time. Um, so I know it is, being, it is, it is looked at in, um, in, in other um, parts of government. But there's nothing specifically to do with the construction industry that the government are considering? So we're happy to take it on notice and put that to our colleagues that look after the construction industry in detail, which would be in the Department of Industry. Okay. Senator Chisholm, if I can just wade into one of my other portfolio responsibilities for a moment. Um, in the digital business plan, which was released in July, um, uh, well, sorry, which was released in 2020, um, the government invested $15.3 billion to support the adoption of e-invoicing by businesses. So it's estimated that um, businesses exchange more than 1.2 billion invoices every single year, and around 90% of those are still processed manually. That's one of the reasons that, uh, that one of the things that contributes to late payments. But e-invoicing can save businesses up to $20 per invoice. So um, the government is currently consulting on options to support business adoption of e-invoicing, and that uh, consultation paper was released in 2020, sorry, December 2021 and it closes at the end of this month to test a range of potential interventions, including the idea of you know, a business e-invoicing right. And also government has really led the way by being an e-invoicer itself. Um, in a recent survey, Zero found 24% of small businesses said they delay payments to themselves, or 23% delay paying their own creditors or suppliers because their customers pay them late. Um, is more action needed from the government to ensure small businesses are paid on time uh, than the current reporting regime? Well, I think that's exactly the point and purpose of doing a consultation on e-invoicing and trying to encourage small and medium enterprises to take up e-invoicing, which can improve payment times so dramatically. Is there anything else the government's considering in this matter in regards to small business? I think that the officials have said that they'll take that on notice and refer it to the relevant port, the relevant departments. Yeah. But, but more broadly, um, Senator, um, the, the sequence of uh, the sequence of events for a company to get paid, um, as the minister has talked about, there is the issuing of the invoice uh, in order to get the payment back. There's also the digital adoption uh, by small business more generally outside the invoicing to be able to um, get payments electronically. Um, in the banking space, uh, we've got the consumer data right, uh, which extends to small businesses as customers, um, for them to be able to um, uh, get, a, get better deals from the financing system for their business. Um, so all, all, there's, all, there's quite a few different uh, components of the financial system um, regulation that's all moving towards um, getting faster transaction. The payment, the new payments platform, underpinning the entire payments platform, makes it possible for payments to happen more quickly. Um, and you, you will have experienced that as a customer, I'm sure, yourself, with the ability to do online banking much quicker and, and, um, and real-time payments. So there's a, there's a whole sequence of things that are happening uh, to digitise and improve the payment system, which will go to helping small business. Um, I've just got one other area I want to cover, Chair, which will go for about five minutes and then I'm, yes. I'm done. And that's, we're done that's with markets yeah. OK, let's do that. Um, but I'm sure the Minister will be able to breeze through this because it's her favourite subject. 
um, which is around the uh, self-managed super fund reforms. Um, so I think uh, the government promised to fix up some of those legacy issues in the 21-22 budget. This is legacy products? Products, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said issues, yeah, products. Um, so I just wanted to check what the current status of uh, legislative implementation of this measure is. Uh, I think we're consulting on it right now. Forgive me if I don't have the details of that one in front of me. Oh, sorry, Lynn Kelly, First Assistant Secretary, Retirement Advice and Investment Division. So the, um, there are a number of announcements in last year's budget. Just to clarify which one you were, it was around the residency or around legacy products? Legacy retirement products. So market link pensions. Uh, so this is the one to provide consumers with a temporary two-year option to transition from legacy retirement products to more flexible and contemporary retirement products. Um, so legislation to give effect to this measure will be in introduced in line with the government's broader legislative priorities. Okay. Um, so does legislation exist? Uh, not currently. Okay. Um, so nothing's been introduced so it has nothing's been introduced. The part of the actual legislation doesn't exist. That's correct. There was um, a suite of changes to the superannuation system that were passed by Parliament last last week, um, and this has to be considered in context of the broader uh, priorities of the government, but also the need to consult in relation to these um, product conversions. They go back quite some way. And so we need to consult in relation to it before we can pull together legislation. Right. So there's there's no there's so just to be clear, there's no draft legislation. No. Okay. So you're proposing that you would consult on this before you draft legislation. That would be the the normal process. Yes. Okay. So we, we normally consult design and then consult on the legislation itself. So there's usually consultation at different phases of, of any reform process. Okay, so when, when can we expect the consultation to start? Ultimately, the um, timing of the consult consultation will be determined by government um, okay. in line with the broader priorities in relation to superannuation. Okay. Um, so I, I, I presume nothing will happen this side of the election? days left before the election, as you know, Senator Chisholm. I think that the government's made it very clear that uh, <coughs> cleaning up legacy products is a, is a particular priority. It's not something that any government has ever proposed before, and yet we know that this is one of the reasons why financial products can potentially be costly, because uh, financial services providers need to maintain legacy systems uh, that, can, um, that are difficult to maintain, uh, and that creates cost pressures on across even new systems and new products as well. So I think that this is, um, it's an enormous undertaking and it has to be done properly. Um, we don't want it to be too costly. At the same time, we want to make sure that we have the most efficient and cost effective financial services sector that we can possibly have. Thanks. So just to be clear, the question was, will anything happen this side of the election? Um, I think I said there's not very many days left. Uh, consultation, that. we would like consultation to get underway it's as soon as possible. It's, it's pretty simple. Will, will anything happen this side of the election? Well, I don't think we can legislate this side of the election, okay. certainly. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of surprised it, it hasn't been more of a priority. Was it, is it a low priority? For you, Minister, this well, I think you could probably send it to Chisholm. We've passed more superannuation legislation in this term of parliament than any parliament has passed in the last 20 years. I don't think you could say that superannuation and financial services is a low priority of this. And that's not, what I, that's not what I said. I asked if this issue was a low priority for you, given no. that you prioritise something. So it's not a low priority, but you've just... It's a personal passion of mine. But you've just chosen to prioritise other? I have lots of passions. Most importantly, I think lowering the cost of superannuation and other financial products, making sure that we don't have duplicate accounts, making sure that insurances aren't inappropriately applied to people so that they're cross-subsidising the rest of the pool when they can't ever claim on that 
insurance, making sure that people have choice in their superannuation funds, making sure that people have transparency and accountability in their super funds and that their super funds are acting in their best financial interests, and ensuring that the system operates efficiently and effectively and concentrates not just on the accumulation phase but also the deaccumulation phase. Most importantly, as you would know, just last week we passed significant tranches of superannuation reform legislation, one of which uh, was to abolish the long-standing 450 rule, which is an outdated relic and anachronism of the superannuation system, which was highly discriminatory towards women. But the good news is the coalition came to the rescue and we have now abolished the 450 rule, and that will take place from the 1st of July 2022. Uh, there are people who are stuck. Uh, actually, before I get there, do we, un do we have a sense of how many people are impacted, would be impacted by this proposed change? The legacy? Yeah, how many? Are we Thousands or? I would imagine it would be in the thousands. Certainly it's something that the sector has spoken of um, and say that it is a priority for them to be able to move people into modern and more efficient products. So, so these people are stuck with these legacy financial products that they would probably like to exit. Um, the government has promised to fix the problem but has not actually progressed anything about it. What's your answer to these people who are stuck waiting for your government who've promised action to actually do something on it? that this is the only government that would potentially ever attack, uh, tackle the issue of legacy products. I haven't heard a single thing to come out of the Labor Party on what it is that they would do around legacy products. Is that seriously so, the best thing you've got to those thousands of people um, who are stuck there? Um, that well, perhaps maybe you can enlighten day, me as to what Labor's policy maybe is. Maybe one day you'll get it. Well, we're the ones asking the questions. You're the ones in government. You've been there for a long time. You're the minister responsible, and you've actually done nothing on this. Well, that's not true. In fact, we've flagged well, an intention it's for the evident. government you haven't done to tackle yet. one of the most difficult and intractable problems in our financial services sector. It just seems like it's another case of this Morrison-Joyce government being all talk and very little action for those people who are impacted by this. Well, that's not a question. That's a comment. I'll finish there. Okay. Thank you. It seems appropriate time for dinner, I think. Uh, so we'll come back at uh, Andrew, 7.45, is it? 7.45 with the Reserve Bank of Australia. Thank you uh, very much, Ms Queen. Quinn, to you and your team. Very, uh, very helpful. Thank you. Bank of Australia, represented by Dr Guy DeBell and Ms Michelle Bullock. Can you both hear us? Oh, sorry. Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, Dr DeBell, you're, you're on mute, I think. I don't think I am, but... No, you're not. Uh, you're not. <laughs> okay. You're right. I can hear you. Uh, in welcoming the RBA, the committee recognises the central bank's independence under the Reserve Bank Act 1959, particularly in regard for its setting of monetary policy. The committee is cognisant that while the RBA does not receive annual appropriations, it does provide the parliament with opportunities to discuss its insight and performance, which the committee greatly welcomes. As such, no government minister will be in attendance with the committee while representatives of the RBA are present. Dr DeBell or Ms Bullock, would you like to make an opening statement? No, we won't, thanks, Chair. Okay. Now, I'm going to give the call first to Senator Rennick, who's got to go to another committee. So, Senator Rennick. Yeah, hi, guys. How are you going? Hello, Senator. Uh, look, um, I just want to follow up on the last set of questions I asked at the last estimates uh, in regards to our gold holdings and you know, the letter that you'd sent to me that said, basically, the Bank of England had fake gold bars and duplicate serial numbers. Um, I just want to drill down a bit more on why the RBA didn't see fit to tell the Treasurer that that fraudulent behaviour had been going on at the Bank of England. So we don't, we didn't see fit to tell him because, as we replied in your, to your question, that the that's in the smaller one kilogram bar market, not the 11.3 kilogram market that comprises our holding. So we did not see this as a mission. 
Well, I mean, regardless of the size of the bar, it's 80 tonnes of gold worth, you know, today's value is $6 billion. Don't you think that, you know, you've got an obligation to tell the shareholder, the key shareholder, the treasurer on behalf of the people of Australia what was going on? I didn't see it as affecting our own holdings, Senator. That was my, that was the assessment. Well, how would you know that it doesn't affect your own holdings if you haven't actually counted all our gold bars? And, and, and I'll note... Yeah, sorry, go on. We, as we also replied to your question, Senator, we follow Australian auditing standards in auditing our gold bars at the Bank of England, and that provides us with the appropriate assurance around those gold bars. Well, well, I'll question that, because a large number of bars have been refined since 2015, and you yourself have told me in prior estimates that no gold had moved in over 20 years. So I failed to see if no gold had moved in over 20 years, why gold bars would be refined, be re-refined um, since 2015. So, as we also noted, when we lend gold bars so under our gold lending program, bars don't actually move. The ownership, the, the, we don't necessarily receive the same bars back as we lent. And so the serial, if you own the bars that we actually hold in terms of the serial numbers can change through time through the gold lending program. Well, and that then brings the question, if you're trying to audit serial numbers, how do you know that you're not, everyone's not get, being given the same set of serial numbers if you're not counting 100% of the gold, which you weren't doing? We've, we are not doing that, I agree with that, but we are following Australian accounting standards in how we audit those gold bars to provide the appropriate assurance under those standards. Okay, well, okay, you're following auditing standards, that's great, but we've identified that the custodian of that gold is actually had been engaging in fraudulent practices. Don't you think that's a good enough reason to bring the gold home and look after it ourselves? I don't think I would agree with your assessment, Senator. Well, well, I do, because gold exports are worth $28 billion a year to this country, and we've got the world's yes. largest gold reserves. So the fact that the Bank of England was engaging in fraudulent behaviour you know, we know as, I, as I pointed out to you last time, the private banks are doing that as well. They paid over a billion dollars in, in fines for manipulating the, the precious metals market. As I said again, isn't it in the best interest of the Australian people and the 70 odd thousand people employed in the gold sector that we actually make sure that we have custodianship of our own gold rather than someone that, you know, Bank of England who had fake gold bars and duplicate serial numbers? No, I don't agree with your assessment, Senator. And why is that? How can you justify that? Because I, have assure, I am satisfied that we have, you know, we get the appropriate assurance about those gold bars. I, I'm not sure that I would agree with your assessment that the Bank of England has, uh, uh, has, been, has been doing fraudulent behaviour. Well, well, don't you think then we should go and count all 100% of our gold bar holdings to ensure that, not just 10%, to ensure that the whole 100% of gold is there? No, I think what I mean, my assessment is we should follow what the audit, what the appropriate auditing standards are, which is what we have done and will continue to do so. In the future. Well, well, I've got question marks over the auditing standards. I've been an auditor myself and you always have to go and do a stock take and a stock take of 100 per cent of it when you've got issues around uh, duplicate serial numbers. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave that, leave it at that. Uh, I've just got one more question around uh, the fact that you've ended your quantitative easing program. Uh, Given that sooner or later we're going to need to raise interest rates, wouldn't it have been wiser to keep the quantitative easing program going to fund infrastructure um, and then tighten the qualitative measures? Uh, I mean, decisions to fund infrastructure are those of you, the government, not us. Well, well it's funny you say that because I asked Stephen Kennedy, the Head of Treasury, about it this morning and he said it was an issue for the RBA. So, and this is what always happens whenever I always right, get ping pong. No, I'm not passing it back to Stephen, Senator. What I'm saying is decisions on how to spend public money are those of the Okay, so, so put that to one side. I accept that. But your quantitative easing program and the $4 billion that you were printing each week, right, is, is that not a decision mm -hmm. made by the RBA? Yes, that is, Senator. Right. And so I'll come back to my original question. Wouldn't it have been better to keep an expansive uh, quantitative easing program going enabled to, you know, to make sure that we're not going to crash the economy as we lift interest rates, given the record amounts of government and personal debt? Uh, so we, in, while we have stopped buying more government bonds, we still own the stock of government's bonds that we 
have already purchased. And so the, the stimulus that we've provided in by buying those bonds remains in place while we continue to hold them, which we do. Well, I mean, this is now, I accept, well, I'd argue the stimulus was when it happened, but going forward, as you raise interest rates, that is going to have a, a contractory expense, uh, you know, effect on the economy, and therefore we need to offset that, I would have thought, with quantitative easing. If you were happy to do it to, you know, shut businesses down and pay people to stay at home for JobKeeper, et cetera, surely we could do it, and I accept I'm branching back out to Treasury here, you know, keep, keep that part of it going on a productive nature, um, while you know interest rates are going up, because as I said, with record uh, government debt and personal debt, we run the risk of crashing the economy if you lift interest rates too high. But you do need to raise them to an extent, so you've got some some petrol in the tank for later on if there's another economic you know downturn. I mean, our aim, Senator, is to have a monetary policy setting appropriately not to crash. You know, we are definitely aiming not to crash the economy. We are aiming to keep the economy on a strong and sustainable growth path going forward. And in, you know, the, the decisions we took last week and will continue to take in the future are very much aimed with that. You know, with that's the very clear objective of those decisions. Well, and I accept, I accept that. But you know, there are external shocks like viruses or whatever that happen from time to time that's outside your control. And that's why we need oh. petrol in the tank oil with higher interest rates. So you need to drop them later on or quantitative easing to keep the economy going. No, we, yeah, but we're comfortable that the settings we have in place currently will indeed keep the economy going on that sustainable path. And, and so we'll, that was our basis of making the decision last week and will continue to be so. So on that basis, you're not planning to raise interest rates anytime soon? No, what we said, well, what we said is we'll make that assessment on, on in terms of achieving those objectives when and if that required will be dependent on the circumstances at the time, as it always is. Okay, thank you for your time. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Rennie. Uh, Senator uh, Roberts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for appearing again. I'm going to start with a, a, a sincere compliment, Mr. DeBell. I've been Im impressed with your frankness and your directness and your succinctness. Um, you convey a lot of confidence. And I would also like to convey, uh, start by complimenting the Reserve Bank for the answers I received in the last estimates, which after examination were complete and factual. So, question one, Chair. The Reserve Bank has now signed on to the International Central Bank Digital Currency Platform. Project Dunbar, and I quote, aims to develop prototype shared platforms for cross-border transactions, which will allow financial institutions to transact directly with each other in the digital currencies issued by participating central banks. Now, as I understand it, Mr. DeBell, Australia will be testing this platform along with Malaysia, Singapore, and South Africa which suggests we have a digital currency to use to test the platform. Where is the Reserve Bank on the de development process for the Reserve Bank digital currency, and what's the time frame here for testing and implementation? Can I defer, uh, pass that one to Ms Bullock, please, Senator? She's the uh, expert in this space, or well, has carriage of this, at least. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, so the first thing to note is that Project Dunbar doesn't have uh, it's, it's a proof of concept, so it isn't a, I distinguish it from a pilot. Pilot is where you actually have actual real money. This isn't a pilot, it's actually a proof of concept. So really what it's about is going through the, the, um, the technical infrastructure you might need, the legal arrangements you might need, the participation requirements you might need to set this sort of multi-currency um, approach up. So there is no central bank digital currency. We don't have one. Central, the um, other central banks don't have one. It's purely a proof of concept. If you like, it's a little bit of a desktop exercise with a little bit of experimentation with, with technical um, approaches to do it. So there's no actual central bank digital currencies involved. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna go on to your second question, if that's all right. Okay. So your second question was about where we are at with the central bank digital currency. So we've been, we've had a multi-year process in this. We've done some small experiments. We've experimented internally with the concept of a wholesale central bank digital currency. Again, it's not real. It's just sort of a, a mock-up, if you like. And uh, we've done that internally to see whether or not individual banks could perhaps use it for settlement between them. We've also expanded that fairly recently. There was a report in December of Project Atom, 
which was a experiment again with um, uh, it was with Commonwealth Bank, National Australia Bank, Perpetual and Consensus and ourselves. And the concept here was, again, a proof of concept. It wasn't a pilot. A proof of concept to see whether or not central bank digital currency paired with tokenised syndicated loans would actually make a more efficient way of having syndicated loans transacted through the economy. We released the report on that in December and it was, I think it proved that there were some efficiencies in this area, but- um, Excuse me, did you say, there, excuse me, did you say there were inefficiencies or- Efficiencies. Efficiencies. So efficiencies. So syndicated loans is a very manual uh, process in and quite lengthy. And what the uh, project proved was if you tokenize the syndicated loans, you had a central bank digital currency to transact amongst the various players in the syndicated loan, that actually that made that a much more efficient process. Whether or not you can do it with or normal payment systems as well is another question, but we didn't test that. So, so there's that. We're also participating, as you mentioned, in Project Dunbar with uh, the, B the Bank for International Settlements Innovation Hub and those uh, three other countries. Um, and we've recently uh, formed ourselves a, a central bank digital currency group um, in the payments policy department. And we're going to be engaging with the digital finance um, uh, cooperative research center, which is looking at all sorts of things digital. We're going to be engaging with them on looking at central bank digital currencies as well. So that's a little bit of a potted history of where we're at with our work on this. Okay, thank you. Um, if a new digital currency is to be created out of electronic ledger entries, will existing amounts of cash be converted into digital dollars? The public may be confused about how this is going to work. Can the Reserve Bank please provide a simple overview of what happens after the project gets the green light? Where, where's the value coming from So, when we have a cash? That's, that's, what, that's what we're assessing, Senator, really is, is exactly that, is, is there value given we have a, you know, Reason, pretty decent payment system as it is, and, and which includes cash clearly, but also electronic settlement. And that's really you, you sort of nailed the question, really, which is: Is there value in this? Is it worth the investment at this stage, or, or not? Michelle, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, the only thing I'd add, Senator, is that um, there is no suggestion in which we are getting rid of cash, um, and um, this isn't this concept is not to replace cash. Um, and it hasn't even been decided that we would do it. This would be a decision not for the Reserve Bank, but for, in fact, the government. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be replacing cash. So that, that's, that's very clear. Um, what, what I was really, when I was talking about the value, I wasn't talk, talking about the value of the process. Is it, is it going to be more efficient? Is it worth doing? Um, so I appreciate your answer and that, and quite clearly, um, that's, that's one interpretation, a valid interpretation of my question. But what I was getting at was, if someone's got so much value in Australian dollars, where, what's, how will that be converted into digital currency dollars or whatever the currency is? So will, will, that, will they still have that value, purchasing value? Sure, so, so the way that most central banks are looking at this around the world is that the, the central bank itself won't be providing people with digital money. It will work like cash does. So at the moment, if you want cash, you go to your ATM or your bank and you withdraw some cash from your bank account. A digital currency, if we had one, would work in a very similar way. You would go into your bank and your bank would have presumably a digital wallet uh, or you'd have a digital wallet and you would take some money out of your bank account and you would put it into central bank digital currency just like cash. So you can think about it in a very parallel way. Yes, but if someone's got $2,000 in cash today in their bank account, will that give them the equivalent purchasing power if there's a conversion into digital currency? Yes, correct. Okay. It, it would be exactly the same as if it was a, a $100 bill or a $100 on your mobile wallet. Okay, thank you. Um, now the BIS is involved. So one specific case our foreign exchange reserves are used to settle international transactions. These will now be replaced with the Reserve Bank digital dollars if it goes ahead. Is the process to simply replace the US dollars we have in reserve with US government issued crypto dollars or a similar value basis digital currency? No. 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 I mean, Sorry, Guy, did you want to take this? 
trade to the chase though, Senator, we would still continue to hold uh, US dollar reserves in the instruments we currently hold them in, which is primarily uh, US Treasuries. Okay, that's pleasing to hear. Um, what are the risks in, in, in doing this? If this is, hand for example, what, what would happen if, if this was handled badly, not, not necessarily from the Reserve Bank, but for the people you're dealing with overseas, if the system wasn't tight? For what, it, what are the various risks that you can foresee that need to be managed? So the, the and, and this is why um, I think there's a lot of water to flow under the bridge before any advanced economies really um, have launched into this. There are obviously cyber issues. You need to make sure that uh, the system is secure. Uh, overseas consultations demonstrate that people are very concerned about privacy, which is a very valid concern. Um, but at the same token, you're also concerned about the uh, use of digital currency for criminal purposes, so there's a balance there. Um, another concern that is one that uh, most central banks identify is concerns about the banking system and whether or not there might be a flight of um, deposits, if you like, to the central bank, to central bank digital currency, which would have implications for banks' balance sheets, potentially make it easier to run on banks if people were concerned about banks. So there's a whole lot of financial stability, risks and issues associated with it. So that's just a sample of some of the issues that need to be considered if we were going to go this direction and have some sort of what I would call retail central bank currency. Thank you. Um, two more questions, Chair. Digital or cryptocurrency is not backed by any asset. It's literally an exercise in trust that the government can protect the value of someone's currency. Is this the time now to start talking about getting an asset backing behind this new currency, such as gold? Um, Senator, just like, uh, just like cash at the moment, um, it's a fiat, it would be a fiat currency, which is, um, which is to say it isn't backed by anything. And you're right, it's all about trust in the institutions of the, of the country, in the government, in the Reserve Bank. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's just like, it would be just like cash. If we were going down this route, it would be an unbacked currency. But it's backed by the government's capacity to you know, raise revenue from its citizens, basically. Backed yeah. by the government's capacity to raise revenue, did you say? Yeah. Thank you. Last question. During COVID, there's been a hell of a lot of money spent on non-productive outcomes. As much as food and rent can be considered non-productive, they're essential, but they're non-productive. The outcome of long-term borrowing for short-term gain is inflation. Is spending on productive capacity, roads, railways, bridges, dams, and irrigation, in this recovery phase, likely to produce a lower inflation outcome across forward estimates than continuing to spend on what can only be described as economic sherbet? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question, Senator. I mean, there is a lot of, I'm not sure it's drawing that distinction. I think food, I would regard as a pretty productive and essential service, for, uh, essential thing for people to consume. So, I mean, you know, we build roads for a purpose, not just because, um, which is to satisfy, you know, people wanting to use them and same with food and same with shelter. So I'm not quite sure how we can draw such a clean line between what's productive and unproductive. Well, perhaps, um, well, food is essential, as I said. Uh, perhaps spending on non-productive assets, um, entertainment, um, instead of traveling overseas, people are going on, on uh, buying new cars, that kind of thing. What I'm talking about is those spending on, on such items that aren't, yeah, that, that may be essential, but not producing increased wealth could lead to inflation. That's the risk. Uh, on the other hand, spending on something that increases productive capacity, like a dam uh, with irrigation systems to supply increased food productivity and lower the cost of food, leaves people better off and wealthier overall. That's what I was getting at, a productive capacity rather than just consumption. I mean, there is a reasonable amount of money being uh, dollars investment in, you know, in, in infrastructure at, at the moment. Uh, that's it's, it's you know that's increased quite a bit both from the um, Commonwealth and the state government. So that sort of spending is absolutely happening. Again, I'm still not quite sure I would draw such a clean distinction. I mean, in the end, we're you know people 
consume what they wanted to consume and I'm not sure it's up to us too much to tell them what that you know what's good and bad about that within reason. Well that's a wonderful statement to, to hear coming into my ears now uh, I love that but uh, yeah yes, anyway I, I, I think you, you sorry I said I thought you might. <laughs> so what, what we've what we've got though um, is an acknowledgement that there is money being spent on infrastructure um, you've answered my question. Yep. Um, I just personally believe, Chair, that we need to spend more on productive, improving our productive capacity. Thank you very much. Again, Chair, I'd like to put on record that um, the Reserve Bank always answers quickly, succinctly and factually. So thank you. It's really appreciated. Dr DeBell, you've got a fan there. Yep, he has. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're now going to... Senator Gallagher, do you want the call? Yes, yeah. I'm happy to, but... Yeah. Or Senator McKim, you've got some questions as well? Oh, no, I'm going before Senator McKim. Okay. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Hey. <laughs> um, After you, Senator Gallagher. Oh. Sorry, Senator McKim, I should have just said another senator has questioned. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see you on the screen. Um, thank you. I'll wait patiently. Chair. All right, That's I'm cool. not going to be very long, Senator McKim, and can I thank officials um, for attending and, and appreciate it at, uh, this evening coming before the committee. Um, uh, Dr DeBell, I wonder, I, I asked some questions earlier of Dr Kennedy around um, interest rates and he he, refer, he was pretty reluctant to say anything um, and, and referred me to you uh, tonight. But can I start with um, your, perhaps if you could update the committee. I'm, I know that you've released, uh, the bank's released the statement of monetary policy, I think on Friday. Uh, but perhaps if you could just update the committee about what you uh, expect um, to see happen with interest rates over the next six to 12 months. Um, I'm not sure I have a strong expectation about what will happen to interest rates. I mean, what we've Try to. I mean, it will be that will be driven by what happens to the economy, which is, I think, with the point tried to stress. So, yeah, our monetary policy decisions are going to be driven by are very much informed by what's actually happening to the economy. So, uh, as Governor said uh, during before the House last Friday, and as we you know said in our um, and he said it before the press club, it's really a, a case of we will see how the economy evolves over the period ahead, and that's really going to be the you know main determinant of what happens to interest rates. So what actually, you know, what actually is going to, how things actually play out in the period ahead. Okay. So um, can I ask some questions around inflation then? In July sure. last year, Dr Kennedy uh, and spoke about the gradual strengthening of inflation if there was higher wage growth. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had a brief discussion around it uh, this morning in the time that was allocated. But would you agree that the underlying forces influencing inflation um, build up over some time before there's a visible impact? Um, sometimes, sometimes not. I mean, you know, the, the drivers we've seen in terms of inflation over the past 12 months in Australia have been uh, particularly higher fuel prices, and you know, they came yep. up pretty quick and passed through. You know, they passed through to what people are paying at the pump pretty much immediately. So, you know, they, they, that happened very fast. Um, we've also seen a bill, you know, one of the other big contributors to uh, the 3.5% um, inflation we had over last year was an uh, increase in home building costs. Um, we're very much a function of strong demand in that sector, as well as disruptions to you know, some of the key inputs into home building. So, you know, that sort of, that pass rate of inflation reasonably quickly. So, I mean, that's so it's, you know, it, it varies. Sometimes it takes, you know, builds up over a period of time. Sometimes some things can happen pretty quickly. I mean, best example, you know, the oil price shocks in 1973 fed through to inflation very, very quickly. So, yeah, but I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to your question, I suppose. That, uh, that, you know, some prices are more sticky, some prices, oh, sorry, you know, more slow moving, and some prices move quite rapidly. Okay, and so in your December quarter, you know, it, it, it was a much sort of stronger result than I think you'd, you'd been predicting. 
Um, so there, are you saying there, there's two components to that? There's the sort of more volatile uh, ones, which is I think what Dr Kennedy said this morning. I just don't have my notes in front of me, but that there was so contributors to um, to inflation could fall into two parts. One was more volatile, and one was sort of a, a longer term impact. Um, would you agree with that? Yep. I would very much agree with my fellow board member. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so those, the I guess the once you remove some of the volatility that you're seeing, those um, the ones that contribute more to the underlying inflation, like they are present. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to say it, but they are they take time to build up to become clear in in your results, basically. Yeah, in terms of what we actually see in terms of yes. prices, I mean, yes. not our results, you know, what everyone pays in terms of prices. But yeah, I mean, maybe to answer your question, underlying inflation is running uh, just over two and a half percent in the year to December, whereas you know the actual overall consumer price inflation was about three and a half. Yeah, and some decent chunk of the difference of that probably is due to you know is due to things like higher petrol prices and the like. I mean, they, you know, they can. Keep up, you know, as the semi, you know, showed oil prices can add to inflation for a while. So they're not, you know, they they're volatile. They can be volatile, but they can also, you know, stay high for a while. Yeah, and in your but we do. I mean, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Just, we, you know, we do our best to try and just, you know, to some extent, maybe if I could have another answer slightly differently, it's like we do our assessment. You know, we have to look at what is going to be the sort of, you know medium term drivers of inflation and take account of that and while well, you know taking account of things which may move around a lot in the short term in both directions up and down yeah okay and so from that would you agree that the underlying causes of inflation that are likely over the next few years have um already been created um not necessarily um i mean you know, again, you know, things come along out of the blue. Um, you know, pandemics came along, which had a pretty material impact on inflation and completely, you know, disrupted whatever was happening two years ago um, and put us in a completely different place. So I'm not sure that I would completely frame it that way. Um, you know, we it, it is the case that our monetary policy settings take some time to have their full impact. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but um, so yeah. that's certainly true. But at the same time, you know, over the course of them having their impact, there are plenty of other things which come along, you know, both expected and unexpected. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of um, what you're seeing um, in the I guess in relation to inflation or the inflationary environment we're in, would does the RBA consider it inevitable that interest rates will be raised over the next year at some point? I think it's possible. I'm not sure it's inevitable. Um, as the governor said uh, again when I was pretty much the same question last Friday, uh, you know there are scenarios absolutely where that happens. Um, there are other ones where that doesn't. So I'm not sure I'd describe it as inevitable. Um, I think it'd be, you know, at some point, interest probable? rates will be higher, and probable? that's probably a good. Um, <laughs> I mean, in the end, it's going to be depending on what how things actually evolve. And I think, you know, being too dogmatic about predictions over the last couple of years, you know, things have turned out quite a lot different to what mm. we've expected. Things, are, you know, in all manner of respects. So. I think we'd have to be somewhat modest in our ability to be too precise about that. Okay. Um, can I ask? You can. Uh, sorry, this is probably a bit. I don't know if you've got. It. Um, there's some questions around lease cost routing or. Is that how you say it? Yep, yep. Michelle yeah. is. Um, I will defer to Michelle on that. So yes, you may. I, end. Yeah. So just an update, really, on on what's happening there. I have read the information on your website, but I think it it relates to um, 2018. It, it doesn't look like it's been updated recently. 
Um, so, uh, Senator, the um, conclusions of the review last year set out our findings there. And what we said was that we expected um, basically dual network debit cards to be issued, which, which by um, all banks which have more than 1% of uh, transaction volumes. Um, and uh, that basically means that that gives the possibility for least cost routing. You can't have least cost routing without dual network debit cards. Yeah. Um, so uh, where that is now is that our understanding is that um, all the major acquirers now offer least cost routing. Some of them offer it um, explicitly to uh, merchants. Others offer it in the background for merchants. So they just automatically provide it to merchants and give them lower costs as a result. Um, but uh, certainly um, all of the major acquirers now offer least cost routing. Uh, and so like from your point of view, is that done then? Or is there a next stage to it now that, like I, sorry, I haven't followed this closely. So um, forgive me if that's a basic question, but it, it looked as, it looks as though this is, there's been work underway. Some, there's been some capability across some merchants and, and issuers for some time, but you're now saying that it, it, it's largely available across the board. It's largely available across the board now, and, and I'll have to be, I'll be frank and say that we were pretty disappointed with the speed with which the banks rolled it out. Yeah, okay. Um, but they have, they have rolled it out now. Um, and as I said, uh, it's not done and dusted in the sense that we're continuing to make sure that the banks are continuing to issue dual network debit cards. And the other aspect of our work is that we are, um, as you know, many people are using um, not just cards now, but they're also using mobiles, yeah. phones. Yeah. And so we're now uh, working, well, we're, we're, we're um, liaising with and trying to persuade a mobile phone providers to actually permit least cost routing with their mobile phones. And we're also working with uh, gateways and payment facilitators to make sure that uh, least cost routing is available online as well as in person. So there's more, there's still more work ongoing, but we're working very hard on, on getting extra bits and pieces underway. Okay, so it should be available on sort of FPOS and PayPass and those kind of, you know, you using it that way, but not, not necessarily or not at all on mobiles and online? At the moment, it works differently. So at the moment on a card, a merchant can just, if, if I present my dual network debit card, the merchant can choose where the transaction goes and they have that choice. In a mobile world, if I have my um, Apple device, for example, I might have my FPOS and my Visa card provisioned on that, on that, so the dual network debit card is there, but I actually choose as the consumer which one I want to use. The functionality to allow the merchant to overturn that or, or choose it isn't there yet, nor is it online. And, and I might just add that there is a, there is a challenge here because, because if I as a customer really don't want to use FPOS, I really want to use my Visa card, um, I think there is a question about whether or the merchant has a right to overturn that mm. without telling me. Yeah. So, so I think we've just got to be a little bit careful um, absolutely, least cost routing is a very important part of the competitive landscape and we want to see it rolled out, but we do have to be mindful that consumers also have uh, rights here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think that's that for us. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim. Well, thanks, Chair, and um, good evening to you both. Um, Dr DeBell, last time we were talking, I was asking you about why the RBA isn't jawboning a little bit more loudly on issues like um, negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount. And you directed me to the RBA submission to the House of Rep inquiry. I read that. Thanks for that. And I read it. I, I have to say, I found it a little bit wishy-washy to um, things that the OECD and the IMF are so I just want to ask you again, I mean, I don't know if you are aware of some of the language that the IMF and the OECD are used. I can, I can read you out some excerpts from what they're saying. If you like, but it's, it's a long, you're a long, long way off it, if, if I might say, in my 
Dutchman. So I just wanted to ask you again why Gosh. why you're not jawboning a bit more loudly for um, tax reform. In, in the end, Senator, is it's a, this, how the taxation regime in this country is a um, decision for the government. That's that's right. I do, I do understand that, of course, but um, the Arbor is an independent body. Um, shouldn't you be at least being honest about the effect that tax policy is having on monetary policy? Because monetary policy is your bag, right? So yes. well, let me put it this way, Dr. DeBell. Do, do you think that negative gearing and capital tax concessions are having an impact on the efficacy of monetary policy in Australia? I'm not sure they're having an impact on the efficacy because you know when they're not changing, you know, the environment while they're not changing remains the same. So I'm not sure that has an impact on on the efficacy of monetary policy. So you don't think that um, negative gearing, the capital gains tax, can, are having an impact on the capacity of the Reserve Bank to assist in the maintenance of full employment and the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia? No, that's not obvious to me, Senator. I mean, they have. I'm not saying they don't have. You know, they don't have an impact. But they are what they are. I mean, this is sort of a more general statement about fiscal policy. They are what they are, and we take account of that in our setting of monetary policy, just like we do any fiscal decision. Sure, but but you've got a situation where house prices in the last 12 months have, have risen um, more than 10 times the the rise in wages. Now. That impacts, does it not, on the welfare of the people of Australia, particularly those people in Australia who aren't lucky enough to already be have a foothold in the property market. And I presume that you know your you know, your aims don't just apply to people who own houses; they also apply to people to folk who don't own houses and who can't afford to get into the market because it's been turbocharged in large decisions the RBA have made around low interest and uh, the QE that you've engaged in over the last couple of years. So I just, I guess I'm just trying to explore, um, I guess, back on any, on your contention that um, that those tax policy settings have no impact on the efficacy of monetary policy. No, I mean, I, I suppose what I'm saying is while they remain, you know, yes, our policy decisions have have had an impact on house prices. That's that's absolutely true, as you said, and that's you know that's been thus for a long time. So I'm not you know, but that's given the tax environment. And yes, they had those impacts. Um, I'm not sure if the tax environment being different, the impact would have been any different. That's over the last couple of years. That's what I'm saying. That doesn't mean you know, but you know, to your question, changes in tax regimes, you know, do absolutely have distributive consequences that's you know that's yeah. ever been thus as well so I'm, I'm just not sure i would you know so directly link the two i'm not okay. saying that tax settings don't have an impact but i'm just not sure that they have any particular impact while they're not changing on on the transmission of our monetary policy settings okay um so uh, last estimates i also um was asking you uh, about the RBA's powers and whether you thought any legislative changes were necessary to enable you to better direct monetary policy to productive ends rather than speculative ends. Um, I've just done a little bit of work on this in the interim and um, I've observed that Section 36 of the Banking Act does actually provide the RBA with powers to direct the class of loans that banks can make. Um, are you aware of whether, when was the last time the RBA used those powers? And did the RBA consider invoking those powers during um, your recent bout of money printing over the last couple of years? Uh, no, the answer to your last, the second part of your question, no, we didn't. The answer to your first part of your question, oh, I, I will have to take that one on notice because I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, the powers, uh, prima facie, seem fairly broad. Would they, for example, allow the RBA to direct a bank to limit the amount of housing loans that it makes with any particular basket of money that it might get? 
for example, from the RBA's money printing? No, I mean, we, as I said, we haven't made, you know, we don't, haven't made those allocated decisions, I don't know since when, or depending on the answer to your uh, first part of your previous mm -hmm. question. I mean, APRA sets prudential standards around, you know, the quality of the loans that banks yeah. can make, uh, but not not necessarily the uh, well, you know, and, and some of those standards have a bit somewhat of a quantitative aspect to them as well, but they're mostly, you know, primarily aimed at the ensuring that the you know, lending standards are appropriate. Okay, so um, perhaps if I could ask you just on notice, I think you've agreed that to take my previous question on notice, but um, just whether the RBA has a view on the extent of those powers, whether it would allow the RBA to direct a bank to limit the amount of housing loans, for example, that it makes, uh, whether the RBA could establish a different cash rate for lending for housing as opposed to lending for business. And well, perhaps if you could take those on notice if you, if you don't have a response immediately. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have, you know, for since the mid eighties, I think off the top of my head, we have had a deregulated interest rates uh, system. That was, I think the by memory, I reckon it was 1986 that the last uh, ceiling on interest rates, on housing loan interest rates was removed. And since then we've operated in a deregulated financial system where interest rates, we set the benchmark, you know, the benchmark interest rate, mm -hmm. the, the, the cash rate, which sort of under the short term risk free rate, which underpins the whole interest rate structure in the economy, but uh, other lending rates above and beyond that, uh, you know, uh, 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 Set by the institutions, not by us. Yeah, they're, no, they're, they're a fun, you know, they're very much dependent on how, on what, how, what, what level we set the cash rate in our overall monetary policy settings. But we have not been, you know, we nor the government, for that matter, have been in the business of, um, you know, of putting particular caps or uh, limits on interest rates. Is that a policy choice of the RBA or of the government of the day? Um. Well, I mean, it's. I think Michelle, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the the setting of uh, I, I, I will actually I'll have to come back to you on that one, Senator. I think you know in terms of the interest rate caps which were in place before, uh, whether they came from uh, directly from us or from yeah, the government. Yeah, I don't. I don't Making know. my memory at this point. No. Oh, thank. You. Oh, sorry, sorry, Ms. Book. Sorry, my, my bad. I was just going to say we'll, we'll take that on notice. And the in the issue of the banking, the Banking Act, um, uh, I wasn't aware that we were mentioned in that context in the Banking Act. So I'll have to go and have a look at the Banking Act. Sure, thank you, and I, I appreciate um, you taking those on notice. I guess just to be clear, I'm I'm interested uh, in um, you know, on notice as you just categorised, Doctor De Bell, but also the decision to. Um, I can't remember the phrase you used. Regulate um, the interest sector, or whatever it was, the decision to to um, unapply any caps or um, rate settings that were in place. Whether that decision was a decision of the RBA or the government of the day, and whether it continues on as a decision, you know, in whose in whose ambit is that policy? Is it government policy? Or is it RBA? Okay, policy? this is what I'm interested in. Um, and I guess. Um, goes to the nub of something I've raised to you before, because on the face of it, it looks like the RBA has plenty of power to direct banks not to do, but you're exercising a choice not to use it. And um, particularly in the context of you, you know, printing 400 odd billion dollars over the last couple of years, whether it's in the, the interest and the welfare of the people of Australia, whether um, it's a wise move to basically abrogate responsibility there and just let the banks do whatever they want with it. I mean, I, I suppose in answering your question, Senator, I would note that we have unemployment down to 4.2%, which is the lowest it's been in quite some time, and that probably benefits the welfare of the Australian people, particularly those who, certainly not does. Now who might not otherwise have had them absent those policy settings. I'm uh, not arguing against QE, Dr DeBell, here, just so that we're abundantly clear. <laughs> okay. I'm not arguing against that at all. I'm simply... Uh, if you like, arguing for um, a little bit more direction on some of the areas of the economy that that money uh, ends up in, and whether well, the RBA is exercising its mind. Um, yeah. in, but you've agreed, I think, to come back on notice on that, so um, that's fine. Uh, I guess ultimately what I'm getting at here is the efficacy of independent central 
banking. I mean, we've had, it was interesting, I had a conversation with Dr. Kennedy this morning and he was saying, you know, we've, he was so, and fair enough too, um, lauding a low unemployment rate. You know, that's something we're all happy to see. Um, he was saying, you know, we're pretty close to this sort of promised land of low unemployment and wages starting to grow. And we've only been this close twice in the last 50 years. And I made the point for him that that means basically, you know, uh, just your information, he was talking about pre the shocks as one of the times and pre the 2008 um, episode as the other time. And uh, I did make the point for him that uh, that's that's basically an admission Put this to, to Dr. Develas a question, my last question, Chair. Um, isn't that an admission that neoliberalism's basically failed, Dr. Debell, for 50 years? Um, we haven't actually achieved the promised land, have we? And um, there's a lot of people that have missed out along the way. And the best we can say is that we now, for the third time in two full generations of Australians, we're close. Um. We haven't yet achieved full employment, which is one of the key aims of the RBA for 50 years. Oh, I accept that that is indeed one of the key aims. I mean, I'd say it was probably difficult to achieve full employment in 2009 after we'd been through the size of the shock that the world, you know, there was a few years where a few things sort of sent both yeah, of the world off the track. But so. 50 years is a long time, Dr. DeBell. No, oh, I, indeed it is. Uh, it, it is a almost long time, as long as me. You've had a long time asking questions too. Have you got many more? No, I've got no more, Chair, and I just want to thank uh, Ms Bullock and Dr DeBell. Okay, thank excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator thank McKim. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Thank you. Uh, what a fascinating uh, debate and discussion about economics more broadly. But I wanted to ask you... Are you going you, to contribute to it? I, I was not going to do okay. that, Chair, I, unless you'd like me to. No, no excellent. your questions. I wanted to talk to you about um, uh, inflation and the CPI. Now, I appreciate yep. that the RBA doesn't uh, set the CPI, that that's or set, you know, um, calculate the CPI. But I, I wanted to talk to you about um, the, the concept that regional Australia, um, the CPIs are set by capital city. Um, particularly in Northern Australia, which is the part I'm interested in. So, you know, I live in Townsville. Um, we had a, a significant uh, increase in costs over the last few years. Um, Townsville city rents increased over 8% last year, but it was a 25% increase over the previous four years. And I suspect that this is in part due to property shortages and um, a lack of new stock coming on because of um, you know, a range of issues. But more importantly, I think it was a result of uh, increasing uh, insurance premiums, which the property owner was then passing back to the renter. Um, so over 30% of households reside in the regions uh, they're, they're tied to their local capital city, but you know they're not really a good. Um, I, I would suggest that they're not really a good proxy for what's really happening in the regions, and it means that um, we're getting these um, two-speed economies where, you know, the second speed's not being not being adequately recognised. Though, I mean, there might be higher wages regionally, there might be offsets, so, you know, but we just don't know. And I wanted to ask you, Dr DeBell um, and Ms Bullock, if you have a view on whether or not that was something that you considered, that was something that should, should be considered. I, I recognise a decade ago, um, us Northerners petitioned for a regional CPI um, and the ABS that they didn't have enough staff to do that. But, you know, what, what are your thoughts is where I'm going? Uh, so let me make a couple of comments and uh, you can ask my good friend, Dr. Gruitt, as to whether he's got the budget for it now to be able to afford it. But, um, but one thing we do, we, the Reserve Bank do, in our liaison program is we do get out and talk to businesses in regional Australia, right, including in Townsville and uh, North Queensland, and uh, you know, and other parts of regional Australia, and you know that is 
you know, particularly over the last uh, year or two, we have had quite a lot of feedback around some of the particularly issues around, obviously, you know, rent and house prices more generally, as Senator McKinley was talking about, mm -hmm. in regional Australia. Um, so that is actually something we pay a reasonable amount of attention to and some of the developments which are which are going on there. So it, it is something we get, notwithstanding uh, whether or not it's in the CPI, it is something that we get you know, information from, from our conversations with people in or businesses, particularly in regional Australia. Okay. So, you know, it, is, it is something we take account of. I mean, in the end, which is true, you know, if we've been having this conversation um, Obviously, 10 years ago, there would have been complaints that we were setting monetary policy for, you know, capital cities, and it was way too tight for uh, for regional Australia. So it's interesting to hear that it's uh, the opposite way around this time around. But um, but the um, uh, but as I said, we do in the end we we have one policy, well, broadly speaking, one policy tool mm -hmm. which we have to set in terms of conditions in the country. Um, as a whole, but in making that assessment, we're very much informed about what happens in all parts of the country, not just in the capital cities. So that's terrific and unsurprising that the RBA is ensuring that it's so well informed. But how do I, as a um, Northern Senator, ensure that, so you just raise the issue of um, uh, property prices. I mean, that's currently being informed by the lack of access to capital for developers to build in Northern Australia. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible to get finance uh, to build outside of, you know, Townsville and Mackay and, and Cairns. So in the absence of there being a tool or a metric to talk about that, it's difficult to then get government to look at uh, levers to pull in places where there's just not a huge population, but it's a really significant issue. Yeah, true. But in the end, I suppose, as you said, really, I suppose the government has the capacity to address that, I suppose, rather than you know, that's in the government's remit rather than ours. I yeah, suppose. sure. I was interested to, to just, you know, talk to you about what was the, um, you know, how did the RBA address that? And you've, you've told me by going out on the ground and having conversations with people and um, I'll continue my continue my quest elsewhere then. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Senator. We wish you luck <laughs> on your quest. Uh, so I'd like to thank the, uh, the witnesses from uh, Reserve Bank of Australia uh, for joining us this evening. Um, so go with our fond regards and uh, I hope uh, you can get a hearing of, you can get a recording of Senator Roberts uh, compliments to you, which uh, you can uh, keep for posterity, it's Dr. Debell. Um, so, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, thank Senator. Chair. Now, uh, we'll take a short break. Okay, so we'll we'll take a short break at this stage. Uh, perhaps uh, we're waiting for the minister to to, to join. So. 15 minutes? 10 minutes? Sure. How quickly Thanks. can the minister get here? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. But in a, in a defence, you didn't know well. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. Of course. So, so, not Absolutely, you can, Minister. So, uh, there's a number of uh, witnesses who are no longer required. Uh, so, just working through it, uh, the Inspector General of Taxation, not required. Productivity Commission, not required. And the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, not required. Right. Okay. So, we've got Catherine and Nifik. Correct. Got it. Okay, I'd like to 
to now welcome our witnesses from APRA as we recommence our hearing. So can everyone hear me? Yep. I can certainly hear you, Chair. And I can hear you, Mr Byers. So, uh, and we have uh, Minister Hume with us as well. Thank you. So, Mr Byers, you have an opening statement. Well, I do have an opening statement, Chair, and it, it does essentially two things. It talks uh, about some of the progress and, in some cases, finalisation of some of the issues that we have discussed uh, before this committee previously and that we've, de that we've dealt with since we last appeared. And then it focuses on some of our recent work on superannuation transparency. I'm conscious though, um, Chair, that it is relatively late in the evening already. Um, I understand the statement has been circulated to the committee members. So if you prefer, I would um, be happy just to have the statement tabled and we could go to questions. Okay, excellent. So it has been uh, circulated to, to members. So I might, uh, Senator Walsh, yes. you're seeking the call? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you all for okay. being here. I'd like to start with some questions uh, on your um, answer to question 45 uh, that you provided uh, recently. Um, so this is a, this is a question about uh, the number of people who remain in um, underperforming uh, super funds. Uh, and you've responded that almost 90,000 members left underperforming funds since August 2021. Uh, and that amounted to 6.4% of members of those funds. Uh, and I just want to confirm that it's it's therefore correct that over uh, so that 93.6% or 1.3 uh, million workers are still in those underperforming funds um, as at the start of February when you provided uh, the information. Senator, I'll hand that question to um, either Margaret Cole or Suzanne Smith, whoever would like to take that, that would be happy to answer that question. Sure. Um, Senator, that, I think that the figures sound right. I haven't got the exact answer in front of me. Um, and I think the last time we have statistics for was as of the end of December, so that's when those figures must be relevant to you. So you are right in saying that um, a number of members remain in the uh, funds that the products that failed the first perform your future your super performance test. Some of those funds are already um, have a changed status, if you like. Um, we have of the thirteen that failed, seven have either closed, merged, or closed, merged. I just, just stop you for a moment, um, Chair. I'm okay. having trouble with the audio, sir. Okay. okay, so um, some issues with your uh, audio. Uh, I wonder if it might be easier if you you can can you turn off your video? We it might assist in terms of your audio. That's something we've found. I think uh, to me it felt as if it was someone in the room, Chair, but I can certainly stop my video, yes. Uh, sometimes that is the case if there's papers or things happening in the room. I didn't think there was. Or, or, or other people who aren't on mute. Okay. Mm. All right. So Everyone could mute. So why don't we try again? Sure. Well, I'm off video now, if that helps. Yep. <laughs> but yep. um, I was about so to can... explain why. Yep, we can hear you well. You can hear me better. I was about to explain why um, you're technically right, but some people are now in, some members are now in funds that failed, but which are now in the process of closing or merging or close to merging mm. with other funds. Um, Ms Cole, thank you. I might just stop you there because I think you said that the most recent data 
that you were aware of was until December, um, but I, I refer you to the answer to the question on notice. I'll just, I'll just read out uh, what, what APRA told us. Um, data received to the 2nd of February 2022 indicates that just over 89,000 members have exited their underperforming MySuper products since the 30th of August 2021 representing a 6.4 net decrease in total membership numbers. These exi exited member accounts held a value of 3.48 billion, 6.2% um, of the amount held in the, end, in the underperforming products at 30 June uh, 2021. So, so the data that you've provided us on notice goes up to the 2nd of February uh, and it says that there's been a 6.4% decrease in membership of those underperforming funds. Uh, and so I would take it from that, uh, that around 94% of people remain in those funds and that that would be 1.3 million workers. I'm not sure it's necessarily inconsistent, um, but Suzanne Smith can say if I've got the date wrong the data is calculated. But I guess I was trying to explain why they're not, why those members are not necessarily going to remain in one of the 13 failed funds, because those 13 failed funds are merging or changing their status pretty well as we speak. Yes, okay. That's to confirm that's correct, Margaret. Yep. Um, we are having a bit of trouble with the audio, but I also just want to check uh, on the record then. Um, I think the, the maths is that if uh, the exited members accounts held a value of 3.48 billion, uh, and that was 6.2% of the amount held in those funds, um, that the total value of the accounts remaining in these underperforming funds is over $50 billion. Does that, can you confirm that? Perhaps we can take that one, can we take that one on notice and we'll come back and confirm that information for you. I'm just wondering if any of the APRA officials have the answer to the question on notice that you provided us, I think the day before yesterday, because I'm just taking the information from what you've provided us very recently and I would think respectfully, you'd be prepared to uh, talk about the answer that you provided a day or two ago. Yeah, um, I'll get that. I'll just um, pull that information out and perhaps we can come back to that one in a moment. Right. Would, um, would most of the people who are still in those funds today um, be stapled to those funds? Would they be stapled to those funds? So those members will have um, a choice of when those mem those funds will be, as Ms. Cole said, those, most of those funds are merging. So they've either made a decision to merge. I think three have three of those funds of the 13 that failed have actually completed a merger. And there are another uh, six that are in the process of merging. So those funds would merge into the new funds. Mm. Um, but that, those members all have a choice mm. of moving. Are they stapled to those funds today? To the extent that they're in the funds and haven't made a decision to move, they will remain members of those funds. Thank you. Um, but to be yeah. clear, Senator, you may be stapled to your fund, which simply means it follows you from job to job, which means that when you move to a new job, you don't get a duplicate fund, yep. a different fund, uh, but at any point in time, because of the government's choice legislation, you can now choose to leave your fund, yep. and again, because of the PYS legislation, yep. there is no exit fee for doing so. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that the, the vast majority of those people who are still in those underperforming funds would currently be stapled to them, and I think the official said, you know, yes, that's the, that's the current situation. 
Yes, yep. but I think it's important not to misinterpret what stapling means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come. We've got lots of questions about that. Yep. Um, when when I asked these questions back in um, the previous estimates back in October, um, Ms. Cole told us that um, you were getting the data on how many people were leaving these. Um, 13 underperforming funds uh, on a weekly <coughs> basis, um, I believe since August um, last year. Um, have you been providing updates to government on how many people are leaving those 13 funds? Well, we certainly have conversations um, with Minister Hume, who's here today from time to time. Um, and I'm sure it's correct to say that we have, from time to time, provided the numbers, yes. Um, when did you first... We've also spoken in public about the numbers, Senator. So Sorry, I think... uh, could you repeat that? I just missed that, Miss Cole. I think I've also spoken in public about the numbers a few times, so it's okay. not... not Numbers are transparent for anyone who asks to see them. Is this the first time that the numbers have been presented in in aggregate? You know, at at, at this point in time, I guess. Yes. Yes, I yeah. think those are yeah. well, first time that we publicly stated in a we've stated in a public setting, if you like, what the up to date last numbers we had are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when did you provide government with the information that you've provided uh, the committee on that data um, received to, to 2 February? I think I can safely answer that this is the first night I've seen that data. First time I've seen the data. Okay. Tonight. Thanks, Minister. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I don't believe. I don't believe we have. I'm not. I'd have to go away and ask. So, Minister, thank, thank you, Ms. Cole. So, Minister, this is the first time that you've heard that 94% of people in the underperforming funds are still in those funds. Yes, but again, I think you've misinterpreted what Ms. Cole has said, which is that even though people are still within those funds, those funds are at least. Seven, and I think it was, uh, of those funds are now already in the process of merging with other funds. So while they may be underperforming funds as at the time of the underperform of the test, uh, hopefully by the middle of this year, they won't be underperforming anymore because they'll be part of a different fund. Okay. So it, it sounds like you're not surprised or concerned that only 6% of people uh, in those funds have, have left them and that 1.3 million people remain in them at the moment? Well, They're I think it's encouraging that 89,000... Was it 89? 89,291 yes. people have taken action of their own accord to move funds, and that's largely because they received something in registered mail to say your superannuation fund is underperforming and you probably don't realise it. And that's the first time that's ever occurred. So I think that that's an encouraging sign. Now, is there going to be a level of stickiness in superannuation? Yes, there always has been. Um, you know, disengagement is one, is one of the things that's in plagued yes. superannuation since day one. Yes. So I think it's a great thing that so many of those people, and I'm, I don't know exactly what the number was, I think you made an estimate of the, the number yourself, Senator Walsh, uh, are now going to be moving because of the mergers that are occurring into funds that are performing. I think the that's terrific. The only numbers I have, Minister, are that 89,000 people left and 1.3 million have stayed in and underperforming moved into funds. High, and of many of that 1.9 are now moving into funds that are performing because well, the of only, the merger process. And well, that the merger only process wouldn't have occurred if it wasn't for the Your Future, Your Super Changes. The only number that we have is that 89,000 left and 1.3 million are still in an underperforming fund. Well, 1.3 million is that? are still in funds that are now in the process of merging with, for, with funds that them? are performing. Some of them? We don't know. I, I, I don't know what numbers are in each particular fund. I've never asked APRA that, and I never ask which ones are merging, which funds are merging either. 
That's okay. not my business. What my business is is to make sure that we do absolutely everything to ensure that people that are in underperforming funds know that they're in underperforming funds and have the option to choose to move funds should they wish to do so. So you're happy with the information that you're receiving just now for the first time on the progress of your policy, which says that a much larger people are choosing to stay in an underperforming fund. Well, we don't know whether they're choosing, choosing to, to stay or just it. not responding to the information that their fund well, is underperforming. What's the difference? They're, they're still in an underperforming fund. Well, the fund. good news is their fund is now merging with a, with a fund that is performing. So they will do much better. And that's terrific news. Right, OK. Um, so this is the first time, Minister, that you have been advised that 1.3 million people are still in underperforming funds and that only 90,000 have left. Why? I'm sorry, I know Why? we're repeating the same thing over and over again, well, Senator Walsh, but it's not the way you are interpreting those numbers. Why have I you not asked for the information earlier? Why well, have you not asked well, actually, for the data earlier? I think the earlier? last estimates we did canvas this. Um, I know that we knew that after the letters were received that there was still some you know, considerable stickiness. Did that take us by surprise? Probably, except for the fact that disengagement, as you know, has plagued the superannuation system since day one, which is one of the reasons why we undertook the Your Future, Your Super reforms, to make sure that those people that are in underperforming funds at least were told that their funds were letting them down. Because let's face it, there were lots and lots of funds out there that uh, were simply hiding behind the skirts of the good performing funds. And they can't so, do that with your future, your super. They held to account for their yeah. performance. So we've asked, we've asked earlier today um, some questions of Treasury and ATO um, about what people have been told about their underperforming funds uh, and also about stapling. Uh, and um, you've referenced the, the letter that the funds were required under your legislation to, to send out. So we know that people in underperforming funds got that information. Mm -hmm. We hope that they got that information. Well, they should have. It was through registered mail. We think they, we believe they got that information, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what information did people get from government or an appropriate agency or regulator about the fact that they were about to be stapled to those funds? Well, nothing changed for people that were in superannuation other than the fact that when they changed jobs, they didn't automatically get a new superannuation fund, which potentially could be a duplicate. I would imagine that there would have been a lot of people out there that just simply forgot that they had superannuation funds when they changed jobs. But now that is... Um, that's a thing of the past, duplicate accounts. Uh, we've you know, we got rid of the stock of duplicate accounts with the PYS protecting your super changes. Uh, we gave people choice with the choice legislation and now we're stopping the flow of duplicate accounts and making the system far more efficient for doing so. With the your future, your super changes, we know that people no longer, um, just by default, have multiple sets of fees, multiple sets of insurances and multiple accounts, which is a very inefficient way to save for your retirement. Um, presumably you would like these um, 1.3 million people who are still in underperforming funds, you will now interject that they may, some of these funds may be in a process of, of merger. Seven but, out of the 13. But, but presumably the intent of your legislation is that people engage with the fact that they're in an underperforming fund and do something about it. Well, in an ideal world, but the good news is the funds are taking action themselves for the first time. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how would you assess the, the level of engagement of, of individuals in the decision to stay or, or, or change funds when 90,000 have left and 1.3 million at present have stayed? Well, as you, you know, said earlier, disengagement in the superannuation system 
is, un is an unfortunate byproduct of a compulsory superannuation system. But that said, there are now nearly 90,000 people that have made the choice, that have engaged with their superannuation potentially for the first time and made the decision to get up and move to a better performing fund. Those that haven't chosen to do that, the good news is they're still protected because their funds are now looking for merger partners with funds that are performing. So they'll have much better retirement outcomes too. Um, and thank you. And I just wanted to clarify, I think I asked you before um, whether there was any communication with people about the fact that they uh, were being stapled to funds and your answer was um, it was, you know, no change for them. Um, can I just confirm the answer to that actual question? Um, was there any communication required by well, nobody's stuck funds in a fund or Senator. anybody? Nobody's stuck in a fund, so nothing's changed. Once, yep. In fact, probably the choice legislation was the one that we should have communicated with them about, the, to tell them that they're no longer stuck in a fund, that they have the choice to move to whatever fund they want to. But So you haven't communicated with the people who are um, still in an underperforming fund, yes, that, they, that, that, that they've been stapled to it, is my question. Well, it's their fund. They're there. But it's They've just defaulted, a yes or no, probably Minister. defaulted into it's not it, your or potentially intention. choosing to stay. So it's just but a yes or no. So we're not it was, it was not your people. intention to, to communicate that to them, and you haven't. Is, we're not is forcing answer. people to move funds if they don't want to move funds. Well, I'm just wondering why it's such a hard question to answer if because you're not concerned about it. Because you're intentionally trying to misinterpret the concept of stapling. Nobody's stuck anywhere. And the reason why they're not stuck anywhere is because of the reforms that this government's made. Right. So you and, don't think... And dare you, I say, you, if we hadn't you, have gone you, through with those reforms, and, you know, let's face it, a Labor government would never have made those reforms. So those people are much better off. They now have the choice to move should they want to. Well, we certainly... Labor certainly did say that we should not be stapling people to underperforming funds. I'm actually thrilled to know, because, um, I've, because Stephen Jones has said it publicly, that Labor will not be making any significant changes to the superannuation reforms that the well, Liberal government has made. we're hearing estimates asking you as the government uh, questions. So I just am going to have one more go, because um, it's a yes or no. It, it, have you, has government communicated to people that they've been stapled to underperforming funds? Individually or collectively? I mean, individually. Have we written to everybody and said that they have a superannuation fund? Have no. you said that, have you told people that they're stapled to an underperforming fund? They're not stapled to anything. All it means is that, that they're, all it means, stapling means, is that their superannuation fund does not duplicate when they go and start a new job. They don't Staple get a brand new your, fund. The they take their fund. Language. You Actually, it wasn't mine. It was it wasn't mine. It was the Productivity statement. Commission's. You built the system, and Senator Walsh is asking you a very straightforward question. If you're so relaxed about it, I am relaxed, and I'm actually interested to know what the alternative would be. Because what it sounds like Senator is what you're Walsh suggesting is, is it would be much better is if every time somebody moved jobs, well, just they got a second fund, they got a third fund, they got a fourth fund. If they have multiple jobs, do they have multiple funds by default? The, the That's a ridiculous that you solution. Haven't communicated to these individuals that they're stapled to an underperforming fund because you just don't think it's necessary to do so, which is within. You know, which is okay. If they can move if that's at any time. What you want to any say. individual can move fund at any time that they choose to do so. If they okay. choose not I'm, to, I'm not sure that's why. Fine too. I'll move on. I'll how, move on. How are we going, Senator Walsh? Yeah. Senator well, McDonald I'm going. I'm going quite well, um, but no, I think I'm they're going around in circles. Five, five, Senate, Senator McDonald does times. have some questions. Yeah, so. I've got. I've got a few about okay. about this important issue. So, um, we also uh, received. Um, answers, uh, Minister, from the Department of the Treasury uh, or to question um, 137 about consumer research on stapling. Uh, and we asked whether um, Treasury had undertaken research to see if employers in the general community were aware of the stapling changes that came into effect. Uh, in November last year, uh, and what the result of that research was. Um, it's obviously, given, given the results uh, where we still have these 1.3 million people in these, these funds, however you would like to now characterise them, um, it's important to understand what the levels of awareness um, are in the community about, about this uh, situation. So we've asked for 
um, a copy of any research to be provided. Uh, and we've been told that in the answer to the question uh, that there is research that's been conducted um, and uh, that campaign evaluation research on the outreach and engagement processes that you've engaged in, campaign evaluation research um, is produced to inform a deliberative process of Cabinet um, and therefore findings are unable to be supplied. Um, why, why is the department refusing to um, give us this research? You might have to ask the department. Um, I am of the understanding that in the answer to this question, the department is essentially claiming cabinet, cabinet incompetence. I'm not aware of that. Well, isn't that what I just read out? I, I, actually, I don't know what you just read out. I've read out. So you haven't seen you haven't seen um, the uh, department's answers to questions on notice in your portfolio number one three seven. Uh, uh, no. Do you want a copy of that? Yeah. That help. Well, if we're going to talk about it, it would be easier. Can we get a copy of it Did for you the minister, people please? not give you a folder. I beg your pardon. Do you not have a folder with yeah, the I've got a folder. I, no, I just know them. Okay. But not this one. Well, you're referring to an obscure question that you asked earlier today. No, no, it's a, it's a question on notice. It's an answer to a question on notice. To whom? Which, 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 which number, question? Number, number 137 from the Department of the Treasury, number 137, consumer, regarding consumer research on stapling. Uh, and the department is claiming cabinet incompetence about research about the levels of awareness and understanding in the community about stapling. And my understanding is that it's really up to you to, to decide whether something is cabinet incompetence or not. Is that, is that right? Well, I'm not exactly sure which piece of research they're referring to. So can we, let's just get the minister it, a copy. It's just, it's just I mean, printing I out I don't now. think you need my copy of an answer no, no. to a question. No, no, that's no, fine. No, yeah. it's printing, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to sorry, I'm I was looking beyond looking you. beyond me, okay, sure. Sarah, sure, I'm, I'm happy to take the department if there were, I haven't seen that research, but that's fine. I'm not entirely sure the context of the question. Well, that's why I wanted to give you fine. the, just so you had the benefit of it. I think it's just printing out our minister. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm referring to uh, the answer to question uh, 137. Did mm -hmm. Treasury undertake consumer research? What was the result of that research and, and can we have a copy of it? Um, yes, Treasury did undertake uh, research to understand uh, the levels of awareness um, in the community. Um, point two, um, answer two, all campaign evaluation research is, I understand these words to mean cabinet in confidence. And so uh, I'm asking you why, um, why, why we're not able to see this research. I'm asking because you what you can tell us about it, why, why we can't see it. Uh, from memory, and I could be speculating here, Senator Walsh, yep. there is research that's done as part of a communications campaign. I do remember, in fact, I do recall you, actually it might not have been you, it might have been Senator Gallagher questioning Treasury this morning on campaigns that were underway, yep. and they did refer to the Your Future, Your Super campaign, and that is currently being developed. So that is cabinet in confidence. It's, it's cabinet in confidence. The research that is, contributes to that campaign, yes. Because it's being used to develop a campaign to increase the I'm, I'm speculating, the I'm responding to the question that's in front of me, and that's yeah, no, would be just... my, that would be my best guess. 
Okay. And sorry, I'm just repeating because I was looking mm -hmm. at the document at the same time, that you think it's uh, cabinet in confidence because it's being used to develop a further campaign. Which is one, something that is um, that goes through a cabinet subcommittee, yes. To increase engagement and awareness in about the In your the future, issue. your super changes more broadly. Okay. Making sure that people go to the website, check their own superannuation fund against other funds that are out there, check it against performance, check it against fees, see if their fund is an underperforming fund, see if there's a fund that might better suit them to move to, which of course is something that didn't exist before the Your Future, Your Super reforms went through, so, and that's what we want people to okay. do. Okay. So what would, what, what would be the harm to the public in releasing this information? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the benefit to the public is in releasing the information either. Um, and I haven't got the information. Oh, sorry, I haven't got the research sitting in front of me, and I haven't read the research in any great detail. So I'm just speculating. It wouldn't be really for me to say. Is I guess the test isn't really a, that there has to be a benefit. That's not really how open government works. Uh, the test is that information should be made public. Well, if it informs some, cabinet uh, May I finish the question? The test is that information should be made public unless there is some harm that would be done. And Senator well, Walsh's question to you was to describe what harm would be caused to the public interest by releasing well, this Well, I don't research. think it is a harm to the public interest, Senator. In fact, I think there's lots of reasons why information would not be made public. And one of them is that it informs cabinet deliberations. And that's a pretty common reason to not release. As a principle. You, um, As a principle, that's right. Minister, you... you referred to some of the questions that we were asking this morning about um, of Treasury uh, and the ATO about advertising campaigns on these mm. changes. Uh, and my recollection is that Treasury said this morning that there was no more funding allocated to further no, that's right. campaigns. So how is that consistent with what you've just said, which is that you think that this research is been claimed to be in confidence because it informs further campaigns? It's not further campaigns, it's current campaigns. Okay. I'm fairly sure that Treasury answered questions saying that um, there was uh, funding for campaigns which had concluded, concluded and that there was no intention and no budget to do further campaigns about um, your future, your super. No, that's not the case. No, they said that money, money has been allocated, money has already been budgeted, it's already been set aside, the campaign is being developed now. Okay, and what, what can you tell us about that campaign? That it's going to be a ripper. What, what, what is it about? Is it about the stapling or is it about the underperformance? It's an awareness funds? campaign. You know, Your Future, Your Super has changed the face of superannuation for so That's many it. Australians. Is it an election Until, campaign? Is that no, it is? it's not an election campaign. It's a campaign to make sure that people are aware now that there is new uh, access to information about their super fund that they've never had before. And it's all in one place at the ATO website that they can compare their fund to other funds that are out there on the basis of performance and fees. And it also, that website highlights which funds are underperforming funds consistently, I mean persistently underperforming funds. So that you've have decided been to do this campaign to provide people with further information about their need uh, to access information about changing funds, but you didn't know until tonight that there are 1.3 million people who were still in underperforming funds. So well, what again, I think you're intentionally misinterpreting that data. Those, uh, whatever number it is of people that are, remain in underperforming funds will not be in underperforming funds much longer because thanks to APRA, who in fact are here and here for questioning any time you're ready, um, are doing a terrific job in facilitating mergers. They've got new powers to do so and they're making it happen. So all of those people that were stuck in underperforming funds won't be much longer. And in fact, they're going to have a much better retirement outcome thanks to the Your Future, Your Super changes. So you, as I understand it, introduced stapling because people were not engaged enough in their super to avoid having the duplet accounts that you, that you talked about before. Um, and now what you're telling us is that all of a sudden these people who are still in these underperforming accounts 
are either through some process not of their choosing, the, the, a merger process, they're going to find themselves in a, in, a, in a better performing fund, or all of a sudden they're just going to wake up and make the choice that they haven't made since last August to get themselves out of this fund. They're going to engage uh, and they're just going to decide to get out. To, you know, despite the fact that the numbers are just so... No, okay. They're so overwhelming. You've, you've had 6% of people choose to leave and 94% of people choose to stay. Well, but all of a sudden, people are so engaged, they're going to get out of their fund. Again, and you can you know, specifically ask APRA about this. Because you did jump that's in, not the case at all. And you are intentionally and deliberately trying to misinterpret the data that's in front of you. In fact, a number of people, nearly 89.2, what 89,291 people, have already made the decision to switch yeah. to a better performing fund. Those that haven't made that decision don't need to worry. We've got their back too, because APRA is facilitating mergers. Three funds money. have also chosen to close. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, is that right, Ms. Cole? It's uh, it's um, it is. It, I think it's three that have chosen to to close. Three that have completed mergers or closed at this stage. Yes, thank you. So those people will have a much better retirement outcome thanks to the Your Future Your Super legislation. And in fact, our estimate and Treasury's estimate is that there is around $17.9 billion in retirement savings that will be made over the next 10 years because of these reforms. So when, when you set out with this signature policy, you were saying to yourself that you would be pretty happy if the six percent, six percent of the people that you've communicated with about being in an underperforming fund decided to get out. I'll be pretty happy after, after the moment them all that Australians one letter, that are one in a fund that you that's delivering them. for them. And there were so many that weren't, and they didn't even know it. So six six percent is the success benchmark for you. Well, there minister. are eighty nine thousand nine hundred was it eighty nine thousand two hundred and ninety one people that have actively made the choice, and for those that haven't made the choice, proportion. it's okay because we've got their back. A as tiny, well. a tiny proportion of the people that would you rather have you, them you stay there, Senator to, Walsh? To what is the alternative that, that Labor has come up with? Because I haven't seen you present a single alternative. In fact, your unions are encouraging people to stay in underperforming funds. The Maritime Union actually wrote to their members and begged them to stay in an underperforming fund. Well, would you... Would is that you, correct? I should just like... check that with APRA. That's the case, isn't it? Would you... Uh, Minister, seriously, are you... Are you, do you I mean, I'd like you to be on the opposition benches asking the questions. That well, would be, I'd probably that, ask that some be, more sensible That would be ones. great. That would be great if you are. Um, but, I mean, essentially, you know, this is a signature policy and what you've done is send people that registered letter that you... No, have, the super funds sent it. We about. didn't send yes, it. Yes, you've required the... Thank you for the question. You've required the super funds to send that registered letter. Um, you've done some advertising to employers that we heard about earlier today. You've got something in the, in the, in the works. But essentially, you've completely failed to communicate to people that they're in these underperforming funds, they're now stapled to them, and only 6% of people have got out. This, Again, is, this, is, a, an this is a complete disaster. I, I, I can't how, how is it out. anything other than a complete disaster? Oh, Senator Walsh, don't be serious. I'm, there are, there I'm, are I'm, I'm thousands very serious. and I mean, thousands at least I had of people the, that are much better off already me, today from these reforms, which, I might remind you, you resisted. Yes, we said that no one should be stapled to an underperforming fund. And they're and, not. And, and they can leave at any time. You also, you also, the majority you of also are voted against choice, an which would have fund. left those people in those underperforming funds and not given the opportunity to move. You also voted against protecting okay. your super. So you would have stopped people uh, having not only just reduced fees, but abolishing exit fees as well. So they couldn't change funds without a penalty. Now, you have not supported a single piece of superannuation legislation until last week. Until last week. Not one. Yeah, our chair, it's obvious. I think I'm concluded. My... So it, it is Senator McAllister, and I look, I have given a bit of latitude because the questions have been are very repetitive. political, to be frank. Um, Based and on data provided I think, by APRA. I think 
Um, so I have given the minister a little bit of latitude, to be frank. Um, but Senator Walsh, do you have many more questions? Uh, I don't. Really different I'm, ones. I'm, no, I'm, I'm concluded. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Chair. Sorry to get you mid-sip. mid tip tap Thank you. Uh, good evening to APRA officials. At the Senate estimates hearing on the 28th of October 2021, I asked a question about how new business volumes for the retail advised life insurance channel had declined by 50 per cent over the last five years as a result of less financial advisors, less commissions and a reduction in those advisors who are providing advice on life insurance products. I also made the point that new business is very important for life insurance as it serves to add younger lives to the life insurance pool and it covers some of the fixed costs of these companies. I asked whether such a significant decline in new business was very concerning for APRA. I asked since the APRA reforms to the uh, individual disability income insurance market from 1st of October 2021 uh, that new business volumes have declined even further. The answer I received last October seemed to suggest that the problem was attributable to recent premium increases as a result of losses experienced by life insurers. These losses have largely been limited to the individual disability income insurance product. So why has this driven such a large reduction in new business across the board? Can you please confirm if this decline in new business is as of material concern to APRA um, and further explain what has been driving this decline in new business and what are the consequences for the life insurance market? Uh, good evening, it's Helen Rowell, Deputy Chair of APRA. I'll respond to that question. Um, I think the drivers of uh, new business volumes in life insurance are quite complex um, and they are significantly linked to the level of premiums that are charged, but also the priority that individuals place on life insurance in the context of their overall circumstances. Uh, there have been a number of changes to uh, the life insurance market and disability products in particular, retail disability products over the last little while. Those new products um, are very different to the previous products that were in place. Uh, they have more sustainable pricing terms and conditions, but uh, getting behaviours and uh, response to those new products to change, um, particularly in the current environment, um, which is, is, is quite uncertain for many people, I think is proving challenging. So there has been a dip in, in new business volumes. I don't have the precise numbers in front of me. We can, we can take that on notice. Um, our understanding from the insurers is that they are getting a reasonable response to their new products, uh, but it, it is taking time to explain the changes and uh, to both the advisors and to the policyholders to get the take up. All right, so you will take on notice that uh, the decline figure, I've quoted 50% over the last five years, but if you could take that on notice, I'd appreciate it. At the Senate estimates hearings on the same date, 28th of October 2021, I asked a question about a response from APRA to a question on notice from Senator Small in June 21, in which APRA justified life insurers giving large discounts to new clients on the basis that having them underwritten again reduces the risk they pose. Now, I asked the question, given that some insurers are offering a 25% discount in year one, supposedly as a result of the underwriting process, which the insurer needs to pay for, how can this be a good thing for the other policyholders in the insurance pool? I'm sorry, that's I don't the think question. I can add, yes, uh, I don't think I can add anything more to, to the previous response we gave on this. Um, the way insurers managing the, the, manage the pricing of their portfolio across new and existing customers is a commercial decision for the insurers. There are a number of reasons for them uh, pricing the way they do. Um, it's important to be sure when you're quoting those figures that um, you're comparing like with like. Often the new policies um, that are being sold to the new policyholders will be different and have different terms and features to the existing policies. And so I think um, some more granular analysis would be needed to understand exactly what 
um, the discounts um, or the or the differential in pricing between new and existing customers was, and whether it was a like for like comparison. Okay, so you and beyond that, I don't have anything to add beyond what we said at the previous hearing. So you you um, don't think these discounts are a further indicator of a life insurance market that is in difficulty? I, I'm wondering if you would have concerns. Um, Excuse me, um, could, could I just say, I, I think we are concerned about the life insurance. I think we are concerned about the, the, the products, the pricing, the sustainability and the cost of insurance. And that's why we are pushing the insurance industry to respond and to um, make changes to all of those aspects of what they're offering so that we get a good outcome for policyholders so that they can get valuable cover at a, re at a reasonable price and that the insurers can write sustainable uh, business. So it is a concern and that's why we've taken action in the disability income space. So the, the pricing practices uh, of the funds, uh, of, the, of the offerings, uh, are you taking any interest in that, tracking that um, and reviewing what the impact of the changes would be? We are monitoring the response of the uh, life insurers but in particular to our um, disability income uh, product uh, expectations. Uh, we're looking at a range of things, um, including what's happening to pricing, but also what's happening in terms of the terms and conditions, the changes they're making to their underwriting and claims processes and the like. Um, it's an ongoing process. It's early days. These new products were only put in the market from October last year. And so that will be an ongoing process for us to monitor over the next, you know, 12 to 24 months. So will, you'll be having a review, you know, a, a, a fixed kind of review period at 12 to 24 months? Is that your intention? Uh, yes. So um, we have communicated to um, the insurers our expectation of what we want them to do um, over the next little while. We have got regular updates from insurers to um, give us information on what they're doing and the changes they're making to their whole process around disability income insurance. And we are getting regular information on premium changes as well so that we can monitor what's happening in the market. Would you publish a review decision? How, how do you go about how does APRA go about that process? So there are two different um, ways in which we would um, deal with those reviews. There's the, the specific feedback to individual insurers, which we would not make public, uh, but we would often uh, publish some sort of summary report of general themes and findings um, of what we're seeing, whether by way of a letter to industry or in some sort of insight article or other, other published report. It really depends on the nature of what we find and the, the level of concern we have, I guess, as to the, the, the depth of, and, and nature of what we would publish or the form of what we would publish. Right, okay. Well, I guess some of the questions that I'm asking are hopefully flagging the concerns that industry's brought to me. So. Um, in response to uh, questions that I asked at the previous Senate estimates, uh, APRA released data on the extent of premium increases for the individual disability income insurance market, suggesting that the average increase in 2020 was 15 per cent, which is before any age-based increase. I'm keen to know what the average increase was for 2021. I don't have that information to hand, uh, and so I will take that on notice and see what we're able to provide. Okay, thank you very much. I'd also like to know the maximum average increase by any one insurer, the extent of increases for level premium businesses, the average increase for closed products, such as agreed value policies that have in the past been so important to small business operators. Uh, I'm hearing that some of these increases, since APRA intervened in the IDII market, have been as much as 70%. An average of 15% can hide what is really going on and the impact that this might be having on everyday Australians. <coughs> Whilst you may have commenced your intervention into the IDII market with a primary focus upon the sustainability of these life insurers, what are you going to ensure? I'm sorry, what are you doing to ensure that these life companies are being fair to their existing policyholders who are now enclosed products? 
So we are expecting that, that the life insurers develop a plan to transition their existing policy holders for, from uh, the existing products to the, the new products or, or to new products. And, and we expect them to do that in a fair and equitable way. Um, I think it's important to understand that that is a, a challenging process and not entirely within the insurer's hands because those policyholders have a choice of keeping the existing policy with all the terms and conditions that go with that, but also a significant increase in, in premium to deal with the losses that have been incurred for those products in the past, which is what the insurers are responding to. The, the alternate decision that they can make is to move to a new, newer product but that perhaps has different terms and conditions that are slightly less generous but is more stably priced and more sustainable going forward. And that's a decision how the, the life insurers um, balance those um, decisions and the information that they give to, to policyholders is clearly important but ultimately that's a decision between the or a, an arrangement between the life insurer and the policyholder. We monitor, engage and review how that's being managed um, but it's not something that we can um, necessarily directly control. Uh, it's, it's a decision for the insurers and the policyholders. Isn't it a, a challenge for the policyholders that they get to a point where they're not insurable under another fund? Uh, this is reflecting on personal experience where I'm now apparently too old and too risky to insure, so uh, I'm going to stick with my wildly expensive um, you know, fund that I have, better, nothing, better something than nothing. Well, I, I mean, I think, again, that's a challenge for the industry and, and there is a, a process called underwriting to assess risk, risks. We expect insurers to do that in a fair and transparent way. Um, there are a range of insurers out there who have different terms and different approaches to underwriting. Um, and um, I would not like to think that just because you're getting older, you're um, uninsurable. I would have, uh, mm -hmm. But there would be insurers out there willing to write reasonable risks, whatever age of the policyholder. Well, that's a, a, a hopeful note to finish on, Chair. Maybe I am insurable after all. Oh, absolutely. I think you're insurable. Excellent. And I think Thank your you, uh, deductible would be very, very low indeed. <laughs> that's OK. Good. Senator Small has some questions. You th can you hear me, Senator Small? from uh, behind the Iron Curtain oh, here. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and good evening. Sorry? Um, I'll start, if I can, <laughs> with a couple of... OK, fire, fire off, Senator Small, as quickly as you can. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes. No. OK, yeah, rip up. Um, so, in response to um, some questions from uh, my colleague, Senator Brockman, uh, in the June estimates of last year, um, APRA indicated a review of the sole purpose test uh, would follow once the Your Future, Your Super reforms uh, had passed. Um, and, and I guess many industry participants I talked to are sort of asking why a 21-year-old piece of guidance has yet to be updated. Can you offer any guidance on how that review is going and what the timeline looks like? So who'd like to... Thanks, well, I think that I missed the first, the dateline. Sorry, Senator Small, but I think it might have pre preceded my joining up. So I might ask Ms. Smith to answer the question, if you don't mind. Thank you. And just for the record, Suzanne Smith, Executive Director of Superannuation at APRA. So thanks for the question. Um, in relation to the sole purpose test, also since that time with the Your Future, Your Super reforms, we've had the introduction of the best financial interest duty, which is an important duty which um, you know extends the onus onto trustees to act in the best financial interests of members and also reverses the onus of proof. What we're looking at doing is um, looking at all of our standards and guidance in relation to what the introduction of the best financial interest duty means and we're in the process of doing that. So with the sole purpose test and the best financial interest duty that will be wrapped up in the review which we're currently undertaking to ensure that the standards and guidance that we have in place um, is best incorporating these higher standards and requirements. So over the course of the next, um, over the course of the next few months into 2022, we're reviewing that, that review will incorporate the sole purpose test and best financial interest duty. 
And so would it be fair to expect that to be finalised by, say, mid-year or? Uh, I wouldn't. I haven't. I, I don't know that I can commit to a time frame, but I I know that we're in the process of looking at all of the the guidance that um, we have in the concept in the context of the best financial interest duty. So I would hope that it would have, if it's not completed, it'd be well in train. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think, Senator, we're also looking at the way that um, testing with trustees, the way that they're approaching the change to best financial interest duty. And with the benefit of the reverse burden of proof, we're being very active in asking them to justify, you know, how they approach that new duty. So anything that we can you know, any changes to guidance or, or standards will be informed by, you know, those real life interactions with the entities that we supervise. Yeah, thanks for that, um, um, Ms. Cole. And I think that's getting to the crux of it. That's what industry really needs. So. There's one other issue I um, touched on last estimates as well, um, and that's uh, the IDII market. And as I understand it, tranche three is scheduled to commence on 1 October of this year, um, and it requires life insurance um, uh, underwriters to provide um, contract renewal every five years, subject to policy terms and conditions that apply at that time. Um, so what, if any, disadvantages uh, could this result for consumers, um, I guess, particularly looking at things like reduced terms, increased costs, or uh, even in extreme cases, uh, the total loss of cover. So I will respond on that. It follows on from the questions from uh, McDonald. Um, we are aware of the um, the implications and 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 pros and cons of moving to the five year policy contract term. Um, there are questions of providing certainty and stability um, for policyholders as well as insurers um, versus some of the issues that you referred to, which is continuing access to cover and the need to re-underwrite and the like. They're complex things to balance. When we introduced the IDII measures, we felt that there was a need to make significant changes in the um, IDII market to address the underlying losses and um, poor outcomes for policyholders that were occurring. The, the five year contract term was one of a set of measures. Um, it's the only one that remains to be put in place and we did defer it because of the feedback we had from industry about some of the challenges and complexities. We've had further engagement up through the Financial Services Council and with individual insurers over the last couple of months and we are still discussing with them those challenges and, and the, the sort of the, the pros and cons, if you like, of that measure. And um, we will need to communicate our response to industry as to um, proceeding or otherwise with that particular provision in the coming months. Yeah. Do you have, um, I guess, a firm deadline in time by which you would communicate that to industry? I guess, given obviously it's, it's quite obviously profoundly important, I guess, to those working in that space. We don't have a firm timeline, but we are aware of the um, importance and the urgency. It is actively under discussion and consideration within APRA, and we would hope to be uh, communicating. I'd like to commit to by the end of March, um, but, but you know, there are no guarantees on that. But that's, that's the goal we're working towards, is to make a decision and communicate by March as to whether we're proceeding with that um, requirement or not. Okay, thanks very much, Ms. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Small. Uh, do we have any? Oh, Senator McAllister. I do. Um, and I think that they are um, probably directed to Ms. Smith. Um, since the choice heat maps were published, has APRA identified any issues with the data that they relied on, or any inaccuracies in the in the choice heat map results? Thank you uh, for the question. So with the choice heat map, we published that heat map using data that was provided by super ratings. Um, we don't actually collect at this point in time data on the choice sector that's provided directly to APRA, but we're in the process of collecting that now. So we, um, we produced that heat map using um, you know, data that we 
used to the best of our ability um, that rep you know represented what we wanted to be able to publish to provide transparency. So to the extent that we've achieved that, provided transparency, we've had some questions from industry around the use of data, but based on the assumptions, we're confident in terms of the assumptions that we've made using that data are consistent across the industry. That doesn't really answer my question though, does it? You say that the assumptions are consistent across the industry. Well, that they could be wrong and applied consistently and it doesn't really resolve any of our challenges. My question to you was, have you identified any issues or inaccuracies with the results? Well, I'm we're confident in the data that we've used, Senator McAllister. So I think we needed to take a snapshot of data. We did an industry tender to provide that data, and we've um, we made assumptions that were consistently applied across the industry. Those assumptions were with an independent group to look at the assumptions. So there will always be differences in assumptions that can be made. So to the extent that um, we have information provided to us that identify areas that you know could be done differently. But you know we're you know we're backing the data that we've used and the application and the manner in which we've done so. All right. So your answer so far is that you proceeded in the way that you set out to proceed, and therefore, by your logic, that's acceptable, irrespective of whether or not there are any issues raised by parties about whether or not it's actually accurate. I mean, consistency is not the same as accuracy, Ms Smith, and so I'm asking for a third time. Uh, are there any inaccuracies in the heat map results? I think it will depend on individual funds. I mean, there's a lot of products and options that are captured in that heat map, Senator, and I think what, the Senate, what, it, mm. what it's highlighted is, you know, a significant number of choice products are performing below benchmark. So I think it's provided a level of transparency. What I would say is that we are very happy to listen to challenges or questions, which we're doing. We've received some questions back from particular funds or groups around the data and which we'll absolutely look into. Okay, so what are the concerns and the questions being raised with you by groups that you are looking into? What are the problems that they are raising with you? Some of the questions have been around the level of granularity of data provided. Um, there'll be question, we've had some questions around benchmarks that have been provided. We've had some questions around why the use of net returns versus net investment returns. So the, the questions you know, are all you know, reasonable questions that we will look into on a case by case basis. Hmm. It, it, APRA didn't consult any of the funds ask them to review the data in relation to their performance to verify or validate it before publication? You just published it. But there wasn't. Publish and be done. There damned. was a level. No, well, I, what we did do was super ratings did engage with, um, you know, a lot of the information that's actually provided to super ratings is provided by funds themselves. And we did engage with a number of funds where there was areas that, where there were areas that we wanted to check for um, consistency or accuracy. It's actually not feasible for us to engage with every fund to check every data point that we're using. And that's why it was important that we, we needed to make some assumptions and that those assumptions were applied consistency, consistently and that we did have some independent validation of the assumptions that were made. Mm. I, I mean, APRA would expect uh, RSE to apply thorough, rigorous checks to any data that they rely on in communication with members and consumers. Does APRA consider itself bound by those same standards? I think APRA, you know, has made no secret of the fact that data is absolutely important and we were disappointed with a lot of the data that was provided last year you know, in relation to the production of, um, you know, in relation to the performance test. So we absolutely um, rely on accurate data. 
Um, what we felt was important, though, was to provide a level of transparency to the industry on a segment of the industry that has had no transparency, of which you know a significant portion of Australians hold their superannuation money, and that's what we've done through the production of the heat map. The heat map metrics that we used have been publicly known since we first published heat maps back in 2019. So the metrics were well known, and um, we. We've also made public that we would be using super ratings data prior to the release of the heat map. Mm. Um, do you consider that the use of that data, which critics say is non-standardised and in fact provides a misleading picture of performance, is compatible with the standards that you would ordinarily apply to trustees? As I said, um, data, the quality data is absolutely important. We did work with super ratings to, um, you know, to look at the data that we were using. Super ratings provide a lot of data to the industry, and we think that the data that we've provided is representative, gives a good picture of, you know, the choice sector. Any concerns? We, 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 I think um, what we've what I will say is so we've worked hard over the last period of time recognising that we need to collect deeper and richer data from the industry, and that's the superannuation data transformation program, which we've been running for the last few years, is doing that, and we are collecting APRA data now directly to APRA, and we will be using that data going forward. So. You're happy with what you've produced, but you are, but you won't be doing it again. Is essentially the message that you have. We will be producing heat maps in the future, but we will have the benefit of data that's been provided directly to APRA for the next iteration. Right. So, is there any world in which you might find yourself in a position to acknowledge that the approach taken this time? has some shortcomings or are you just sticking with your position that since you applied a consistent approach across the industry that was enough? As I said, um, we're, we're open to receiving feedback and looking at, at where there are genuine concerns in relation to that and we've received some of those and we've got meetings coming up with um, groups who have expressed concerns on that data. We've received some information and correspondence in relation to that that we're looking into. So we need to spend some time looking at what those concerns are more deeply and to the extent, you know, if there's anything that needs to be done about it, we would consider it at that point. But we also consider that the benefits of transparency and getting information into the the market around transparency in the choice sector to hold trustees to account um, is really important as well. And you know, the fact is that it's 12 months sooner than it would have otherwise been. And I think that we're, we will see action from trustees mm -hmm. around um, ensuring that outcomes for members are prioritised in those products. Yes, Ms Smith, I mean, I'm very conscious that the choice sector was left alone for a very, very long time. Um, so I see your point. Obviously, APRA found its way to find, make assessments of some other funds much sooner. All right. Thank you, Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Senator McAllister. So I think we've finished just, with just a few questions. Okay. Senator Chisholm. Thanks. Over to you. Um, just, I just had some questions around. Uh, the finding that the default My Ethical Super product offered by Christian Super uh, was underperforming in August uh, 2021. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Christian Super does not invest in a range of industries that do not meet its faith-based standards, including alcohol producers, gambling comp companies and weapons manufacturers. Are companies in these industries included in the indexes used to set the benchmark? Not, no, I'm not sure I specifically know the answer to that one. Is that one we could take away or notice, Senator? Okay. Um, sure. Uh, I've just got a few questions I'll put. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of Christian Super, 
I presume APRA would be of the view that most members of that um, super fund are aware of their faith-based investment approach in that they would choose that fund for that reason. That would seem to be a reasonable assumption. I couldn't say for sure, but okay. I see where I think I see <laughs> the sense in what you're saying. Okay. Well, I, I suppose was there any consideration of the faith-based mandate of Christian Super in relation to the benchmark? I mean, the performance test regulations are, you know, emanated from Treasury or from the government, um, and they weren't they weren't APRA's. Uh, that wasn't APRA's consideration. We were the ones that implemented the test in accordance with those regulations. So I don't, I'm not aware that there was anything specific in there in relation to faith-based investment. Minister, are you aware of anything? Uh, there's nothing specific in the benchmark, of course. Um, but if you're suggesting, Senator Chisholm, that you can't invest with an ethical framework and outperform, I'd suggest you look at the at the performance tables because Australian ethical investment has been one of the top performers for the last five years, three years and ten years and it has very similar investment guidelines to Christian Super which hasn't and has underperformed. I'm, I'm just curious though if there'd be any consideration given to how those funds are evaluated against the benchmark. Well they're based on a benchmark, an investment benchmark, not an ethical benchmark. We don't do a faith overlay, if that's what you're asking. And in all honesty, neither should we. I mean, let's face it, why should we discriminate against people of faith and say, well, it's okay for you to have an underperforming fund, but people that invest in other parts of the superannuation system get a, a bonus because we're gonna punish you because you're of faith. I think that's entirely unfair. We and look, let's face it, Christian Super could quite easily have a, a product that isn't a My Super product that people could choose to go in. Um, but My Super products are there for default. Sure. So, what would happen if they, uh, if Christian Super was found to fail this benchmark for the second year in a row? Well, then they would be prevented from having new members join the fund, join that particular option of the fund. Um, and what about? merger propositions? I can't answer that. Um, does APRA have a view on how that would be handled with a fund like this? I think with, um, you know, they'd be looking at um, appropriate merger opportunities and, you know, looking at scanning the market to identify funds that would be appropriate for, for merger where member outcomes were prioritised and that they were acting in the best interest of their members. And what about their, their faith-based investment approach? How would that be considered? I think, you know, part of the, the merger discussions are all about how that, how, how they would incorporate that. So I think really the prioritise, they, they need to prioritise acting in the best interests of their members, the best financial interests mm. of their members. So, you know, that's what we're really looking at. What is the, what is the approach that they've taken? How have they scanned the market? And how have they made the decision that it is in the best financial interest of their members? Thanks, Chair. No, is that a question? One more question, please, <laughs> okay, Chair. I'm Senator. sorry, just briefly. Right. I, I have asked questions over several estimates, though not previously, about APRA's roadmap to risk for insurance and capital. There is a, a, a real problem with capital into regional Australia, particularly into the north, where banking uh, institutions are saying, I won't lend you that money in Croydon, Normanton, Richmond, um, uh, Quilpie, but I will lend it to you in Townsville and Toowoomba. Um, that's not where the business is. The ABA is denying there's a problem, but their risk shading is is stopping financiers from lending in those places. Um, what, if anything, is APRA going to do about managing the availability of finance into regional Australia? Given that you've written a roadmap to risk, so you obviously cared enough to, to write some what not to do, but you're going to get interested in what they should be doing? Is 
Senator, I'm not um, I'm not sure of the roadmap document you're referring to. Can you? We've talked about this previously. I guess then I'd, what I'm interested in is what interest, if any, would you take in the fact that you can't access finance into regional parts of Australia? Well, well so we've talked about this in the context of the work we've done on climate risk, financial risks from climate change. And as you know, we published our guidance, so we finalised our guidance late last year, and we were very careful in that guidance not to uh, be seen to be prescribing where banks uh, should lend or shouldn't lend, where insurers should insure or shouldn't insure, and where super funds should or shouldn't invest. Those are appropriately the decisions for those organisations, and we ask that the um, we ask that the decisions they make are well founded. Having said that, the concern that you raise more broadly about um, access to financial services, particularly in rural and remote communities, is one that we we understand, we, we are interested in, uh, in our corporate plan. We've talked about, in particular, um, the availability and affordability of insurance, which in many parts of the country is increasingly difficult. Um, we're aware, obviously, of the, uh, and participating or, or contributing to, I shouldn't say participating, but contributing to uh, the government's task force on, uh, on um, banking in, um, in uh, the remote, rural remote parts of the country. We're doing our bit to contribute to that. But, um, we don't have a mandate to tell people who to lend to. That's a bit disappointing for the rest of us and the rest of the country. What about um, uh, the proportionality of, um, of regulation between the COBA um, operators and the big banking um, institutions? So we've been very conscious of the, the competitive dynamic between the large four banks and the smaller institutions in and many things we've done in recent years. Uh, most recently, uh, and I referred in the opening statement to um, changes to the bank capital regime, which we finalised at the end of last year. Uh, there are many measures in that regime designed to ensure that there aren't competitive inequalities created by regulation. Um, making sure that different approaches produce similar outcomes, producing uh, simplified approaches that are less burdensome for smaller banks to implement. Uh, in the remuneration requirements that we introduced earlier in the year, we focused those very much on the large institutions where we saw challenges in culture and behaviour and uh, applied very simple approaches to smaller institutions uh, we've changed reporting timeframes for smaller institutions relative to large institutions to make uh, make sure that there's no undue burden on smaller entities. So I think we've been very active and very alert to those issues and doing what we can to make sure that the smaller institutions are not carrying an undue or an unfair burden relative to their larger competitors. Okay. Well, my reality is is that people can't get finance, so I don't know who else to turn to if if you're not tracking it or you're saying that it's up to the financiers because they don't really they will go where they make more money. Yeah. No. And I, I don't want to. As I said, uh, Senator, we're not uninterested in the issue. Obviously, we provide a, a lot of the data and collect data about things like where the branch networks are and where they're not anymore, where the access to financial services is uh, declining, we're providing that to government. My point uh, was really to say that um, it's very difficult for a regulator like us to tell people that they must do something. Okay. I, I'm suggesting that your policies have encouraged them to make that decision as to where not to lend? Uh, if, if, um, if you have any feedback on 
where that is in our framework or if people give you feedback on aspects of our framework that are creating that incentive, very happy for us to have a look at those and talk to you some more about it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator MacDonald. And thank you, no more questions for APRA? Okay. Uh, so we'll now move, so thank you to our witnesses for, from APRA. Thanks for joining us so late in the evening as well. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And I would now like to invite witnesses from the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. If you could put your videos on. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we'll 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 manage. But is he is is coming back in a minute or? Okay, all right. Uh, okay, um, if I could. Um, just ask our witnesses first if they could just introduce themselves. Stuart Nielsen, CFO and CEO of uh, NIFIC. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Rob Saville, General Counsel and Board Secretary of NIFIC. Thank you, Mr. Saville. S Senator, we're just waiting for our CEO, Mr. Nathan Dalbon, to join. He'll, he should be joining straight away. Thank you. Okay, that's okay. We'll just stand by for the moment. Mr. Nelson, I just wonder if, whilst we're waiting, whether or not I could see if you're in a position to answer a question. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Um, so could you, um, just in terms of providing us context, uh, could you explain how the corporation helps increase housing supply? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, NIFIC has, um, I guess, two main vehicles, one of which is the um, affordable housing bond aggregator. Um, the idea of the bond aggregator is to uh, accumulate loans um, on one side and then go and issue a bond to cover those loans. Those loans um, are made to community housing providers, generally for long tenor, um, and at a lower uh, rate of um, interest than what would be generally available. Um, so it's, not, it's, it's above the government bond rate, but what that does is it encourages greater investment in the um, social and affordable housing uh, sector. And it means that uh, CHPs that are the beneficiary of those loans can construct more social and affordable housing dwellings as a result of that. So that's, that's through um, the AHBA. There's also the NIF, which is the infrastructure facility where we can provide monies for um, effectively new developments uh, to provide necessary infrastructure, which will also help enable um, projects to proceed um, to build a set more social and affordable housing. Okay, and are there any metrics you can give us to enable us to assess the, the success of, of, of these initiatives? Um, thank you, Senator. Yes, look, we, we um, in our corporate plan, um, we put a number of uh, measures down, including the amount of loans that are being approved by the board. Um, so we'd set a target of up to uh, 2.5 billion, um, and you know we're we're close to that that um, that target. In our most recent um, plan, uh, we've exceeded the um, objectives that were outlined in the plan. Um, so, for example, we had set a target of. Um, somewhere between 300 and 500 million dollars worth of um, of loans and uh, and we have a liability cap that 
is currently set at 3.5 billion and uh, we've been successful in in making those loans such that the um, we're getting very close to that liability cap so we we measure um, approved loans we also measure the number of social and affordable housing or dwellings that are being created um, I think that number is about 12 to 13 thousand uh, social and affordable homes and we also measure the interest savings that we generate uh, for the CHPs, which is um, around $420 million. Right, okay, excellent. Uh, and could you give us an update uh, in relation, in particular, uh, how the Family Home Guarantee uh, program has performed since its 1 July start? And maybe if you can just give a bit of background and context in, in relation to the nature of the program. Uh, thank you, Senator. The um, Family Home Guarantee Scheme, as you highlighted, it's only been, uh, well, it's been in operation now for uh, six months. Um, the, it's part of the overall uh, FOLDS scheme. I have um, some data uh, that I'm happy to uh, to share with you, Senator, in terms of um, the number of places um, that have been um, issued. So the places available, first home guarantee, um, for about 7,900 places. Um, we've issued 1,407 certificates and there are 650 um, places um, on hold. Um, the bold scheme, it's the um, Family Home Guarantee Scheme itself, as you may be aware, is um, is designed to help um, particularly vulnerable people. Sorry, said I'm getting a lot of background noise. I don't know whether you are as well. Uh, no, actually, we can we can hear oh. you fine. But oh, yeah. these are the okay, then. these are the wonders of technology. So okay, if no, you're that's bear okay. With us. Um, and uh, the the idea of the Family Home Guarantee Scheme is to provide um, monies for um, particularly uh, vulnerable people, including um, singles and um, uh, single parents, and they are only required to have a deposit of um, 2%. So um, the scheme has um, uh, the scheme has um, been successful in getting um, monies out to or guarantees out to those um, those beneficiaries. Um, but in terms of that, uh, Senator, I probably don't have a lot more information to um, to share. Our, I said our CEO, um, when he comes on the line, will be able to add some more information to that. Do you, do you have, an, an, and you've got with you uh, this evening, three senators from Queensland uh, and a senator from Victoria. Uh, do you, and two senators from Victoria, the minister as well. Do you have any? Um, granularity in terms of geographical distribution in terms of the loans which are being provided? Are they um, reasonably proportionately uh, spread across the country? Um, is that one of the things you track? Uh, we certainly do track that, um, Senator. I'm just looking um, through my notes. I apologise to see so if I have you, got You've that. got three senators from Queensland here, two from Victoria would expect 60% of the loans to be provided in Queensland and 40% in Victoria. Um, that was a joke, I, sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a bit late, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Senator. Um, can I take that on notice? Because I just uh, can't, um, I, I have- No, you can, take, you can take it on notice. So I'm, I'm just interested in whenever programs like this are established, um, I'm always interested in terms of the geographical spread of, of the beneficiaries, and uh, uh, and we do track that inf we do track that information, Senator, by each of the schemes that we operate, whether that be the folds, uh, the new home guarantee scheme, or the family home guarantee scheme, and we track that also by um, by other metrics. I think to, uh, I think it's fair to say um, that probably the strongest um, contingent of first home of family home. Uh, guarantee loans has been going into Queensland. Oh, that's that's excellent. Well, that, that's the best answer I've heard all day. <laughs> so, excellent. Uh, Senator Chisholm, you've, um, do you have some questions? Uh, we do, yes. Uh, 
I might um, I might start just continue on that family home guarantee question uh, or line of questioning. Uh, so back in October last year, the Minister for Housing said, I think it was 1,236 um, people had applied for the family home guarantee or was that single parents had applied for the for the place under the family home guarantee in the first three months? Sorry, Sandy, could I just ask you to repeat the question in terms of that number? Um, back in October last year, the Minister for Housing said 1,236 single parents had applied for a place under the family home guarantee in the first three months. Um, can you tell us how many single parents have applied for a place under the Family Home Guarantee to date? Um, I may not have that information immediately to hand, Senator, so I'm happy to take that um, on notice. We, we know the total number of places that are available, but the breakdown of that... Senator, I, Senator, I, can, I can probably help with that answer. Um, from um, July 2021 to 31st December 2021, we had 1,407 guarantee uh, certificates issued okay. in respect to the family home guarantee. And do you have a breakdown of, of how many of those are, are single parents? Of well, that 1,407? All, all, well, all, all, center, all, all family guarantees, family home guarantees can only be issued to single parents. With dependents. Okay. So um, they all are. And, presumably, is that right? And, they all are. And uh, one of the other things that's claimed is that the fund is getting them out of public housing. Um, do you have any data as to how many of those 1,407? have left public housing as a result? Um, I don't believe we have that data, um, Senator. Um, okay. And Is, I don't think all of them would have left public housing. Some of them might have just left the rental market. Right, okay. Well, just the, the Prime Minister said on the 20th of December last year that the family home guarantee is, and I quote, targeted towards single parents and it's getting them out of public housing. Um, Not so I'm, I'm just trying parents to, live in public housing. I'm just trying to get a sense of when he makes that claim, how can he, uh, what data is there to back it up? Nothing, nothing that you're aware of? Senator said um, we don't have any particular data um, it's available, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Minister, you're not aware of of how that claim... I think you said before that most of them... Come I would imagine anything. that there would be some that would be public housing, some might be renters, um, some might be living with friends or with family that uh, while they waited for somewhere more permanent. But I think the good news in in this story is that there are now so many single parents that are finally getting a foot in the housing market that would never have done so before because of the family home guarantee. So, so Minister, just sorry to interrupt. Um, I think the Chief Executive Officer uh, has managed to dial in. I just want to check he can hear us. Uh, Mr Dalbon, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. So. Um, can, yeah, I, I can say uh, Mr Nielsen and Mr Saville have done a very good job in your absence. Um, my deep apologies. I haven't been able to connect. No, that's OK. OK, we can hear you now. So, Senator Chisholm. OK, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just go back to um, just some general questions about programs in general. Um, I've got the transcript of a press conference by the Prime Minister in Eagle Farm, um, not far from home, at, uh, in Brisbane, from the 20th of December 2021. Uh, and part of his answer is, and that's why we introduced these, those programs, so people would be able to buy a first home with a much smaller deposit. Now, since we've done that, 320,000 Australians have got into their first home 
since the last election, and that's extraordinary. Um, so the Prime Minister uh, and Minister for Housing have repeatedly said that the government's home builder scheme and the three home guarantee schemes, the first home loan deposit scheme, the new home guarantee and the family home guarantee, and the first home super save scheme, have directly led to 320,000 Australians being able to get into their first home since the last election. Um, could you explain how the government has calculated this? Um, Senator, so it's Nathan Dalbon here. Um, so in terms of that sort of global figure, it wasn't quite clear from the, the comment or the quote whether you were referring to the total number of first home buyers or the total number of first home buyers that have been assisted by uh, government initiatives. But I, I can certainly, from a, from a NIFIC point of view in terms of the schemes that we administer, I can certainly relay uh, how many people have accessed the scheme uh, since well, the scheme since the inception. Would that, would that information be helpful? A breakdown would be good. Yeah, so in, in terms of the, um, the total number of recipients uh, since the schemes have been operating uh, at the beginning of 2020, just bear with me for one, one second, um, we've had approximately um, a total of 60,000 places released across the three schemes, uh, a total of 40,968 places have been taken up to date, um, and there are about 4,261 of those places that are still looking for a property, and there are 36,707 uh, that have now uh, bought a home, uh, and therefore the guarantee has, has been issued. Um, uh, in terms of the breakdown uh, across the different schemes, um, if you look at um, uh, sort of like the global numbers, so in terms of, for example, so Folds has been operating now uh, for, for a number of years. Um, so we've had almost full take up of the 10,000 places across 2019-20, 2020-21. Um, and I can give you the latest numbers in terms of the folds or the first home loan deposit scheme take up for 2021-22. Uh, the new home guarantee in terms of 2020-21 places uh, ended up still 10,000 places available, 5,332 uh, were issued and there were 4,430 that were rolled over into this year, this financial year's fold places. And then we have uh, the first home guarantee, uh, that's been operating for just over six months. Uh, in terms of the total number of places that have been taken up, um, we're looking at, and just bear with me and I'll give you the latest, the latest figures. You're looking at um, around 2,200 in terms of places that have been taken up. Uh, this is for the family home guarantee and roughly, uh, looking at those figures, about um, 1,700 of those 2,200 have progressed to guarantee, uh, guarantee certificate issues or beyond. Um, okay, so basically it's, it's, it's the tally from the government scheme point of view is 60,000. In terms of the, the guarantee schemes that, that NIFIC is responsible for, yep. um, uh, there's been 60,000 places, as I said before, that have been allocated. Okay. And of those places, um, we've had just under 41, around 41,000 places taken up to date. Okay. Um, can you provide an update on the total number and a breakdown according to each state and territory uh, on the number of people who have been assisted through the home guarantee schemes? Um, so they were, they were the numbers, uh, so I've got the global numbers, just let me check if I, if I have those state breakdowns for you. I've certainly got some state, I've certainly got some state breakdowns for this financial year if that's helpful, Senator. Uh, I was, I was after the, the, the title. Through the, through the home guarantee schemes. 
Um, if you have to take it on notice, I understand. Yeah, look, the, the, the data that I have at hand, Senator, relates to a state breakdown for this financial year. Yep. In terms of previous financial years, I'll just, I just probably need to take that on notice. Okay. Um, and, and same for um, the first home loan deposit scheme? Sure, yes. I, I was going to take away all the, the first home loan deposit scheme, the new home guarantee and the family home guarantee. Um, I, sh I should say, just in terms of the state breakdown, that, that information is published publicly uh, through a paper that we released through our research function. Yeah. So we we have released two previous papers that summarise 2019-20 and 2020-21, and that includes a, a breakdown by state. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that that is published already. And then for this year, obviously we're still in progress, uh, but I'm I'm happy to sort of provide those details on notice. But I'm happy to provide them now, whatever you prefer. Yeah, I, uh, well, d just in terms of the first home loan deposit scheme, do you have how many people have been allocated a place under that? Uh, total? Yeah. Um, it, it would be the sum of those numbers that I just read out uh, before, um, which was uh, we had, so for 2019-20, uh, certificates issued were 9,803. For 2020-21, uh, number of certificates issued was 9,765. And then to date, uh, for FOLD, uh, we're looking at um, 8,218. And uh, noting that we're halfway through the financial year. That's at 31st of December uh, last year. And, and how many of those have settled? Uh, so the fast fault, certainly for previous years, would have, would have all settled by now, given the, the time frame. Um, uh, in terms of this year, if you, if you bear with me for, for a second, I can give you that number. So this is more up-to-date data, Senator, so not the 31st of December, but the 14th of February. Um, what we've had so far is 8,191 settlements confirmed. Okay, so 8,191 of the 8,218 have settled. Uh, in terms of the certificates, there's been 8,808 certificates issued. Uh, so that means there's 613 uh, still, there's contract signing stage that haven't settled. Okay. In addition, there's 1,388 at the pre-approval stage, and then there's 459 at the reserve stage. And if you want me just to quickly explain, the, the reserve stage is essentially that there's four steps to the process in terms of um, the issuance of the guarantee. The first stage is essentially a two-week process where essentially a place is reserved. Um, uh, they then go through, assuming they're successful in terms of their application, they go through to a finance pre-approval. And then the guarantee issue stage, which is the third stage, is that, that contract signing stage. And the fourth stage is the, uh, the settlement. Uh, and what about the new home guarantee scheme? How many people have been allocated a place under that versus how many of those people have settled? For this year, Senator? Uh, all, all up. Um, so again, it'd be sort of based on those numbers that I read out before um, in terms of the different years. So the new home guarantee was operating um, for around seven months of 2020-21. The number of certificates that were issued were 5,332. There were 4,430 places uh, that were rolled over into this financial year, and they were rolled over into the default scheme. And then there is a number of places that have been taken up um, so far this financial year. And in terms of new home guarantee um, take up, 
you're looking at um, 2,249 settlement confirmed, uh, 347 that are at the post-contract stage, so guarantee issued, 1,785 at the pre-approval stage, and 81 at the reserve stage. And uh, the Family Home Guarantee Scheme? Uh, so the Family Home, family home Guarantee Scheme um, started on 1st of July, um, this financial year. In terms of the numbers that we have, there is 1,462 uh, in terms of settlement confirmed. Uh, in terms of guarantee issues, we have 254. We have 500 at the pre-approval and we have 45 at the Stage. And just to repeat, this is at four February. Thanks, Mark. Uh, in December last year, the government announced that it would reissue up to 4,651 unused guarantees for first home buyers from the 2021 financial year who did not have the opportunity to purchase their first home. Can you please explain the process by which unused guarantees occur and are reissued? Yes, yeah, so um, for the new home guarantee, uh, the Minister has the discretion to roll over those places under the investment mandate. Um, there was a decision by the Minister to roll over those places um, and, and that, um, became, that essentially became live on the 31st of January this year. Thanks for that. Um, just in terms of the home guarantee scheme price caps, um, can you explain how these property price caps work across the three home guarantee schemes? Um, so there is there essentially, I mean, there's five caps across metro regional areas. Um, so there's a range of, of different price caps depending on location. In addition, uh, there's price caps that apply for the fold first home loan deposit scheme and the family home guarantee. And then there's a separate um, price cap set of thresholds that apply to the new home guarantee. Um, is there any mechanism to review these price caps on a regular basis? Yes, that's, that's within the, um, the investment mandate. Uh, again, the provision there that relates to uh, NIFIC uh, having a, an annual review of, of the price cap, and we provide that information uh, through to the Minister. So how, how does that work? Who, who, who makes the decision on the price caps? Uh, the Minister makes the decision. OK, so you, you provide evidence to the minister, for the minister to make the decision, is that? Yes, we, we, we essentially um, assess uh, the potential for price cap. Yeah. Uh, we then provide uh, that information to the minister uh, to adjust the price threshold flow, and then we provide that information to the minister. Right, so it, does that include a recommendation or? Uh, I, I believe the um, uh, what we provided last through the recommendation. Okay. Um, at the recent press club appearance, the Prime Minister suggested that the government would keep pursuing policies to ensure Australians could purchase property, stating, and I quote, there will be more to help people get that f first start in their home to ensure that Australians conti continue to get a go. Uh, has the Minister for Housing or his office asked NIFIC to do any additional work regarding the expansion of the home guarantee schemes? Not that I recall, Senator. Um, has the Minister... I, I it's, it's not just mythic. I'd also sort of direct that question towards the Department of Treasury as well. Understood. Um, has the Minister for Housing or his office asked NIFIC to do any additional work regarding a new scheme to assist first home buyers? Not that I recall, Senator. Um, did you want to do something? Yeah, um, Chair, is it okay if I take call? Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, just a, a few uh, questions from me. Um, 
In, um, in December, your liability cap was lifted from $3 billion to $3.5 billion, uh, and many people have urged that it be lifted uh, even further. Uh, and Mr Delbon, you said last time we were here um, that you're seeking clarity about whether there would be an increase uh, and you thought that that would certainly help in terms of uh, investment decisions, but, but of course that it was a decision for government. Um, do you still agree that clarity with respect to whether there will be um, any further increase uh, and, and when would help in terms of investment decisions? Look, I, I think uh, so the government did make a decision uh, since estimates last year to increase the liability cap from 3 to 3.5 billion. Um, and I, I, my sense is that the government will, will obviously um, uh, take into consideration the views of NIFIC in deciding whether to, to lift the liability cap again. Um, I, 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 there are also you know, views put forward um, uh, with respect to the, uh, the statutory review that was released, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work with government and, and then we'll rely upon their decision in terms of whether they lift the liability cap or, or not. Um, thank you. Uh, if the liability cap was lifted to five billion, do you have any estimates of how many more social and affordable homes could be supported? I haven't done a I haven't done a scenario analysis to, to try and estimate what that figure may be. I mean, obviously, it's very heavily assumption driven. Um, when the when the liability cap was um, Increase from two to three billion uh, a little while ago. Uh, we did uh, attempt to estimate what that would mean in terms of additional supply, but I must confess um, because I haven't. I mean, because it's a hypothetical. I'm starting to work around the increase to five billion. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding actual commitments, how many loans have been issued to community housing providers? Um, I think from memory, there's around 50 or so one. I just confirm that to them. 50 or so. Yeah, I'm just um, just in terms of total. There's been 55 CHP transactions. Thank you. Um, and how many applications have been um, approved? Um, how many are waiting for approval? Uh, so when you say wait have been approved but waiting for approval, can I just clarify? Uh, so there's a pipeline of transactions that we have at the moment that are very stages of development. And then there's um, uh, actually decisions that have been approved by the board and then proceeding to financial close. Um, this, do you mind if I just clarify which, um, which piece of information you're looking for? Yeah, maybe maybe just give us both and we'll figure it out later. Okay. Thank you. Um, so look, I, I have, I, what I have is essentially a dollar for you. Um, uh, so that, that 55 figure that I referred to is a deal that um, uh, essentially a close. Finan we reached financial close. In terms of the... Um, uh, the figure that we have, we have approximately 2.8 billion of bond aggregated loans uh, that have been that have received board approval. Of that figure, roughly 2.2 billion of loans uh, have closed, settled. Um, so the difference, you know, between the two is essentially those transactions that are in the process of, of working towards financial close. Um, in addition, uh, we have. Uh, quite a substantial pipeline of, of work that's coming forward um, over the next uh, three to six months. Um, I'm just trying to find a, a figure here that I can see to. Um, then give me one second.
Okay, so I might have to come to you the precise figure. Um, there, there's, um, as I say, there's, there's a range of sort of transactions that, uh, where, for example, we use letters of comfort or letters of support through to applications being submitted. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll, if I could take that on notice, I'll come back. Um, actually, I've yeah. got a figure here. My apologies. Um, this, uh, this is an old figure, but at the moment um, we have about $798 of active transactions in the pipeline. Okay, thank you. And um, if, if we were to sort of piece, piece all of that together, are you able to give us an assessment of, of basically how close you are to reaching that, the $3.5 billion cap that you have today? Yes, I, I think. I mean, there's a lot of movement in the pipeline. Um, I guess that's one of the one of the issues, which is um, which is unknown. So that obviously goes to the amount of headroom that we have within the liability cap. Uh, so, so what we what we've been doing is managing a certain um, number of transactions within the liability cap, and then there's a certain number of transactions that we um, that we say are, are off. Um, so that basically means that um, we're progressing the, the transaction, uh, but we are clear to the, the counterparty that at this time we don't have headroom. Um, but at m most of the transactions um, uh, at this stage can be accommodated, you know, within the liability cap. But there is, um, and I can I can take this on notice. Obviously, I can come back to you and, and give you a sense of what that on the. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, the NIFIC website currently states that over 14,000 new and existing homes have been supported. Um, do you have an update on that total figure? Uh, that 14,000 figure would be the latest figure we have based on the 2.8 billion um, uh, board commitment figure that I referred to previously, Senator. Sorry, I think you might have to repeat that. Sorry, we're having a little bit of trouble with your line. I'm, I'm really sorry. Sir. That's okay. Um, uh, I'll talk up. The, the figure that I referred to before in terms of the uh, 2.8 billion in terms of the um, board decisions, that $2.8 billion figure equates to the 14,000 properties. Okay. Yeah, so 14,000 is up to date right now, but, but there's more in the pipeline. Correct. Um, and do you, do you have a number of how many houses are in the pipeline? Um, not in front of me, uh, Senator, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Okay, thank you. Um, of the 14,000, how many of them are new homes? And, and how many existing homes? So, of the 14,000, um, roughly 3,000, obviously rounding, um, 3,800 are new dwellings, and a further 8,300 are existing dwellings. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, just check with my colleague. Uh, sorry, just one moment. Um, uh, so I'm just referring now to a media release um, where the Minister for Housing um, states that the National Housing Infrastructure Facility has um, unlocked more than um, 6,700 social, affordable and market dwellings. Can you tell us what that means? What does unlocked mean because of the NHIF? Um, so, I mean, I, I guess in terms of the terminology that was used in this, it generally relates to the the supply uh, outcome, which is supported by the financing. So, 
So, for example, if, if we have a particular project, you know, that is worth um, X amount of dollars, we generally, uh, well, we do estimate the supply outcome that results from the level of support that we provide to a particular project. Okay. Um, and how much of the $1 billion um, facility has been approved, committed and dispersed? So in terms of the numbers, uh, we're looking at uh, 316 million of NIST transactions have been approved by the NISI board. Yep. And as I said before, that 316 million relates to 6,700 uh, new dwellings. Then there's, of that 316, 202 million has been uh, committed. And then 73.3 million has been dispersed at this, at yep. this stage. Thank you. Um, the $1 billion facility provides the opportunity to access up to $600 million in concessional loans, um, $225 million in equity investments and $175 million in grants. Yes. Um, I've got the same, same questions there for each of those categories and I wonder if you've got that information. So how much of the $600 million in concessional loans has been approved, committed and dispersed. Just let me check for you, Senator, and see one second. So of the, uh, just looking at the, the figures here, the, This, of, of the 250 that's been committed, I can use that breakdown, 162 million is in the form of loans and 40 million is in the form of grants. Okay. Um, and then for, for the uh, 316 million, 251 million is in the form of loans, 64 million is in the form of grants. Um, yep. Looking for the 73. Look, I don't have that breakdown. 73, sorry, so I'd have to come to you on that. Yep. I'll just clarify my question there, just in case. I'm not sure if we were on the same page there or not, but um, so just get you to, to repeat if I could. I was asking there of, of the 600 million in concessional loans, um, first of all, whether whether you've got figures there for for um, how much of that is approved, committed, and dispersed. Yeah. So, so of that six hundred dollar figure, um, there's been three hundred sixteen million dollars of commitments, and within that three hundred sixteen million. There's 250 million, 251 million associated loans. So of the 600, 251. Okay. And in terms of the 225 million in equity investments, what what could you tell us about what's what's approved and committed and dispersed there? So all the transactions that we've done to date have been in the form of uh, concessional loans and, and grants. There haven't been any um, equity. Oh, OK. Uh, that involve equity. OK. OK. Um, and sorry, did you say it's been in concessional loans and in, and in grants? Yeah, so I'll just, I'll just repeat that figure, sorry. Um, so of the 316 million, 251 million is in, in the form of loans and 64 million is in the form of grant. Okay. All right. I think that is uh, 
very helpful to us. Thank you very much. Senator, I was just going to say I have found that figure for you in terms of the liability cap. Oh, great. Yeah, so, I mean, this was at the 31st of um, uh, December last year. Uh, so, this, as I said before, this figure is moving around uh, on, a, on a sort of constant basis. But at that stage, uh, you're looking at um, roughly 290 million, you know, potentially in terms of transactions on risk. Thanks so much for that. For that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that how close they are? Yes. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Chisholm was just going to ask the same question, but we, we just clarified that we had the information that we want. So thank you very much, Mr Delbon. Excellent. So no further questions, I think. Yes, excellent. Uh, so can I thank our witnesses from the National Housing Finance and Investments Corporation, in particular, if I can underline that uh, expression of gratitude, especially because you had the graveyard shift. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you very much for your patience and being with us today. Uh, the committee will conclude its hearings for, the, for today. The committee's consideration of the 2021-22 additional budget estimates will resume tomorrow morning at 9am with further examination of the Treasury portfolio. I also thank uh, the Minister, Minister Hume, for being with us to, today and I declare the hearing now adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>